This is the Collected Works of Robert Adams. This volume consists of transcripts of recorded talks between August 1990 to June 1993. Transcribed recorded satsangs were completed as accurate as possible, word for word. Robert's speech being more clearer and accurate than students especially in the question and answer section. In some of the transcripts the word unclear are used to signify that the audio was unclear and the dialogue could not be heard well enough to be transcribed. Forward by Ed Musica. This is the collected works of Robert Adams. There are at least 250 recorded talks by Robert. We have compiled 248 of the transcripts in this book. There is also a seven-volume set designed for printing available. Robert was not exactly a disciple in the traditional sense of Ramana Maharshi. He was awakened at age 14 and went to India five years later. But it was from Ramana that he finally understood the nature of his awakening. Robert was the most unusual man I ever met. He was not of this world. He left no trace. He was unknown and unknowable. He shunned public attention and therefore was little known when he was alive. He didn't want many students. He said he wanted ten who would teach after him. Because he was ill and could not work, his shunning public recognition left him in relative poverty. He said he couldn't care less, and if it were not for his wife and daughters, he would not do anything. He'd sit for hours at a time looking out his window at Capital Butt in Sedona, not moving his eyes or blinking. He was always, as he told me in Sahaja Samadhi. Most around him had only the dimmest awareness of his state of being, Turiya, the fourth state of eternal rest in self, wherein nothing existed as objects away from him. The external world did not exist. Others did not exist for him as something apart, objective. All was self alone. He taught only two ways to awaken from the dreaming imagination, thinking, imagining process. Self-inquiry, wherein the sense of I, the sense of existence, the sense of being alive was followed inward, down through the false I, tied to the body, and human existence, to the great I of the absolute unmoving self. All of his talks attend to these two matters. The world is not real, so leave it alone. Your true self has nothing to do with your body or humanity, and the experience of the root self is attained by self-inquiry or by complete surrender to the Guru. When you read Robert's talks, it is best to read very slowly and let the words wash through you and trickle down to the lowest level of your being. Do not be in a hurry. Approach silence and silence. The self is subtle, so you must become subtle, quiet, watching so that it can take you away, entirely away, to the other shore, beyond life and death. Transcript 1. You must have your own experience. 3rd August 1990. Robert, I welcome you with all my heart. This body does not presume that it has anything new to teach you. I will refer to this body as I to make it short. I have nothing new to tell you. I am not a philosopher. I am not a preacher. I am not worthy. I simply have a confession. I confess to you your own reality. It is not a teaching, it's a confession. I am speaking to myself confessing, and you are myself. You are sat chit ananda knowledge, existence, and bliss. You are not the body or the mind. What you appear to be is not the truth, it may be a fact but it is not the truth. A fact is something that appears to be true but it changes. You cannot be who you think you were for when you were a baby, you were quite different. And when you were a little boy or a little girl you were also different. And the way you are now is completely different than you were before. Consequently, how can you be the body? What are you? Who are you? That shit, Ananda? What's that? Even if I tell you this, it means absolutely nothing. 
You must have your own experience. You mustn't believe a word I say. Why should you believe me? What do I know? I am simply confessing to you that there is only para Brahman consciousness bliss being awareness pure intelligence. This has been my experience. There is nothing else. Everything else is an experience of the mind, an appearance like hypnosis. The world seems real, so does a dream. What is this world? It's as if you just woke up from your dream and you still remember the dream. In the dream you were going places, getting married, having children, getting older, then you wake up and you halfway remember the dream and halfway remember the world in which you wake up. So which one is real, the world or the dream? It has been my experience that they're both alike. There is no real difference. You attach yourself to this world in the same way you attach yourself in your dream. If you were dreaming and you dreamt you were falling off a mountain and I was falling beside you. And I said to you don't worry nothing can happen to you, you're dreaming, you wouldn't believe me, you would be filled with fear and you would say can't you see we're falling, can't you see what's happening, how can you tell me I'm dreaming. Just before you hit the ground you wake up and you laugh, it was all a dream. In the same way you have attached yourself to sickness, to health, to good, to bad, to happiness, to unhappiness, these are all concepts. You've attached yourself to person, place or thing. You have forgotten that this is a dream. You believe it's real and because you believe it's real you suffer accordingly. When you leave your body you will have to come back again and again and again, all part of the dream, until you become detached. How do you do that? By simply observing what's going on around you and not attaching yourself to it. By being awake to your reality. Understanding yourself that you are not the doer. Everything that you do has been preordained. It will be done. You have to let go mentally of all conditioning, of all objectivity. And you must still your mind. Make your mind placid like a motionless lake. Then reality comes of its own accord. Happiness comes of its own accord. Peace comes of its own accord. Love comes of its own accord. Freedom comes of its own accord. These things are synonymous. They happen without you ever thinking about them. But first you must get rid of the notion that I am the body or mind or the doer and then everything will happen by itself. Be still and know that I am God. There was once a girl who was born into a house of prostitution. And across the street in front of the marketplace there was a preacher, a holy man. He used to exclaim the virtues of God and talk about the house of prostitution. How it was filled with sinners and he told people to repent. Yet the girl who grew up in the house of prostitution was 23 years old. She used to look out the window every day and cry to herself and she would say, How I wish I was like that holy man, how I wish I was spiritual, and she would imagine in her mind that she was a holy person and yet go on with her work. Now they both got old and died and went to St. Peter to go into heaven. St. Peter told the man you can't come in you've got to go to hell and he told the girl you can come in. So the holy man became dumbfounded and said, Why? For all these years I've proclaimed your goodness and your virtues. I told people to repent. How can you let her in when she was a prostitute and leave me out? And St. Peter said, You've been a hypocrite. You were very worthy and talked a lot and said nothing. In your heart you thought everybody was a sinner but you. Whereas the girl in her imagination, in her feelings, always was thinking of God. Though she can come in, you can't. Point is this, it's not what you say. It's not what you proclaim. It's what's deep, deep, deep in your heart that determines what happens to you. It's not reading books, it's not studying, it's not going to classes. It's sitting by yourself, becoming quiet, going deeper and deeper within yourself. Transcending your mind and your body until something happens. When thoughts come to you, you simply ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? From whence cometh these thoughts, follow the thoughts to their source. 
Find out the source of your thoughts. You will find that the source of your thoughts is I. Follow the I thread to its source by asking, Who am I, or what is the source of I? Where did this I come from? You will realize that the pronoun I is the first word that was ever spoken and everything else is attached to I. Every other word, every other thought, every other feeling, every other emotion, they're all attached to the I. I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel sick. I feel well. I feel poor. I feel rich. Everything is attached to I. If the I becomes dissolved, so does everything else and you become free. Find out for whom there is an I and you will discover something amazing. You will discover that I never existed. There never was an I. You will discover that you never existed. There's no such thing as you. You will discover that you are the imperishable self. That you were never born and you can never die. You will discover that your omnipresence, omniscient, omnipotent. That there are no others. There is no world. There is no universe. There is no God. There is only the self. All this is the self. All that you behold is the self and I am is that. This will give you a feeling of freedom of bliss of happiness. You will not lose your awareness. When I speak these things people believe that they become completely annihilated and there's nothing left. They melt into the great ocean of nirvana. This is not necessarily true. You will always be awareness. You will always be pure intelligence for that is your real nature. You will always be blissful. Except you will understand that you are not who you appear to be. Your body will still appear to be doing things, going through its motions. You will appear to be an ordinary person, but you will know. You have lifted yourself up above the gross world into the heavenly world of pure consciousness and you will be at peace. Any questions about that? Feel free to say anything you want. S.A. Hi Robert, I've been thinking about the practice of the teachings in the world in daily life. I was mulling over this recent business of the problem of the two Christian scientists in Boston whose child had died. I'm not sure whether you're aware of that. This was in the news recently. And of course there was strong similarities between the teaching and Christian science. And of course these parents believe that the illness was error and they wanted to project only health, only divine health, divine reality which was all that existed according to the teaching whether it's Christian science or this teaching or whatever. And so they refused to acknowledge that the child was sick. So what do you have to say about this subject that has, do you want us to believe that you are projecting a different reality, the true reality or not? Robert, this has nothing to do with the belief system. You have to understand what's going on and where you are. If you are sick you see a doctor, if you're hungry you eat, if you're in the sun burning up, you get out of the sun. It's not a belief. This is why I tell you to believe nothing. Do not believe what I say. Do not believe anything. Christian science unfortunately believes that you shouldn't go to doctors even if you're sick. But, they have a belief system. A belief system doesn't make it so. You have to have a consciousness of the truth. That's why there are some Christian scientists who do not go to doctors, and it works, but most of them that do not go to doctors die because they are not high enough. You can't just accept this system and say, this is the way it is mentally. You have to become a living embodiment of the teaching and then it works. In other words you can't join a Christian science church and never go to a doctor again. You have to work on yourself. You have to do certain things within your own consciousness until you lift yourself up and out of the ordinary human error, then things begin to happen. But, of course what I'm saying to you is go beyond sickness and health, beyond poverty and riches, beyond good and bad. We're not trying to exchange bad for good, they're two sides of the same coin. 
We are trying to get off the wheel. To become completely, totally free of human good and human bad. It's a completely different dimension. If you exchange bad for good, you'll have to exchange good for bad. For we live in a world of duality. For every good there's a bad. For every bad there's a good, for every up there's a down. For every amount of pressure pushing this way, an equal amount of pressure pushes the other way. Like in the flying of jet planes. Without pressure the plane couldn't fly without resistance. This is the world in which we live. I am talking about transcending the world, going beyond the limitations of this world. Coming pure bliss, pure consciousness while embodied. Completely different, do you follow? S.A. Yes. S.H. Three weeks ago you said something which I wish you could elaborate on. I think it's beautiful, you said, the only choice you have is to abide or not to abide in the self. Robert, oh I was referring to everything that's happened to you in this life has been preordained, you're not as free as you believe. Every hair on your head is counted, every move you make. If I move my finger like this, moves finger, it has all been preordained. S.A. What is the source of it? Why did it begin though? Robert, it didn't. It never began its hypnotism. SS, who preordained it? Robert, no one. Not yourself nothing? Robert, no. Capital nothing? Robert, no. It's hypnosis. I always use the example the sky is blue. There is really no sky and there is no blue. If you fly up there is only space but we see the sky is blue. If you're in the desert, and you see an optical illusion, and you see water, and you chase the water, it's a mirage. It didn't exist, same thing. SM, so you're saying it's the mind that has to believe it has a source. Robert, the mind. That's rejecting that upon itself. Robert, when the mind goes, all those concepts disappear with it. SM, those concepts also, uh? To what I was referring to, the only freedom the mind has, and this has to do with the mind, is to turn within and find the source. SM, it's almost like connecting to the same circuit, just freeing it from the mind. Yes, you have to use your mind to destroy your mind. SM, is that so yeah? The mind is nothing but a bunch of concepts. All that the mind is, is bunch of thoughts of the past and the future. If you understand that everything is preordained, you have nothing to worry about. SS, is that also what people say is you have an attitude of, what the heck, it's preordained. No, that's no good, I'm glad you brought that up, you have to act as if nothing is preordained. SS, even though it is. Even though it is. SS, then why is that? Due to the fact it will give people license to do whatever they like. The average person should never hear anything like this. For they will all go out and do all kinds of strange things. Though we say, your life is preordained but don't just sit back and say, it's going to happen anyway. Act as if it's not, act as if you're free, but realize it's preordained and everything will take care of itself. SS, because ultimately you're the watcher? Yes, your real nature is freedom. SS, but when you have all those stopping points in between, is that worth it? It's the mind, it all comes from the mind, all creation exists in the mind. Your universe, what you see and feel, extends out of your mind. You create your own universe every day. The way you see things with your eyes and your senses, it's an extension of your mind. When you pull in your mind and rest your mind in your heart, you're in a completely different universe. SS, you don't need a mantra to do that. No, just awareness, it's a waking up process. SS, when you meditate there's so many things on meditation, contemplation, 
concentration and so on that recently I'll begin, I'll go in, I'll start with this mantra and then I'll go to that mantra and then I'll think just thoughts. I'm having different mantras now, it's very dizzy, but then there's the idea of blankness, we don't want blankness necessarily either it's not just a void is it or is it? Robert, there is no such thing as a void. SS, there's still awareness. There is pure intelligence, absolute reality, but that's ineffable, you can't explain it, you'll have to experience it for yourself. What we call the void in Buddhism is pure awareness. It's not really a void, the reason it's called a void, it means it transcends the world, it's beyond anything you know and so it's a void, as far as that's concerned, but it's really pure awareness. Says, and so in meditation if you have no experience it means nothing? Absolutely nothing doesn't matter. Experiences are not reality. Says, I'm saying that because I'm wanting confirmation on feelings that I've already had, you've confirmed many thoughts. All forms of meditations, affirmations, yoga, breathing exercises are all to make the mind stop, to still the mind, to make the mind quiescent, but that's going about it the hard way. The fastest way to do this is to ask yourself the question, to whom comes these thoughts? As I mentioned before, you must use your mind to annihilate your mind. And by asking the question, to whom do these thoughts come? But not answering, it will take care of itself. SS, by not answering? Do not answer due to the fact when you answer it's your ego answering. Your ego seems to have all the right answers and you never get anywhere. You do not answer but the feeling will come to you these thoughts come to me I feel these thoughts and the next query should be from where does the I come from? Or who am I and again you do not answer. And one day you will find out that the I does not come from anything, it's mesmerism, there is no I, there never was an I, there is only I am freedom bliss consciousness existence, they are all synonymous. And you will feel yourself not as a body, but as omnipresence. You will realize everything as yourself. There's only one and even the one does not exist. There is no word to use. There is the self. That's the only word you can use. Everything is the self and you are that. SS, so find that self. When you use words it spoils it. It's beyond words, beyond thoughts. It comes to you. It's like you wake up, it's like you've been asleep for all these years then all of a sudden you awaken and you know. It's like the story of the Buddha. He was sitting under the Bodhi tree for 30 days, and he made up his mind he was going to sit there until he dies or until he awakens. And his disciples were sitting all around him, watching. On about the 30th day, he opened his eyes and he was shining, he was smiling. His disciples asked him, Master, what happened to you, did you see God? He said, No, did you become self-realized? No, well what happened, and he simply exclaimed, I am awake. Therefore all these words, self-realization, illumination, awareness, they're just words. You just wake up from the dream. Right now you feel your body. You feel your emotions. You feel pain. You feel hurt. You feel all kinds of things going on in this world. You watch TV, you watch the news and you get upset, all these terrible things, these dastardly things that are taking place in this world, but when you wake up all these feelings are gone. You realize the illusion, the dream, and you are no longer that. SS, do you behave then differently in the world with things that used to interest you no longer interest you? Robert, in a way that can be true but in a way you could still be doing the same things except you're no longer attached to them. As an example if you have a good job, be the president of a bank or if you're a garbage man, doesn't make any difference, you will do your duty whatever you have to do better than you ever did it before. You will no longer look at time. You will no longer think that you are the doer. 
you will just do whatever has to be done. Whatever your body is supposed to do will be done. Your body is under the law of karma and whatever you have to do you will do. But, you will have no attachment, you will have compassion, you will have love, you will have loving kindness and mercy but no attachment. SS, does it just happen like flicks fingers that? Yes. SS, so we're not in the process of that? No it appears that you're in a process. SS, yeah that's what I think, I feel like I know more now or I know now that I don't know, how do I say this? The process is an appearance. SA, couldn't you say that this is a necessary preliminary state though? Robert, no. SS, so somebody working at the car wash down here could all of a sudden just flix fingers. Robert, yes. They wouldn't be going through any of the gymnastics. Robert, exactly. We would be going through? Robert, some people call this God's grace but there is more to it than that. You had to be in this thing in a previous life. You did your sadhana, you did your spiritual exercises, your spiritual practices in a previous existence, and you're now waking up. SS, that makes it sound like a process. That's how it appears, that's the appearance. SA, wouldn't that be true of the fellow at the car wash too? If he'd done something in previous lives while he was washing cars, and suddenly he woke up. Robert, yes that's all an appearance, you're speaking of the appearance world. In reality nobody's ever done anything and nobody's ever become deluded. Everyone is already free. Identify with your freedom. Identify with the ultimate reality. Do not identify with the experiences you're going through bodily, leave them alone, leave them be. Do whatever you have to to take care of them but do not put your mind to that. Keep your mind on your freedom, on your absolute reality, and then you will see what happens. SB, what exactly does it mean when Ramana says, the mind falls into the heart? The mind rests in the heart as the heart? Robert, the heart he is referring to is absolute reality, pure intelligence. The mind has come out of the heart and does all its damage by making you believe you're worldly. When you go back again, the mind goes back into the heart, into the absolute reality from which it came because it never really existed. And the absolute reality shines forth once again, in all its glory and splendor. Just like the sun in the clouds. When the clouds cover the sun, the ignorant person says there's no sun. He or she does not realize that the sun is always shining, but the clouds are now covering the sun. And once the clouds dissipate, the sun is shining once again. Though it is with us, we appear to have troubles and problems and all kinds of nonsense going on in our lives, those are clouds, but your true self is trying to shine. You will not let it because you imagine your problems are real. You identify with the evil with the negativity. You identify with the wrong conditioning. Though you keep the clouds from dissipating. As soon as you turn from your problems and turn towards the light, the clouds of your problems will dissipate once again and your heart or your sun will shine through and everything will be resolved. SB, how does that relate to the physical body? Is there any relationship? Robert, no. Didn't. Ramena used to say you can feel it in the right side of your chest? Robert, yes, people always wanted to know where the absolute reality is, so he gave them a place on the right side of the chest, to focus over there. In other words people asked him for a process, Ramana, where should I meditate? On what part of my body? Though he realized that they weren't understanding anything, so he said, okay meditate on the right side of your chest, that's where your spiritual heart is, see reality there. Go jump into the right side, that's where it's at. He wasn't speaking literally, he was just giving people a place to go because they couldn't comprehend the absolute reality. SB, 
but to be established in absolute consciousness or to be established in samadhi, it seems to be based on absolute faith that we're not a person, that we are consciousness. On the contrary, faith has nothing to do with it. SB. I mean trust in the divine rather than trust in me as an ego. You know trust in that samadhi. No. SB. Trust to be able to release into samadhi, you know. Remember the person who wants to trust is the ego. So you don't want to do any of those things. You just want to awaken and you don't even want to do that. Just be yourself, be yourself. Ask yourself who wants to trust. Who wants to awaken. And you will see it's all your ego, it's I. I want to do this, I want to do that, I want an experience, I want this. All of that has to go. When all of that is gone, the sun will shine by itself. And the way you get rid of these things is by asking from whence do they come? From whence do they come? In other words, where does the idea that I have to trust some power come from? It comes from me. I believe that. Who am I who believes that? Just observe your thoughts. Do not try to change them. Do not try to correct them. Just observe them. And you can ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? Or you can just witness your thoughts without asking anything, and the process will take care of itself. You will know what to do. What we use here sometimes which is a very good beginning is the I am meditation. You relax your body and you inhale and you say I, and you exhale and you say am I am. You can do this while you're waking, while you're walking, while you're washing dishes, while you're resting. What it does is it makes your mind one-pointed, so it'll stop thinking. In other words, you use whatever method you have to to still your mind. The whole secret is to quiet your mind. To keep it from thinking. To keep it from being active. Your mind is a bunch of waves. You want to stop the waves and you want your mind to become still and the fastest way to do that is by self-inquiry or by observing your thoughts, watching your thoughts, becoming the witness to your thoughts. SS. I was in a group for ages, are you familiar with Morris Nicol? Robert. No. He wrote, Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Ouspensky. He talked about doing self-observation. I thought it was too intellectual, too much trying. They say, what am I observing? I'm observing anger, and they would bring up what is the opposite of anger, and then they would say what would be the feature of consciousness. But, I felt that was a whole. Robert, it's a whole procedure. Procedure just like any other school or clinic, and I thought I couldn't do that anymore. Robert, whatever you think you need. I have a question about illness. Robert, okay, are personal questions appropriate? Robert, sure. This one I call I, in November of 88 became ill, became very tired, went to the doctor, it was after some treatment. He can't do anything for me, he called it chronic fatigue syndrome, this, TRI. Though somebody suggested to me to go to a naturopathic doctor, I feel that I felt myself trying to do those things and it came to me that as long as I am seeking health, I will always have an illness. And when I no longer care that there is a state of health or there is a state of illness, that's the place where I want to be. Robert, you're on the right track. There is no teacher that earnest and you know what you're to do now and that's all there is. Robert, whatever your karma is, is going to happen, no matter what you do. So why concern yourself? Assess, yet do I ignore the body? See whatever you're going to do, you will not be able to stop. Assess, I know, I find that. I write down, I say, why do I allow myself, I observe myself, look I went here, I went here, I went to this person, I ask this person, I see what I'm doing, why do I allow it? When I can be here in this peaceful state, sitting in my rocker, looking out at the trees or whatever, and yet I do that, 
but each time I do it, I feel like I'm learning a little bit. Robert, the way to see it is like this. Let your body do whatever it has to do. Do not think about it too much. Do not identify with it. Do not attach yourself to it. Everything was preordained before you came into existence. S.A. But still there has to be a rational process. It will take care of itself. The apples grow, the grass grows, the sun shines, there's warmth to make human life exist, there is a power that takes care of everything and it has nothing to do with our thoughts. S.A. Okay now let me throw this back at you. I know you made a move recently, to move your apartment. You didn't tell me this, I think it was Dana who told me this. As she was saying you moved into a better apartment and there were various advantages. Obviously some form of thinking went into this, you just didn't decide you were going to move into an apartment. So, Robert, on the contrary, it just happened. S.A., you didn't think about it? No, it became available, I just did it. S.B., but wouldn't it be intelligent to find out the needs of the body and then supply those needs and then just forget it? Robert, if that's your karma, I'll give an example. At one of my experiences in India, I was with a yogi called Nimkarali Baba. And one day a bunch of us, and one of the people there was Ram Das, you remember Ram Das, he was there too. We were sitting in front of him, when an old lady came up to him, and spoke in Hindi, whatever language they were talking I forgot. And what she said was that her husband was dying, would you please come and save him, because only you can come and save him. And Nimkarali Baba looked at me and said, should I go? And I said, yes go, let's all go. So we walked about two miles to a little shack, and the husband was lying on the cot dying of some kind of disease. And he looked at him and all of a sudden the candles began to flicker. So he turned around and ran out the house, Robert laughs, and started to run back to the ashram and we all followed him. And we said when we finally stopped we said, Baba what happened? Why did you leave? And he said, Ah, God wants him to die and he died. The point is this, your life, your health or your sickness, your riches or your poverty has all been preordained by the law of karma. And whatever you're going to go through, you're going to go through. If you're supposed to become a health fanatic and watch your health and eat the right things all the time, you will do that, and if you're not supposed to, you won't. If you're supposed to take the middle path, you will do that. Everything is ordained, planned before time. The only freedom we've got is to not identify with the process, even though your body's going through it. Do not attach yourself to what your body's going through. Keep your mind above it, keep your head in heaven, and your feet on the ground. Though we have no choice in the matter. Whatever is going to happen will happen. Though if we have to do all kinds of things, and we find ourselves running from one doctor to another doctor and so forth, do not attach yourself to that but do it anyway because you can't help it. Say, can you try to clarify this a little more, you've just been speaking of karma, and yet I know that you believe that karma does not exist. Will you comment on that karma exists and karma does not exist? Robert, again the Buddha said karma is a taskmaster for the foolish and the servant to the wise, meaning, if we in the level mentally of karma, we will suffer and it'll become our taskmaster. But, if we lift our minds away from the condition and we keep our minds on the absolute reality, we will not suffer no matter what the body is going through. Who suffers? The mind, not the body. The body cannot suffer. The body is merely a lump of flesh and bone and blood, but it's animated by the mind, so the mind suffers and allows the body to suffer, but the body can do nothing by itself. So if the mind is taken away from the body, something else will happen, you'll be free. S.A. What was the line again? Buddha's line karma is the taskmaster for the foolish. And the servant for the wise, it's a servant because you do not pay any heed. S.A. Control it. 
Exactly, you observe it and you do not respond. Though it becomes your servant when you do not respond to karma, then you overcome it. In other words, if somebody becomes angry at you and you do not respond, there is no karma and you'll be free. Karma again is like a person who talks to you and talks to you and talks to you but you say nothing. What will that person do? They'll get up and leave. Though when your karma sees that you're not paying any attention to it, it dissipates and returns to the nothingness from whence it came. Pause, let's play some music. Why don't you put the fan on while we're doing it? Tape starts abruptly after music is played as Robert continues. To assure you there is a power that knows how to take care of all things if you trust it. That power of course is you, but you don't know it. I've been trying to get a hold of a certain picture of Ramana Maharshi for quite a while but first I should tell you that when I was 17 I was led in mysterious ways to Arunachala where I met Ramana. I won't elaborate on that right now but there was mysterious circumstances that caused that. So going back to now, I tried to get a picture of Ramana Maharshi that I liked and sure enough last week George brings me the same picture as a present in color that I had been looking for for a long time. So I took it home and hung it on the wall. But, in the meanwhile I had a visitor from Hawaii. He used to be one of my students came to see me, he was traveling through, and he brought a lee and put it around my neck. So I took off the lay and put it around Ramana's picture, and he said to me, after being on this path for so-called ten years or more, he said, I didn't know you worship gurus. Now, he should have known better. So I explained to him the facts. Ramana's not a guru, he's the same as myself, I am simply paying homage to myself. There's only one self and we are all that. So when I honor him with a lay, I am doing it to me because he is none other than myself, and you none other than myself also. Though it's not a guru worship, it's bowing to yourself, praying to yourself, worshipping yourself, because God dwells in you as you. But, this just goes to show you that there is a power that knows how to take care of you, that loves you, that is always on your side. It only requires one thing, surrender. Surrender to yourself. God, Kiru and self are one, bow down to yourself, love yourself. When I speak of yourself I'm not referring to your ego self. There is something about you that perhaps you're not aware of yet. The absolute reality that we've been talking about. It is you that's what you worship, that is what you bow down to, that is what you express. Never defile yourself by hating yourself. Never believe there is any mistake you've made that is going to rise up against you. Everyone has made mistakes, forget it. Begin to realize who you are, begin to love yourself dearly, have mercy on yourself, lift yourself up and become free. Any questions about that? S.A. Robert, I know that it's a mistake to take these words literally as you said many times that you speak of the One, as the One Self as being pure intelligence, and then you speak of its great love and so it's so hard to realize that this thing is beyond these words which we can't help at our level in associating with a more tangible identity. Robert, yes. Those words, pure intelligence, what do we think about naturally? We think about the workings of the mind. Robert, human intelligence. S.A., yeah. Of course that's why I say, if I say anything at all, if I speak, listen with your heart, not with your head. Get your head out of the way. Do not try to analyze because you can only analyze with your own concepts. Rather let it happen, let it be, become open and then things begin to happen. S.A. One other thing that went through my mind, this is a different one entirely, which indicates that the Greek teachings are the same as yours. I've read that over the entrance to the Greek mysteries where the words are written, know thyself which is really your teaching. Robert, well this teaching is neither Greek, nor Hebrew, nor Christian, nor Hindu, it is just a universal message of the truth, that's as ancient as the hills, it's nothing new. 
only it works something happens to lift us up above the mundane and into freedom. And you will know when it happens because you will have a feeling of immortality, a feeling of spaciousness. Right now you feel bound to a body. When you become free your body will no longer hinder you even though you may appear to still have it. You will feel omnipresence. The whole universe will be you and you will be in bliss all the time, but you will still appear as an ordinary person to most people. SS Student asks whether she is fooling herself by becoming quiet and writing to herself. Robert, in a way you are because isn't that temporary? And then the condition comes back again in a different time? It's like using drugs to get high. They make you feel good for a while then, when you come down you feel worse anything that's temporary is an illusion. A better way is to ask yourself, to whom does this depression come? And wait and see. Is this don't write? If the writing has helped you feel better than you can use for a while, yes, why should you stop? But a better way is to ask yourself, who is depressed? The yourself can never be depressed, your ego is depressed, it's playing games with you. In reality, there is no ego, so there's nothing to be depressed, you're free. SS, it never really answers anything about the question that I ask laughs. It'll say I know no such thing as depression. Um. It's your mind playing with you, it's playing games with you, but if it makes you feel good for a while continue. SS, it has given me some insight. So continue for a while. It will not make you free, but at least it'll give you spurts of happiness. So if you have to continue then do it. But, the better way is to ask yourself, to whom comes this depression? And realize there is no place for it to come. There's no body home to be depressed. Your real self can never be depressed, it's free and happy. We have to do whatever we have to do in the beginning. For instance, sometimes you have a depression you can't get rid of it no matter what you do. So a good way to help you is to take a cold shower. If you take a nice cold shower, it will change the molecular structure of your body and you'll feel better or put ice on back of your neck. Assess, is that a mind game too? It's a mind game. It relieves it for a moment, for a while, but tomorrow you may be depressed again and until you get rid of the entire concept of depression. Assess, that way as it becomes less intense it's easier for the mind to become detached from it. Robert, yes. If you turn your mind away, you're constantly not doing anything about it. Robert, yes, turn your mind away completely. SS, sometimes. For a while I was doing gardening. Whatever you have to do and when you do feel better work on yourself and practice self-inquiry, that's the fastest way. SB, so the mind is creating its own depression? Robert, yes it is. And trying to get out of it. Robert, yes it is. Though if we just realize that we'll just stop creating the depression. Robert, yes. If we want to be happy, just be happy instead of creating depression. Robert, sure. SS, do not figure out why it's there. Robert, no. I wonder why though. What caused it? Robert, you'll be doing that forever. That's just like a person who has a tumor. Instead of finding the cause, he makes the doctor cut it out. Though it grows back on this side, then they cut it out of this side, then it grows back on his leg, it never stops. But, if you went for the cause, why did he have the tumor? He might find the cure, so it's the same thing. Do not look at the effect, but go to yourself because the self is always free. SS, you don't ask why we got sick. No, just ask to whom does it come? And you'll realize it comes to no one, no one is depressed. It's part of the dream. Sage, do you know how did I come to find that picture? Robert, tell us. 
It was about two weeks ago I went to sit in the morning to meditate. And I recall one of books of Ramana, I think it was done in India, and I saw there a beautiful picture of Ramana. And I was watching it and I lifted it up and there was a feeling, such a beautiful feeling interlocking the picture of Ramana and I said, I have to expand it, take it and make copies with a big computer graph. I couldn't find the time to do it but at midnight, I went to some place to get it done. I was busy one week, the second week I finally find the break for it, and that was when I brought it to you. Robert, um, I don't know why I did it or how I did it, I just had to do it. Robert, it's interesting. I wanted to offer you the picture, that was the basic feeling I. Robert, about three months ago, I saw the same picture somewhere, I can't remember where I saw it, somebody showed it to me and I said to myself, I haven't seen this picture before, I'd really like to get a picture like that, and you presented it, it's funny how things work. SS, it's not the picture that's in the books. No, he was about 48 years old in this picture. Tape ends abruptly. Transcript 2 there is no birth. 12th August, 1990. Robert, think and ask yourself, why did I come here today? We come to a hot room for what? We could have gone swimming, bowling, we could be home watching TV, but something motivated us to come here, what? Ask yourself. There is a mysterious power that motivates people to do what they do. Some people are motivated to go to a house of ill repute. Some people are motivated to go to the movies. Some people are motivated to go to spiritual meetings. What causes this? Who makes this happen? We can say God does it, but of course God is within yourself and some of the things you do, you would never allow God to make you do that, if God is yourself. So we would have to say it's your karma. It's your karma that motivates you to come here or to go anywhere else. When you come to a meeting like this you can rest assured that you have been working on yourself in past lives. You've been practicing for many lifetimes. Remember this is not a church and this is not a teaching, this is a confession of reality. Whenever I use the pronoun I, I am not referring to myself, I am referring to I am. So when I refer to my confession, I am referring to our confession, omnipresence. Remember whenever I use the word I, it means omnipresence. So, I am here to confess, of absolute reality, of being unborn, of ultimate oneness, of pure intelligence, of emptiness, of nirvana. I confess all these things for you. Let's ponder these things as we meditate together. Plays music then Robert continues. If you truly want to repent, just sit in silent meditation and see the perfect reality within, for all manners of error merely arise in erroneous thought, and like the morning dew before the rising sun, can perfectly be eliminated through the benevolent light and wisdom. Um shanty shanty peace. When we meditate like this, it's for the purpose of emptying the mind. The mind is like a garbage can. It's full of preconceived ideas, thoughts, concepts, not only from this life but from previous lives. There's a lot of stuff in that mind. In truth there is no mind but as long as you're expressing concepts, ideas, opinions, then we will talk of a mind. As you sit in silent meditation and you watch your thoughts, observe how they come and they go. Observe the kind of thoughts that come to you. We do not try to change them. We do not repeat affirmations. You merely watch the thoughts, and they leave of their own accord. This is how you deal with your mind. You observe your thoughts, you become the witness to your thoughts or you ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? One or the other. If you do this often enough, the day is going to come when you become totally free and you realize and understand what I mean when I say, you are unborn, you are nirvana, emptiness. What do I mean when I say you are unborn? Now the opinions that I express to you does not have to be accepted. 
remember I am speaking to myself. I am is speaking and I am is the infinite, the absolute reality. And I tell you in truth I am unborn, everything is unborn. Take a tree for instance, what gave birth to a tree? A seed, where does the seed come from? Another tree? Where does the tree come from? Another seed and you go back like that and there is no answer, no validity. Take for instance creatures, worms, cockroaches, bugs, who gave them birth originally? Where did they come from? Flowers, the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, human beings, ideas, intuition, discrimination. I tell you none of these things exist. Nothing has ever been born. It is a false premise you believe in. Changing bad to good, wanting positive experiences, it's all nonsense. The reason you don't want a positive experience is because you've never had a negative experience. There is no birth. What gave anything birth? Where did it come from? Do you know what anything is? You have no idea what anything at all is. You just give it a name. For instance, a cat. What is a cat? You have no idea. It was here when you came into existence, and we called it a cat. Why don't we call it a tree? We call it a cat. We give everything a name. That's the first mistake because no thing is what it appears to be. Therefore, the first rule of the true spiritual path is called divine ignorance. Divine ignorance. You have no idea what anything is, you just assume to know. You want to act intelligent, to imagine you know something. So you study harder, to learn relative existence. But what you don't realize, is that you're studying yourself right into the grave. You'll learn and you'll study and you'll become something as it appears, and you'll get older and older and older and before you die, you'll wonder what anything is all about. You have no idea what anything is, but I tell you again everything is unborn. Nothing actually exists, and the only explanation is, it's like a dream. When you have a dream, do you give birth to everything? The dream just begins with everything as it appears. You do not go to a beginning or to an end. The dream just starts from nothing, and it goes on until you awaken. The waking state is called the mortal dream. We're dreaming the mortal dream. All of the things that you are interested in, all of your fears, all of your frustrations, goods and bads, all of your happy and sads, it's all a dream. And the more you get attached to it, the more human you become. It's like getting attached to a dream and never waking up, and you keep living the dream. Consequently, you create your own reincarnation because you are attached to person, place and thing. And this pulls you back into a body over and over and over again until you learn to let go, until you start practicing emptiness. Remember there is no being and there is no non-being. There is no birth and there is no death. Just knowing this brings you a semblance of peace. Just thinking of these things makes you happy. But, it is beyond human happiness. It is beyond human peace. It is beyond laughter. Laughter is when the body is happy over something. When you realize there is no body, where is the laughter? Where is the crying? Where is being impersonal come in? None of those things exist. Therefore you ask the question, well do I exist? You have to ask yourself, what do I mean by I? Do I exist as a human being? As a reacting mechanism? As a person who gets turned on and turned off? That is a false concept. It is called false imagination. You imagine a world populated by insects, trees, the moon, the sun, human beings and everything else that appears to exist and you have discrimination. You like this, you hate this, you enjoy this, you despise that, but I say to you, you must go beyond these concepts if you wish to be free. 
Just imagine how peaceful you feel when your mind stops thinking, stops trying to change conditions, stops trying to get even, to fight for your rights. What rights? You have no rights. As a human being you have rights, and you always will have to fight for them, for it will appear that someone is trying to take them away, but in reality there are no rights. There's nothing to stick up for. You may ask well what do I become nothing? No emptiness is not no thing. It is called emptiness because it means nothing exists as it appears. But, there is something, a mysterious power that is an embodiment of love, compassion, peace, happiness, joy, bliss. Yet those words are meaningless. They do not give it justice for it is much more behind that. You have to experience it to understand it. You have to experience to go beyond cause. Metaphysics teaches you there's a cause for everything but that's kindergarten. Cause does not exist. There never was a cause, for there would have to have been someone to make the cause, to produce the cause, and of course most people call that God. So we get into duality, into separation. We say that God made the cause and we're experiencing the effect. Though, I ask you, where does this God come from that made the cause? And who made the God? It's all concepts, it's all relative thinking. Do not try to understand this with your finite mind, you cannot. The infinite can never comprehend the finite or the finite can never comprehend the infinite. They are two different things. Suffice it to say that you as you exist now are complete emptiness. You are pure intelligence, pure awareness, absolute reality, nirvana. Just the way you are right now. Do not think about it, if you think about it you spoil it. Do not just try to understand this with your finite mind, you cannot. The infinite can never comprehend the finite, or the finite that can never comprehend the infinite, they are two different things. Suffice it to say, that you as you exist now are complete emptiness. You are pure intelligence, pure awareness, absolute reality, nirvana, just the way you are right now. Do not think about it. If you think about it, you spoil it just the way you are this moment. You are pure intelligence, absolute reality. You are the unborn, but every time a thought comes into your mind you spoil it. When you first wake up, those few seconds between getting up, waking up. Just before you wake up, that's when you are in your true state. You just opened your eyes and you haven't thought of a single thought yet that lasts a few seconds. Think about that time, don't you really feel good in those few seconds? Before you start thinking about the day's activities, that's reality. Try to catch yourself tomorrow morning as soon as you open your eyes. Before a thought comes. That is your true state, and that is what you are. Forget about your problems. There is a power that knows how to take care of everything for you if you allow it to. You have to allow it to. You have to surrender your ego, your pride, your concepts, your opinions, your questions, your answers, everything has to be surrendered and the power works on its own volition. A great master said, take no thought of what you should eat, of what you should wear, of where you should go, but seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you, it's the same thing. But how often do you take thought? Most people take thought every moment, you're always thinking, worrying, trying to correct something, trying to figure it out. And that's what keeps you from the kingdom of heaven. So what do you do? Nothing. You do not try to fix anything. You do not even try to change. You simply become yourself just the way you really are. You leave the world alone. You leave things alone, you leave people alone. Though you say, how can I exist? I have to go to work. I have to mix with people. I have to make decisions. Have no fear. You will do all those things, but it'll be different. You will understand totally that you are not the doer. Your body came to this earth to do something and it will do its job. You have absolutely nothing to do with it. 
Stop fighting, stop trying to make things happen, keep your mind on yourself. What do I mean when I say keep your mind on yourself? Your real self is your heart, not your human heart, but your spiritual heart. Your heart is God. Keep your mind stayed on God in your heart. If you want to use your imagination to begin with, you can image a sphere of white light in your heart on the right side of your chest, your spiritual heart. And allow all your thoughts to merge into your heart. In other words, do not allow your thoughts to go outward. When your thoughts go outward conditions take place. When you keep your thoughts in your heart centered, all of a sudden you find peace, pure happiness it comes by itself. We have to allow the power that we don't understand to take care of us. This mysterious power knows what your needs are. I recall when I first saw a picture of Ramana Maharshi in my teens and I had to go to India to see him. I had no idea why. I didn't have the funds. A couple of months later my aunt died and left me $14,000. And I left my family and went to India. I don't know why. And it has been like this all of my life. Though I've learned to surrender my wants, my desires, my ego, to the power that knows the way. And this power will always carry you on a stream of blessedness to your highest good, if you allow it. But, you have to become humble and you have to let go of fear. You do this by this the methods we teach, through self-inquiry and becoming a witness. This is called satsing it means that I shouldn't even be talking as much as I do and just answering questions and talking back and forth. So let's do that now. Express your ideas, ask questions, do something, share with us some of your experiences. SD, I have a question Robert, I understand the concept of surrender, but at the highest level you say to allow it but how could you possibly disallow omnipresence? Robert, it appears as if you are that's all a part of the appearance. SD, that's on the mortal plane. Yes. SD, but I mean if everything is unfolding as it should and predestined, on the highest level how do you disallow it? You do not try to disallow it, but you hear these words and you no longer react to it. By not reacting you disallow it. For if you didn't hear the words you would still be fighting. But, now you watch and you see it unfolding before your eyes. Yet you do not react to it for you realize who you are. You're like the mirror like that mirror over there and a reflection is taking place. But, you are not the reflection, you remain as the mirror, so you do not fight, you do not argue, you do not fear, and you're not overly happy. SD, not overly happy? Yes physically. SD, I do not know of anyone who is overly happy. Laughter. If you, if someone won forty million dollars in the Lido last night? If you won forty million dollars would you be overly happy? SD, for a while. Laughter. That's what I mean, for you become overly happy for a while. But, if you understand what I'm talking about, all that stuff stops. General talk between students. Robert, what's the other question, Dana? SD, oh my other question is that on a certain level I accept that we know nothing and yet, I think Arnold brought up the other day, that the evolutionary process which has a certain logic to it, would that be, I guess that would be just part of the dream right, in other words, that would be an explanation within the dream? Robert, all explanations are the dream. That's true because how can they be that doesn't exist? Robert, there is no cause, there is no birth of anything. So there are no explanations, you're wasting time trying to explain. SD, that's true because you're explaining with the mind. People write voluminous texts about nonsense, about existence. And we read and we get involved and we try to be intelligent about it and we suffer. All suffering stops when you stop searching and you stop fighting. 
SB, so Robert you're saying, since we really don't know what anything is, and since we don't know who we are therefore we would be released into a disposition, if we don't really know what anything is, and if we realize, that the self that we think we are, is all perceptual or it's an illusion, that would automatically release us into a no-self condition. Robert, into emptiness. Like a releasement into emptiness. Robert, but remember the emptiness is not real emptiness, it's bliss. SB, it's like a no-center, it's not like a regular spiritual path, they are always trying to get you to go back to a center and that keeps you in the ego self you know. But, this is like a releasement. Total release, total emptiness, there's no center. SB, so no center that's tremendous. Or if there was a center where did it come from? There is no center. SB, yeah and as long that there's thinking there's a center. We separate ourselves right there? Exactly. SB, when you're released there's no center. So there is no thought to have no center. SB, then there is no differentiation between things. No discrimination whatsoever. SD, a release is scary to the ego. SB, oh it's death, it's death. Nobody wants it. How many people are here, do you see the whole Los Angeles wanting this, nobody wants this. Robert, this is why I always say in the beginning, I'm just relating my confession, what I feel, the experiences that I've been through, and I ask no one to accept it, but I ask you to work on yourself and see what happens. S.A., I have a question about self-inquiry and self-observation. About a week or so ago, there were just three of us here, Sam, myself, and Dana. You asked us to speak about what has been happening in our lives, and we all kind of spoke, and we all gave a little brief, a very positive synopsis of the previous weeks. Very chipper, very up each one of us. And I've been thinking about that and I've been thinking about the importance of being positive that you speak of and out projecting the positive. And so I want to use one little example which will help you get to my eventual point which gets us into the literature. There are two kinds of books I'd say, one is a very famous bestseller type where people go through certain experiences and all ends well, and there's true love, and all that kind of thing and people are drawn to that and then there's I'd say, War and Peace. I don't know how many people have read War and Peace, where you really get involved in life in a way that most literature does not allow us to get involved with or most experiences. There is the black and white in War and Peace. There is the yin and yang. Tolstoy created a vast world of both pain and pleasure etc etc. Unlike these other books. So my point is to get back to where I was before. When you read War and Peace the final experience is one of being moved to a higher reality, of being moved by something beyond oneself. It leads you to something else, whereas this other literature, although in a temporary sense appears to be positive does not. Okay now to get back to my original point, my original example. We all spoke very positively about our little weeks. We're all good little soldiers, good little boy scouts and girl scouts. Was this a valid experience of self-observation, or was this positiveness that everybody is mad for in Los Angeles, or was it a distortion? Or would it have been better for us in the long run to have said something like for example you know today, the morning was hell, this that and the other thing was hell, this afternoon I'm feeling better I can see certain things. In other words to give an experience in the yin and yang, the black and white which appears to lead to these higher realms. Robert, you're right. Always be truthful to yourself. Don't put it on, don't imagine things are going well when they're not. Be free and be yourself. When you're free you can express yourself positively and negatively, and you have no fear of either one, because they're both the same as far as a human path is concerned. But, 
When you're not free you try to hide the negative and accentuate the positive and as you see you're making a mistake because you are just fooling yourself and in your subconscious you're hiding all the negativity. Say, that's what I feel here very much and this is particular to Southern California which is where because of the constant sunlight and all that sort of thing and people want to have pleasure and they want to be positive, it's a misinterpretation of what being positive is, it seems to me. SD, it's like happy faces. It's like it's all happy faces all the time. And the ultimate result is that if anybody is honest, we've talked about this, is that people are not happy really underneath, it's a surface phenomena, it's an illusion again. Robert, but these people are going through whatever they have to go through, this is why when the question is asked, what can I do to change the world and make everybody know the truth? The answer is become self-realized, because when you're self-realized that's not a selfish answer. Self-realization means omnipresence, and when you're self-realized you see the world for what it really is. But, when you see it through human eyes, you see suffering, you see good and you see bad and you think it's true. So your omnipresence of self-realization helps others, just by being your real self. In the beginning it appears selfish because you're saying I am and self-realized, what about the other people that are suffering? What about the homeless? First become self-realized and then see what you think of the homeless, you'll have a completely new idea. SD, that's what Maharshi always says too isn't it? Just do self-inquiry and the world will appear differently. Robert, and that appears strange and it even appears sometimes like a cop-out. Because you say work on yourself and you'll help others, how can you do that? But it's true, because as you know God is in everyone and in everything and when you become self-realized, you become God. So you become the self of all. The real self of all is perfection. So when you become the real self of all you see perfection in everything. And the seeing of perfection, not with your eyes but with your spiritual self, that perfection causes the perfection to be in others. S.A. Well it's a different kind of positiveness than just saying yeah, it's just marvelous. Robert, oh yes of course. It's a lovely day and I'm going to be marvelous? Robert, of course, totally different. Say, would you analyze this thing that happened to me yesterday? What was really going on with this? I went to a party, a family party, and I had an experience with someone else in the family several weeks ago. You know, I used to write books and do quite a bit of writing, and it happened that I was with these people, and this cousin of mine read one of my books, and he finished it, and he threw it on the floor, and this. Robert, he really liked it, huh? Laughs was quite an experience. This is a very unusual thing for somebody to do. SN, I'd take that as a compliment. Laughter. SA, so I was with these other family members yesterday, and I wanted to tell the story. I took great joy in telling the story for one thing because it was an interesting story to tell and for another thing my cousins, I could arouse their intense interest which I enjoy doing. What was I doing? Was this kind of a negative experience for me, I wanted to communicate very much and also I wanted to, in this communication, I was relieving myself from the tension of this experience because it did happen, I didn't comment on it, to this man who did it. I didn't say anything, because that's a very difficult situation with that married couple, they wouldn't be able to understand anything that I might say. So I repressed everything then. Do you have any comments on that? Robert, yes, what was the name of the book? Laughter. Ask yourself, to whom did this happen and who wants to comment? It's your ego playing all these games. If you were coming from your real self, it doesn't matter, you would have no feeling for or against. S.A., but since I still am involved in the ego wouldn't it be better for me just to, now I'm trying to justify my actions of course, wouldn't it be better for me too? 
Break in tape then tape starts abruptly as another student asks a question. SB, we have moments of being able to do the self abiding and it happens and then just a moment later the habits of attention, the consciousness is addicted to the habit patterns and all of a sudden the self abiding just seems to disappear and we're back in the ego, again in the motions of attention. And we can never transcend that ego attention. Robert, don't say never. Not never, but it seems to last for only a very short time and then by habit we're back. Then there is attention moving in, there is desire and the me and the memory. You know the whole thing again you know? Robert, of course in the beginning this is quite true, but say you're trying to become a surgeon. You have to keep practicing, you make mistakes, that's why you practice on the stiffs and dead bodies. SB, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do right now. What are you doing? SB, by myself practicing on the stiffs. Laughter. Yes, you keep practicing, you practice again and again, and you have more stiffs to practice on, until the day comes when you give a perfect operation, then you become a surgeon, same principle. You keep catching yourself. SB, yet trying to recognize through recognition. You keep remembering to catch yourself and it happens more often, more often. SB, and that is what the inquiry is helpful for. Yes. It keeps reminding me that I'm back in me again. Time lapse becomes closer and closer to reality and starts coming closer to it. SB. It's really interesting because when you're doing even a little bit of self-abiding to some extent, no matter all the things that get you angry when you're in the ego, they don't bother you, you know people driving they cut in front of you, usually you get all tight and contracted and angry, but when you're self-abiding you are just resting, they can do anything, you don't react, you're released, you're not tense, the day goes smooth. Robert if you're really doing it, it brings you perfect peace. SB, perfect bliss, yeah. It really does. Though we keep remembering, remembering, we'll forget. Then we'll remember again, sometimes we'll get disgusted with the whole thing and we'll stop for a couple of months, who knows? And we'll go back to it. If we keep abiding, we'll get there and become free. But, then again if you don't that's okay because you'll come back again and you'll be ahead of the game. SB, but the way you're speaking now it seems like we're going to get there. It seems like we're not there, isn't it true that we're there? Of course. SB, only that we're just distracting ourselves. Of course, you're distracting yourself. You can awaken any time. SB, yay, but it's not a goal to be attained, it's just to recognize. To waken just like from a dream. You keep dreaming the same dream until you wake up. SB, so we're going to wake up to what is already the reality, truth right there, aren't we? Of course. And the only difference about this and the dream is that this appears longer, that's all. SD, and another difference it seems to me that, with rare exception and I guess you'd call it lucid dreaming but we usually aren't trying to wake up from the dream at night, when we have night dreams. Robert, but some people are. Yeah, in lucid dreaming you do. Robert, it depends on the dream. Because you know that you are dreaming but most dreams you aren't attempting to awaken within the dream, and in this dream we are. Consciously we're attempting to awaken to this different dream. Robert, I had an interesting dream the other night. I dreamt that I was conducting a class and Queen Elizabeth came in and she sat down and took off her crown and put her hands on her lap. Then I woke up. SD, that's interesting. Whatever that means. SD, did she have a crown on? I was going to ask whether she had one of her silly hats on but she had a crown. She had a crown on and she took it off and put it on her lap. S.A. I know that we can't take this word literally, but it kind of leads to certain conflict. You speak of the great reality, at times pure intelligence, 
I think I've made this point before more than once, but you use the term pure intelligence. It's so hard for me to accept that term and not believe that intelligence leads to something else. Intelligence for us in our current state implies so many other things, so that this intelligence when you use the word, and I know you mean something more than intelligence. Robert, I mean non-discrimination, non-attachment. When there is non-discrimination and non-attachment, there is pure intelligence because you see things as they are. S.A., but isn't there a suggestion that something develops out of this type of intelligence, that it is a pregnant situation? If you accept it that way, but that's not the meaning. The meaning is just pure intelligence, period. No concepts, no definitions, non-discriminatory, nothing you hold on to, it's pure existence, pure knowledge, same thing, pure bliss, those words are all synonymous. S.A., that reminds me of, I told you I've been reading Plotinus again, Plotinus says, nothing can be said about the one. No attributes can be given to the one, beyond any such thing. That's true. That's why we call it ultimate oneness, there's no definition. S.N., you can't even call it one. Robert, it's not one at all. One is also a concept. S.B., that's why they call it non-dual, instead of one they call it non-dual, for not two. Robert, or emptiness. Robert, I had an idea about it with that I think might be interesting. I think what it is, is really realization of consciousness. I've been living as realization of mind. You know me wanting to know wanting to get realized, you know wanting to be released. I've been really living as realization of me, realization of mine, with memory, conditioning. I think this whole thing is coming to rest as realization of consciousness, just consciousness, not consciousness of anything but just consciousness. And when that position is held on to, rested in, established in that position, something magical happens. Robert. Yes, you are speaking of no realization. Realization of consciousness is really, no realization because there's no one to realize. SB, yeah, no self. SD, isn't it called pure awareness? Robert, same thing, absolute reality. SA, the Zen Buddhists speak of no mind, that's a common term. Robert, no mind. SB, no self. Robert, or Nirvana the same thing. SD, so maybe Arnold when you think of pure intelligence, you might think of pure awareness or pure consciousness. Robert, why think? Laughter. If only we could stop. Robert, who said that? Like it says my ego. Oh I have a kind of dilemma that has occurred to me in meditation once in a while and that is, say it goes on for a long time when we're listening to music and everybody, the natives grow sort of restless, and I'm thinking to myself you know well who is restless? And I think as you have taught us, I am then I think, who is I? But that's contradictory because the real I could not possibly be restless. Robert, of course not. But when you realize who your ego, I, is and you follow it to its culmination, you follow it to emptiness, to nothing. SD, so it's the ego I that we're asking about when we say, who is I? It's the ego I. SD, and it will just annihilate itself by. It annihilates itself when you take it to its source which is nowhere. SD because I thought for a long time that it was the I who was awareness. That exists by itself, but when you don't know it then you're talking about the ego I. SD, so in self-inquiry when you say, who am I, you are talking about the ego I. The ego I, yes. SA, the little I you might say. Robert, Yes, and when I play music in between, it's not to make you feel nice listening to music. 
It's because it gives you the space to watch your thoughts when the music is playing and see how you respond, see what you do. Always watch, always be aware, always watch yourself, watch how you react, watch how you think, watch the kind of thoughts that come to you while the music is playing, while you're meditating. Be aware of all these things, and the more aware you become the more you disappear. All these concepts start to disappear, just by you being aware of them. It's like playing hide and seek. You're trying to find the person who is hiding. Though you're trying to find the thoughts that are lurking deep deep in the subconscious, and they come up themselves and you say I see you. I know that you're there. You cannot fool me any longer. The fear is there, I see where you are and you ask yourself who fears. Where did you come from fear? Who is your mother? Who is your father? Who gave you birth? You have no birth? You don't exist? You keep talking to yourself like this, so that part of you no more exists and it dissipates of its own accord. That's how you work on yourself. Let's play some more music. Music played. When he says I need no one or I need nothing and I am free, he doesn't mean that literally. He means he's not attached to people, places and things. There's quite a difference. You ask perhaps how can I have a relationship without being attached. You can have the most beautiful relationship that you can ever imagine. It doesn't mean you become a loner on this path. It means you have friends, you have loved ones, but you give them all the freedom in the world and you're not attached to their emotions or with anything else. That means total uncommitted love. It's a little different than what most people do. Being non-attached means being compassionate, being loving, being kind. Now you know what mercy means. Helping your friend before you even help yourself. If you're attached, you think of yourself first, but if you're not attached, you think of the other person first, there is a lot to that. Any comments? S.B. Robert being released from the self, I think instead of calling it self-realization it should be called, realization of there's no self. Laughter. That would be closer to. Robert, it would be complicated for some people. S.B. Because self-realization people think, only as the self is going to realize something, but that's absolutely the opposite. That's what brings them in. That's how you begin. SB, it brings them in, in the beginning thinking the ego is going to get something. It's just the opposite of that, it's just losing everything. Of course. SD, but it's also realizing that the self is all there is. SB, yeah. But, you know my mind it's such a strange condition. Like the mind is just not used to walking around being released from themselves. Like we walk around like we always hugging ourselves, like Mimi and I'm trying to grab everything you know. And understanding this it would be a release from everything, walking around it's like being a zombie. It's different to what we're used to. As a person educated, as a child you know we're used to me in the world you know. It's a very strange condition and the mind doesn't like it. You know it's hard to have to constantly reinforce, to be able to. Robert, first experience the condition and then see how strange it is. SB, it's like a zombie condition. It's your natural condition. SB, yeah it's natural but we're so unnatural. Yes. SB, the self is so unnatural and that's all we know. Though you glimpse it for a second and then you run back and grab hold of yourself again you know. That's how it happens. That's why you keep working on yourself, working on yourself. You keep remembering what to do until it becomes second nature. SB, it's almost like floating around you know it's so light, there is no tension. You become light that's true. SB, it's so light it's pleasant. Yes. SN, how do you know if you're so not in bliss? Laughs. SB, so in other words you have to go to total zero from the point of the mind. 
though it's like dying going to total zero. Robert, well it isn't that bad really. What you are doing is that you are just changing your allegiance. Before you used to have faith in the world and people, places and things. Now you have faith in omnipresence, in the infinite. In something that you can't feel, taste, touch, smell or see. And the more faith you have in that which is yourself, the more faith that you have in the world, the real world as yourself. SB, so really it starts with an act of faith in that. Faith in the invisible. SB, in the invisible so that you go on with it. You drop your self-importance. And you stop having conflicts with people, places and things. And you just start loving and you become compassionate. And you realize everybody is your brothers and sisters and everything happens by itself. SD, isn't he right in saying in a way that it feels like dying, because I think it was St. Paul, or one of those who said, I die daily. Robert, yes St. Paul said that, you die daily to the world. But, it's not a negative experience, it's a good experience. Every time you let go of something you feel better. SB, self-transcendence. As an example, say you have a job and you're worried about being laid off, inflation, pay increases, strikes, but as you begin to understand this teaching you let go of all those thoughts, you realize that you will always be at your right place and no one can take your right place away from you. So wherever your right place is that's where you are going to be. You subsequently stop worrying about your job, about layoffs, about strikes, about pay increases and you just do your work without fear and you become a better worker as a result. Though you get promoted, you get a raise and everything happens by itself but all fear goes away. SB, it's really amazing not to be attached to body-mind and to people, places and things. Robert, and life goes on. But, it goes on the way it's supposed to go on naturally, infinitely and it's all good. SB, I think it would make you healthy because you're not all nervous about things. It improves you in every way. All parts of you will improve. It's amazing how it works. You stop seeing evil. First you stop seeing evil in yourself. You sort of forgive yourself for all of your mistakes. It's like being born again and then you can forgive everybody else totally, completely. You become free, unlearn everything and you feel your omnipresence. You realize you are not yourself as a person, you are the self as the universe, it's a grand feeling. SB, tell us about the bliss aspect of it. Bliss, love, joy, happiness, those words are all synonymous. But, take the happiest experience you can think of as a human being, what's a real happy experience that you've had in your life? Experience that really turns you on. Now compared to bliss, it's not even an atom of bliss. That's how more powerful bliss is, it has nothing to do with human happiness. It's a billion times more powerful, it's unexplainable, it's ineffable, nothing you can even think about. You can just be in it and partake of it, but nothing to explain. SB, how is it possible to stay conscious if it's that good? Robert, who's conscious? If something is really painful you lose consciousness. Though I would think if something is unbearably ecstatic one would also lose consciousness. Robert, you're speaking in human terms that's why they call it transcendental. You transcend human terms and you're in a completely different space so there's no one to lose consciousness. You can only lose consciousness as a human being but if you transcend your humanhood there's no one left to lose consciousness. There has to be a body to lose consciousness but when you see I am not the body, there is no one left to lose consciousness, do you follow? To have any experience, there has to be someone left to have the experience. If you get rid of the someone then, you become natural and you do not lose consciousness when we're natural. SB, so there's no experience anymore. There's no experience at all. SB, 
the one who experiences has been transcended is gone. Is dead. SB, so realization is a non-experience, it's like a primal. It's not even that, it's beyond that, it's totally transcendental. SD, you can't experience bliss, is that true? Robert, that's right. SB, you really do feel bliss, I mean, you feel bliss, but it's different, it's not the mind experiencing bliss. Robert, it's like the sun trying to experience heat. SB laughs. That's good. You can't. SB, there is bliss but there's no one experiencing, there is just bliss. It's a natural state. SB, yeah. SA, speaking of the sun, I don't know if it's out of speculation but, there's a teaching that the world, the earth, is an intelligence. The earth is going through its evolution and it's struggling for its own revelations, its own enlightenment as we are part of this way of life. And the same is true for the sun. Robert, um, do you have a teaching on that? Robert, that's the mental plane. In the mental plane everything is alive. There is no such thing as dead matter. Everything lives and wants to express itself, the moon, the sun, the earth, the flowers, everything. But when you go beyond that it doesn't exist. It only exists on the mental plane but in truth there is no mental plane. Though none of that exists it's like a dream. Always go back to the dream. SA, so the whole universe, the solar system and the universe are projections in a sense also. Projection of the mind. ST, all part of the Maya. Robert, all Maya. SB, and all the inner planes too. Robert, all the inner planes, projections of the mind. Astral, causal, physical, all of that? Robert, for whom are these things? Where did they come from? For whom are they? They're all projections of the mind. When the mind goes, everything else goes. Though that's why when you follow the eye, the eye is the mind and the ego. When you go to the source, everything is attached to mind, all the things that we've been discussing, they are all part of the I thought. I see the sun, I perceive the moon. As you said, I perceive the earth as being alive. I do these things. But, when the I is transcended, who's left? Just itself and all of those things are gone. So there's peace, there is nobody left to worry about those things that they concern themselves with. S.A., when you say you go beyond it reminds me of a line in a book I'm very fond of. It's called The Secret Teachings of the Tibetan Masters and one of the phrases that is used by the Tibetans is going beyond the beyond. Robert laughs. Is that by Paul Brunton? S.A., no, Alexander David Neal, French woman from Tibet. I don't know her. S.B., was Paul Brunton a realized being? Robert, yes. I thought he was because he had a whole series of books. S.A., oh it's a very thick book, it's very succinct, which is wonderful. He speaks on the misconceptions of the self of being having any identity at all, she pushes more of a scientific standpoint that everything is constantly in flux, although we don't see the changes from moment to moment, the things that you've said of course. We want to hold on to this idea of an identity which simply has no reality, personal identity. Robert, on the mental plane everything is in a state of flux, nothing is solid, everything moves. For it doesn't exist, because it's non-duality, non-duality exists. Duality is when everything is in a state of flux, then there are atoms, there's energy, there are molecules, and there are things and they're in complete motion. But, if you go beyond the molecules and the atoms and the energy then you'll have nothing, emptiness, and that's reality. It's like the story I tell of the monk, who is asking the master, what is reality, what is reality, and the master said go pick a fig. And he picked a fig off a tree and the master said, open the fig and the monk did. 
And the master said, Cut open the seed, and he cut open the seed, and he said, What do you see? And the monk said emptiness, and the master said, That's true, everything comes from emptiness, because in the fig seed there is a hollow, there is nothing. Though out of the nothingness came the fig tree, and so has everything else. Pause, remember I love you all, and I always think about you, but remember to love yourselves, to pray to yourself, to bow to yourself, to worship yourself, because God dwells in you as you peace. See you again next time, God bless. Tape ends as students organize to go to restaurant. Transcript 3 My Confession 16th August, 1990 Robert, what I teach is utter nonsense gobbledygook. It has no meaning except to myself. I have no teaching. It is simply my confession. It's useless for most people because I'm not giving you direction. I'm not telling you to meditate for 12 hours a day or to stand on your head or to utter mantras. There is no instruction. There is just my personal confession, the way that I feel. Now, it does some people good for it is an invisible instruction. By just being here, by just opening your heart, something happens. So don't listen with your head. Do not try to analyze or judge or come to any conclusions. As I always say, do not even believe a word I say. Why should you? Who am I? I am nobody, nobody important. Listen to your own heart. I'm sort of a mirror. What you see in me is yourself. Subsequently, the way you feel about yourself is the way you feel about me, because you're looking into the mirror. I can truthfully say that I am ultimate oneness, absolute reality, emptiness, unborn nirvana. I am that I am. When many people read spiritual books on Advaita Vedanta or on Janamarga, they immediately try to act out the part, and they memorize many of these quotations, sayings, they become useless. You have to go through spiritual disciplines to get to the place where you wake up. In my own experience, I had probably did these disciplines in a previous existence, for when I was very young I had felt these things. I had no idea what it was until I read the books, so reading of books confirmed my experience. And then I went to see Ramana Maharshi, for I had already felt this. There is a difference. I've got to be very careful what I say, because this path sometimes gives people license to become arrogant, obnoxious, rude. It's just the opposite. If you really have jhana knowledge, you show loving kindness, mercy, compassion, joy, and you express yourself as that. Many of us believe in a cause. In metaphysics we learn that there is a cause for everything. And even on the path of John Amargo, we say there is a substratum. But, that's just to explain that there is an underlying power. But, in truth I tell you, there is no substratum, there is no cause. There isn't any cause for anything. Since there is no cause, there is no effect. What I am saying is simply this. You are always looking for a reason, for why you are like you are, why you have these habits, why you look and appear to be this way, why you're kind or why you're mean. You're always looking for a reason, a solution, a cause, but there is no reason, there is no cause, there's no effect, there's emptiness. Emptiness is the self and I am that. Now when I speak of I am, I am not referring to Robert. I am referring to omnipresence. I am is that. Therefore when I utter I am, I'm speaking for all of us. For there is only one ultimate oneness and we are all ultimate oneness, there is no distinction. People ask me strange questions. Strange to me but not to them I guess. For instance, someone asked me this week, how come all the great sages died of disease, not all of them, but some of them, like Ramana died of cancer, Nisargadatta died of cancer, Jesus was hung on the cross. And the question was, if these people are so great, why did they suffer so? And I can only laugh when I hear a question like this. The answer is who sees the suffering? For whom is their suffering? 
This is why in my predicament people say I've got Parkinson's disease. And they try to help me with remedies, and I have to bite my lip to keep from laughing because I see perfection. Perfection is all there is, oneness, ultimate reality. There is nothing else. But, you say, but I see these people suffering, do my eyes deceive me? And then I answer, the sky is blue when someone takes me outside and say, Robert, look at the beautiful blue sky, so I agree, but I know in reality there is no sky and there is no blue. It just doesn't exist. It's an optical illusion, a mirage in the desert. There appears to be an oasis with water, but when you get closer, there is only sand. It's the same thing. Your eyes deceive you, your senses deceive you, things are not like they appear. All is well and everything is unfolding as it should. There are no mistakes. No mistakes have been made, no mistakes are being made, and no mistakes will ever be made. Everything is perfect just the way it is. Consequently when you see a condition, before you judge you have to ask yourself, who sees that condition? For whom is that condition? For instance, let's take a simple example. If we all looked at this room and I asked you, what is your impression of this room? One person will say, oh I think it's lovely, another person will say, I hate it. Another person will say, it's too small, somebody else will say, it's too big, somebody else will say, it's very clean, someone else will say, it's very dirty, that's how it is, you're seeing yourself. You're seeing nothing but yourself. The world is a reflection of your mind. The universe is an emanation of yourself. If you didn't exist there would be no universe. The universe exists because you exist. You are the universe and that's true of every so-called fact in your life. It's a fact that someone is dying and if someone dies that's a fact but it's not the truth. The truth is we are all unborn. No, one was ever born. If no one was ever born how can you die? No one was born and no one dies. Again, I'm expressing my confession. That's how it appears to me. That's what I mean when I say, this teaching is useless to most people, because you can't do anything with it, yet things happen, lives improve, spirituality grows, happiness ensues, bliss comes. It all happens spontaneously, just by being present, and this is what satsang is all about. By being present, without taking thought, without manipulation, without playing mind games, without trying to improve yourself, without thinking of yourself, without thinking of others, everything good happens, all by itself. Why? Because emptiness is goodness, nirvana is absolute reality. The unborn is the self and you are that, what else can I say? So what do you think about this? I'm open to questions. SG, I have a question. The hill that Ramana Maharshi spent his life, Arunachala, what function did that play in his enlightenment? And what function does the natural areas, the harmonies that are out there and balanced ecosystems of the world important for us to keep in touch with? Robert, it's important for some people. Arunachala for some reason had a tremendous impact on Ramana's life. Arunachala is another name for Shiva and Ramana's family, his ancestors, were all worshippers of Shiva. To the hill called Ramana, at an early age. The mysterious power led him to the hill, that was his experience. There have been others who have walked around the hill and felt absolute nothing, and it was meaningless for them. The same is true of the other places you are speaking of. For most people they mean nothing. Now what happens to most people, especially in the West, they imagine they're feeling something, it's a mind game. It's just like the healing shrines. You work yourself up into a frenzy and you can't wait to get to this healing shrine. So naturally when you go there, you experience a healing. It's not the shrine that did it, it's yourself because you worked yourself up into a frenzy, 
it is your mind that caused it. And I'll relate a true story that happened in this way. In Italy in a little town, there was a healing shrine. People used to come from all over the world, and they would climb the steps and get on their knees and hundreds of thousands of people were actually healed from all kinds of diseases. Now the fathers of the town found out from some scientists that there was going to be an earthquake in that town. This article was in Time magazine in about 1967. So what the fathers decided to do is to remove the remains of the saint who was buried underneath the shrine to another point of town where there was no earthquake. They began to dig and lo and behold no saint was ever buried there. There was nothing. They built the shrine upon nothing. What did the healing? How come all these thousands of people were healed? It's all in the mind. When you psych yourself out mentally, you can accomplish almost anything. Though again to answer your question, most of these things are meaningless. Aaron Achala meant a great deal to myself. I've had experiences inside Aaron Achala. But for most people it's just a hill. Though again the answer is this, work on yourself, worship yourself, find yourself, find out who you are. And when you do this everything becomes holy, and like Moses said, the ground upon which I stand is holy ground. Everything becomes holy, not only certain places but everything. And that's only because you have become that yourself. Your omnipresence makes it holy. You have become one with all there is and you can truthfully say, all of this is the self and I am that. Does it make any sense? SG, yes. Good. SG, in what sense is the spirit of the whole earth our mother? A brother? SG, our mother is giving us birth to another state of being. The earth has no power without you, you are the power and the earth is within yourself. So when you become powerful the earth has power. When you are weak, the earth is weak. The earth like the universe is an emanation of yourself. The mother, the father, it's all within you. Everything is within yourself. There is no power outside of yourself. When you see some power happening from some place, it is because collectively people are giving it their power. But, the people are the power. They misunderstand. They think the thing has power by itself. Nothing exists except yourself. Nothing exists because everything changes, nothing is ever the same. What changes cannot be real? Take your body for instance, you didn't always look this way. When you were conceived you were no larger than the size of a pinhead that was you. And then you became a little baby, a teenager, an adult and now here you are. Though you were never the same as you were years ago. This is true of everything. This chair used to be a piece of wood, a tree. Now it has become a chair. Everything comes from the same source, nothing. Nothing exists, except the self. Everything is like a dream. When you have a dream, you dream you're flying an airplane, you're going to China, and to Japan, then you come back here and you go to sleep. And then you wake up, it was a dream. This life is also like a dream. One day, you will awaken and realize who you are, and you will realize there is no power outside of yourself and even there's no power within yourself. No power exists, only the self exists, nothing else is necessary. So we make up all these games, they're all mind games. They do not lead us to self-realization, they lead us to further delusion. That's why we're born again and again and again, until we wake up. And then reincarnation stops, and then we become totally liberated and free, which we already are. Assess. When you go out and deny that there's a blue sky. Do you see the blue skies? Or doesn't it make any difference? Robert, no I see the blue skies but I see myself as the blue sky. Assess and you enjoy it? Sure I enjoy myself. I always enjoy myself 24 hours a day. SD, 
I asked him the same thing once, what about chocolates and sunsets? And he said, you are the sunset which you enjoy. SS, but that's after the ego dissolves then you're able to annihilate the ego. Robert, let's imagine you believe you're enjoying the blue sky, then the next moment there's thunderstorms, lightning and you become frightened and you cry. What happened to your enjoyment? When you realize that you are the self, blue skies, thunderstorms, they're both the same. Nothing can hurt you. SS, so you can enjoy both of them? There's no one left to enjoy, you just are these things. You are bliss. You have become Sat Chitananda, being knowledge and bliss. That's your true nature. This is why I said in the beginning, these words are meaningless, unless you've experienced that otherwise they don't mean anything. SS, yeah you kinda lost me again. Laughs. Most people like to go to classes. Where the teachers chants mantras and gives you relative knowledge and tells you how to improve your finances and your health and your lifestyle. Those people draw thousands of followers, but of course these things don't exist. They exist for a while. You get a good feeling. You improve your life for a while, but you have to go on with your life and soon you die and then where are you? Nowhere. SS, that's why I go and when I do it gives me a good feeling there's always something missing. It's all good when you need it, nothing is wrong with anything. SS, I'm still going to get the good feelings and... Yes. SS, do the chanting and all that but I feel like there's something more, like I can't stop there. Then you'll go onward. SS, pardon? You'll go onward wherever you have to go. SS, look at discipline, sometimes I get the feeling that I'm just not very disciplined so I need to go to some place like that so I can get disciplined like I don't have enough of that or... As I said before, this path is sometimes a contradiction because it is true you need discipline, and then again you don't need discipline. There's a time when you do and a time when you don't, but if you follow the principles involved by asking yourself who is it that needs the discipline, you will realize that your true self never needed discipline but your ego does. And since you are not the ego, there is no one left for discipline at all evens itself out. SD. When you refer to discipline, what do you mean? What would be the definition of it? Robert, well I mean not being rude to other people, not being obnoxious, being kind and loving, putting other people first, having compassion, helping others. SD, so you're not talking about meditation or mantras? Well meditations and mantras are good, but they are only to make you one-pointed, to make the mind one-pointed so you can disintegrate the mind. SS, so it isn't important then even now to do meditation? Robert, it's important for some people. Again if you can make your mind quiet then it's unnecessary, but all the spiritual discipline you are referring to are only to quiet the mind. When the mind is quiet, everything happens by itself. When the mind is noisy the world becomes real and terrible for you. Therefore mantras quiet the mind. Meditation quiets the mind, everything leads to quietening the mind. SS, watching your breath, to quiet the mind. SS, so you don't need any fixed thing or fixed time or power of the mind to do all that. Yet there are some people who do need that kind of discipline, because that's the way they are in this life. SS, how would you know? It's all karmic. Your heart will tell you what feels good, what feels right. SS, on the way out here today, on the freeway today, I did that, to whom does this state was? Or whatever and I did this on the way out here and I was just real calm. Even if I thought of like rushing, who did this idea of time come? You know, I mean the mind was going the whole time asking those questions yet even though it was, I didn't feel rattled or ruffled because I didn't get identified with any of the things that came up. Robert, it's a great psychotherapy. 
Is that all it is though, is it? Robert, no, it's the highest form. I mean it kept coming but in between there was some quiet because I mean as soon as something would come up, the question would be there to cancel out any data data imaginings that go with it. Once you start thinking about time and the traffic and, you know how the mind goes, so it just stopped. And another thing that it did was, it may be totally unrelated, but every time I did that I could see that there was some kind of, I don't know. Robert, as you keep that momentum up you'll be surprised at what happens. SS, well I thought yay, if you could do this all the time everything would dissolve. Yes, you have to catch yourself. Whatever thoughts come to you, you simply ask yourself, to whom do these thoughts come? SS, even if they were good things, I did it you know and it made those okay but I don't know how to say it. I understand you're doing well that's good. SS, I thought gee if I could do that all the time it would be good. Then ask yourself, who needs to do it all the time? When you do it often enough it will begin to do you. SS, it was kinda doing me after a while. Laughs. It didn't feel uncomfortable, it felt very natural, a very natural place to be. SD, it seems to detach you a little and not feel personally involved, which is great. Robert, it does yes. Just doing that is sufficient for most people. SS, what's that? Just doing what you're doing is sufficient for most people. SS, but can you ask too many questions like that? No, if you want to go deeper you can go deeper with that, but don't do this when you're driving your car. When you're driving your car what you did is sufficient, but when you go home then you could do it differently. You can ask yourself, for instance, if you're feeling depressed, to whom does this come? And then you realize it comes to you. Though you say it comes to me, I feel this, I feel depressed, I feel terrible. Then you ask yourself, who is this I? From where does this I come that feels terrible? But don't answer. Just follow it, follow the I to its source, and you will realize that all of life, the relative world, is attached to I. And when the I is dissolved, everything else is dissolved with it. It happens by itself. You simply go deeper with the I, deep, deep, deep. From where comes this I? Where does this I come from? Or who am I? Whatever feels good for you and you will realize that the I comes from nowhere. It doesn't exist. It never did exist. You are free. You are bright and shining. You are the one. SS, you're not going to sit and just contemplate your navel all day. You're still going to do your activities and all that? Of course you are. You'll even do your activities better than you ever did before. SS, I sometimes feel when I've gone into a yoga, I saw myself as strong. You're having the wrong experience. The right way is to let your body do whatever it has to do. Your body came to this earth for a purpose, so it appears, and your body is going to do whatever it came here to do, but it has nothing to do with you. SD, so is that what you mean when you say that we are not the doer? Robert, exactly, you don't have to concern yourself about work or non-work, whatever you're supposed to do you're going to do, it's all preordained, just be happy SS, what happens when your money runs out and you're not able to work? Robert, why do you believe this will happen? You're giving it strength. You're thinking mentally that this may happen. SS. It may be close right now, it appears to be. Well then thinking mentally about this makes it stronger. The more you worry about this the stronger it becomes, but if you push that thought way out of your mind, your omnipresence will come forth. SD, what if you say to whom does this thought come? To whom does this fear come? Robert, you can do that too, yes. SN. The fear of poverty is only because it's the ego that's afraid that it's poor. Robert, of course remember the trees do not lack for leaves nor do the flowers fail to bloom, everything is beautiful and so are you. 
You can never experience lack except mentally. Have faith, trust yourself and trust the power that knows the way. Which is within you, everything will be okay. SD, I remember you saying if everything is predestined then, at least on the earth plane might not look at us trying to be poor or rich, couldn't you still look with the same detachment on that more or less? Robert, well but for whom is there poor or rich? Who has to look with detachment? It's back to the ego again. SN, the more afraid you are of being poor the stronger the ego is. For the self, wealth and poverty are the same. So the more fear you have the further away you are going from the self, and what Robert says, is preordained, so worrying about it does not really alter it. Not that you should not do anything about it, but realize who you are. Who is rich and who is poor? When you reach a peace, it is beyond wealth and poverty. So whenever there's a fear of poverty, that's only the ego, and when there's the self you're always rich. Book the lilies of the field and that's what that says, why worry about poverty, but of course we can do that but that's. SD, the goal. Robert, the truth is you can never suffer, never, if you flow with the Dharma, you can never suffer, it's impossible. SD, but if you seem to be then that's the ego suffering. The ego is suffering, you've got to work on yourself. If you change conditions it's no good. As an example, if you think that your husband is giving you a hard time and he's unemployed and he can't support you, so you say, I'll trade him for another husband. Then when you get the other husband you've got other problems because you've not resolved it in your own mind. It has to start and end with you. You can't change outside conditions. It only appears for a while that you can, but it always comes back again. The chickens always come home to roost. So wherever you go, wherever you run, you have to take yourself with you, and if you've got a poverty consciousness, wherever you go you're going to experience poverty. So don't change anything, but work on yourself and see who you really are and what you really are and you'll never have to be concerned about poverty again. SD, it's like Jesus saying, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you, because we don't really do anything in that state because you've let go, you know. SS, well, because I haven't worked and because I've got a disability now. And whether I should use the mind thing of picturing myself of being able to work, and that's just as bad. Just to do that or another way which is just temporary. And think I'm going to picture myself doing such and such. Robert, yes. The best you can do is to make yourself happy. Happiness will take care of everything else. Really be happy from the depths of your soul. Do not look at conditions. Conditions change, but make yourself real happy because you are you. Not because you have something, but because you are you. Happiness has nothing to do with person, places and things. Happiness is a state of mind. If you can be happy it'll change everything in your life. SS, you turn on the switch by self-inquiry. Yes, but forget about the switch. Be yourself and you will know what to do. You did not come to this earth to suffer you came to find yourself and to be happy. Break in tape as Robert continues. Robert, and the big income to think we're prosperous. It's wrong our values are completely warped. SD, and you have to say whoever has the most toys when he dies wins. Laughs. That's so ironic in the self because who cares about this or that or. The poverty and prosperity are secondary. The first thing is to find yourself. That's why you came to this earth. Everything else will take care of itself. SS, I've been in both places, I've never had true poverty, okay but I've had big houses and cars and all that whole stuff, and then I've had where I've had just enough to meet my needs and either ways okay I feel that, I feel that burden kind of like keep on meeting my needs, okay like. Changes topic, health insurance. 
even though I'm going off topic but health insurance isn't that a fear thing? Robert, of course. But do we get it anyway because we live in this? Robert, if you need it. If you need it. I used it a lot this year. Thumb years I never use it at all, but you know, I have a roof over my head and food to eat. The things that I need money for are my phone, my health insurance and my car insurance, and if I need to buy a pair of clothes. I'll buy that once in a while, I don't really need a lot. SD, but sometimes I say to myself, and I think Robert taught me this, that at any given moment, you have everything you need and this thought at any given second. SS, I know right now. Right now are you hungry? SS, no, no, insurance is paid. I go back to this health insurance business. There's something about it. SN, setting against the self. Yeah. Any type of insurance. Robert, you have to do what you have to do. SD, maybe she was led to have it for this need now, maybe she won't need it anymore. Robert, take this body as an example, I own nothing. Says, you owe nothing? I owe nothing. There's nothing I own but I've got everything. I have nothing but I have everything. SD, but you're so much advanced, more advanced than us. Well, I don't know about that except that I have no needs. I live in a good place, I eat properly, but I own nothing, I'm just there. SS, I don't own anything either. I have no insurance. SS, oh yeah, I know that but I have use of a car, but I don't really own the car and I don't own the house that I live in. SD, I think you are better off than me. Laughs. The way that I feel about insurance, this may be a stupid earth plane reaction, but it kind of ties in with this, but the odds are just for money. Those companies wouldn't stay in business if they weren't making any money. SS, I probably have used the insurance now, this year and why would they? They're way behind. Laughs. What will raise the rates? Laughs. Robert, but you got to be very careful when you talk about these things. SS, you giving them power? No I mean, if you don't have the consciousness, you can cause a lot of problems for yourself. I remember many years ago we had a class about something like this and I used to talk about when I lived in Hawaii and I used to talk about the fact that I never locked my car and nothing has ever been stolen because I never felt that I needed to lock my car, so I never did. But I apparently said the wrong thing to somebody because there was one person in the class who always locked his car because he didn't trust anybody. When he heard me talk about this, he said he was going to do the same thing. He was a shirt salesman. In the back of his car he had samples of about 20 different shirts, and the one time that he didn't lock his car, someone stole all of the shirts out of his car. Laughs. Though I said, I didn't tell you to not lock your car, I said, I don't lock my car. But you have to do what you have to do until the time comes that you don't have to do it anymore. Everybody is different. SD, that's what I meant by you being more advanced, you know. I don't think I'm more advanced, it just happened like that. SS, people are comfortable with that, you don't have any fear about it. Robert, I don't even think about it. SS, the thing to do with insurance is if I still think about it, I probably just get it. That's right. SS, that means by buying it doesn't mean make you get sick though necessarily. No, why should it make you get sick, unless you think you've got to get sick so you can use it? Sess, no, no, there has been a lot of times when I've had it and didn't even know I had it and didn't even use it. Some people think that they're paying for nothing and they say, so why don't I just get sick? I've got to use my insurance. Laughter, SS, no, yeah I don't care if I use it, I'll donate the money. Laughs. Pause while students have some refreshments. SN, Robert, I have a couple of questions. Do you consider Ramana your guru? Robert, I consider Ramana as myself.
I look at him as more than a guru. I look at him as the universe, as life itself, which is none other than myself. Though he is simply another aspect of me. When I was with him I paid him homage because he was myself. Though I was paying myself homage, do you follow that? I treated him as I would treat myself. When I came, I brought food, I brought flowers because I am the flowers and I am the food. It's all one. But, the actual word Guru means teacher. And Ramana was no one's teacher. He was simply doing the same thing I do. He was simply confessing the truth about himself. And the people who wanted to sit around him were welcome. He didn't care. In other words, he never said, I am a teacher, and these are students. He looked at everyone as himself, and he just went on with his daily activities, and people just sat all around him. When he would go to sleep on the couch, the whole auditorium, they would go to sleep on the floor. Sn. Well, say for instance, some people will read some books, like Who Am I, and they would be saying that Ramana's my guru. Robert, well it can't hurt. Laughter. S.D., in a sense of master teacher. Robert, it can't hurt. S.N., I was reading a book by Ramana. S.D., did he really write it? Robert, he just wrote some verses but the mistake that most people make about that is there's too much separation. And as long as there is separation there is going to be trouble. Because if you fall in love with the Guru, the first mistake the Guru makes, so it appears, then you hate him. Because physical love is the other side of the coin of hate. But when you look at a Guru as not being a person, but being yourself, that's different. ST. Can you repeat that? When you look at a guru as not being a person, but being yourself, that's a completely different story. You make a mistake according to your thinking. T. Because you give them your own. ST. Egoless. That you're egoless. Yes, I was just going to say that. You want God to live up to your expectations. Laughs. SS and that's your ego wanting freedom. Yes, in other words, you are creating God in your image. Do you expect the Guru to do this? As an example, say you're celibate, so of course you're going to expect your Guru to be celibate. Say you live in a cave, so you want your Guru to live in a cave also. And if he lives in a house, you'll say that's not a Guru because he lives in a house he should live in a cave. Do we give all our expectations to the Guru? SD, don't we do that to God too? Robert, to God same thing. And we anthropomorphize. Robert, exactly, but the true way is to totally surrender to yourself. Then you will be led to the true Sat Guru which is none other than yourself, and then there will be harmony. Because then you couldn't care less what the Guru does because the Guru is yourself. SN. Robert doesn't that also happen in personal relationships rather than love the Guru you have that love in your personal relationships and you have expectations and then you get put down? Robert of course. Not any different? Robert of course. SD. I think most people fall in love with an image of the other person and what usually happens in relationships is that neither person can live up to the other so the other has to move forward. Robert, expect nothing and you will never be disappointed. SN, and should you also see the other person in the relationship as yourself? Yes you should. ST, how do you do that? Robert, you simply realize there is one self and that self is me. Though you and I are one therefore, whatever you do to me, I can't be mad at you. SS. Yes, but how do you do that? Laughs. By working on yourself. SS with self-inquiry. Through self-inquiry, through mind control. SD. Would you ask yourself, who feels hurt? You can ask yourself who feels hurt. Who is seeing all these things? To whom do these feelings come? 
st in every situation rather than change the situation you have to change yourself wherever you go robert yes you have to bring yourself with you st tape unclear same thing exactly well you have to draw a line someplace some time depends on your advancement your maturity but if you're living with a person that you can't get along with and you want to develop yourself and you can't be in those circumstances then you should change them but if you're not working on yourself if you change your circumstances they'll pop up somewhere else says but there's a lot of relationships where one person is working on themselves and the other person couldn't care less what's happening and they can get along that true robert Yes, but as you work on yourself, you will know what to do. For instance, if someone comes to me and they say, "I want your car." That's not strange to me. SS, they want your car. They want my car. If I feel in the mood to give it to them, I'll say, "Take it." If I don't, I'll say, "No," and forget all about it. But I won't think about it or I won't get caught up in the struggle. Why does she want my car? What is he going to do with my car? I don't think that way. Laughter. I'll say if you want to take it if I don't think so I'll say no I can't give it to you and that's the end of that. There is nothing to think about. There's nothing to worry about. I once had a beautiful ring and somebody really liked it so I took it off and gave to him because I'm not attached. What's rightfully mine can never be taken away and that's myself. Everything else comes and goes. ST tape unclear Robert you don't get attached but you have a loving feeling a kind feeling ST so how would you do it by being attached means you own them it's like you own the person and they have to do what you want that's attachment ST but can it be the other way round so that they own me Robert yes it can same thing but if you're free then you love them but you don't let them walk all over you but you still love them you do what is necessary sd that's like the story of the man and his sons something like that yes now i don't mean to make this cold and calculating i mean i love you more than anybody else can ever love you in your life and you don't know that but i'm not attached do you see the difference ss even if you never saw us again it wouldn't make any difference robert and yet i'd give up my life for you can you follow that you are me we are one and i could do nothing but love you cuz i have no life ss oh whose life are you going to be giving up there's nothing to give up st well how do you deal with emotions robert you ask yourself to whom do they come ST yeah but why are they there they're not you think they do it's like hypnosis you've been brought up in a way to have emotions but they don't really exist so when you ask yourself to whom do they come they'll disappear ST emotions comes from thinking right and thinking comes from ego robert Yes, but then again you can say, but I like to have good emotions. I don't want to get rid of all my emotions. That's hard to explain, but when you're empty, you've got love and bliss and joy and you have those feelings toward everything. So you don't need those emotions that you're talking about. Those are from the mind. You simply ask yourself to whom do they come? ST, you mean it's that easy? Oh yes, but you have to mean what you say. SD and after turn in again Robert yes because we're so programmed and not aware of it SN it's not mechanical it's not a mantra to whom do they come SS how can you keep that from becoming mechanical mechanical is to whom do they come 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 SS right But when you really ask to whom do these come that's the difference Robert when you ask from your heart instead of your head SS probably a different kind of feeling in a way 
Sure it does. Sen, well when you're truly asking the other it's just mechanical, you're not asking at all. Sess, that's how affirmations become, they just become mechanical. But there was nothing that soothed me and everything that I picked up or read that helped me in the past meant nothing. Robert, I'll tell you what affirmations do. That you have to catch a plane and you're late, so you have to affirm to yourself, I will catch this plane. It will wait for me. I'm going to catch this plane. Though you go to the airport and the plane is late and you catch the plane and you say, boy, these affirmations work, then the plane crashes. Laughter, SS, well you won't use that one. Laughter. Though forget about affirmations. Zess, be careful what you ask for. You'll get it. Zess, that's just the thing about health, wishing for that or wish for. D, that's funny to me, you know why? Because if you wish for health, that means you've got a disease. SS, yeah, that's the affirmation for disease. So you're affirming the disease is getting bigger all the time. You say I wish I was healthy, I wish I was healthy, I'm going to be healthier and healthier every day. That means you are sicker and sicker every day so you can be healthier and healthier. Assess, how do they coin that psychologist Emile Cow? Emile Cow. French psychologist optimistic autosuggestion. SS. Yeah, and he had this every day and in. Day by day in every way. SS, every day I'm feeling better and better. That helps to an extent. SS, for a period of time, but if you don't resolve it from the top, it will always be coming back and it's going to be two sides of the coin. Yes, those things are for neurotic people, all these affirmations, I'm getting better, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Forget about it, there is nobody to get better because nobody's sick. SS, there's no betterness. SG, isn't there the other aspect of introspection? Which is being part of the creative process of manifesting the I am and isn't there two directions to go in the aim of searching or questioning who am I and the result of that, the gift from that questioning, the answer to that question, I am this and so do we not have responsibility to create the self. Robert, no. To manifest the self? Robert, the self does not have to be, no, because who is manifesting the self? In reality nothing, only the self exists and nobody needs to manifest it. It's like asking God to manifest God. You already exist as the self. SG, are we creators? We have a mind that wants to create. The mind is the creator. SD, put the mind in the ego realm. SS, but the mind merges into the heart though. Okay, when you get to that point. Is that what you're speaking of John when you get to that point when the mind merges with the heart? Robert, everything that the mind creates, it creates problems. ST, so the mind is not really needed. Yes. SG, is music a problem or art? Robert, art and music are part of the material world, they are of a higher state, they are of a higher consciousness. ST, the highest consciousness. No higher, but they are still a part of the relative world. When you are yourself, you are music. So you don't have to create music. ST, but I think what John is talking about is like what Joel Goldsmith teaches, who was one of Robert's teachers when he said, there's no one to ask for abundance because you are abundance. Abundance is not having a demonstration, you are abundance and those are simply manifestations of your abundance. SG, well what makes so much sense to me, is the self-inquiring is that the answer to the question is not an affirmation it isn't. I am this, I am that. In asking, who am I? The answer can happen naturally. Instead of a conditioned answer of who we believe we are. SD, oh right, because you're not even supposed to answer as Robert says, you just wait for the answer, and the answer will ultimately come to you. 
SG, right but there is that aspect of the process there is they, all I can do is ask right. Who am I but there is also the answer which is happening to right and is that the creativity. Robert, it's not really creativity. He the answer already exists by itself. And by inquiring you're opening yourself up for the answer, but the answer is already there. SG, oh I see. Though there is no one needed to create anything. SG, but aren't we also opening up our bodies, our ego, our feelings and our minds which have been in the past closed or we're not opening that up to the answers so that they can express through our minds. Robert, you can call it opening up, but those things that you mentioned do not exist. Therefore when you open up you just become, but you don't have to go through the process you're talking about. You simply ask the question and the answer comes by itself. It's like being in a room of darkness. To get to the light you don't have to go through a series of processes. You just turn on the switch and the light exists. It's the same thing. You don't have to create the light, you don't have to pray for the light. You don't have to make something so that the light will come, you simply turn on the switch. SD, and it was there all the time. SG, right, so by asking the question that's the switch. SG, but if we stop asking then the light goes out again, huh? You get caught up in the world, you get caught up in the world. SG, yeah. SD, also. I've got a question and tell me if I'm wrong, but the answer doesn't always come to you and that's why we keep having to do something for it. When it comes isn't that you're awakening? Robert, yes, it's like the sun and the clouds. SS, it will come in the words. No, it's like the sun and the clouds. The sun is always shining, it never goes away, but sometimes clouds block it. Though it's an ignorant person who says there's no sun. What do I have to do to make the sun come out? Though I'll climb upon a ladder and push the clouds out of the way. Or shall I get a wind machine and blow the clouds away? The clouds are always there because of ignorance. When the clouds dissipate the sun shines once again. SD, but it never stopped. It never stopped. The light within us is always bright and shining but we cover it up with ego and mind. Though when the ego and mind is removed, we shine once again in all our splendor, like we're supposed to. SD, are the ego and mind the same thing? Just about, the mind actually creates the ego, but those are just terms. SD, so if you get rid of the ego you get rid of the mind and vice versa. Yes, if you follow the eye back to its culmination they both go. SD, oh that's right because you said that the mind is the projector and the ego is the screen. Yes. SG, I can see that the highest aspect of the arts from the audience point of view is a tool to draw someone into reality. Robert, that's true true. Like the Buddhist Mandorla. But, I know that without my mask of my ego, I don't have a perspective to create something. Robert, how do you know? Because I've been through that in my earlier years of realizing that I had talent in a certain area such as theater. I also felt lost because I didn't have a perspective. I didn't know what I wanted to communicate. Robert, but you're still talking in egoic terms because the ego was lost. The ego felt lost. SG, isn't there a positive aspect to the ego as far as being a mask of thought where the dance is concerned? It appears like this. If you want to get caught up in the dance of life then you do those things you're talking about, that's true. SG, and can we not wear the mask and be aware that it is the mask and see that there is a function for it in everyday life, getting along in the world? If you want to, but it will still pull you back into earth again because you are attached to something. To become totally free, you have to be unattached to everything. That doesn't mean you won't do it. You can become a great artist and not be attached and you do beautiful artwork. Though you can do whatever you like, but just don't be attached. 
realize that you are not the doer. SG, is there a certain amount of attachment that a bodhisattva has to take on in order to survive in the world? No, your body will take care of itself. There's a power that runs the universe and it takes care of bodies. But, you are not the body. So you work on yourself and your body will take care of itself and it will do whatever it came here to do. SS, whether it's theater or not. Whether it's theater, whether it's not, whether it's nothing. Whatever you came here to do, you are going to do, but you have nothing to do with it. ST, but how do you know if you've done it already? Robert, you don't have to know. Something does know and something will lead you and guide you. But don't be attached to your body. ST, to your body? Yes. You will be guided. You will be directed in the right way. There is nothing to worry about. If you came here to be a nurse, no matter how you try not to be a nurse, you're going to be a nurse. Nothing can stop you no matter what you do. SD, because of predestination and karma. Robert, yes. SG, in the younger years of life, isn't there a function that, what I want to be is the ego then right? But isn't there a certain amount that is necessary to get us through school and so training can happen, because if we decide before we've gone through that we're God, and that's what we want to be then maybe we won't feel we have to go through the education and the processes of becoming. Robert, if you are realized it all depends on what your body came here to do. Some people go to school, some people don't, everybody's different. But it doesn't matter. Do we get caught up with all these thoughts? Keep thinking about yourself and everything will take care of itself. SG, it's like we have to have something to throw into the fire to begin with. You know what I mean. Doesn't there have to something ego first in order to burn up? Robert, the ego burns up last. It's like we have a fight with all of our thoughts, and we get rid of everything and the stick we use is the ego, and then we have to throw in the stick also. SD, but I think he's asking if the ego is necessary up to a certain point. SG, yeah. The ego is never necessary. ST, why does it exist then? It doesn't. You think it does? Laughter. It's because we're talking. SD, because we're talking about the earth plane and the world's evolution, right? Robert, yes, exactly. It's all part of the dream. SN, knowing the end you don't really have to ask questions and the only reason why you're asking questions so that you'll come to the realization that you don't have to ask questions. I have a question. Laughter, SP. You don't have to ask it. Dana, did you say abundance is a Cadillac? SD, no I said abundance is not a Cadillac. I said abundance is within you. You are abundance and the Cadillac or Ferrari whatever was a manifestation of abundance but... Robert, how about the Volkswagen? Laughs, that too, you don't have to ask someone yourself or God or anybody else for abundance, it's not like, please, please, please can I have. Because you are abundance and that realization will manifest these things, but the things are not abundance. We have to make that distinction. Things are not abundance, you are abundance. SN, I have a question on consciousness. I suppose the question is, what is consciousness? And is consciousness the self? And the thing that brought the question on is I was thinking about the fourth state, the waking state, the dreaming state, the dreamless state. Now in the dreamless state is there consciousness? And in my experience there is no consciousness and I question what is consciousness and what is the self. And is the consciousness and the self the same thing? Robert, consciousness is an aspect of the self. Consciousness is the creative principle of the true self, it's the next step before the true self. It's the creative principle that creates everything. Everything that appears created comes from consciousness. 
though in reality you are consciousness. It's another name for awareness. All these names are synonymous really. Consciousness, awareness, the self-God but yet they're also different aspects. Consciousness is like universal mind. SN, but is there consciousness in deep sleep? Robert, yes, there is but you're not aware of it. Laughs, SN, that's what I'm trying to get at. I remember reading that in the waking state, the dreaming state, and the dreamless state, there is still the self. I can relate to the waking state, I can even relate to the dreaming state. For me the dreamless state is, before I go to bed, I'm awake, and then I go to sleep, and then I wake up and the period between going to sleep and waking up is only one second, although it was so many hours. So where's the consciousness or where is the self? And what is the difference between the two? Consciousness permeates everything and when you are a Johnny you are aware of the dreamless state, you're in the dreamless state but you are aware of it. The ordinary person is consciousness when they're asleep and dreamless sleep they're not aware of it, that's the only difference. Essen, oh so it's just a matter of levels? Levels, it's a matter of levels of enlightenment. Sn, so a Johnny is conscious during dream, dreamless sleep. A Johnny is always in dreamless sleep but is aware of it. Sn, so even when he's asleep he's conscious he's aware. Yes. Sn, but a person that isn't a Johnny when he's in deep sleep isn't aware. He's not aware. Sg. It's difficult for me to comprehend awareness without subject-object, without something to be aware of. Robert, here's an example. You take a baby. The baby is asleep, but the mother gives the baby a bottle and the baby sucks on the bottle, but is not aware of it because it's asleep, but yet it's sucking on the bottle. So in dreamless sleep you're not aware of what you're doing, but you're pure consciousness. So when you become self-realized, you're pure consciousness but you're aware of it. You're awake. That's the difference. Sn, so basically we're all asleep, and it's not until we become awake that we can be aware during dreamless sleep. Robert, that's right. St, so what do the dreams mean? Is there something in consciousness that it talks about? When I had a dream about doing something and woke up, why did I dream about that when I can do that? Robert, dreams are part of the relative world. St, they are a part of the relative world? They have to do with your experiences in life. They're a part of it. St, what if you dream about something that we fear? Dreams are simply images that come because of your past experiences. In other words, if you were brought up frightened, and you fear things, you will dream fearful dreams about things that never happened, but they'll be fearful because you created this in your dream mind. SD, are you saying that they are part of the earth plane existence? Robert, yes. If you awaken, would you still dream? Robert, you can't dream when you're awake, you can only dream when you're asleep. SD, so a Johnny never has dreams, right? No, a Johnny has dreams sometimes. But, the dreams are meaningless most of the time. SD, dreams are meaningless. Yes, don't pay too much attention to dreams. ST, why do they happen then? Because of your state of affairs. It vents emotions. It gets rid of temper tantrums emotions. ST, so they have meaning in that sense, right? To keep us from acting out some of these things during the day? Yes, it's a release of energy. ST, but what if you wake up and you've had that sort of dream that wasn't pleasant and when you wake up it affects your mood? Robert, then change your mood. ST, I mean is that possible? Simply realize it's a dream and ask yourself, who had the dream? Again, it's your ego that dreams. It's your ego that dreams, not yourself. The third person looking at it. So you don't give too much power to dreams. A lot of people make a lot of things out of dreams. Tape ends. 
Transcript 4. The Four Principles of Self-Realization of Noble Wisdom 19th August, 1990 Robert, I want to let you in on a little secret. There are no problems. There are no problems. There never were any problems, there are no problems today, and there will never be any problems. Problems just mean that the world isn't turning the way you want it to. But, in truth, there are no problems. Everything is unfolding as it should. Everything is right. You have to forget about yourself and expand your consciousness until you become the whole universe. The reality in back of the universe is pure awareness. It has no problems. And you are that. If you identify with your body, then there's a problem, because your body always gets into trouble of some kind. But, if you learn to forget about your body and your mind, where is there a problem? In other words, leave your body alone. Take just enough care of it. Exercise it a little, feed it right foods, but don't think about it too much. Keep your mind on reality. Merge your mind with reality, and you will experience reality. You will live in a world without problems. The world may appear to have problems to others, but not to you. You will see things differently from a higher point of view. I had an interesting phone call this week. Someone asked me, do self-realized people dream or have visions? Now, in order to have a dream or a vision, there has to be somebody left to have it, and yet if you're self-realized, there's nobody home. There's nobody left. Though it's a contradiction as truth is. All truth is a contradiction, it's a paradox. The answer is sages do dream sometimes and have visions. But, they're aware of the dreamer. In other words, they realize that they are not the person dreaming or having the vision. But as long as there's a body there someplace, there will be dreams and visions. Even though there's no one home, there will still, once in a while, be a dream or a vision. As an example, Ramana Maharshi often dreamt and had visions. Nisargadatta dreamt and had visions. And they were both self-realized. But, again the question is, who dreams, who has the vision? There's no ego left, as long as the dreamer is separate from the I. I can only speak from my own experience. There's no difference to me in the waking state, the dreaming state, the sleeping state, or the vision state. They're all the same. I'm aware of all of them, but I am not them. I observe them. I see them happening. As a matter of fact, sometimes I don't know the difference. Sometimes I don't know whether I'm dreaming or awake or having a vision or I'm asleep. It's all the same, because I take a step backward, and I watch myself going through all these things. So for some reason lately, I've been dreaming about the Queen of England. She was coming to Satsang. I don't know why for about three nights in a row. But, I did have an interesting vision this morning, at about four o'clock, and will spend the rest of the time discussing them, because I found it very interesting. As many of you know, I have had a constant vision, periodically, of myself going to Arunachala, the sacred mountain where Ramana Maharshi lived. And the mountain is hollow in the vision. And I go through the mountain, to the center, where there's a bright light, a thousand times more brighter than the sun, but yet it's pleasing and calm, and there's no heat. And then I meet Ramana, Jesus, Rama, Krishna, Nisargadaya, Lao Tzu, and others. And we smile at each other, we walk toward each other, and melt into one light, and become one. Then there's a blinding light, and an explosion, sort of. And then I open my eyes. I've shared that with you before. But this morning, for the first time, I had a very interesting vision which I'll share with you again. I dreamt I was somewhere in an open field, beautiful field. There was a lake nearby, trees, a forest. And I was sitting under a tree, in this open field. And I had on the orange garb of a renunciate. I must have been Buddhist. 
All of a sudden hundreds of bodhisattvas and mahasattvas come from the forest and start walking toward me. And they all sit down in a semicircle around me in meditation and I wondered what I was doing. Then I realized that I had become the Buddha. We all sat in silence for about three hours. Then one of the bodhisattvas got up and asked a question. He said, Master, what is your teaching? It was not in English. I don't know what language he spoke. But I understood quite clearly. And without hesitation I said, I teach self-realization of noble wisdom. And he sat down. We sat for about another three hours in silence, and then another bodhisattva got up and asked a question. Master, how can you tell when one is close to self-realization? How can you tell when one is about to become self-realized? How does one tell? And this is what I'd like to discuss today. How can we tell if we're on the path correctly? I gave four principles which I really never do in the waking state. I never have a teaching. But, I was giving a teaching so I'll share it with you. I explained four principles where you know that you're close to self-realization. Of course we're all self-realized already. Principle number one, you have a feeling complete understanding that everything you see, everything in the universe, in the world emanates from your mind. In other words, you feel this. You do not have to think about it or try to bring it on. It comes by itself. It becomes a part of you. The realization that everything that you see, the universe, people, worms, insects, the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, your body, your mind, everything that appears is a manifestation of your mind. You have to have that feeling, that deep understanding without trying to. So you ask yourself, what do I think about all day long? Of course, if you fear something, if you worry, if you believe something is wrong somewhere, if you think you're suffering from lack or limitation or sickness or anything, then you're out of it completely, because you're not understanding that all these things are simply a manifestation of your own mind. And if you worry about these things, you become attached to false imagination. It's called false imagination. You've been attached to habit energy for many years and all these attachments and beliefs come from habit energy. It's like watching a TV show and becoming one of the characters when you know that you're not even in the TV. But you believe you're one of the characters in the TV show. Though so it is with the world. Do not get involved. I don't mean you become passive. I mean your body does what it's supposed to do. Remember, your body came to this earth to do something. It will do something without your knowledge. It'll take care of itself, don't worry. But do not identify your body with yourself. They're different. Your body is not yourself. And I'll prove this. When you refer to your body, what do you say? Don't you say my body? Who is this my you're referring to? You say my finger, my eye. Who are you referring to? You couldn't be talking about your body because you're saying it's my body like you own it. Who owns it? This proves to yourself that you're not your body. So do not identify yourself with the body and the world. Therefore the first principle to see how close you are to self-realization is you are not feeling that you are identifying with the world. You're separate and you're feeling happiness because your natural state is pure happiness. Once you identify with worldly things, you spoil it. The happiness disappears, it dissipates. But when you're separate from worldly things, happiness is automatic, beautiful, pure happiness. It comes by itself. So that's the first principle. The second principle I explained to the bodhisattvas was this. You have to have a strong feeling, a deep realization, that you are unborn. You are not born, you do not experience a life, and you do not disappear, you do not die. You are not born, you have no life, and you do not die. You have to feel this that you are of the unborn. You realize what this means? 
There is no cause for your existence. There is no cause for your suffering. There is no cause for your problems. Some of you still believe in cause and effect. This is true in the relative world, but in the world of reality there is no cause. Nothing has ever been made. Nothing has ever been created. There is no creation. I know it's hard to comprehend. How do I exist if I was not born, I have no life and I do not disappear in old age. You exist as I am. You have always existed, and you will always exist. You exist as pure intelligence, as absolute reality. That is your true nature. You exist as Satchitananda. You exist as bliss consciousness, but you do exist. You exist as emptiness as Nirvana, but you do exist. So don't worry about being non-existent. But, you do not exist as the body. You do not exist as person, place or thing. Do you feel that? If you have a strong feeling about that, then you're close to self-realization. Principle number three, you are aware and you have a deep understanding of the egolessness of all things, that everything has no ego. I'm not only speaking of sentient beings. I'm speaking of the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom. Nothing has an ego. There is no ego. And do you realize what this means? It means that everything is sacred. Everything is God. Only when the ego comes, does God disappear, what we call God. Everything becomes God. You have reverence for everything. When there is no ego, you have reverence for everybody and everything. So you have to be aware of the egolessness of all things. Animals have no ego, minerals have no ego, vegetables have no ego, and humans have no ego. There is no cause, so there cannot be an effect. There is only divine consciousness, and everything becomes divine consciousness. So if you look at your fellow man and animals and everything else as being egolessness, you will see them as yourself. Can't you see that? It's the ego that causes separation. When I am full of ego, I become strong within myself. I become totally separate. So the more you like yourself as a person, the bigger your ego is. You say, well, I'm not supposed to like myself. You're supposed to love yourself, but what self are we talking about? We're not talking about your body self, because that comes and goes. We're talking about your permanent self that has always been here. And your permanent self is me, is you, is the world, is the universe, is everything, that's your permanent self, egolessness. That's the only time that you can love your fellow human beings when you have no ego. That's how you can tell where you're at if you're close to self-realization. That's principle number three. Principle number four is simply this. You have a deep conviction, a deep understanding, a deep feeling of what self-realization of noble wisdom really is. What is self-realization of noble wisdom to you? You can never know by trying to find out what it is, because it's absolute reality. You can only know by finding out what it is not. Though so you say, it is not my body, it is not my mind, it is not my organs, it is not my thoughts, it is not my world, it is not my universe, it is not the animals, or the trees, or the moon, or the sun, or the stars, it is not any of those things. When you've gone through everything and there's nothing left, that's what it is, nothing, emptiness, nirvana, ultimate oneness. Anyway, I explain these four principles to all the bodhisattvas and all the mahasattvas. Then we sat three hours in meditation, and they got up and walked back into the forest. Then there was a flash of light, and I opened my eyes. What do you think of that? Any questions? SD, was it a dream or a vision, and how do you distinguish between the two? Robert, well I don't really know to tell you the truth. I'm usually aware of what's going on, so all the time I was aware of the vision dream taking place. 
SD, including this time. Yes, I realize I was doing all these things. It was like I was watching everything taking place. But, there was never a time when I actually became the dream or the vision. SD, or felt totally caught up in it. You always observed it. Right, I was always observing. But, it was like an omnipresent observer. So that's the teaching, that's how you tell when you're getting close to self-realization. So, do you remember the four principles? Glenn, why don't you repeat them for George because he came late? SG, I don't think I remember the four. I think they're very important to remember. Which ones do you remember? SG, that the second principle is that all things are egoless. No, that's the third one. Laughs. Tim, how about you? What's the first one? SM, stop identifying. Robert, see how easy we forget. We're guessing. SD, everything emanates from the mind. Robert, that's right. That the whole universe is a manifestation of the mind, everything. You've got to feel that and know it's true. SS, as long as we're identified with the body or the mind, then we're not very far off. Robert, exactly. You're part of the world. SS, how do we say that in short sentencing? Basic one? SS, the first one. The first one is that everything, and I mean everything, the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, everything your senses show you, is an emanation of the mind. You're projecting a picture, just like you project a moving picture and everything you see right now in this room, comes from your mind. You may say, how can we collectively see the same thing? That's because of the habit energy that we're brought up in. So collectively we seem to be seeing the same thing, the same picture. That's number one. What's number two? Who can tell me? Do you remember Ben? Students try to remember. SN, we're not regarded, we're just nothing. Robert, we're just nothing. Doesn't sound too good laughs. SN, we're not born and no one dies. That's right, but there's something in between. We're not born. We have no existence. In between the time we're born and when we die, we really have no existence. And we do not die. There's no disappearance. SD, so how would you summarize it? That we are non-existence, or that we have no beginning and no end. Robert, both are right. We have no cause. SM, so you're saying that existence implies a relative cause. Robert, yes. An existence only takes place in the relative world. Robert, yes. And we're not really a part of it. Robert, exactly. SN, and non-existence. Robert, non-existence also does not exist. ST, but then couldn't you say the mind doesn't exist? I mean you say that everything that exists. Robert, nothing that you can explain exists. But earlier you said that everything emanates from the mind. So how can you say it? Robert, yes because you're projecting the picture. And you have a mind. Robert, you don't have a mind. ST, I think he means everything in the earth plane world. Robert, in the relative world. In reality, there's no mind. That's how the picture appears. The mind projects the whole universe. So if you get rid of the mind, there's no universe. We have to kill the mind and the whole universe is annihilated because it's the mind that projects the universe and tells us all these stories. Think for a moment of all the problems that you believe you have. Think of what's bothering you. You can tell me your story for four hours. This is wrong and that's wrong. It's all a projection of the mind. 
though by getting rid of the mind, everything stops and beauty and joy and bliss ensue. But, you're covering the beauty and joy and bliss when you worry, when you fear, when you think something is wrong someplace. So that's precept number two. What's number three? Who can tell me? S.N. Egoless. Robert Wright, everything is egoless. Not only human beings, but everything, mountains, trees, the sun, nothing has an ego. That means it has no existence. So where did it come from? When you have a dream, where does the dream come from? Same place from nowhere, from false imagination. SD, I don't understand the expression false imagination, because the word imagination implies a certain falsity. Robert, we're imagining a false world and a false ego. SD, that's sort of a paradoxical saying. Sure, it's all paradox because it doesn't exist. But, that's how we imagine it. This is the reason I always go back to the sky is blue. Somebody takes me outside and says, look at the beautiful blue sky. And I agree with them, but I know deep inside that that's not true. There's no sky and there's no blue, it doesn't exist. Or the oasis in the desert, the water, it doesn't exist, it's a mirage, the world's the same thing. The universe only exists in the dreaming state. It's like a dream. Now, what's the fourth precept? What's number four? ST. It has something to do with we are nothing. Robert laughs. Well, everything has to do with that. But, it's actually to have an understanding and a deep realization of what self-realization of noble wisdom is. SD, and how is noble wisdom defined from regular wisdom? Robert, it's not, it's the same thing just more wordy. It's a Buddhist expression. ST, they have all these real long expressions. And then they always say what it is. They call it as it is rather than give a name to it. Robert, the eightfold path, and then they take years explaining it. But when you get into the highest teaching there's nothing. ST, so would you go through the fourth one again? Fourth one, the only way to know what self-realization is, is by knowing what it is not. And whatever is left, that's what it is. ST, and that's noble wisdom. Same thing. Though you say it's not the body, it's not the mind, it's not my organs, it's not my thoughts, it's not the world, it's not the sun, it's not the universe, it's not God, it's not creation, and you go on and on and on. When you get out of breath and out of words, that's it. SD, is that what the expression neti neti means? Robert, not this, not this, yes. SN, it's sort of like nowhere, nowhere. If you spilt the two words, there is nowhere. SS, is it boring though? If all that goes away and there is nothing? Robert, laughs. No. See, that's what people think. That's why I explained before, the mind will make you say that because it doesn't want to be annihilated. It wants to rule you and control you completely, because that's its nature. That's the nature of the mind that doesn't exist. SD, it sounds like the survival instinct. The ego wants to survive. Robert, the ego wants to survive, of course. Survival instinct. Robert, exactly. ST, when you're meditating, are you totally separate from this physical world and everything? Robert, when who's meditating? When I'm meditating personally. ST, um hum. Well, I don't usually meditate. I sit sometimes with my eyes closed, but that is just to rest my eyelids. Laughter. SD, because there's no one there, right? There's no one to meditate. Robert, there has to be someone to meditate. SD, student talks to other student with question. He feels that he's no thing, nothing. 
the why yourself realized you need to know that what would they meditate about. That doesn't mean you should stop meditating. It means you should look at these four principles and compare them to where you are yourself and work on yourself so that you can apply these principles to yourself every day until the day comes when you don't have to talk about them any longer. You just become a total manifestation of those principles. Says, work on them but you don't make effort ever. That's what I find. Robert, you just realize. You become aware of. SS, you can do mind games with that too. There's a principle in say, okay I'm not going to look at things and identify with them. I don't know if that's a way to start. No, you don't start like that. You start by mindfulness. SS by what? By mindfulness, by being aware of all your actions from the moment you get out of bed in the morning. SD, or observing yourself. Observing yourself. Like, what are the first thoughts you think about when you open your eyes? It doesn't matter but you just watch. Don't try to change them that's when your mind will fight you. And that is when the games begin that you're talking about. But, if you make no effort to change anything and you just watch that will kill it. SD, so self-observation and mindfulness are the same thing. Robert, yes. ST, another thing this man also taught me about when you talk about just watching everything. He also talked about accepting everything. Robert, the same thing yes. You don't fight, you don't try to change. But, I don't like to use the word accepting because if some horrid thought comes to you why should you accept it? You don't accept it and you don't reject it. You just watch it. SS, so it's like when you were having visions or whatever you just sat and watched them. I just watched. It wasn't good, it wasn't bad. Just observe. SA, can I make a comment about this? It leads into this. I'm caught in that area at the moment of austerities. Robert, okay. I've been thinking about a different approach to this. It seems to me that for example, if we take advantage of a fan, and because we feel this cool air our attention is really, it comes because of our attention to the body. We all sit here and we all participate in this, and incidentally we can only participate in anything because of the positive efforts of the rest. Which says that there is a reality, and that there is evolution and there is growth in that realm. Though so wouldn't it be better if we declined this attention to the physical self? Wouldn't it be better if we just got rid of the fan? We wouldn't have to think it's hot, we have to cool the body. By using the fan, and of course this is only one side example, we acknowledge the reality of the body. We're acknowledging the reality of the self because we're really concerned in this particular moment right here and now with the status of the self in the physical world. And we're emphasizing it, we're going on about it, we're developing it. Why not go the other direction? Why not turn off the fan? Robert, because while you're on the path why not be comfortable? Simple as that. S.A. Okay why can't I have a Rolls Royce outside, it'd make me very comfortable. Well go ahead, who said you can't? They were not saying how to live. Living this in the world has nothing to do with it. You can be rich, you can be poor, you can be well, you can be sick. It has nothing to do with it at all, that's the point. SS, so how will this happen? Robert, because your karma. If you are karmically supposed to have a Rolls Royce, your body is going to have a Rolls Royce whether you like it or not. But, it has nothing to do with it. SD, my feeling also is that this comes from being very sensitive to heat, but if we did not have the fan on, I would be more focused on the body than I am in comfort. SA, yes but that's a special situation. Well doesn't it apply to everyone that if you're comfortable you're not as distracted? S.A. I'm aware of the pleasure right now. 
I'm aware of, my attention has turned to my body because every time I feel the fan I feel the sensation. SN, that's good every time the fan goes by that's good. SA, so the attention is toward to the transient and the physical rather than to the other. Robert, then you have to work on that. If the fan were off you would be sweating, you would be thinking about that. SD, that is what I was saying. If we were uncomfortable wouldn't we be more? SA, it would be worse as what you're saying, yeah. But, it's a very important point. SS, you're very hedonistic. Robert, they're two sides of the same coin. ST, maybe now while we're on our way to self-actualization. Maybe later on in our progression we will be able to sit in the room without the fan and feel comfortable. Now while we're... Robert, self-actualization is Maslow don't talk about that. Laughter. ST, you know that is one thing I wanted to bring up. I have the hardest time with words. I wish that I could communicate without words. Robert, that's good. You can, because of right definitions and... Robert, I know. That was something I wanted to ask you whether you have a hard time giving us the definition of self-realization. Robert, oh yes because I have to use words. That is why when you get to know me better we sit in the silence and don't say too much. And then you get a direct teaching that's silent. In the silence you get the highest teachings. But, if we have to use words we have to do the best we can. So let's play some music. Music played. General talk continues during Prashad on different topics. Robert, there are three methods we use to help us on the path, so we can realize what we were talking about before. Number one is self-surrender, where we surrender completely to God or to the self. But, that's hard to do for most people. Sounds easy but it's not. It means that you have no life of your own. You surrender completely and totally everything to God totally. Every part of your life goes to God. Not my will but thine. That's devotion bhakti. Again it sounds easy to some people, but it's not when you get into it, because it means every decision that you have to make is left up to God. You give your mind to God totally, completely and absolutely. And that leads you to self-realization. Number two is mindfulness, which we were talking about, becoming a witness. Watching yourself continuously. Watching your thoughts. Watching your actions. Sitting in meditation and watching what goes on in your mind. Not trying to change anything or correct anything. Just observing. Becoming the witness to your thoughts in meditation and to your actions in the waking state. And number three is the one that I advocate, self-inquiry. Asking yourself, to whom do these troubles come? To whom does this karma come? To whom does this suffering come? It comes to me. Well, what is me? I am me. Who am I? From where did the I come from? And following the I to its source. You can use any of those three methods, the one that suits you best. But, by all means do something. Don't waste your life with frivolities. Work on yourself if you want to become free. It doesn't mean you have to give up going to the movies or going to work or anything. You give nothing up. You just become aware of what you're doing. You become a conscious being. You become conscious of your actions. You become loving, compassionate, gentle to all people. You stop watching out for number one. Most of us say, number one. I'm number one. Forget it. That's how you suffer, that's ego. It's hard to understand, when you give up your ego, how you can have a better life. But you do. Try it and you'll see. When you stop thinking of yourself, and you start thinking on yourself, but yourself becomes omnipresence, that means you're thinking of everybody else as yourself. 
Though if any human being suffers, you suffer too. But, in a way we differ from Buddhism, not much but a little. Because the Bodhisattva says he will not be realized until everybody else is realized. But, then they have a higher Bodhisattva called the Arhat. It's like the Avidhat in Hinduism, who becomes self-realized by himself, because he understands that his self is the self of all. And that's what we accept. In other words, if you want to help your fellow man, if you want to make this world a better world in which to live, find yourself first, and everything else will take care of itself. Any questions about that? SF, you mention about the self-observing or observing your thoughts. Robert, yay. Isn't it the same thought just mixed into observer and observed or same? Robert, only when you give it power, only when you think you're doing it. But, when you just stop and watch, there is no action taking place, there's nothing moving. SD, isn't watching an action. But you're not watching, just observing watching, but you're not. You're not, but something is, but it's not you. Only when you think I'm watching the problem arises. SS, isn't that the voice that says, to whom does the suffering come? SD, yeah, it would be the same. Robert, yeah, same thing, yes. Says, because I've been watching that voice, because if you feel a calm after that or something starts to dissolve, then you start doing that. Robert, well, actually what you're doing is you're using the mind to annihilate the mind. Says, but you're not identifying with it. You don't identify with it, but you're using the mind when you say to whom does this come. SS, that's not the self, is it? It's the mind. SS, it's still the mind. But you're using it to get rid of the mind. SS, it's becoming more one-pointed so that you can dissolve. Yes. Only when you think that it's you, is there any karma or action. SF, so in the mature phase of observing thoughts there will be a point in which there's no awareness of observing? Robert, there's no awareness, no. Observing and things are being observed without somebody being aware of observing and that's the mature phase of observing? Robert, exactly yes. SS, that's difficult to do when you first start observing to say that to whom does this come? And sometimes you feel a sense of it dissolving, or whatever, and at other times the body is real strong. Robert, of course it is. Do you try something else? Well okay then we'll fix this. Laughs. Robert, you just try to ask yourself, or you watch yourself, or you surrender. You can tell yourself, okay God take this for me, I give it all to you. That's a total surrender to God, give it all to God, give it away. Assess, and if that's the thing that I don't want to go. But that's what you have to do. Assess, if you're having pain or something and you say take it away. Give it to God, say take it, take it God, it's yours, I've got nothing to do with it. You have to do what you have to do depending on where you're at in consciousness, but by all means do something or you could just sit down and do nothing, that helps too. SD, I think letting go is the same as just like taking control of yourself, just a little easier, with a little difference. Says, what about sleeping? Robert, what about it? If you're feeling certain feelings and then you go, I'm just going to lie down. Robert, then you have to do that, that's what you do. SS, is that similar to letting go too? In a way. Assess. I fight that you know. I don't like that. Don't fight anything. It gives you another chance to relax, and when you wake up you can start again. ST. Sometimes though it seems that when they have problems and they seem to go to sleep and go to sleep and go to sleep. ST. Yeah, it can be an actual depression. Robert. Well, those are people who are not working on themselves, but those of us here realize. SS, you can be observing that in yourself that you're fighting in your sleep, 
even though it's really what I want to do, but maybe something's telling me maybe that's what you need to do and let go and don't fight the sleep. Robert, that's why I say, don't fight anything, just go to sleep and when you wake up start again where you left off. SS, I have felt sometimes worse when I woke up. So that's why I avoid sleep. SD, because you're using it as an escape. SS, no legitimately I felt very like I just couldn't. Like I'm just sitting here, why don't you just let yourself go to sleep, okay, I'll just let myself go to sleep, and I go to sleep and I wake up and it, it'd take me about an hour or two to bring me back. Robert, now from this moment on, how will you react when you wake up and you feel better? SS, detach from it. Observe it watch it, even if you're feeling bad, no matter how bad you're feeling. SS don't fear. I get fears, see that's what happens like, so what does this mean? The, I start questioning. See that what happens and I'll question now, why does happen? You may ask to whom does it come? But observe it watch it, let yourself be fearful, don't try to change it. SK, watch yourself fearing. Robert, just be observant of what's going on. Students discuss different ways with other students. S.A., I would say that today my mind is full of heresy. Laughter all round. Today it's very difficult to let go of the idea in the Bible that I am the vine, you're the branches. That the great drama of realization is being lived out in each differently in each human being and that that living out, that drama is important. Robert, in the relative world. I can't accept that today. Robert, don't. Laughter. My feeling is you could say that, the divine being or God should I say so, that it thrills to the individual drama, the individual adventure. Robert, in the relative world that's true. I was going to Robert ask about this my understanding, I don't know if it comes to the same point. I was wondering, isn't it self-surrendering, self-surrender isn't it? For instance to decide to live of course always within the context of devotion to God, try to live as one lives with all your demons, all your evil deeds, everything and take life as it comes and accept it. Of course knowing that consequences are coming from action and the action will come in accepting everything. I understand that if devotion is strong, things will start moving little by little, going to showing up as beautiful or better integrated being and maybe the beginnings of self-realized. In other words if there is devotion, self-surrender, no matter what you do, things will take care of itself. Robert, exactly that's very true. If you surrender to God, you don't have to worry about your life again. SF, I mean you don't have to be compulsively observing of the egoic drive or Robert, not if you surrender to God correctly. SF, because you could be acting for instance from another observer, but you keep pursuing that devotion and surrendering even when you look for observers, outside observers. It's like when you imagine you have a pail of dirty water, scummy water. It's been standing for years and the water is very dirty. But, there's a hole in the roof and every time it rains a drop comes in and it starts clearing the water. Maybe after 20 years the water will dissipate and will be clean. That's what happens to us. The more we surrender as you say, the more pure we become little by little by little by little and everything will take care of itself, if you surrender properly. SD, isn't that bhakti, isn't that what you were talking about the different methods that we use? Robert, yes. More or less the same as devotional bhakti. As opposed to self-observation. Robert, yes. As opposed to self-inquiry. Robert, yes. SN, Horat mentioned acceptance, and also Dana mentioned acceptance, and Robert said earlier, don't accept, just watch, because when you accept there's someone to accept. Just watch, because when you accept, it sounds like you're affirming your ego again, just watch. Though acceptance is good, but you can also just watch. SD, 
Yeah, watch without judgment. Maybe it's just words again. And also Arnold's comments on God and the vine and the tree and the branches, and Robert said, well that's just the relative world, and that's kind of like subject-object again. And in the book Ramana said, as long as you believe that you are the self then there is a God. Though it's kind of like going from non-duality into duality. Though if you're dealing on the level of duality, what you're saying is true, but when you go into non-duality then, there are different principles. Though Arnold says, this week I'm into non-duality, next week I'm into duality, I don't know if that would help Arnold. Do you see what I'm saying? S.A., I know what you're saying. S.N., as long as you believe that you're the self then there is a God, then those principles apply. But, then if you go into non-duality then you are God. Though there are different principles, you know, you don't use the analogy of the tree and branches because you are the tree and you are the branches. SF, what you mean to ask was just like saying that God is saying there is a good time, good play going on, why get rid of it? Laughter. Yeah yeah yeah, he's so wise. Laughter. SA, not exactly, God is saying that because of his play. When the play is over, I am the play, it's true, but when the play is over, I will know more about myself. I will be in a different spot from when the play began, because of the play, and all the participants in the play. And through the participants, through the actors having lived in each of the actors, I will be in a different place afterwards. Robert, yes but you'll have to come back again and play another role again and again and again. SS, because we're still identified with an actor. That's what they mean in Buddhism, getting off the wheel. You want to get off the wheel. From turning around, keep turning around, again and again and again. We want to get off. SA, but what if God is standing and watching this and knows that he is in a sense, his projections are part of it, but his essence is apart from the play. But even that essence which is a part will be in some way changed. I will not be on the wheel because it never was on the wheel. Robert, but as long as you believe in duality you are on the wheel. As long as you are approaching a god outside of yourself, you are on the wheel. SS, I have a question, what you were referring to when we talked surrender to God, accepting a god outside of yourself and yet that's where with the devotion thing because I feel like I'm. I mean with all three of these, you can say, you can pick one of these, or you can use all three of these. Robert, sure. Where actually they're not in conflict. Robert, no they're not. That to talk about God, and if you surrender to God it sounds like outside yourself. Robert, that's how it sounds yes. How can we surrender to God and be full of light, because I have a certain part of me that has this devotional part, but I also have a part that is more of the knowledge part too, you know. Robert, um. But I like both, I like the combination, I want the combination play. So how do I? I do go to my knees with oh God you're beautiful you know. Now when I hear that I can feel it in my being, I don't think of it as some man out there with a beard out there. I do feel it in here. In the matter of surrender how can we do that without making separation? Robert, simply surrender to yourself. That's all. This, we don't at this point we don't really know it because we haven't realized it. So where's the God you want to surrender to? Where does he live? SS, he's in here well I don't really know. It all has to do with your own mind. You talk to yourself, you surrender to yourself. You have to reconcile yourself with yourself. SS, so it's past the ego, it's past the mind and surrender to that. You can be very humble and have a lot of humility and talk to God, but realize you're talking to yourself. SD, I don't know about you but it seems like surrendering is dualistic. Robert, it seems that way. But, you can keep it like that if you like. 
SS, it will go away after a while anyway, huh? Robert, if it doesn't, you'll still feel great. If you surrender totally like Ramakrishna. He never wanted to become one with God, he wanted to worship Kali. Which was an image of God, and he did so all of his life, but in his own way he was self-realized. In his own way. But he never separated God from himself. SS, he was after surrendering to Kali, but he never did. He never did. He was unique. SS, but did he go back on the wheel then or not? Well, he was totally free because he became one with Kali, he merged with Kali, which is God. SS, because I have tapes at home and I like to listen to them and I like to go, well, is that in conflict with? Well, this is a different path and I say, well, this is in conflict with this, or this is separation, or this is duality. Do you make it a conflict in your own mind? There is no conflict. SS, just love it and enjoy it? Exactly, there is no conflict except what you imagine. That's what is called false imagination. You imagine that there's conflict so there's conflict. But there isn't any. It's all one. SD, like when you hear, Oh God beautiful you should have known that you are, because you're the self. It's just a knowing, a way of just describing that, whatever that is. SS, yay, you don't have to say it and even though that's some words or something about it. But you know it's you, even that is dualism. SF, Robert isn't inquiry a tremendous surrender. Robert, tremendous what? Surrendering. Robert, oh yes. SF, utmost surrendering. In order to go through that it's so. Devotion turns into self-inquiry, pure devotion. SF, or even when you go to self-inquiry intensely you are really surrendering the ego. You are yes. Exactly, they're all the same. SS, it's still devotional when you do that, I have a feeling of devotion or surrender when. Robert, there are different paths to the summit of the mountain, but they all lead to the same summit. Assess there what? There are many paths that go to the top of the mountain, but they all get to the top. So you can use any path that appeals to you. S.A. Robert, why is this teaching which is essentially Eastern mysticism as I understand it? Why is it dying out throughout Asia? It certainly appears to be. Robert, truth never dies out. I don't know what you mean by dying out. S.A., while you look at countries like India, Japan, where Buddhism and Hinduism had very strong holds and now you see that these teachings are practiced by, from what I understand, by very few, fewer and fewer people all the time. Then we hear of tremendous growth in Bombay, the land in Bombay costs more than New York. The Indians are good businessmen, so you tell me. It's all becoming extremely westernized. Robert, it's the way of the world. It goes up and it goes down, goes up and it goes down. Been like that since the beginning of time. But, you're looking at the world. Look to yourself, don't worry about the world. The world has been destroyed numerous times and was built again. We have had many civilizations on this earth say that we don't know about we don't know about throughout the billions of years of existence we can't think about those things because they're past our mind we have to know who we are then we'll know everything else though we shouldn't concern ourselves with history too much or get involved in the world situation too much because it can pull you into it but rather we should work on ourselves and then everything will take care of itself ss don't things change, though as your consciousness is raised, do you become less interested in certain things? Robert, well naturally, just like when you were a little girl, you drop stuff and now you're interested in other things. Assess, will I be coming antisocial or like you're invited to a wedding, and I look at it, and I'm going okay, if I go to the wedding, and I get home I'm glad that's over. 
Robert, you become selective, there's nothing wrong with that. SS, but I don't want them to think that I don't care about going to their sister's wedding and now, I'm going to their wedding. But, it didn't matter to me that I went to the wedding. I just didn't have a whole lot of interest in it. Robert, but are you happy? SS, when I was there I was there. When I went to the wedding, I was mindful I was at the wedding. I didn't sit there and go, I can't wait to get home. I wasn't complaining or anything. But I could have been just as happy being at home and I learnt more out of somewhat obligation or you know family's going to be there so I ought to be there. Then there's the persona that comes in and says that I might miss out on something, you know that sort of thing. Robert, there's nothing wrong with that that's good whether you miss out or don't miss out. SS, no it doesn't matter. I go to a lot of functions, but wherever I am is fine. SS, but you're still active about it. I mean you don't have obligations? I'm not normally selective about anything, everything just happens. SS, but you don't accept everything. The I'm not worried, I don't think about all these things. Whether I'm selective or non-selective or whether I'm this or I'm that. I just am, and whatever happens, happens. SD, so you're the same wherever you are. Robert, whatever I do. I say, what if I called you at two o'clock Sunday afternoon and said, there's a good movie Bob, I'd like you to go, it's going to last for hours, and we all assemble here, so that means you are selective. Robert, why? You made it a point to be here. Robert, I made it a point to be here. Yeah. Robert, you mean I can't come because you went to a movie? No, what I'm saying is if that option had come up. Robert, oh I see. You would have had to say no. Apparently you do say no to other things because you are here every Sunday. Robert, oh of course but it's not being selective, it's a way of life. SD, you can't be at two places at once. Robert, it's a way of life. I don't think about it, I just do it. SG, you don't have to be selective or non-selective. It doesn't matter, you can be selective or non-selective. SN, there has to be a you to be selective. Yeah, so you don't have to say I'm non-selective. Robert, I know it's difficult to understand, but I don't make a decision, I just do what has to be done. There's no thought, there's no thought process. If somebody says, you want to go to a movie? I'll say no I'm going to a meeting, and I forget about it. S, A. It's the best way to be. S, D. So there's no moment of indecision or. Robert, there is no energy. S, S. Should I go to the wedding now or care if I go to the wedding or should I not go to the wedding, and you go back and forth. But if you steal the mind. Robert, if you don't try to decide at all, you'll make the right decision. S.A., for you it is. He's a good example of the importance of being selective. It really takes a lot of process of selection and determination to be here in the first place otherwise you wouldn't or couldn't be here. S.S., I had to do that a bit today, yeah. You would have to do it every day to go through what you go through. Robert, if you're here six months from now you won't have to do it anymore. Laughter. SS, after today I don't know. The body was hankering at me, you know, why don't you take a shower, that will zip me up sometimes, so I say okay I'll go try that except I just kept on going, I just tried not to think about anything. SA, but you had a focus. Took a shower, ate, got in the car and then got here. SA, then you got here. Well, like the going back and forth part. Robert, that's what you have to do now but it will change. SG, a simple analogy is when you say you need the fan and you don't need the fan on or also when you're turning the fan off and trying not to be the body. You're also going on one side of the pole as well. So the fan could be on or could be off and it shouldn't matter. Because you're also making a conscious process not to be a body by choosing one particular pole, a lack of something 
or having something or not having something. Say, theoretically that makes sense, but that's why I brought up the term austerity, but when you give solace and joy and comforts to the body, you encourage the body to want more. So you are feeding. SG, well that's two sides of the same pole. Because are you saying then? SG, it's the same as austerities. It's not the same. If we sat here without the fan and you're sweating, our bodies would not desire to sweat more and have more heat, but we do desire to be cooler and feel more pleasant. SG, but you could also turn it the other way and say, by feeling more pleasant I have to pay more attention not to feel pleasant. SS, yeah, they're two sides of the same coin. SA, but that was the entire reason for austerities all over the world, whether Christianity, or Hinduism, or Buddhism, because of those reasons, because the fan is encouraging the body. Is encouraging all of us to want, to want pleasure and more joy for the body. SG, but that's like saying that it's better to be a monk. It's quicker to be on a spiritual plane by being a monk than being a playboy, let's say or being in a situation as a playboy. But, on the other side, by being in the world with all those things around you, you can also, it's the same pull. SA, perhaps it's true for some people. I know it is. The other point is a very important point to consider. SN, even in austerity, who is austere? It's still the self, the self is gaining all these, it's still the ego. So it's the ego that runs after things and it's the ego that runs away from things, but it's still the ego so there's no difference. SA, to some extent while you're in the body attention must be paid to these things. It's all a razor's edge, but because we are here in a three-dimensional world, to just constantly fall back on that idea leads to problems because we must maintain the physical body. Robert, who says you won't? Who is to say you won't? If you're practicing spiritual sadhana your body will take care of itself, you will take care of it. That's it. SS, I mean you will be aware of it, but you'll just walk over to there and you're not going to go, oh this is making me feel better and it is giving me comfort, you won't go through all those processes. Robert, that's it exactly. Students talking between themselves over each other. SS, well there is nothing wrong to be in this musical and to enjoy it, did you say that? Robert, yes. But what you're saying by enjoying it we're feeding it. But see that is another concept of mind. Robert, of course. SD, well I think the bottom line question would be, because Arnold brought up a good point, that throughout history there have been austerities, are austerities necessary? Robert, they are necessary as long as they are there, but when you wake up they're gone. SD, so it would more or less be a matter of karma whether you are austere or not. Robert, your body is karmic. It came to this earth for a certain purpose and it's going to accomplish that purpose whether you like it or not. It has nothing to do with you. SD, so that will be either you live in austerity or not that would be your karma or not. Robert, exactly. And it affects realization. Robert, if it was your karma you would have been born in Cambodia or Vietnam. SA, how about Paris? Laughter. Let's talk about Paris. Robert, Paris. The French Riviera. Laughter. That was your karma, Las Vegas. SS, through detachment again, you could say, if you're sitting here and you're saying, this is totally within my body comfort, this is just total duality, and you could stop your mind at that point and observe that and stop and say, to whom does this comfort come? SD, yeah, and to whom does the thoughts about it come to? Robert, that's true it's all the same. Sess, or from whence do these thoughts come? Either one would that work out? Robert, yes. You pose both of those from whence do these come? 
And to whom do this come? Robert, makes no difference. However I found this weak, and I observed making a judgment, and I'm going to whom does this judgment come? Because I felt like maybe I was making a judgment about someone, of course there's no one else out there, but I felt from whence does this judgment come? Instead of to whom does this judgment come, because that's like pointing a finger. Robert, whatever turns you on. Yeah I guess, as long as the observation is there is a means. S.A., you see the problem is theoretically everybody's repeating this and it makes very good sense. I understand it as a teaching but, and I asked you about two weeks ago I said, it seems to me that the teaching is very dangerous and you said yes it is. Your answer was yes it is and now to carry on what you're saying. Let's take a look further beyond the path. Let's say we go to work tomorrow as bored as hell to whom does this happen? It doesn't happen to anybody so the work, you start doing less and less at your work. To make a long story short, one thing leads to another, the first thing you find yourself out on the street. Robert, but why are doing less and less? And so somebody asks you and you say, it's not happening to anybody Robert, why are you doing less and less? And you're down and down and down. Robert, okay. Let's go to the first premise. S.A. Yeah. Why are you doing less and less? S.A. Why what? Why are you doing less and less work? S.D. Yeah, why do you assume that you do less and less? S.A. Because it's no fun and who is it happening to? There's nobody sitting at the desk anyway, so what difference does it make? Laughter S.N. Do you know that though? That's something I'm practicing. Thelf inquiry tells me that there's nobody there. SN, but that's also your mind. SG, if you were in that state you're not thinking that. SS, it's just words at this point. SN, that's like saying I have the same consciousness as Robert though you don't. Theoretically that's true but we don't experience that so it's not a reality. SA, so then we must make choices, we must be selective, and we must realize that the fan is giving us pleasure and it may lead to a desire for it. Robert, because that's what I said before Arnold, you've got to work on yourself. If you're in that job, if you're working on yourself correctly, you'll do more and more work, not less and less. ST, something came to my mind when we were talking about the fan. When I came into this room my first thought was, it's so hot, and the thing is, everybody in this room is sitting here, is anybody thinking, I've got to get out of here. SN, I am, laughter. No I was going to say that, if a lot of you are thinking that, then in a way you're accepting something that even like, not wanting to work, it's like all in the mind. I mean we don't realize that it's suffering because we're just comfortable here. Yeah and at your job, if you have a job that you do and you still the mind, it's like you just forget what it's about and you do it. Say, most people let things out and they're just aware of it all the time, that's not true, you don't forget. SS, well maybe your job will change when you work on yourself. SD, well don't forget what you just said about, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added to you and I think that includes the productivity of your job. It's like what Robert said, focus on the self and then see how you feel about that. S.A. All of this leads back into the Western idea that there is growth and evolution, but if we concentrate on those things then to some extent then we're in a better state. If we accept the relative world and acknowledge it and really give it our attention and our energy, we're in a much better place to move on eventually to other realms. Robert but the relative world changes, it's never the same. S.A., so we must change with it, that's why flexibility is important. But then you change with it until you die, and you haven't got anywhere. The whole idea is to change yourself, not the world. S.D., this goes back to, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Robert often says, do self-inquiry and then see how the world... 
We're still going, oh my god, why is the world in such a mess? Why would all, in ku wait yada yada? But if we concentrate more on self-inquiry, the world may look different to you. You won't know until you try. S.A. It still seems very dangerous to me. S.S. What do you mean when you said that Robert said that this teaching is dangerous? S.A. Well he did say that, did you remember saying that? To Robert. Robert, yes I said that. It's dangerous to new people because it gives them license to go out and do anything they want. S.S. I thought well you're preordained so. Nothing matters. But it doesn't work like that. S.A. But also it seems to be in stages, in some way it draws off energy and attention from the relative world. So that there isn't, and it's so hard to survive in the world. So that when that energy and attention is drained off in the world, you are left in kind of a limbo, and it's a bit more difficult to find yourself. Robert, who is me? And before you know something has happened and you could be pulled under. Robert, who is making that statement? Who says so? That's how you feel about it, but that's not like that at all. S.A. But it reminds of a very simple cult based on a glimpse of nothingness by a Dutch writer who went to the Orient and began to sell books. Anyway before he left Amsterdam he discusses his quest and his spiritual desire to his father and his father says, Yes, but be careful, I knew a man who felt the same way you did and one day, the embassy in Iran reported that he was found in a ditch on a country road. And that has always stayed in my mind, because I mean those things are always happening to, or similar things. Robert, but you're working in the relative world, all this is relative. S.D., in a way that's just a body that was in a ditch. S.N., well really, there are people that get involved in drugs and things like that, that end up in a ditch, not just people on a spiritual quest. There's a similar thing that happens in Hawaii, some people get into trouble there because they go into the jungle where they're growing all the dope, it's like they're looking for trouble. S.A., now that isn't true, history is full of stories of people, just the Catholic tradition for example of nuns, monks, maybe a large number of them go crazy, they go psychotic. They go into the monasteries, just because of their spiritual desires, and yet the practices drive them out of their minds. Tape ends abruptly. Transcript 5 The Four Principles Revisited 23rd August, 19, 190 Robert, I welcome you with all my heart. Most of us have been searching for reality for many years. We've been to many teachers, many groups. But, we still haven't found peace. Why? Because we're searching. That's a direct succinct answer. Because we're searching for something. No matter how many times I emphasize there's nothing to search for, people still search. Sometimes it would be better if we tore up all the books. Books are only to motivate us, to make us know there's something else, but, there comes a time when we have to go within and try to understand what this body really is. The truth of course is not a teaching. I do not philosophize. I do not give a teaching as it were. I simply give a confession and to most people it means nothing. But, we're not trying to attract most people. Those who feel something in their heart will always come to satsang and you'll always attract a teacher that is more to your liking. I do not consider myself a teacher or a guru. I do not consider myself anything at all. But the reality that is left over is your reality. It is omnipresence. There is one unqualified reality and this is it, right here, right now. There are no bodies here. What you see is your own business. When you see others you're making a mistake. There never were others. We're always looking for something. We want to find the right teacher. But as I often say, you are the right teacher. The right teacher is where you are. Person, place or thing is not the right teacher. 
You probably saw the movie Siddhartha, where he found the river and the peace of the forest. Even that's a mistake because he took the river seriously and made too much of the forest. He was the forest. He was the river. What we're seeking is utter foolishness. There's nothing to seek. I get so many calls. People tell me their problems all the time. And I really don't know how to respond. To whom shall I tell my problems? There just are not any problems. There are no problems, there never were problems, and there never will be problems. You may say to yourself, if he only knew my problems. But if you live in the moment, is there a problem right now the second? There's nothing. Nothing is your real nature. The problem begins only when you start thinking. But, if you learn not to think, where's the problem? So, we have to empty the mind, and then get rid of the mind. We cannot empty the mind by thinking, only by observation. Only when there is no thought is there reality. There's no sense saying to yourself, I am Parabrahman, absolute reality. I am unborn. Those are just words. And the next moment, you have a problem, you have an emotion, you feel something is wrong. But, you keep declaring I am unborn. I am the absolute reality. It is better to say nothing, to believe nothing, to be nothing, and that's just being yourself. It's better just to sit and think of nothing and try to become nothing, than it is to chant mantras, or to make affirmations, or to keep saying I am Brahman. Just by sitting you will become yourself. Last Sunday I gave you four principles, which I usually don't do. But I shared four principles with you and everybody was in awe. But, in the next couple of days I received phone calls from people, still telling me their problems. If you understood the principles, where is the problem? Even if you understood one principle and you ponder that you would be at peace. So, what are the four principles? Who can tell me? Sam, do you remember? SM, I know it but... Robert, but yet you know about food, you know about sleep. You know about girls. SM, count me out of that. Laughter. SD, I know the first one. That everything emanates from the mind. Robert, yes. Think about that. Everything in this universe, person, place or thing, everything, your body, your thoughts, creation, God, everything you can think about. SD, each other. Yes, everything, and I mean everything, is a projection of your mind. If you really understand this, how can you have a problem? But you may say, well, my rent's due on the first, and I don't have any money, so how can this help me? You would be amazed at what it does for you. Do the trees lack for leaves? Do the flowers fail to bloom? If you could realize the truth that everything is an emanation of your mind, you would become yourself, and yourself is omnipresence. It includes everything for the survival of your body. Think about that. Your body comes from your mind. But, as long as you believe your body is yourself, and you understand that it comes out of your mind, it will be provided for, just like leaves are provided for the trunk of the tree. Though this teaching is quite predictable and it can be used to improve your humanhood. Not by trying to improve your humanhood directly, that's where you've got problems, but by forgetting about your humanhood and realizing everything is a mental projection. Again what happens? When you realize that the whole universe is a manifestation of your mind, you become omnipresence. And in the omnipresence is contained all of your needs, and all of your needs are met from within. But when you start worrying or thinking about it, you spoil it. Then you have to do human things to take care of you. But, if you leave the humanhood alone, and go back to the understanding that it's all in your mind, you automatically let go of your mind, and the self takes over, bringing the right people into your life, the right situation, the right address. Remember again, 
your body came to this earth because of karma. And it's going to go through whatever it has to go through. But, you've got absolutely nothing to do with that because you are not your body. But, if you think about it you spoil it. Subsequently, allow your body to do whatever it came here to do. Do not interfere. Do not fight. Simply observe. Do not react. You will be okay. SC, is it okay to ask questions during this? Robert, sure. How about following your inner feelings? What I've been doing lately is going by my inner feelings more. This feels really right for me. Is this also? Robert, you've got to watch yourself because most of the time inner feelings are really habit energy from past lives. SC, okay. And from this life when you were a little kid, you developed certain habits. Most people believe their inner feelings. SC, well I feel I go against my inner feelings like church. I stayed in there against my inner feelings and it tore me apart to stay there. I feel so much clearer now that I've left. Well you were meant to leave, so you did. SC, pardon me. You were meant to leave. You were not meant to be there. SD, well what about this inner voice people talk about? Is that the unconscious and how reliable is that? Robert, most of the time it's a bunch of nonsense because to whom comes the inner voice? To the mind. SE, it's all part of the body. Yes. It's all part of astral planes, mental planes, causal planes. It all has to do with your body. Though you have to ask yourself to whom does the inner voice come? SD, would it be distinguished from instincts? Robert, it would in the mental plane. When we're speaking of the mental plane, we speak of distinguishing between instinct and intuition. SD, and is one better than the other? They're both the same. When we're talking about this path we realize that intuition as well as instinct comes to the ego. It is the ego that feels these things. The self is omnipresent. There's no room for anything else. It's emptiness nirvana the unborn. C. Is it possible that this body and mind can go on living like it seems like, maybe go on inner feelings, maybe not, that always looking beyond that into, who am I? Robert, your body will go on living anyway. SC, right. It'll take care of itself. SC, right. And all those thoughts come from the ego. SC, okay. So that's the point if you look at it properly. Yes. SC, to see that it goes on by itself. Exactly. SC. Okay. But do not concern yourself with what you should eat, what you should wear, or where you should go. SC. So it all becomes apparent. Sure does. SC. It all becomes apparent. That's good. Robert, there is something within you that guides you. It'll direct you when you become still, when you make the mind quiescent, quiet, calm. You will then be guided to know what to do. It is true that some people use their intuition and accomplish great things. But, how long does it last before it attracts misery to it? As long as you're living in the world of cause and effect, the world of duality, for every good there's a bad, for every bad there's a good. For every up there's a down. Don't be fooled. You use your intuition, you hear voices, and they guide you and tell you to do this, and you become successful. And you think you did something good. But, before you know it the IRS gets a hold of you laughter. And they throw you in jail. SC, well, I guess they drive you right into the grave one day. Of course. SD, I think the question is, is the inner voice superior to regular feelings? Robert, nothing is superior to the self. Be yourself, abide in yourself and you'll never go wrong. 
But when you hear voices, it comes out of your mind. You're trapped. SD, and the mind is Maya. The mind is very powerful. SC, isn't that one of the questions? Who's aware of this? Robert, well, tell me who is. Who is? SC, who is? Who's aware of it? There's nobody to be aware of anything, nobody is home emptiness. SC, I feel that that's true. Who feels that? SC, uh, okay. Even the feeling is wrong. You just abide in the self. There's no feeling. There's nirvana, there's emptiness, there's the state of the unborn. SC, it's really interesting that all the manifestations can point to that. Even the words, who am I? It just says, oh. To me it says something's aware of it. That seed. The seed's got to go. SC, pardon me. The C has to go. SC, seed. It has to go. You should have no feeling. SC, as myself. As yourself, but something will take over. Something that's beyond words. There's a something that will come. It can be called Sat Chit Ananda Bliss. Call it whatever you like. But something will take over, and you'll feel divine, and you'll be okay just the way you are. Now what's the second principle we were talking about? See, the secret as I told you Sunday, is to think about these things as soon as you open your eyes in the morning. As soon as you open your eyes, what do you think about? You think about food, you think about your day, you think about work, you think about money, you think about friends, relationships, but you do not think about your mind being a projection of all the things that happen. Whatever you think about in the morning will carry you through. Therefore, you have to think about the right things in the morning as soon as you awaken. Don't wait. So what's the second principle we discuss Sunday? Who remembers? Students guess. Robert C. So again I ask you, what do you remember? You remember your personal problems, you remember your needs and you think you are human. You think about the body continuously. That's why there is trouble with self-realization. Doorbell rings as someone arrives and is greeted then Robert continues. Robert. So you've got to investigate your mind and watch it all the time. See what it's doing to you. Watch how it controls you. It makes you emotional. It makes you believe something is wrong. It makes you angry. All these things come from the mind. The idea is to be aware of this. The awareness alone leads you to the light, just being aware of that alone. You don't have to know any book knowledge. Just be aware of what your mind really is. That's how you conquer your mind. By being aware of it, and no longer responding to it, no longer to react to the mind. Something that usually makes you angry, before you'd respond, and you'd want to win the argument, but now your reaction is no reaction. You simply smile and you watch. When your mind sees there's no response it will become weaker and weaker, until it disappears. It's just like arguing with a person. What happens if you stop arguing? The person goes away. They don't know what to think. They just won't have anything to do with you. They just leave. So when you stop responding to your thoughts your mind will go away and become weaker and weaker and weaker until there is no mind. So, what's the second principle? SD, give us a hint. Some of the words I spoke with them. Students guess some more. Robert, see think about this. There are so many things you remember. But they all have to do with your body. Drew, more remembering. Robert, okay. The second one was to have a deep feeling and a realization that you are unborn, that you do not prevail and you will never disappear. Remember? You will never die. Think about that. Just to think to yourself that you are unborn. 
There's no cause for your birth. Cause doesn't exist. There's no reason for your birth. You never were born. And as far as your existence is concerned, it's not there. You do not prevail from birth to death. There is nothing going on, absolute nothing. And you do not get older, you do not disappear, or you do not die. Think about that. How free you'll become when you understand what this means. It's a beautiful feeling to know that you were never born, that you've always existed, but not the way you think you are. Your life as it is right now, whatever you think you're doing, however important it may be to you, is totally meaningless. Why? Because it'll be gone soon. For whatever you're getting into, whatever excites you, is only for a time. Take Elvis Presley, people still remember him. But will anybody remember him 500 years from now? Take your great classical musicians, concertos, Bach, Schubert, everybody else, Rachman and off. They're important to you right now, but 500 years from now nobody will remember them at all. Everything will be so different it'll be like you're in another universe. Though the point is, if you get too involved in those things you're missing the mark, because you're not understanding your real nature. You're not understanding who you really are. You should be searching for the meaning to yourself and spending 80% of the time doing that. I know it's not easy to do for some people because they seem to be involved in life. But, yet you can do it. It doesn't matter. You don't have to set aside a time for meditation. You can do it while you're driving your car, while you're at work, while you're playing music. Just be aware of yourself, of who you really are, and realize the rest are a projection of your mind. To be aware of these truths sets you free. Just to be aware of them. SD, would that be the same when you say you are unborn or you will never die? Would that be the same as saying nothing exists? Robert, yes it is. Nothing as you think or as it appears exists. It appears to exist but so does a dream. A dream appears very real. But, is there a creation in a dream? Is there an end? Everything just begins and ends when you wake up. The world is the same. SG, you should not say nothing exists, because even exists is an idea. Robert, it's an idea. That's got to go in the end. In the beginning when you're finding yourself, you realize that I exist. I am that I am means I exist same thing. But then you find out who is the I that exists. And you follow it through. And that's got to go. SG, the I has to go too. Robert, everything has got to go. Now the average person will think if everything goes, what's left? What's left is everything, you are left as yourself, and that's beyond explanation. Then you turn back to yourself, and you become humble, compassionate, loving, because you are aware that you are the whole universe. And you can say all this is the self and I am that. SC, is that an experience? That's an experience. It's beyond experience. It's a revelation. It stays with you all the time. SC, because appearances fall down. Exactly true. That can be called Sahaja Samadhi when you abide in the self all the time. But that's ineffable, it's beyond words. SC, the experience does it matter, does how deep really matter? Robert, there's no such thing as deep. Deep is a mind concept. You're either that or you're not. Though, what's the third principle? Silence. Robert, Robert laughs, I'm going to ask you again on Sunday. Egolessness is at the basis of everything. Everything has no ego. Now I'm not just talking about sentient things, everything. The mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, and so forth. There is no ego behind it. SD, that's number three that there is no ego in existence. 
Robert, that means there's no cause for its existence. And just to understand this perfectly makes you live in the moment all the time. It gets you centered. Think what that means to you personally, that there's no ego in back of anything. There's no cause for anything to exist. Like the dream again, is there a cause for the dream? All of a sudden you find yourself dreaming and everything exists. Where did it come from? It came from the mind. It's a dream. And the only way to get out of the dream is what? To wake up. Though this is also a sort of a dream, it has no substance. Everything is transient, no ego in back of it. S.D. I don't quite understand there being no ego and there being no cause as being the same things, really. Robert, the ego is what makes something real. Makes it appear real? Robert, the reason your body is doing what it does is because of your ego. That's the cause of your body function, the ego. Though if there's no ego, there's no lack, there's no limitation, there's no sickness, there's no death, there's nothing like that. SD, are the ego and the mind the same, or are you making a differentiation? Robert, they can be synonymous in a way. Take for instance you've got a sickness of some type. If you realize there's no ego in back of it, there's no cause, where did it come from? It didn't come from anything so it doesn't exist. SD, so could you also just say nothing exists? Robert, but is it meaningful for you, when you say that? See, it has to be meaningful for you. If you say nothing exists, your mind and your ego will come and fight you and say, what do you mean? Look the chair is solid. It exists. Though you'll become disappointed. SD, my non-existent ego will be disappointed. Laughter. Robert, but when you understand the entire principle that everything is egolessness, everything, then you just exist in the moment like that snaps his fingers. You exist in the second in the moment, and in that moment all is well and everything is unfolding as it should in that moment. But as soon as you start to think then there's a cause. SC, so the only cause is the thinking process. Robert, Exactly. What you are telling us it's truth. Robert. Yes. Yeah because I'm experiencing that right now. Robert. Exactly. And you may think it's hard to do to think like that to be like that, but it's not. Just by remembering the egolessness of all things will wake you up. And you will become free. Now, what's the fourth principle? More guesses including, none of these principles exist. Robert, you're right. I usually don't do this, but I'm giving you these principles to help you. Laughs. Right. They don't exist, you're right. But, as long as you believe your body exists, they exist also. As long as you feel the world exists, your body exists, and your mind exists, then the principles also exist. And karma exists, and God exists, and creation exists. Nobody remembers the fourth principle? Well I'll share it with you again. More guessing. Robert, well if you recall, you have to have a strong feeling and realization of what self-realization means. And what's the only way you can do that? Remember? More guessing. Robert, that helps. By realizing what it is not. So you're right. You can't know what self-realization is because you are already that. But you can know what it's not. Though so by eliminating everything, then what is left is self-realization. SD, so how would you simply define number four? Robert, by realizing there's no body, there's no world, there's no God, there are no organs, there is no mind. SD, it sort of summarizes all the others. Yes, that there's nothing. Though every time you think of something you say, netty netty. 
Not this, not this. And you go all the way down until there's nothing left to say. Then you're that. SD, I still would like a simple explanation, three or four words. Three or four words. Laughs. There are no others. Nothing else exists but the self and I am that. You've got to work it out in your own head. You've got to use your mind to destroy your mind. SD, but it's based on netty netty. Yes. SD, rather than emotion. Exactly. Even if thoughts come to you like I am perfect. Get rid of that. SD, never had that problem. Laughter, I am not the body. Get rid of that thought. SN, I wrote down realize what is not. Robert, that's good. Whatever you come up with, it's not that, until you're completely empty. It's like emptying out a garbage can. As long as you keep turning it back over, the garbage will stay in. You've got to hold it upside down until all the garbage falls out. So we've got a lot of samskaras past tendencies karma. All that's got to go. So we empty everything out so there's nothing left. SG, stay upside down. Stay upside down. Then you become free. It's really simple, it's not complicated. But, if you remember the principles it helps you. That's all I've got to say. Questions. See those of us who come here are tired of playing mind games. We want to become free and you become free by not wanting to become free. It's just abiding in the self. By being yourself. If you follow those four principles, you will become yourself very fast, but you have to think of them all the time. St. May I ask you a question? Robert, of course. When you spoke about the first principle, you spoke a lot of what was going on with me, and I realize the answer is stressful. I also hate the situation. Robert, change it. That's what I wanted to ask, do I accept it or change it relatively speaking? Robert, it depends on where you're coming from. I haven't been able to transcend it as yet. Robert, so change it. How do I do this? I have no alternatives. Robert, look at your past, look at your background. If you've seen that you've changed things a lot in your life and things are still bad then don't change it but work on yourself. But if you have not had negative experiences and this is pretty bad for you then change it. St. I have a pattern of being in negative experiences. One in particular is I've been working in the world different jobs, just making a living in the world. Like teaching for now and then I take on routine jobs and then I go back to teaching. And with this job which just about finished, it's getting me back on my feet just a little bit. Robert, find out who is going through those experiences. You're not going through any of those experiences, you are free. Find out who is free and who is going through those experiences. Separate them. ST. May I still change the job, it still represents itself a possibility. Robert, by all means. And so I'm in a job that my heart says I hate. It's hard for me to get up in the morning to go to it, very hard to. I don't have to force myself to keep the job if that means doing my practice, is that wrong-headed? Robert, no it's not. It means that I'm not really deep enough, I know I'm not deep enough. Robert, you're going to find that things will improve for you this year. St, I'm sorry I didn't hear you. Things will start improving this year for you to your liking. St, you said as to whom do these things occur and that self-inquiry right. Robert, of course it always does if you do it in the right way. SD, because if you ask, who hates this? It turns out to be the ego who hates. ST, it doesn't work for me, not as an experience. R, then don't do it. Yeah, any intuition I'll share it, 
but it does not take me to the experience that I am not the mind and the body, it does not cease suffering. Suffering does not cease, I do not go to the point of the cessation of suffering of the body by inquiry, and yet the teaching is true what it means. What seems to work partly for me is surrendering, a giving up, but it's not sufficient. Giving up isn't sufficient. I realize that I listen to that whatever, whether it's the strength or the insight, there's still fighting, there's a partial giving up and still there's a tremendous suffering. Robert, then simply quiet your mind, sit still and do nothing. Everything will happen by itself. Like you're doing now, become still. Do not try to do anything to yourself. Thoughts come just watch them and everything will take care of itself. St. Don't inquire and surrender. You know it makes sense, that makes perfect sense, it's a matter of depth. That's when you abide in the self, when you do nothing and everything stops, all action stops and no matter how things come to you, you don't care, you just don't react. Even death makes no difference. St. Would you say that there is something more important than all of the sadhanas? No you can't say that because that's the ego again, but when you just sit and all fear leaves you, something else will take its place, and that will be bliss and happiness. When you stop fearing. St. Yes. So just sit and let all the fears come. Smile and sit still. St. You mean just look at them and detachedly. Robert, just watch them. Let them come, let them do their worst, let them drive you crazy and you don't care, let them. But, you try to stop, now let them. Just whistle, sing a song, do nothing and watch what happens. SD, so you're talking basically about self-observation, Robert? Not even self-observation because you've got to think about that, to do self-observation. You're actually just doing just absolute zero. You've turned yourself off and you have the attitude, even if I die right now so what doesn't matter. Even if my worst fear manifests good, let it. Laughter, SD, it seems difficult. No not really, it seems difficult but it's easy if you do it, try it. Get by yourself and just sit down, put your hands together and do absolutely nothing. Don't tell yourself you're watching where you're practicing anything at all. Give all practices up, give it all up. S.E., so even questioning, who am I, is still ego. Robert, yes definitely, give everything up and let the worst come. S.T., one problem with my job is that I have to get up at 5.30 in the morning, and I meditate best in the morning, and it's been eliminated in my life in the last three weeks, and I find it hard in the evening because I come home so stressed out. I still will try it, but I felt crippled by not being able to meditate in the mornings. SD, can you get up a half an hour earlier? Then I will have to get up real early, actually. Laughs. Robert, no, your problem is this, you think you have to meditate. You don't have to do anything. ST, I understand you don't do anything, or you think you can't really sit. No, just be yourself. You don't have to meditate. You don't have to do anything. Be yourself just the way you are. Then, the path that Robert teaches really blew my mind because I was on a different path and I've been meditating for like eight years and I was taught that I needed meditation. It was a dualistic path. St. I'm not into that. I was. Well, whatever, right? But the thing about what Robert has taught me, I mean the main thing, first of all that growth doesn't come about when you're conscious of it, even here it's not coming about through words. Yet it's happening, it's not through words, and the same growth in your lifetime does not come about when you're sitting and meditating. Not that that's bad but even while you're meditating and trying to meditate. I used to have to sit away and have a practice. Now if I do sit to meditate, according to what I've learnt from Robert, it's just, it's just like, I am, I am that I am, I am. What I am is the feeling that's behind when I say I am. So whatever that feeling is. 
I don't do anything, I don't think, I know nothing, and I just try to be like Robert, and I see how he sits. To the growth that occurs, so in a way he was saying that maybe you don't have to meditate, if you want to meditate, that's fine. St. It's beneficial, being still and I realize you can be still in action, but I do find it, especially when you're teaching it's not only still. Sn. It's not only being still but I still like to sit, but then Robert says that you don't even have to sit. And I understand how growth is occurring when I'm trying to still myself, and how Robert says, you just think and try to be that by sitting quietly helps me to do that. Although you don't grow just when you sit quietly, it's a 24-hour feat and for me it changes. If I'm out during the day I may ask, who am I? To whom does this experience come? Robert, it's important that you make your life simple. St. That's the thing mine's very complicated. But when I say simple I mean your mind. St. Oh. A person can do 20 different things but mentally you're not doing anything at all. Detach yourself from everything. Go to work if you have to, come home wash the dishes, eat do what you do but don't think about it. Don't get involved in the thought process. Just by doing that alone something will move you to wherever you have to be. In other words what I'm saying when you go out of this situation mentally, you'll be forced to leave by the momentum of your mind. When you're doing what you're doing, without attachment, without being the doer, without thunking that it is hard or easy. It's like being at school and graduating and the momentum will pick you up and put you on the next plateau wherever you've got to be. Though if you're supposed to be in China, something will put you there and you'll wind up in China. That's your next step. You've got nothing to do with it. SI, is that how you went to India? Robert, Exactly, you have absolutely nothing to do with it. There's a mysterious power that takes care of everything. All you've got to do is abide in the self, and you do that by keeping still. SD, so he's talking to us about that we are not the doer. SN, you know how you blew my mind, as I was always taught of the so many different paths of meditation. The key word is kind of like self-realization. Almost the first time I met Robert he said, there's no self and there's nothing to do and just, there are no words. SC, is not doing anything different from the practicing of witnessing. Robert, yes it's different, because you're not witnessing. SC, is witnessing doing something. Yes. There's nobody to witness. You're just empty. SC. Well I can see that that's true, okay, and things appear, and there's no one really witnessing because that hasn't come into being yet, as far as the witnessing goes, so obviously, there's no one doing it. To witness there has to be an ego. A C, so the witness would come later and say, I've got to witness this. Yes just watch. A C, can you say that just witnessing goes on without being? Without being aware. SC, pardon me, without being aware. Yes, it just happens by itself. SC, it does just happen by itself. It's always happening. In this manifestation, it's always happening. When you're not aware of your comings and goings, that means you've arrived. SC, okay, you mean as a person? As a person, as a mind. SC, and as emotions, is there a difference? As a person, it's all your actions, mind is all your thoughts. SC, okay, so the thoughts are still something? When there is nobody left to pay attention to the comings and goings of your body or your mind, then you've arrived. SC, okay, paying attention though is the key to that space. Key yes. SC, the attention. Okay, so if the thoughts are there, just like the buildings are there and the sky is there and so on. They're just there. I see, they're just there, you don't have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with you. I see, someone. Exactly. 
That's why the example I always use every time is, the sky is blue. If you go outside and show me the sky and say, look rubber how beautiful blue it is. I will agree with you, but in reality there's no sky and there's no blue. SC. Right. So in reality there are no thoughts and there are no actions. There is nobody to act and there are no thoughts, it's like hypnotism. See, do I need to realize that? You just have to be that. SC. Okay. Laughs. It's like you've been hypnotized. SC. Can you just see the truth of it? You don't even do that, no. SC. This is good. There are no words to explain it. You just, you're just there. SC. Who's the self? That's what bliss is. SC. Yes, there's a touch of that. It's kind of like practice without practicing. That's right. Robert turns to another student. John, what do you think of all this? SJ. I try not to. Laughter. Robert, how do you think this affects your music? SJ. I think that Brahman and Shakti are the same thing, that manifestation and non-manifestation are the same thing. You're right, Drew. The music will go on, but you've got nothing to do with it. SJ, that's the work I have to do is to, if it's time to go on, then my work is to get out of the way of it. The music will become more beautiful, but your ego will not be involved. SJ, um, I still have an appreciation for the beauty of... Well, we all have an appreciation for life. I need to love life and the manifestation of life, and I think that, that aspect of the manifestation that is the same thing as the mother aspect of God. Robert, but where does it come from? I recently read a story of Ramakrishna and how his teacher brought him into Samadhi. Robert, yes. And Ramakrishna could not experience it because he was too attached to the mother. His love for worshipping the mother, I forget what his teacher did, but I think he picked up a piece of glass and pressed it between his forehead. Robert, he pressed Krishna between his eyes. Pressed Krishna between his eyebrows. S.J. Yeah, and to bring him into. Robert, oneness right. One-pointedness and so I can see how we can be too attached to the beauty of nature. Robert, well look at it like this. But also later Ramakrishna's teacher began to realize that Shakti was simply the same thing. That in appreciating the beauty of a tree, you're also appreciating the non-existence of the tree too or God, and that it's the same thing. That we can worship God in mindlessness, or one-pointedness in asking, who am I? Also when one sees God in manifestation are we not, is it not the same state? Robert, it depends what state of consciousness you're speaking from. As long you are aware that all things are of your mind, that you're creating the universe out of your own mind, then you can worship whatever you like. But, Look at it this way again, I appreciate a flower, so I take the flower into my room and worship the flower, and in two days it's dead, so what have I accomplished? I have become disappointed, discouraged. Though it is with life, we worship somebody, we worship something and everything changes and now we become disappointed, but like you said before, if we worship those things as the self, that's a different story. SD if you see that all is one that's a different story. Robert, that's different. SK, you can say also that the manifestations are really not out there either? Robert, true. SJ, is that what Ramakrishna did? Robert, um. See that's why in the beginning stage, you learn to shy away from everything, because you realize that everything is duality. It's transitory, it comes and goes. But then the realized sage, you begin to love everything again because it's all part of the self. You just see it differently. SD, so is appreciation of nature is the appreciation of the self, right? Robert, exactly. 
You are what you see. Robert, yes. S.J., I can see that there is also within duality light and the dark. God or Brahman also has the qualities of Shakti that perhaps by understanding the mother that there is life, there is death, there is constant change, maybe that's also an aspect of the father, constantly renewal. That God is not stagnant. He lies beyond concept. You can imagine life and death at the same time, constantly renewing and constantly dying at the same time. And that perhaps nature is, you know the aspect of the mountain lion consuming a deer, is simply the aspect of Brahman consuming himself. Robert, um. If you can see it like that then you're okay, that's good. S.J., I think that nature is simply a manifestation of the qualities of the Godhead and. This is true but from your talking you have a tendency to separate both of them. Again God is myself. Everything is the self. Though when you're talking about getting realized it's the self you're talking about. You're talking about yourself. S.J., right. Tiger consuming the deer is yourself. It's going on within you. S.J., right. But if you see it from that aspect, then you can go back into duality it doesn't matter. S.G., so at that point there is neither duality nor manifestation. Robert, that's right. There's just bliss. S.J., I see then in the ecosystem that aspect of nature which has had thousands of years to work out balance, and life is coexistent with life, and in that ecosystem, it functions like music does. It helps me to understand how I can balance my own life and helps me to see God. Robert, but you're still separating yourself. S.D., separating yourself from God. S.J., well right now I'm speaking as the ego as Arjuna now. Robert, look at it this way, it's like this. It's like you're having a dream, but you're aware that you're dreaming. You're awake in the dream and you know you're participating in the dream, but you know that you're dreaming and going to wake up. S.G., think of it as a lucid dream. It's the same thing. Except what we have a tendency to do is we get involved in the dream. We think the dream is real. We get involved and we have emotions and the dream becomes more powerful. Though we're giving power to the dream. Thus we suffer. That's why we suffer. But, if we're always aware it's a dream we can't suffer. It's impossible to suffer because you're aware that you're dreaming and the dream is going on and you're in it. S.J. The question came up about whether or not to change one's lifestyle. Not to change your lifestyle? S.J. Whether or not to. To make the decision to change something in one's life or to accept it. There's no standard answer because it is determined by the person or karma and everything else. Everybody's different. S.J. What I've been thinking about is what part does the so-called science of mind create a visualization, what part does that play in our lives as far as imagining something first so then you can manifest it? Robert, that's completely mind power. The mind. S.J., is it natural but? Is it natural for us to do that as human beings? We have to learn to do it also. Like going from grammar school to high school where we learn all about the mind. Now when we learn all about the mind we have to go higher and drop the mind completely and go beyond the mind. SD plus Richard wouldn't we create in our own reality as they're taught in those paths. Also all of that is predestined so whatever reality you create on a certain level would have happened anyway. You were predestined to create that in life. SJ are we not co-creators with that destiny or part of it? Robert no, we're not co-creators at all. There's only one creator, there's only one. There's not a co and you are that one. Everything else is mental. S.J., seeing the mind as a tool in the process of creativity. Robert, who sees? 
I know that I'm not the mind, but can I not learn how to use my mind naturally in the process of creativity? Robert, as long as you use the mind, you've got to suffer. They you use the mind to become a great musician, and you're going to play a concert in London, and the plane crashes, and you're dead. That's from the use of your mind. But if you go beyond that and you understand what the mind is and where it comes from, then you begin to realize that the only freedom you've got is to turn within and see the truth. Everything else is karmic. S G, that in itself is a path to the creative process, I suppose. One level of that, because we're watching something manifest, but you're watching yourself do it rather than to be immersed in it. S D. You're kind of knowing that you're not the doer, right? Yeah. Much less ego annoying you for it, and then it's like doing work. It's like doing anything else. You do it better because you're not there. You're there, but you're not there. Laughter, S D. It sounds paradoxical when you know that you are not the doer. You just do it. That sounds like a paradox, but it really works. Robert, see, you can create the whole world with your mind. The mind is very powerful, but you've got to watch out what you create. S. G. Frankenstein. Laughter. S. C. We're creating monsters. Laughter. Robert, what you should rather do is to ask yourself, to whom comes this mind? Where did the mind come from? Find out. You got the power. Where did it come from? Where does all the power in this mind come from? Ask yourself, S J. Where this thinking has led me is that there is that aspect of mind, a subconscious or world mind or universal mind that's able to see what I need in my life better than me, and so the words seeking the kingdom makes sense. To me, it makes sense that that is part of creativity. That in seeking the kingdom, what I manifest in it will I also create in it as part of my reality. And if that's the case, then There's no need to think or create anything other than that, because universal mind knows what we need in order to live a balanced life. Robert, how does it know? Where did it get its knowledge? Where did the knowledge come to? S J, the self. Exactly. So you've been giving it power all the time. You thought it was outside of yourself because all the time you're coming from there. Take back the power. Do not think anything has power outside of yourself. S J. If I see that the world is also the self, I can understand that. But the illusion is also the self, isn't it? There is nothing other than the self. But what self are you talking about? S J. Brahman. If you're talking from the standpoint of para Brahman, then everything becomes love, compassion, joy, and bliss. S D the self with a capital S. That's the one. Robert, in other words, you treat your enemies and your loved ones alike. You look at an animal and a human being, and they're both the same thing. You stop differentiating. You don't do it consciously; it just happens that way. So the closer you get to self-realization, the more unity unveils itself. You like become one with every living thing. There's no difference. S D and everything that you're doing is the self. Yes. S D, you're one with all things. With all things. S C, tape unclear. Robert, it depends who's talking. But there's no one talking. Robert, that's why silence is the greatest teacher. When Narada came over to my house the other day with joy, some other people were there. There was a big conversation going on. What was I doing? S N, sitting in silence. I just sat there. S N, I learned a lot from that. It blew my mind. I saw that. Though I'm not too good of a conversationalist. Laughter. S N. I saw it. It was very blatant because he was sitting in a chair and he was hiding in the middle of the room, and I was like, nothing will happen except the meeting is going to blow up, and it was something. 
hang out with Robert a little bit more next week because you'd see. Like I was saying about meditation earlier, it's like self-realization, there's no self, there's nothing to realize, so when you sit and meditate there is no you, there's no. It's just sitting there and everything is perfect as it is. And when I saw Robert sitting there it's like I visualized, I saw what I knew. You know it'd be perfect if he could just come here and sit here in silence. Robert, so don't invite me to your party. Laughter. No, remember also, I didn't consciously say, I'm going to sit here and say nothing. There was just nothing to say. In other words, don't put it on. Don't imagine you're like that. I remember one time when I was in Fallsburg, New York. Muktananda invited me over to see him when Muktananda was alive. Though he was having all the shakti going on, and everybody was jumping up and down and doing all kinds of things. Laughter and screaming and going crazy. Though I was really amused. He went to all the monitors, he said, throw this guy out, throw that guy out, throw this guy out, because they're all putting it on, they're all playing games. They imagine all kinds of things are happening to them and spirits are there and all kinds of nonsense. Though the point is, be yourself. Don't put anything on, do not imagine you're somebody else, just be yourself. See, you told me that on the phone, that there are two ways, another was to be myself during the day and be as natural as possible. Robert, and what about at night? Pardon me? Robert, what about at night? What about at night? Same thing, same thing, Robert, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. SD, are you saying be yourself or be the self? Robert, same thing. When you just think. SC, don't separate it. Don't separate I am myself. Does that alone make something happen? SC, is it the same as saying don't make this self any different? SD, from that self. From everything else? Robert, that's right. In the beginning stages you try to separate yourself from your body. You say I'm not the body. Then, I must be something else, so that's duality. But, as you advance you realize there's no body. There never was a body, there's only the self and I am that. SD, which is the fourth principle right? Yes right. In other words what you believe is your body is the self but you think it's the body. SD, because everything is the self. Door. You're not limited to a body. SJ, is it possible to experience the self through focusing on, say, a waterfall, or a tree, or something outside of our own body presence? Robert, it can give you a good feeling, give you a very high feeling, but there has to be an experiencer to experience. Yet no experiencer exists. So as long as you're the experiencer, you'll be experiencing all kinds of phenomenon. When you transcend the experiencer, then you are the waterfall or the mountain or whatever. There's no difference. SJ, it's the same obstacle though, isn't it? The obstacle that's in the way of realizing the self within the body is the same as realizing the self in the waterfall. Robert, yes, you are the obstacle exactly. SC, did you say you are the obstacle? Yes, you are the obstacle. SC, you mean the mind? The mind, yes. SJ, if the self is in a tree as well as inside us, then should it not be possible to be in touch with the self by meditating on the tree rather than on my own chakras? Ask who the tree is. Robert laughs. Robert, that's separation. SG, a good analogy would be, instead of trying to look at the tree, look at everything as one big eye. That we're all one, that this is an eye that sees, but this is all an eye. There's nothing to look at. An eye that just exists by itself, which is the same as I. There's nothing to look at. You're the eye and that's the eye. 
You're not looking at anything because then you're looking at something and saying that's not. SJ, then you'd be imagining an eye rather than. No, you don't imagine the eye because everything is the eye. You aren't imagining an eye, you are it, you are already eye, and that's the eye, and it's not looking. The water falls the eye and that that looks at the waterfall is the eye. Robert, when the average person looks on a tree, they don't really see the tree. They have a concept of a tree. SC, Robert I have an experience that feels like everything is myself, and then sometimes it turns around and it feels like I'm not there, it's so obvious from that experience. Kind of experience from this point of view when I'm in that it's like there's obviously nobody there, it's just things that seem to, it's hard to explain it. Robert, I know what you mean. And later I say I experience that, but at the time there's no one there to experience that, that's what it feels like. SD, do you feel anything? SC, I don't feel anything. I don't feel like I'm even here. Seeing that it's only an experience, no it's not an experience right now I'm saying experience, it feels like there's no one there, there's no one anywhere and everything is. SD, just being this right? Robert, well my question to you is, are you happy? During these experiences? C, am I happy during the experience? It feels very. I can almost say happy, it's a transcendence kind of happiness though there's a. Robert, if you have a semblance of reality, it's untold happiness, extreme happiness. So it's a mental condition. You're either the self or you're not. There are no gradual stages. Everything else is mental. Take break as Robert continues and finishes up satsang. Robert, shanty shanty peace peace. Did you get your answer to your last question? When I said so what who cares? ST, yes. Remember that your problem has no substance. It's like a shock if it appears, so what? There is no basis for the problem. They're just disturbances in you. Get it out of your mind. It's not good. Though it's been nice being with you. Remember to love yourself, to worship yourself, to bow to yourself, to pray to yourself, because God dwells in you as you peace. Tape ends. Transcript 6. The Three Vehicles of Self-Realization 26 August 1990 Robert, good evening. It's good to see you again, whoever is here again. Please do not be shocked at some of the things I may say. I am not a teacher, nor am I a lecturer, nor am I a minister. I am merely a looking glass so that you can see your own reflection. What you think of yourself you see in me. I may say certain things you're not used to. Bear with me. You should not accept anything I say nor should you believe anything I say until you're able to prove it to yourself. I simply give my confession that I am not the body, nor the mind, nor the phenomenal world, that I am pure intelligence, absolute reality, sat chit ananda, divine mind, unborn emptiness. When I use the words I am, I am not referring to Robert. I am referring to I am that I am, omnipresence the infinite. I get lots of phone calls from people asking me all kinds of questions. One question that most people keep asking again and again is, what can I do to resolve my problems? Can you give me an affirmation, a mantra, a meditation, a breathing exercise, something I can use? These things have their place, but they will not awaken you to your true self. In all of the higher scriptures, it is written that the path of Advaita Vedanta or Janamarga is only for mature souls. Now what does that mean? It is for those who in a previous lifetime have already practiced sadhanas, breathing exercises, yoga techniques, etc., and now they're ready to awaken through this type of teaching. And the Buddhist scripture declares that those who want to do yogas, 
or breathing exercises are the simple-minded and ignorant, he chuckles. Now what do they mean? They don't mean to insult you, but they are referring to those who are attached to the world, those who believe the world is real and who feel the pull of the world. They want to use all kinds of gimmicks to free themselves from their problems, but not to be totally free. Now what does Janamarga teach? We teach simply this, not to accept anything unless you can demonstrate it. Not to believe anything unless you can use it for yourself and you can see it's true. To do affirmations, mantras, yoga exercises and so forth will not awaken you. You start from the beginning. You simply admit to yourself that you exist. This is the truth. You do exist, don't you? Though you say to yourself, I exist. I know that for sure. I exist. I exist. That's all I know. I'm ignorant of everything else, but I do know that I exist because here I am. And as you keep saying this to yourself, I exist, you begin to put more space between I and exist. I exist. Say that to yourselves, I exist, I exist. If you're doing this correctly you'll soon find that I and exist are two separate words. In other words you'll come to the conclusion that you exist as I. You'll have to ask yourself ponder, who is this I that exists? What is I? You never answer. It will come to you of its own accord. When you sleep and you awaken you say, I slept. When you dream you say, I had a dream. And when you're awake of course you say, I am awake. But that I is always there. You start to inquire within yourself, what is this I that exists at all times? It exists when I'm asleep, when I'm awake, when I dream. Who is this I? And now the inquiry starts. Where does this I come from? From whence cometh the I? You ask yourself. The answers are within yourself. And you keep asking yourself over and over and over again, from whence cometh the I? Where does the I come from? Or who am I? And you wait a little while, and you repeat the same question, where does the I come from? While you're doing that you follow the I deep deep within. You keep following the I. You go deeper and deeper into the I. Where does this I come from? Who is this I? Whatever answer comes to you is the wrong answer. Do not accept it but do not deny it. You simply put it aside. And you continue with the self-inquiry. Who am I? And you wait. And you ask again, who am I? Is not a mantra. Where did the I come from? How did it get there? Who gave it birth? What is the source of the I? You continue to abide in the I. As you continue this process someday something will happen. Some people it comes like an explosion within, where all your thoughts are wiped away. Where you see, I is the first pronoun, and every thought that you have in the world is attached to the I. It is secondary. Think about that. Whatever you have to say about yourself has I in it. Everything in the world is about yourself. I am going to the movies. I am going bowling. I feel like crying. I feel terrible. I feel wonderful. I feel sick. I feel well. There's always an I I I. What is this I and what is it all about? Everything is attached to the I. Subsequently, when the I is wiped out, everything else is wiped out and the troubles are over. All thoughts go with the I. Now there's no answer to who am I. When you get to the answer there will be emptiness, a void. You will be of the unborn. But, it is not a void like you think. It is not emptiness like you think. For want of a better word you can call it godliness, nirvana, satchit ananda, bliss consciousness, absolute reality. It doesn't matter what name you give it. You will become that, and there will be no explanation. 
You will just become that and you will feel a profound peace that you have never felt before. You will feel a bliss that is unqualified. You will try to explain it to yourself and to your friends, but you cannot for the finite cannot comprehend the infinite. There are no words. That's the method you use self-inquiry. You follow the I thought to its source. How long does it take? It depends on yourself. How sincere you are, what else you're doing with your life. If you're using this like you do everything else. For instance, if you say, well today I'm going to practice the I thought, then I'm going to go to a movie, then I'm going to go bowling, then I'm going to watch TV, then tomorrow I'll do the same thing. Of course what's going to happen in a case like that? Very little, but if you put your energy into it, and you practice it every chance you get, and you put this first in your life, you will see amazing results, amazing results. But, you have to put it first in your life. Think right now, what is first in your life? Don't tell me but just think. What comes first in your life? Can you take it with you when you die? Don't you see by now that you live in a world of constant change? That the only thing permanent in life is change? All facts change. Only truth is real, and truth is non-personal. You have to find it for yourself. For the sincere devotee or student, they will put this first in their life, and then you will start seeing results. But, if you're still worrying and fearing something, and you think other duties come first, then you've got to work on yourself. That's why with great compassion, I give you certain things you can do before you get into self-realization. Just before you become self-realized, you begin to feel certain things. And those are the four principles I gave you last week. That comes to you automatically. But as I mentioned last Sunday and Thursday, you have to upon awakening, become aware of these principles. You cannot think of them at your leisure. But, you sort of have to coax the mind. You have to coax your mind to think upon the four principles as soon as you open your eyes in the morning. Though so you have two things to do. When you open your eyes you can either ask yourself, where did the I come from? Who am I that slipped last night? Who am I that has just awakened? Who am I that exists now? Or you can think about the four principles. Whatever is convenient for you. But by all means, if you want self-realization, and you want to become free, and you want to be free from the ocean of samsara worldliness, and become blissful, then it's up to you. I can share these things with you but I can't make you do it. It's just like I can bring you to the gold mine but you've got to do your own digging. What comes first in your life again? Whatever comes first in your life that's what you become. In the end you're going to have to leave your body, your thoughts, your possessions, your loved ones. Everything is going to be left in the end. Though the wise person searches for truth now, and tries to become free now. So let's briefly go over the four principles again, for I feel they're very important. Another thing I do is this, most ministers, teachers, whatever philosophers, they always search for new knowledge. They research, 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 and then they share with their congregations or students something profound, something new every Sunday. And of course, you always forget the previous Sunday, and you go into new words. The game of words. You may learn about the astral planes, the causal planes, reincarnation. You may learn about how to become positive in your life, how to attract the right mate, how to attract money, health, and all kinds of stuff. How to channel, how to do this, and it's very exciting to the ego. What we do here is we try for you to remove your ego, so you do not get caught up in the world. That's the only way to become happy, truly happy and self-realized. This is why I reiterate and repeat again and again, the same principle. Though it can soak deep into your subconscious mind, and you can become a living embodiment of this truth. Now, what are the four principles? Who can tell me? Who remembers? What's the first one? S. 
everything emanates from the mind. Robert, that's right but you had to think. It should be like second nature to you. When it's second nature to you, then you're going to find true happiness in your life and reach your goals. But, when you have to think about it first, it means your mind's impressed with something else. You've got other thoughts that you're thinking about most of the time. The first principle again, is that everything, and I mean everything, the universe, the world, your body, your fears, your problems, your happiness, everything that you can think about, everything that your senses behold, is a manifestation of your mind. It's a mind quality. When you close your eyes it goes away. When you sleep you transcend it. But, when you are awake the world exists. The world only exists because your mind exists, and your mind exists because your ego exists. Therefore when you begin to work on yourself, and you begin to realize that everything comes from your mind, you stop fearing, and you stop worrying, for you realize it's of the mind. And as you begin to change your mind, transcend your mind, annihilate your mind, bliss, happiness, peace, love, joy, truth, comes all by itself. It is the mind that is your enemy. What is your mind? It is a conglomeration of thoughts about the past and the future. You worry about the past and you worry about the future. That's all your mind is. It is not your friend therefore, ignore your mind. Do not believe what it says. Simply watch it, behold it, become the witness to it. But, just to realize that everything is an emanation of your mind, that alone sets you free. And you have to practice self-inquiry, by realizing everything comes out of your mind asking yourself, what is my mind? Where did it come from? And you will realize that I is the mind, I is also the mind. Because you say I think, don't you see? I think, and the mind is thoughts. So we get back to the... I again. We always come back to the I. Subsequently again, if you want to remove your mind you remove the I. You ask yourself again if the mind is I then where did I come from? What is the source of this I? Who am I? You always get back to the I. Everything leads to the same thing doesn't it? All the processes we use lead to the same thing to I. The first principle. The whole universe is a projection of my mind. Then you say my mind. Who is my? I'm referring to my mind. And then again you tell yourself I am referring. I'm back to I again. I am referring to my mind. Again you go back to where did this I come from? Who created it? What is its source? Who gave it birth? And you keep questioning this way again and again and again. And as I said before with most people, one day, there will be like an explosion, and the eye will blow itself to pieces. And you'll see light, tremendous light. You'll become light. The light of a thousand suns, but that's not the answer. You have to go through the light into emptiness, into nirvana into absolute reality, which is called Parabrahman nothingness. That nothingness becomes everything. Now you go back to the second principle. Who remembers that? S. The self is beginningless, without beginning? Robert, not quite, you're on the right track, but not quite. Any more volunteers? S. There is no birth, no existence, no death. Robert, you're on the right track. As I am not born. I do not persist, I do not die. Robert, yes. See, if you remember these things it will carry you across the ocean of samsara, into the land of the self-realization of noble wisdom. But, you have to think of these things all the time. The second principle is this. You are unborn, you do not persist, and you do not disappear. In other words, you were never born, the life that you're experiencing does not exist, and you do not die. You have always been. What I am saying is, there is no cause for anything. 
What is its cause? Of course the Bible will tell you Adam and Eve. That's a nice story if you like stories. But if you're talking about reality it just began out of nothing. What came first, the seed or the tree, the chicken or the egg? You can say to me, I was born my mother and father gave me birth. Well, go all the way back. Who was the first mother and father, just like what came first, the tree or the seed? Perplexing. This way to explain it is, take a look at your dreams. How do you create a dream? Does it start with a beginning? As soon as you start dreaming there's no creation. The dream just starts. Everything is already there. The trees, the sky, the earth, the flowers, the grass, people, insects, birds, flowers, everything just appears. Does it die in the end? You just wake up and it's all gone. What we're doing now is living the mortal dream. We believe in our bodies, in our existence as it were. We believe the world is real, the mind is real, our experiences are real, and we get involved in them like we get involved in a movie. You know you're not the movie. You watch the movie it ends and you go home. The more you get involved in the world situations and in yourself, the small self, your body-mind phenomena, the more you get pulled into ignorance. You have to loosen yourself from this maya and thinking about every day that you are unborn, you have no personal life, and you do not exist, and you will not disappear. Just thinking about these things does something to you. You begin to feel different. You begin to feel alive but not as a body as omnipresence. You begin to understand what Moses said when he said, I am that I am. You begin to feel free untarnished. Your past is dissolved because it never existed to begin with. You have no past. There's no cause. It's all a manifestation of your mind. As you think about this, you become totally free. Now, what's the third principle? S. Everything is egoless. Robert, yes. The third principle is the egolessness of all things. You have to have a deep realization and a deep feeling that no thing has an ego. No thing has a cause again. There's no reason for anything to be. No thing really exists. You are not a sinner. You are not an evil person. Your past is dead, forget it. You're born again now and all is glory and joy. This is what it means to be born again, to realize that you exist now in this moment. Not a moment ago, and never mind what's going to happen a moment from now, but you exist in this moment as pure intelligence, unqualified love, absolute reality, unconditioned oneness, that's you. You live in that reality. And again that sets you free. Now, what's the fourth principle? As long as you don't remember them I'm going to repeat them every week until you get sick. S. Netty Netty. Robert, yes but what is the principle? S. The realization or knowing the truth through the discarding of the non-truth. Robert, yes. Fourth principle is, to have a feeling, a deep feeling, a realization, of what self-realization of noble wisdom really means. And of course, you can't explain it, so you negate it. In other words you think of what it isn't. Self-realization is not the world, it's not the universe, it's not my body, it's not anything I can think about. It's not my mind. Then, what is self-realization? Whatever answer comes to you is wrong, for it has no answer. There are no words that can describe it. Forget about your intelligence. Human intelligence sucks, it doesn't exist. Why? Because it dies with you. We're talking about something that's eternal, that has always been, and will always be. You have to become aware of these principles. I give you these things with great compassion, that you have something to do every day besides watching TV or reading comic books. Think but not intellectually. 
Let's play some music. Music played. Robert, because of Richard and Jim who are going back to Santa Cruz, I'll cover something else which just came to me. After you learn the four principles, and they become a living embodiment within yourself, then you learn about the three vehicles which carry you over the ocean of samsara into the land of self-realization of noble wisdom. That's why they're called vehicles. But, you can only feel these vehicles when you've mastered the previous. The first vehicle is this, you have a deep feeling, now remember, this is before self-realization, afterwards it doesn't matter what you do, you have a deep longing, a deep feeling, to be by yourself. Now in the West they tell you this is antisocial behavior, but you have a feeling, in other words you don't mentally say to yourself, I want to be alone, like Greta Garbo. Not a mental game you're playing. Because of your inquiry, and your feeling and knowing the four principles, you have a feeling to be by yourself, so you are not pulled down by the world to give you an opportunity to make the four principles and self-inquiry work for you. Though you enjoy being alone, you want to be by yourself. You look for times that you can be by yourself so you can work on yourself, and that becomes a total joy for you. It's like total heaven to be by yourself, not all the time, but most of the time. It's only when you're by yourself that you can argue with yourself, and you can tell off your mind, and you can scream a little if you like, and do whatever you have to do to get rid of the ego and the mind. That's the first vehicle. The second vehicle is, you have a deep feeling, a deep desire to always be at satsang. Now satsang is not just a spiritual meeting, as most of you know. It's not a gathering of people when they hear a lecture. Who can explain what satsang is? How about Inarada? What is satsang to you? S. Well, ultimately I suppose it can't really be put into words, so to realize that I understand what the essence of satsang is, that it can't be put into words. Satsang is like the embodiment of the teaching. Though I think that there's a growth in satsang that takes place, a growth that does not take place in the words. Robert, okay. That's a good explanation. Anybody else like to say what satsang is? S. Abiding in the self. Yes, exactly. Being together with people who abide in the self, the realization that there is one self and you are that. So being in satsang is being at the feet of God. That's what it literally means, sitting at the feet of God. And God is none other than yourself. Do so you want to be with yourself when you come together with us? And you're still alone. You're still by yourself because all the people with you are yourself. S. Doesn't it usually involve the presence of a sage? Robert. Yes, but remember the sage, the guru and God are yourself. It's all the same. What I mean by that is I don't want you to look at me as being a sage or being anything at all. When you see me, as I mentioned in the beginning, I am a mirror. You see yourself. And when you see yourself as divinity, you will also see everyone else here as divinity. We're all one. There's no difference. The third vehicle is, you will have a deep feeling and a deep desire to be around people like yourself. In other words, your old relatives, your old friends, your old cronies that you used to drink with and get high with, or whatever you did with them, they don't turn you on anymore. You want to be with spiritual people like yourself. You're not putting it on. You're not intellectualizing it. You're not imagining that you want to do that because I told you to. From your practice you become like that. It's an inner feeling, a deep inner feeling. Those are the three vehicles. Now again, because Richard and Jim are leaving I brought along a couple of lessons. Once in a while I give out lessons I wrote years ago. Robert, okay now we're going to have some press shot and then we'll have questions and answers. S, I have a question for you about meditation. You said sit and do nothing. My question is when I do that thought stop, but the world appears. 
By doing nothing do you mean no world appearing? Robert, let the world appear but do not react to it. Let whatever appears appear, but just do not give any response. S. Should you sit with your eyes closed or open or does it make any difference? It doesn't make any difference. S. Plus, if you were to try to make the world appear or disappear you would be doing something. Suppose if you could do nothing. S. You'd be realized. S. You'd be there. S. That's why it's so direct. Robert, of course the proper action to take when the world appears is to ask, to whom does the world appear? But if that doesn't work for you just do nothing at all. S. I've also tried in doing that, I've tried the principles you gave. They if I'm thinking of someone, what I've noticed is if everything is egoless, that seems to do away a lot with any kind of judgment I had about others or about myself. Robert, exactly, sure that's what it does. S. It does away with it. Just like snaps his fingers that. It's really nice. That's what it's supposed to do. S. In an everyday situation, it seems like it pays to use that too. Of course. And the more you think of that the deeper the feeling goes, and the greater the experience. S. I wasn't really thinking about it. I just thought maybe to use it as the situation arises. You can do that. Whatever helps. S. Well how do you handle this? Let's say you're opposing a strong negative force, a very destructive force, people who embody that force. You have to confront it and work against it, knowing that there is no ego in the force. Robert, no, you don't do that at all. You simply ask yourself to whom does this force come? S. You don't confront it. No, you don't avoid it or confront it. S. All right, what if we were in danger of losing our lives right now? What would we do? Whatever you have to do. S. What? Your body knows what to do. S. That would be confronting it then. But you have nothing to do with it. Your body will do what it has to do. But, it has nothing to do with you. S. You mean you'll run or you'll fight? S. It's more spontaneous than the thinking? Robert. Yes, everything will happen spontaneously. Your body knows what to do. There is a power that takes care of your body. It will know what to do. S. All right, what if it's more abstract though? Now I used an example of something immediate. Let's say the current situation in the Near East, that you're going to be called up or something. And that also is a very destructive and terrible force. How would our bodies react to that? Robert, leave that to God. God knows how to take care of the universe. Focus on yourself. Ask yourself, to whom do these feelings come? S. But what if it comes right down to it? What if a telegraph or telephone call comes? Then you do what you have to do. Your body will know what to do. You will take care of yourself. If you're a major in the Air Force you fly a plane. You go wherever you have to go. S. All the while asking or reminding yourself to whom it comes. As long as you're aware that it has nothing to do with you. You are not your body. You are not your mind. You are not the situation. You are free from it. S. Isn't it like watching yourself as if you were a character in a play? Robert. Yes. Or watching yourself on a film. You know if you've ever had that experience. Well you know it's you but you're not. S. Okay, but it's still confusing to me. Let's say to follow this little possibility, I can go away and fly the plane and so forth, and I can say that's not really me doing it, or I can stay home and say I don't want to be part of that destruction, and that's also not me doing it. Robert, no both are wrong. If you have to say, it's not me doing it, then it is you doing it. You don't say, it's not me doing it. 
You ask the question, to whom does it come? There's a difference. It keeps them out of it completely. S. It's more obvious than that. It's more obvious that it's not you doing it, that it is you doing it. D. When you say, it's not me doing it, you believe that you are the one, you are the body. S. All right, let's strike that part of it from the record. Still it seems to me a choice must be made. Choice will be made. But, you have nothing to do with it. S. That's very difficult, very, very difficult. S. Will you be guided? Robert, something will take care of you. When you came to this earth, everything was predestined. Something is aware of how to take care of you and what you're going to go through. But, it has nothing to do with you. The secret is not to react. Just do what has to be done. And you will do what has to be done. You can't help it. If you're meant to go to fight, no matter how you try to stop yourself, you couldn't. You'll go to fight. If you were meant to be a pacifist, you couldn't fight if you wanted to. If he gave you a million dollars, you couldn't do it because you're predestined. It's your karma. S. So you're saying if you face a decision, that's already been predestined also? Yes. Everything will work out. The secret is not to identify with your body or your mind. And then if you're doing it correctly things will change on the outside too. S. I can accept it theoretically. It's the same teaching, the same response the rabbis had the wise Jews at the time of the Holocaust. Get into the cattle car, off you go to Auschwitz, and the rabbis say, well you know it's God's will. What difference does it make? It doesn't matter. And now that we've lived through the Holocaust, now we think maybe they should have said something. Robert, there's a difference. You're right. There's a difference in knowing the truth and just letting yourself be walked on. This does not mean you become a rug for somebody to step on you. You become a doormat for no one. You are abiding in the self. When you abide in the self, everything will be okay. You're not a coward. You're not running from anything. You're abiding in the self. When you abide in the self, if you have to pick up a sword and fight, you will. If you have to run, you will. But, you will do what you have to do. But, it has nothing to do with you. It's different than you think. It's not like you think. S. I can theoretically, it all makes sense. In actual practice is where I get confused. If it made sense, it wouldn't be the truth. S. What kind of answer can one expect when you ask who is it for? Robert, no answer. So therefore the action would be non-personal. Robert, exactly. If there's an answer, it's the wrong answer. See, all these years we've been dealing with a finite mind, with our own intellectual processes, with our preconceived ideas, with our concepts. But I'm saying we have to transcend those and use a new part of us that we've never used before and that's the self. So when you abide in the self, everything will be okay. Everything will work out. It has nothing to do with being passive or being violent or anything else. It's a completely new ball game. You're on God's team and you're well taken care of, but it's different. There are no words to explain it. S. You have to now go inside to understand it. Yes, you have a deep understanding and a deep knowledge that all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. S. Robert, then it is imperative that we do have a guide or a master, isn't it? People can't just do this on their own. Robert, it depends, very few can. But, the majority cannot. S. Did Ramana have a guru? No. But he's one in a billion. S. So what you're also saying then, is in predestination the soul chooses to be born in a particular time or to a particular life in order to continue with its existence. That's part of the appearance. And if you believe in your body, 
and you believe in your mind, then karma is real and predestination is real. But, if you abide in the self everything else becomes redundant. S because of your four principles that we. Robert, yes. And if you become realized you can get off the karmic wheel. S, but in the meantime on this earthly plane or this particular plane, one way of describing it is predestination. The answer is there, but if you look at it as a continuum, it's part of the four principles. Nothing appears in the beginning, no end Robert, yes exactly. To put it in an easier point of view so you can understand it, if you believe in your body again, if you believe in your mind, if you believe that you are a body, then everything else exists karma, God, creation, everything exists. But, when the realization comes to you that I am not the body, and I am not the mind, everything disappears. Like the four principles. So that's why the secret is to practice abiding in the self. Then everything else will happen by itself. You don't try to get rid of your karma or get rid of negative situations, because that's like cutting off a tumor on one arm, and it grows back on the other arm. You go right to the source, the self. And then everything is resolved. End. Transcript 7. Working with the Four Principles of Self-Realization. 30th August, 1990. Robert, greetings and salutations. We can be real and formal. All I can do is tell you about my own personal experiences, not what I read. And I can tell you that nothing exists the way it appears. Everything is an appearance, and the trap is we get pulled into the appearance. We react to it. We feel hurt. We feel slandered. We feel as if something is wrong. We have emotions and they become negative because we are falling for a false premise and the false premise is that the world is real. In fact the world is not real and neither are you. What we have to do is stop reacting to anything. And the only way to do that is to discover who you are. When you discover your true nature, when you awaken to your true nature, everything becomes perfectly clear. You're at peace. If something works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You don't look at it that way. Your feelings have been transmuted. You no longer feel what human beings feel. You just have a great love for all things, a great compassion. And you know that the substratum of all existence is harmony, peace, emptiness, and you feel wonderful all the time. What can disturb you if you are at peace? If you found true peace, what can possibly disturb you? The world comes and goes. One day the world is like this, the next day it's like that. But what does it got to do with you? Nothing, you are free. You are not the world. You are not your body, you are not your mind. You are total freedom, total joy, total love. You have to awaken to this fact. It's the truth. Science is beginning to see this more and more. They're beginning to see that the only thing permanent in life is change. We speak many words, we take many actions, but to what avail? Does it matter in the end? We build our life, we own possessions, we father children, and what happens at the end? Poof! It's all gone. Everything just disappears, he laughs. There's nothing. So what's the purpose? People say I'm making this world a better world for my children. They're just dreaming. The world will never be better, it'll never be worse. The world just is a dream of existence, and it's like this one day, it's like that another day. But you are not the world. You have to awaken to that fact. You are not your thoughts. You are not your karmic expressions. You are not your inclinations from past lives. These things appear real as long as you believe in them. As an example, if you believe in the devil, the devil will appear to you because you are creating the devil yourself. 
If you believe in a god, the god will appear to you. As for instance, Ramakrishna believed in the god Kali. Kali used to become very real to him, and he used to dance and sing with Kali. He laughs, and this was true as far as he was concerned. But he created Kali. That's why nobody else was able to see her but him. And that's how we create our lives. Think of the things you fear in your life. That you fear becoming sick, you fear poverty, you fear getting divorced, you fear getting married. Whatever you fear is a concept created by your own mind. There is no question of should I get married or shouldn't I get married. It doesn't matter. What matters is how you react to it, how you see it, what you expect of it. This is true of every aspect of your life. That's what you've been trained to believe since you were a little kid. First started in kindergarten. Your teachers brainwashed you. Your family brainwashed you. The outside world brainwashed you. The system brainwashed you. And here you are. You are filled with ideas, concepts, notions, feelings, attitudes, and that makes you what you are. Miserable. Laughter. As soon as you wake up, all that disappears. Nothing can ever happen to you that is of a destructive nature. There is absolutely nothing that can ever destroy you. You cannot be destroyed. Your body may appear to vanish, but that's like a dream. You dream about yourself. You're doing something, and you get shot, and you disappear. But then you wake up. So my question to you is. What do you believe about yourself and about the world? What's most important to you? This is why I feel that a spiritual path, not necessarily this one, but a true spiritual path, should be the first thing of importance in your life. Why? Because it wakes you up. No matter how good of a life you live, you may become the richest and most famous person on earth. You will have to experience the other side of the same coin one day, and be the poorest, most miserable person on earth. That's the way it works. You may say to me, "My neighbor never has any problems. It's like he fell into a pot of gold. Everything he touches turns into money. He's as healthy as a horse. He's got a beautiful wife, a big house, everything he could possibly need, and look at me." I know that guy's life hasn't changed in forty years. You're making the wrong conclusion. He has earned this karmically, and if he doesn't pull away from it, he might spend his whole life in goodness, human goodness. But then he will be drawn back again by the law of karma, which is in his mind, and he doesn't know it. And this time, he will be a homeless person. And whatever he does, he won't be able to make a dime. He'll try his best, but he'll always be poverty-stricken. He won't be able to earn a dime, no matter how hard he tries. This is why we should never judge. You have no idea what your neighbor is going through. Never say he or she has a wonderful life, and look at mine. Why am I poor? Why am I sick? Why am I this way? Why am I that way? The idea is to wake up. Not to look at yourself, not to feel sorry for yourself, not to compare yourself with others, but to awaken. When you awaken, something happens that is unexplainable. There are no human words to explain. When you awaken, you just understand. Not even understand. You know. You feel. And those words are inadequate. You become divine harmony. You are no longer fooled by person, place, and thing. You no longer react. As an example, someone tells you, "Oh, you won the lotto. You won fifty billion dollars. It's okay. You do not become a slave to that." Someone tells you, "You lost fifty billion dollars. Same thing. Same reaction. You do not become a slave to that. What happens in the human life does not matter. When you know who you are, you do not say it doesn't matter. You simply exist." You exist as yourself. You're at peace. No one can ever take the peace away from you, no matter how hard they try. You're not fooled by things. Rather, what you do is you give of yourself. You can give yourself because you become the living self. 
Therefore you can give yourself away, and you're still there, for you've become the infinite self, the Divine Mother, Omnipresence, total oneness with all things. Though you can give of yourself, and yet you're always there. When Ramana Maharshi was being robbed by robbers his devotees wanted to attack the robbers, and he said no no no. It's our dharma to be what we are and it's their dharma to be what they are. We should not interfere in their dharma. Therefore give them what they want and that's very profound. We are spiritual people. The world is not. Therefore, we act in accordance with spiritual principles. What this really means is we as human beings, become last not first. That's what Jesus meant when he said, those who go first will be last and those who are last will be first. You have to develop a great humility. Do not long for anything. Do not long to be famous or rich or great. And do not say I want to be poor and have nothing either, they're both wrong. Just be yourself. When you are yourself you will be amazed how the universe takes care of you. It's like the body with vitamins and medicines. Your body, you know, is a natural healing factory. It really knows how to heal itself. But, when we start taking too many vitamins and not enough sugar he laughs, when we start taking medicines too much, the body says, well, you have made that into your God, so now you've got to depend on it. And then you have to keep gulping vitamins for the rest of your life or you get sick. Really think about that. SD or you become a crazy addict. Robert or a crazy addict doesn't matter. Laughter. But think about those things. You've got to depend upon yourself to take care of everything. Now yourself is yourself. There's one self so we take care of each other. But you don't think of that. When you think of others you're making a mistake. The feeling will come to you one day that you are all others. There are no others, there is just the self appearing as others. So how do you treat others? As you treat yourself, you don't think about it. You do not say that person is worthy and that person is not, so I'm going to help this person, not that person. You give of yourself automatically. You do not think about it because everything is yourself, and that includes the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, and everything else you don't understand. It's all part of the one. What you do to the one you do to everything. How you treat one person, that's how you treat the whole universe, because everything is one. Now these four principles I gave you back to the four principles, have to do with all these things. You're supposed to ponder these things. How do you work with these principles? First, who can tell me what they are? Go ahead. A student recalls them. Robert, now you said them correctly in a way, but it's like you're reciting a lecture. SD, that's because we're just learning them. Robert, but it's the way you say it to yourself. As soon as you open your eyes in the morning, I'll speak in the first person. You have to say to yourself, I feel and realize and understand that everything, everything, say everything twice, is a projection of my mind. Think about what that means, forget about the other three. Work on that. Everything. Everything. I feel that I realize that I understand that, that everything is a projection of my mind. And then you may think of the problems you have if you have any, and you say to yourself, if everything is a projection of my mind, where do these problems come from? Where do they begin? You then realize why they came from me. I projected them. I created them. And then you say, who is this I that created them? See? Now you're getting to the meaty part, to the substance. Who is the I that created all this delusion in my life? Where did the I come from? Who gave it birth? My mind, where did my mind come from? The I. Why, they're both the same. The I and my mind are the same, and that's a whole new revelation. 
you think along these lines. Where does the mind I come from, and to whom does it come? And you follow it deep deep within yourself. If you do it correctly you will realize there is no I, there is no mind, so there are no problems and it'll be over, and you'll start laughing. You'll actually start laughing at yourself. You'll say to think I feared this and I feared that. And once you get into that consciousness something will happen to actually physically relieve you of the problem, or what you think is a problem. As long as you believe in your mind that there's a problem, whether it's little or big doesn't matter, they're both the same, but as long as you believe you've got a problem, you'll have a problem and it'll grow, and you can't change it. It may appear that you change it, but it turns into something else of a worse nature when you try to work with the problem itself. Never try to work with the problem, but ask where the problem came from. How did I get it? How did I get this birth? Where did it come from? That's a problem, the birth's the problem because you believe you were born you have the problem, and you can go on and on and on. That's how you work with the principle. Everything. I feel and understand that everything is a projection, a manifestation of my mind. Whose mind? My mind. Who is my? I am I? I am I. Who am I? Who am I who has this problem? And as you ask yourself this question, you will begin to feel better and better and better. You will actually begin to feel better, and as you feel better the problem becomes less and less important, and it will vanish. This is great psychotherapy. It works. Psychiatrists gave this to patients they wouldn't have to give them any drugs. Though you understand, you feel that everything is an emanation of your mind or it wouldn't exist. All existence, from the smallest atom to the greatest cosmic galaxy, it all comes out of your mind. But even if I tell you this you still feel that something is real, don't you? You feel that something is real. You may say the sun is real. You may say well, God is real. You may say an atom is real, but you do not comprehend that you are creating these things. They're all a project of your mind. If you didn't have a mind, you would not have these concepts. That's why we are told to annihilate the mind, to kill the mind, no mind, no concepts. All these ideas come as you begin to realize that everything is a projection of your mind. SD, can you say the self is real, or is real a term that doesn't exist? Robert, well if you say the self is real you don't really mean it. If you meant it you wouldn't have to say it, but you can say it when you are training yourself, because it makes you feel better. It helps you live. It's better than saying that my world is real or my problem is real. It's better to say the self is real than to say that. SD, but better would it be. Robert, to keep silent. SD, that nothing is real. Don't even say that, say nothing. When you ask yourself the question, where does the mind come from? Or where do my problems come from? And you keep still, that's real. The emptiness is real. SD, isn't the emptiness the same as the self? Yes, but when you speak you spoil it to an extent. SD, that's right because the self doesn't know anything. When you say the self is real, it becomes personal. When there's silence it becomes omnipresent. Silence is always the best policy after you say all those things to yourself. And it's in the silence that your problems just dissolve. Try it, it really works. When you keep still after saying all these things, your problems will dissolve by themselves. Do not think I am getting rid of my problems, because that enhances the problems. Do not think about the problems at all but work on yourself to see your own reality, and in reality, there are no problems. Yet I also know to most people, no matter how many times I say this, their problems are very real to them. And they've got a hold of them like a vice. They really feel their problems. So to those people I say, 
to the extent that you can realize that your mind has created these problems and in reality you are mindless to that extent where your problems begin to dissolve. But do this when you wake up when you open your eyes in the morning. Don't go through the four principles all at once and say I'm finished. Now I can go worry about my problems laughter. Take one at a time even if you do not get to the second one that morning. An hour or two has passed and you're working on the first one that's good. You can work on these things all your life if necessary. It's better than worrying about your problems. But take them one at a time. Now you go to the second one and you work on the second one just like on the first one. Now what's the second did you say Sam? SM we were never born. Robert, true, but it's the way you say it to yourself that counts. SM, right. Use your own words that are comfortable for you. You have to sort of say something like this. I perceive, I feel, I understand that I was never born or I am unborn. I do not prevail. All my existence does not exist and I will never disappear. SD can you say I perceive or I understand before your mind really has fully accepted it? Robert, whatever is more appealing to you. Whatever you can work with. But, let yourself know that you perceive it and you understand it and you feel it. SD, I mean would it be more honest to say I am beginning to perceive or? There is no beginning. So when you say, I'm beginning you begin and begin, and begin every day. It never ends. Speak up for the truth. You can say, there's something within me that perceives, there's something within me that knows I was never born, I do not prevail, and I will never disappear. And I am that one that knows. So you start working on that. What does this mean, I was never born, I am unborn? Sounds like a contradiction because you say my father and mother gave me birth. This appears to be true. Who gave them birth? My grandmother and my grandfather. Then you go all the way back. Who gave them birth? Who gave them birth? And you go back to the beginning. Where did the first man and woman come from? Who started this? Who started the human race? Who started the idea of birth? Now don't come up with your answers because the mind answers. You can say Adam and Eve God. Somebody told you that. You learned it from reading the Bible. But is it true? Where did the God come from who created everything? So you go back to the beginning and you can say to yourself, it's like saying, what came first, the chicken or the egg? The tree or the seed? It's the same thing. What came first, the man or the woman? How did they both get together? Who made them? Then you will realize they don't exist. Nothing gave you birth. Because the whole origin is false. That's what I call false imagination. The whole origin of birth is false. It's a dream. It doesn't exist. Therefore, I do not exist the way I appear to be. Then you go right back to the first premise. Then, who am I? See, you're always going back to self-inquiry. Who am I that exists? If I am not the body, am I my thoughts? I can't be my thoughts because they keep on changing. Then who am I? Then you keep silent for a while. You know it's working when you start getting a quiet loving feeling. You start to feel peace that you have not felt before and you start to feel that all is well. SD, what if you say I am the eternal now? Even that is a product of the mind? Yes it is, it's a temporary help because the mind creates it. SD, there should be no knowing just an inner knowing. Yes, if you do this often enough, this is why you have to do this every day, when you wake up, pretty soon you will start to feel something. Really, you will feel a happiness that you never felt before, an extreme happiness, and you couldn't care if they dropped a bomb on your head. You would feel this happiness because you will know that you can't die. 
See right now they're just words. But, you will actually know someday that you just can't disappear. Nothing can kill you. Heal is just a word that means something that you have accepted. It's just an ignorant word. We make up words and we put feelings behind them. Stay to yourself for a while. See how ridiculous it sounds. Kill, 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 kill. It's just an English word that human beings make up to connote some kind of danger. But, the word has no power except the power that you give it yourself. When the mind is silent then reality comes of its own accord. When you're thinking, 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 then the world has got you and you become worldly again. Though self-inquiry causes the mind to be quiet. And after you work on that you go on. I do not prevail. Though you say to yourself, you mean my entire existence since I was a baby, until I die means nothing? And then you say to yourself, I have just proven that I was never born, because I've gone way back to the beginning. Though if I were never born, how can I prevail? What prevails? Who prevails? And you will see it's the mind that prevails. The mind wants existence, wants strength, wants power. It makes you believe that you are a body. You ask yourself, to whom comes the mind? Where does the mind come from? Who gave it birth? How did it originate? What is its source? And then keep quiet, keep still. And you will begin to laugh because you will actually feel, even if for a moment, that there is no mind. You will actually feel no mind. In the beginning it may last for a moment or two. But, as you practice every day those moments of no mind will become greater and greater and greater and greater. And then you go on and you'll say, I will never disappear. So now you're laughing again because you realize who disappears. That which never existed disappears. But I am no mind so how can I disappear? And this becomes very meaningful for you. And as you do it every day, you become stronger and stronger in mindfulness. And something happens that's so beautiful that I can't describe it. You feel such love, such joy, such harmony, such bliss. Then you carry on. Now, what's the third principle? Student responds. SM, isn't it that everything is egoless? Robert, say it the way you're supposed to say it. You begin with I feel. Students laugh. See how easy we forget. You've got to feel it. You've got to say something in me feels understands the egolessness of all things. All these principles are alike. Did you come to that conclusion yet? They all have the same source, nothing. But, you have to work with them until you get there. I feel and understand the egolessness of all things. And you say all things, not just some things, but all things from the greatest galaxy to the minutest atom. Nothing has an ego. If it has no ego, it has no source, because to have an ego, there has to be a source, and just by realizing this great truth, you become free immediately. That blows your mind. It's like a Zen koan. All of a sudden something snaps in your mind, and your mind is gone because it has no source since there's no ego. It never existed, then you feel so good. There was a tape break here, must have been a question concerning Hussein and the Gulf War, Ed. Robert continues, I can like them or dislike them. But this is a worldly thing and you are not of this world. Though you react completely differently to things like that. When I discuss these things with you it's to make conversation. But, it doesn't exist. It will come and go. Whether there is a war, or there is not a war. Fact remains you're still going to die. Though what's more important? To discuss who's good and who's bad in the world, or to find out your true self, and become free from everything. SD, I just meant, would it help something like that not matter? Of course it helps because it makes them disappear. SD, yeah. 
you realize it's part of the mind, like the blanket, like the radio. SD, and just saying he's egoless doesn't mean it in the way we would say that. But, it means he has no source, he came from nothing. How he appears does not exist, just like his body, same thing. See, when you say, I am not the body, you're not speaking of your body. You're speaking of the body, the universal body. Nobody is the body. SD, so you could say I am is not the body? Yes, you can say that. That's why I tell you not to use that too much, because you make it too personal. You're still into yourself as an individual. When you read in the textbooks, I am not the body, I am not the mind, they're referring to the universal body and universal mind. That there is no body, nobody, no body. Laughter. Nobody exists. That sounds ridiculous to the average person. Now you may say, what does this do for me? It does everything for you. If you are creative in music or in art or anything else, you'll become a greater musician or a greater artist without wanting to, without going after it. Your body will do what it's supposed to. There will be no karmic attachment. As an example, if you were a great artist and a great musician, or a great carpenter, or a great loafer, or a great homeless person, and you go after it humanly this is what is holding you to the earth, and you're going to have to come back again and again and again, because you've made yourself earthbound, don't you see? Anything that you attach yourself to pulls you back to the earth whether it's good or bad. If you hate something it's the same as if you love something. It pulls you back to the earth. You've got to let go. If you read that lesson on non-attachment I gave you last week it explains it all. It's not being indifferent. It's just a letting go because you know, I am my brother and my brother is me. I am everything. So I do not have to attach myself to anything. The egolessness of all things. And now, I go to the last principle which is what? A student replies. Robert, good. No, you say I perceive and understand what realization is. I know something within me understands and feels what self-realization is and you keep still. Then the thoughts will come to you that the only way to find out is through negation. Though you can say to yourself, it's not the sun, because the sun is a projection of my mind. It's not the moon, same thing. It's not my husband or my wife, it's not my body, it's not my organs. It's not Hussein, it's not peace, it's not the war. And everything you name, it's not. So when you get tired of naming things, you keep silent, and that's what it is. Everything is silence. All four principles end in silence, they're all the same. Any questions about that? S.A. Yes, I have a question concerning two things that you said which I have difficulty with. One of the things you said is never deal with a problem. Robert Wright and I know that if you concentrate on the positive things that you're speaking about, that's the essential teaching, say to express all the ideas that you've already talked about today. I realize that that is the energy that must be expended. But, still in this period of life that we have, as we make these statements, and as we move towards this goal which I can accept, and this theoretical idea which I accept, this abstract idea, Still there is the life to be lived, and there are issues to deal with. Robert, yes. Though it seems to me that if you say, don't deal with the problem, this leads to enormous problems. Robert, on the contrary, you're separating both. You're putting them in two categories. But they're only one. As an example, say somebody cheated you, and you sue them in court. When you sue somebody, and you're getting involved in something like that, you're setting up an energy. Even if you win the case, you're going to have to sue somebody else, and then sue somebody else, and it never stops because you've created a pattern for yourself. But if you go about it the other way, if you know the truth about yourself, you also know the truth about the guy who cheated because you're both one. S.A. All right, 
Let me give you another example. Let's say that we're all here and we all stay here and we have no money. And tomorrow we're hungry. We're all hungry in the morning and we say we're not going to deal with this problem, but because our hunger is so great and keeps mounting, we really can't think of anything else. Eventually we can't think of any of these ideas that you've told us about because we're so extremely hungry. Robert, your first premise is wrong. It doesn't work like that. It'll never work like that. You are hungry, something will happen to appease your hunger. See, what you're thinking about is you sit down and you do nothing. It doesn't work like that. When you know the truth, somebody will knock on the door and bring you food. S.A., I brought up the example a week or two ago about the Holocaust, and remember I said how the attitude of the Jewish people, and especially the rabbis, was that God is living in the Nazis, God has manifested himself through Auschwitz and the others, and so we must go along with this. Would you say that is the attitude the Jewish people should have had? Robert, on the contrary, because that's an attitude, I'm not talking about attitudes. S, but it's a problem to deal with. I'm talking about realization. T, reading the Bible and making quotations is one thing. Being a living embodiment of the truth is another thing. Though I'm not saying you're supposed to be passive. There are times that you're not passive. S.A., then, you are saying deal with the problem. On the contrary, if you are in the truth, the problem will deal with itself. S.A., yes, but you're speaking of a state to which we are aspiring and I grant what you say. I believe that would happen, but we're not in that state yet. I mean, we are, but we are not fully in the state because we cannot fully grasp it and manifest it. Robert, if you take it personally and you work on yourself as I said, you will do what's right. You will not be passive. SG, so you would say that your body will do the right thing by itself. It's not a matter of trying to think of it or not think of it. That's the easiest way to look at it right there. S.A. It isn't that at all. It's your mind that tells you to put on clothes and go out and find food in the morning. Your body too, but it's the body-mind working together. S.D. Remember what Christ said when he said, Put ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. Isn't that sort of the same thing you're saying? Robert, yes it is. If you dwell on self-inquiry or self-realization, somehow these things will be taken care of, maybe even by the body. S.A., wasn't it Christ also who said, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? And that's the critical point here. There's no argument with the concept, the idea, and the goal and the abstract reality of it. I am talking about the interim period as we live in our daily bodies through the day. S.D., before we are realized. Yes, and that's why I bring up these problems of the fan, which I did the other day, and the food as examples of these things that we have to deal with every moment. Robert, your body and your mind are motivated by karma. The law of karma takes care of them. But, you are not your body. If you are aware that you are not your body, right action will pursue. SD, you mean you can be aware that you are not your body, and yet your body will go out and get food? Robert, exactly. But you would know that you are not the doer. S.A., but you say if you are aware those are your words, if you are aware that you are not the body. I would say from my understanding of the teaching, there are degrees of awareness. If you are fully and completely and absolutely and totally and wholly aware that you are not the body, then okay, I grant you that. But, there are these degrees of awareness, and if you are not at that particular state then you must render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Robert, in reality, there are no degrees. Though you either are or you're not. If you think you're not, then you have to fetch for yourself. If you think you are, you'll think about these things, and then you'll go do something. But you won't be doing it. It will do itself. S.D., 
That's what I was going to say. The answer to me is what Robert was telling us before about not being the doer. The realization that you are not the doer is even what Christ was talking about. That is, you dwell on the self on realization, and your body will continue to do whatever is necessary karmically, but your realization that you're not the body, and you're not the doer doesn't mean it doesn't get done. S.A. Well now we're getting down to the nitty gritty. All right, then what you're suggesting is this. Let's talk about tomorrow morning. And I'm hungry so if my body mind says go out and try to find some money to get breakfast, but all the time that I'm doing this I can still think I am not doing this, Robert. No, no. I am not going to be getting the money. I am not going to be eating it. But both can exist simultaneously. SG. You don't think about it. Robert, no, no, no. See what's going to happen when you work on the principles, and if you have hunger in your body, you will automatically, spontaneously, go get food. SD, but you won't be dwelling on it. Robert, your mind will be somewhere else. Could you say like, okay, here I am going to the bread bakery, but this is all a dream? SG, you won't even say it like that. SD, yeah you wouldn't I understand. Robert, see take my life for instance. When I get up in the morning I have no idea what's going to happen the next day or that day or during the day, but I am active and I'm not active. I do certain things but I don't do purposely. It happens spontaneously. I didn't ask to teach classes like this. It happened. I never asked for anything. But it happens because my body does it spontaneously. But, my mind is not aware of it, and I'm not involved in it. But, I'm fed, I live in a house. I come to these meetings. But, I never say I'm going to do it. SD, you don't plan? I don't plan. I may plan a couple of hours in advance, or something like that, but I have no long drawn out plans. But, everything works out. I know it is hard to perceive. It's really hard to perceive how I live. S.A. My second point is related to this one and you said at the beginning of the speech tonight. You quoted Ramana for him being robbed. And you said that he told his followers to give. To allow the robbers to take what they wanted and that was their karma. Robert, their dharma. And it was his karma to have it and to give it. Why couldn't it also be his karma to protect what he has? Robert, because it was not his dharma, it was not his way. SD, what is the difference between dharma and karma? Dharma is the way things are. The truth of the way things are. SG, so another enlightened teacher could have said anything. I mean they both are the two sides of the same coin in reality, right? Robert, in a way that's true. Just say, go kill them, although you know I mean not kill them, but I mean in reality, there's no difference. Robert, well you're right. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita with Arjuna. S.G., yet exactly. When Krishna told him to go fight. S.G., or go sue them or go fight them. S.A., so he could have said, let's protect what we have. S.G., yeah and they're really both the same, but that wasn't his. Robert, he said, this is not our path. This is not his path. S.D., saying Dharma? See, I have the same question, because I thought Dharma and Karma were the same thing. Robert, no. Though they're not so, the Dharma would be the teaching, to teach them not to resist, but Karma might be to beat the shit out of them. Robert, yes. Laughter. But if you were holy enough you would go with the Dharma without taking really. Robert, it depends on the path that you're on. People are on different paths I guess. But the highest teaching of all not only that Krishna himself didn't have to fight did he? He told Arjuna to fight. SG, that's right. You see. SA, well it's easy to tell somebody else to fight. Laughs. 
Robert, when you get to the highest, there's peace. SG, there's no need to. Robert, there's no need to do anything. There's no need for anything. Maybe to just show, maybe as a demonstration for somebody else, you could say, fight or don't fight. I mean, as an extension. Robert, for your students. For your students, yeah. Robert, it's like in the martial arts, when somebody becomes so proficient in the martial arts. I mean proficient, the highest he can ever go higher than that. They do nothing. They do not even defend themselves. They go the other way, just sit. They accept being killed. There's nothing to fight. But, Arjuna was not up there, he belonged to the warrior class. S.A., and so do we were one of the more. Robert, you belong to whatever you believe. S.G., castes are like beliefs in your mind. So you belong to whatever you believe. It's all in your mind. If you want to believe you've got to fight, then go fight. If you have to believe you've got to take care of yourself, because if you don't do it, then who's going to do it? Then you've got to. You've got to do what you've got to do. But, I'm speaking of the highest teaching. Where everything is taken care of. Look at Ramana again, as an example. When he was a boy, he would have been dead, if it weren't for this mysterious power to take care of him. He just went into the jungle, went into a cave and sat there. He didn't know where his food was going to come from. He didn't even think about it, how he was going to take care of himself. It didn't enter his mind. He just sat motionless, for days, until a woman came up the hill and started to feed him. S.D., but he was more or less born enlightened and were just struggling. Robert, well I'm just speaking of the highest ideal. What I'm trying to tell you is that if you have trust and faith, there is a mysterious power that will take care of you and supply all you need. S.N., Arnold you've mentioned several times, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's but continue to render unto the Lord that which is the Lord's, and that man does not live by bread alone, but every word which proceedeth from the mouth of the Lord. So let us ask ourselves, what is Caesar? What is the Lord? And what is the bread of life? It seems the body alone life is not sustaining, life is not perceived from the body alone. Robert, that's a good point. Jesus himself never rendered unto Caesar. He told that to the people. Laughter, S.N., he always passed it on. S.D., better you than me. Laughter. S.A., I don't see that what you're saying at all, but my problem is with the acknowledgement of the bread part of it, how one deals with that, and I think people have those concrete problems, like in the world dealing with the world as, you all do simultaneously with the work of the Lord and all that, while you pay your attention to the Spirit. At the same time you have these other problems. That's the fact. Robert, Arnold, remember Arnold you're speaking from your point of view. S.N. Ultimately there are no problems and it's a matter of where we put our attention. Wherever we put our attention that becomes our reality. So if we focus in on the bread, so if we focus in on the Caesar, but what if we ask ourselves, what is the source of our life? Is it from Caesar or is it from the bread? That's the question, so even if you solve the problem of the bread then you are fed, but if you never know who you are subsequent problems are inevitable. Essay, that's true I don't deny that. Though it's not only finding out who we are, but it's also a matter of that there's a flow, and to realize that flow and connect ourselves with that flow. And from that flow comes the bread and it's not just us but it's all things. So it's not just conquering that one problem. When you conquer the problem of the self all the other problems are conquered. S.A. Theoretically, but remember also in the past I've mentioned this. In every culture, in every time, whether in Catholicism in the Middle Ages, in the West or whether in Buddhism in the East, because of the awareness of this problem, those who are in control have established communities, 
they've established ways in the world for the process to go on, and that's why it's still existent. That's why monasteries do exist. That's why there are groups of teachers of Sufis out in the desert everywhere and that sort of thing. Or where arrangements are made for survival while the process is. Then, even as those arrangements are made, they're not really made, they happen of themselves and again that's the flow. Robert, see you're speaking of appearances. That's how it appears to you. That's what I said in the beginning, this is your point of view, that's how you see it now. But, it's not like that. S.N., the ashrams themselves didn't say well let's make an ashram. They happened of themselves because the people that were involved of it were unfolding of themselves. Everything unfolds of itself. Our life shall unfold of itself. But, when we think we're the doer then, there are problems. Not that we don't do anything. It's not that we do nothing. It's not that we do. Be as we are. It unfolds of itself. There's no stopping of action and there's no action. S.A. Maybe it's just semantics. Let's try another attack. When I came here Sam said to me several times that I should come here. This just happened. I didn't go to Sam. I didn't say please tell me what to do where to go. I wasn't even aware that he was thinking of me. They came to me just in the manner we were speaking of. And I did. Nevertheless every week I have to arrange to come here. Though the two energies exist simultaneously on this plane so I see. Robert, no this plane doesn't exist but as long as you believe it does, it does because you're creating it. You're giving its power. You are the power source. When you take the power away, everything just is. S.N., that kind of gets to a question that I have. It's not really a question and I kind of know that. I feel it's a little fruitless for me to ask questions. Robert, no that's all right. S.N., well I feel I'm kind of doing it for conversation too, because I realize that I'm at a point where I'm beyond questions but, everything is an emanation of the mind. Um yes? Sn, but the mind does not exist. Exactly. Sn, so we have different levels here. Pause, okay well, everything is an emanation of the mind but the mind does not exist. Everything is an emanation of the mind, as if it's a dream however the dream does not really exist. The one level is first of all, if everything is an emanation of the mind, Thus there is a process which is the dream, yet the mind does not exist. The dream itself has no reality. It's real but it's not true. It's better to ask questions to yourself than to make statements. When you come to this conclusion you ask yourself, whose mind doesn't exist? Where did the mind come from? To whom does it belong? And you keep silent. Then your answer will be emptiness nirvana and you will know. S.D., what question should I have asked myself? Robert, the question that you're asking me, you should ask yourself, who has all these questions? S.D., are you meaning who has to get her act together again? All these things. You are with realizing that I have to do these things. Then go back to the I and say, where did the I come from who has to do all these things? and follow the eye through to its culmination, to its source. S.A., let me try another tack to express these ideas. Parent has a child, and the child, let's say that the child is afraid of a bogey man or whatever. And we know that children have this fantasy life and I know as a parent how you deal with children. If you have a little child of yours who is going to bed, you know very well that these fantasies that he's having, they're not real you know that they're not going to have any substance in his future life or in your life, there is no substance to it whatsoever. Nevertheless, because you know he's a child, and you know that he's on a certain level, you go along with it, and you know that he's moving gradually towards greater realization as he gets older and as the reality of the world, or the unreality if you like, becomes more apparent to him. But, 
Nevertheless, you have to deal with him on those levels and that's why a parent will say, Oh, I don't think that terrible man's going to come in the door, and you talk to him about all of these things, and you go along with him on his level, even though you know it's not real, and he knows it too in some way inside. Robert, but you're doing all that in the dream. That's all part of the dream. S.A., that's true, but in doing it you enable him to move to higher levels of realization. He said to the child, I am not going to discuss this because there is no reality there, I am not going to do this. Then you keep the child from moving. That's the dream what you're saying is the dream. But, if you just wake up, all that doesn't exist and you wouldn't have to do all of those things. I say, what would you do to the child? What would you say to the child? As long as you're not listening, you say what you think. I say, what would you say if you were deep in the reality? I have two girls and when they were babies I read books to them and did what you said, but I realized that I was not the doer, that's the point. I went through all that. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do anything at all. I realized that I was just playing a part. I was not the doer so I read them books, calmed their fears, and did what a father has to do. But I knew I am not the doer, that's the difference. S.A., yes but in doing that you help the girls to move to higher levels. It's the girls that I'm thinking about as being the important issue here. I'm using that as an example of our own position in life. People who are. Robert, are you going Sam? S.M., yeah. Go in peace. S.D., are you going to play music? SM, yeah. Robert, when you realize that you are not the doer, your body will do whatever it came to this earth to do. Your body follows karma, and your body will do whatever you're supposed to do. But, it's not you. And that can only be experienced. SD, we were just talking while you were out of the room. I don't know if this is correct or not but in a way as I perceive it, it's taking an overview and knowing as you go through these bodily actions, it's a dream. You're captured in the dream and you're watching yourself as on video, you know you're not and you know that's you. SN, you do all the worldly things. Robert, um. But you say, but I'm not the doer. Robert, you don't say that, if you have to say that then you are. SD, true. You just realize that you are the universe and you're playing all the parts. SD, but we cannot just say that I'm not the doer Robert. SN, some of the other teachings would say that you are not the doer but this isn't thinking that. You know we interpret it that way but that isn't what it's saying. SD, well I agree with Arnold that we're all at different levels that we're all at. Robert, it appears that way. SD, we seem to need words. That's why you have to inquire, for whom are their levels? SD, so after I am not doer you have to say, who is I? No, when you know that you are not the doer you won't say anything. SD, but in the meantime I seem to need to say, I'm not the doer, to remind myself, because I'm at a lower level or I feel that I'm at a lower level. I need words like that to tell me. SN, better to not say that I'm not the doer because that's that type of certain pattern. It's better to ask yourself, who is the doer? Than to say I am the doer. SD, that's a good point. Yes, see that's the point. The point is that I am not the doer is not this practice. Question. SD, because that's duality. Well it's not self-inquiry. SD, well it could lead to self-inquiry, you could say who was I? I, is non-existent. When you're conquering something in the world and you say I am not the doer, that is not what this path is teaching. That's like a negation. You neither affirm nor negate. This is non-duality, you ask yourself, who is the doer? To whom does this come? 
Not I am not the doer because in a sense what you're saying is, I am, you're already affirming yourself by saying, I am not the doer you're saying well I exist. SD, you could be saying, I am is not the doer. That's different. Yeah but in your mind what do you do? See when I was saying, in the Bible it says, be still and know that I am God. Well, I got one impression when I was doing that, but when I said be still and know that I am as God, I got a totally different impression because I became God rather than a God outside of me. So when we slur that, we have to be very careful. SD. Yeah. Better to define it and say, I am or to whom does this come? Rather than, Robert, remember that you can never become God because God is you. You don't become anything because you don't exist as it appears. See, remember a couple of weeks ago I mentioned this is my confession. This is the way I feel about it and to most people it's ridiculous. It's gobbledygook, it doesn't mean a thing, it doesn't seem practical in the beginning, to most people, because most people want something practical that they can improve their humanhood with. But, the highest truth is, humanhood does not exist and if you come to that conclusion your life will be bliss. SD, but isn't one of the purposes of satsang is to ask those questions that we're asking so that we are aspiring to understand? Robert, yes that's what satsang is all about. But, then you have to practice the things that I tell you and watch what happens. In other words, you can't go home and get caught up in the world and forget about this until the next meeting. You've got to work on yourself, work on yourself and you'll see what happens. SD, but I think it's so in vain Robert, the reason Sam was unable to say the four fundamentals with feeling, like an actor or something, is because we are still at the point of learning them and the grasping of each individual one will come later. It's very helpful you to tell us to like expand on each one or maybe do one at a time. But, if we know we're going to be questioned when we come to class the night before we're going to be ready you know. Otherwise don't you have to start that way before they become out of the attic? Robert, yes, you work on one until you become a living embodiment of it. You can repeat all four to yourself or when you work on yourself you take one at a time. SD, right. SA, I'd like to write them down in your words if I may as succinctly as possible, is that all right? Robert, that's fine. I'll need a pen. SD, I think I wrote them down the other day. Every time he says it, it's kind of different anyway. Could you tell me the four is A? Robert, okay number one, I understand, I feel, I perceive that everything, everything twice everything, two times everything. Everything, emphasize the second everything. Put a line under it. Is a manifestation of my mind. Number two. I feel and understand deeply that I am unborn, I do not prevail and I do not disappear. SD. Either die or disappear. Same thing. Number 3. I feel and understand the egolessness of everything, of all creation. Number 4. I have a deep understanding of what self-realization is. That's it. SD, wasn't number 4 the ending of that by what it's not? Robert, that's how you work on yourself through negation. SD, because you always say it different, the way you told me was, you can discover what self-realization is by what it is not. Yes. SD, or nitty nitty. If I were quoting from books I would say the same thing all the time, but I say it as it comes and that's the only difference. SN, yeah when you said that we perceive and we have a deep understanding, and though we don't feel that we say that. Robert, it's good to say it when you wake up because it starts something going. SN, but I'm saying during the day if we do the principles do we say the same thing? You can sort of make it a little different. During the day you can just think about that everything is just a projection of your mind. But in the morning it's good to say I perceive I understand, you know why. 
because when you first open your eyes you're not awake yet and you're your real self. Though you're actually confessing to yourself your real nature. That I perceive I understand and it goes deeper into the subconscious mind. When you just woke up you're fresh, your mind is fresh no ideas. And during the day when the world's got you you can just say, everything is a projection of my mind everything. And leave the I perceive off. Sen. Yeah but does the tree think I am? Yeah, but does a tree exist? Students laugh, you see it's a perception of your mind. Sn. Well some of the principles are easier than others. Everything is a projection of the mind I can follow that but I have no beginning. There's not a feeling inside of me that I don't have a beginning because I identify with the body. I exist, remember? You work with I exist, that's the beginning because you can't say you don't exist. Though you exist, and you say to yourself, I exist, and you put more space between I and exist as you keep going. I exist and then you ask yourself, who is this I that exists? Where did it come from? SD. My mother used to instill that to us. She used to say, where will you spend eternity? As if eternity was in the future. And I would say even then mother how could eternity be something that comes later? It has no beginning and no end. SG, and what did she say? Blasphemous sort of words. Robert, see real satsang is non-intellectual. SD, then what is it? Is it emotional? It's not emotional. It's the reality of the person giving it. Whenever we have new students they'll ask the same questions but that's their perception. That's where they're coming from. And no matter what I say they will not be able to see it until they become it. Because they're identified with their body. But, you're getting more advanced because you're realizing things of a higher nature. SD, the more advanced the more confused. That's good, that's a good sign. SD, laughs. I don't know is it? The more I know the less I know. The more I know the more I don't know what anything is. That's good because you're getting rid of your ego. The ego wants to know. It has to know. For when you begin to feel the less, I know that's a good sign for you because you know less about the world and more about the self. SD unclear that's good. SD even the self. Laughs keep it up it happens. SN Arnold do you feel that your perceptions are different from a non-dual point of view since you've been coming to satsang for quite a while? S.A. Well not particularly because I have been aware of this teaching for a long time. S.N. Non-duality. Yeah oh yeah. I would say that since I've been coming here there is a deeper quality of realizing, but intellectually, I've been aware of this for a long time. S.N. No well I don't mean intellectually, I'm just saying well basically do you feel any difference? Well. I would say there is yeah. I would say it has permeated myself more my non-self. Robert, you see the more confounded you become the more the ego breaks up, whether you know it or not. SD, does it or doesn't it sort of become more manageable? No it breaks up. When the ego is. Tape ends. Transcript 8. The Three Vehicles. 2nd September. 19. 190. Robert, I welcome you with all my heart. It's good to see you again. Those of you who are new welcome. I confess to you that I am not the body-mind phenomena. That I am eternal spirit. When I use the pronoun I, I refer to omnipresence. I'm not talking of myself personally. I'm speaking of the universal I. So whenever I use that pronoun, this is what I refer to, and so when I make a confession I'm not talking about Robert. I'm talking about every sentient creature on this earth. I am absolute reality. I am birthless, deathless, and do not disappear. I am eternal bliss, no beginning and no end. I am that I am. 
I am pure intelligence, always available, omniscient, omnipotent, residing in everything. I am that sat chit ananda. All knowledge existence bliss. I am nirvana. I am emptiness. And because I am that, all is well. There are no problems. Nothing is wrong. There is no creation. Nothing has ever been created. I am that eternal something that has always existed from the beginning, exists now, and will always exist. All is well. No problems. No anxiety. Peace, harmony, love, bliss, I am that. Take break. I get a few phone calls from different people all over the world. Basically they ask the same questions. How do I solve my problems and how do I become self-realized? And that's a funny question to me. It's like a person standing in the middle of the ocean, asking for water. Self-realization is your very nature. You are already that, but because we are attached to Maya, we are earthbound. We use discrimination and we believe everything we see is real. Because of this, because we believe the body is real, the mind is real, it becomes like the clouds hiding the sun. You do not say there is no sun, you wait for the clouds to dissipate, and the sun shines again in all its glory and splendor. You are divine. You are a radiant being of light. Only the clouds of ignorance appear have to fall in upon you and so do you believe you are human. You believe you have problems. You believe you need enlightenment. You think something is wrong someplace. But, I say to you that there are no mistakes. No mistakes have ever been made. No mistakes are being made. No mistakes will ever be made. Everything is right just the way it is. Everything is beautiful. Everything is God. Everything is absolute intelligence, absolute reality, Parabrahman. That is what you are. That is your real nature. How did we get lost? Again, one way is by reading too much. There are so many books. So much to read we become confused. We do not know which path to follow. We get involved in all kinds of pseudo-religious cults, and this causes us to go down, as it were, until we can really find ourselves again. Reading is only for motivation. Be careful what you read. There are too many books. If you speak to those people who have really become enlightened, you will find that they hardly ever read at all. Maybe a couple of books, but what they did was the sadhana, the spiritual practices required. They worked on themselves consistently, constantly, 24 hours a day. How bad do you want realization? This is determined by what you do. If you're more interested in entertainment, TV parties, drinking, going out a lot, spending time with the idiot friends, what do you expect? You get out of life what you put into it. If you're really looking for enlightenment in this incarnation, before you leave your body it's possible, but you have to do certain things and through investigation, we have found that the fastest way for the average person to feel the urge for enlightenment is to sit in satsang. It tells you this in the Upanishads. Only those who sit in satsang will achieve the final goal. This means you do not even have to read. You do not have to practice meditation formally. All you have to do is sit in satsang and things begin to happen of their own accord. You automatically start inquiring yourself. You begin to investigate. It happens spontaneously. Now this is an important point. Most people read books, Advaita Vedanta, Ramana Maharshi, Nisargadaya, whatever and they see what they did, but yet they do not do anything like that themselves. They never inquire. They read the books and they obtain intellectual knowledge, mind knowledge, head knowledge. They have a good memory, they can quote passages, remember phraseologies, certain cliches, certain sayings, but they never have the experience. The experience only comes when you have complete humility. When you just let go of yourself, 
your little self. When you stop worrying about yourself, stop thinking of your little self so much. Stop saying, I need this and I need that, and I've got to become this, and I got to get this. Give up all desire. Give up all attachments to person, place, or thing. Relax. Make your life very simple. Sit in silence, investigate. Find out who has problems. Find out who feels depressed. Find out who is not enlightened, and you will laugh. For you are a radiant light in a world of darkness. You are divine. You are a wonderful being. Never criticize yourself. Never put yourself down. Think of yourself as God and act the part. I give you this information so that you can do something with yourself, something practical. I give you the three vehicles that cross the ocean of samsara to the land of self realization. But you have to use the vehicles. You have to work with them day after day. When you first get out of bed, when you first open your eyes, and these vehicles begin to make sense to you after you practice the four principles that I shared with you. The first vehicle is this you have a strong desire to be alone. This doesn't mean you become antisocial. It means that you have to make the time to be alone. For instance, yesterday morning before 10 o'clock, I got three phone calls, invitations to go here, to go there, to go to a movie, to go to this place, but I declined. I was all by myself in the house. I sat down and looked at the trees and before you knew it, it was five o'clock, but I was filled with bliss, filled with joy, filled with happiness, which never goes away anyway. There's a time to be by yourself and there's a time to be with people. But those who really want to become enlightened have to make the time to be by themselves. So they can think of the four principles. They can inquire. Where does the mind come from? Who thinks these thoughts? Watch the thoughts, watch what they're doing to you, observe them, do not react to them, but ask, to whom do they come, and realize they come to you. Who are you? Who am I, and as you follow the eye thread to its source, there will be perfect peace in your life. Many people say, is a path like this practical? And I always answer what do you mean by practical? Is your life right now practical? You have no idea, I say, what life is all about. You have no idea whether you're living or dead. You just exist. Find out who exists. Discover who you are. As far as practicality is concerned, as you discover who you are, your humanhood seems to increase and become better because the vibrations you're putting into your image body that appears to be real for you is of a higher vibration and life becomes easier for you. You stop struggling. You stop reacting. You simply exist and like a divine magnet you seem to attract everything you need in your life. But this only happens when you're truly on the path. Everything is supplied at the right time. The right people come into your life at the right time. The right things always happen. But, you have loving kindness for all things. Your temper, your ego, your emotions have subsided. You no longer become angry at things that don't go your way. Because you realize you have no way. You no longer try to make God into your image and believe God is Santa Claus and you ask God for gifts or to have mercy on your soul. You realize all that God is you are. And you inquire within yourself, to whom comes this emotion? To whom comes these questions? This begging to God for things, to whom does it come? You will realize in time it's your ego and it will happen by itself. Something will tell you, your ego has to be annihilated, removed, destroyed. You do this through self-inquiry, who has an ego? Where did it come from? Who gave it birth? You will come up with your own answers and the answers are never the solution. But, you come up with answers to help your humanhood. Things unfold properly in the right way. There's nothing to fight. 
nothing to change. Everything happens by itself. And the question many people ask, how can things happen by themselves? How can that be? Well, when you understand who you are, you realize that what you call your body has been programmed before you were born. When you first came into this body, everything was already mapped out for you. What the body was going to become. Where you're going to end up. Even the day of your the so-called death of the body, it is all mapped out, everything is mapped out and nothing changes. The why worry? Again, this doesn't mean that you've got license to do whatever you want. As I said previously, you have to have loving kindness for all. Humility mercy, you always have to remember, I am my brother and my brother is me. What's good for you is good for your friends and your relatives and everybody else. Do not separate yourself from anything. Everything is one. Not only human beings but animals, minerals, vegetables, it is all one. However, you treat anything, you're really treating yourself. The whole world is a looking glass for you. And what you see is what you get. So what do you see? This is why it is so often. I am merely a mirror for you. When you see me, you're seeing yourself. The question is therefore, what are you seeing? What kind of self are you seeing? If you're seeing something ugly, something negative, you have to work on yourself. Do not try to change other people. Do not try to change your circumstances. If you get rid of one set of circumstances, another one of the same nature will pop up later. You can't get rid of yourself until you change yourself. You have to work on yourself all the time and above all you've got to have patience. Patience is the key especially when you're practicing this path. You must have a lot of patience. Do not ask when. Live each moment as it comes in beauty and joy. One day you will be awakened and you will be surprised and you will laugh hysterically, but patience is the key. It's like the story of the two frogs who lived in a milk factory outside in the woods, a fat frog and a skinny frog. One day, they inadvertently jumped into a milk vat and they couldn't get out. And the fat frog said, Brother Frog, we've been paddling like this for a long time. We'll never get out of here. I guess we're doomed to die. And the thin frog said, Brother Frog, have hope, have faith, keep paddling, something will happen, somebody will rescue us, never give up. So they kept paddling for a few hours and they still couldn't get out, and the fat frog said, Brother Frog, this is the end, I'm getting tired, it's hopeless. I see no rescue coming, it is impossible, there's no way out. And the skinny frog said, Brother Frog, do not give up hope, keep paddling, don't think about it, just paddle, something will happen, something will give, we'll be rescued. So he paddled a couple more hours and the fat frog said, Brother Frog, you don't know what you're talking about. There's no hope, this is the end. I'm going to give up. And he stopped paddling and sank in the milk and drowned. But, the thin frog kept paddling without thinking. After a while he felt something solid beneath him. He had churned the milk into butter and he was able to hop out of the vat. And this is like us. We see no hope. We think it's the end. Nobody loves us. We have incurable diseases. We have no job. The world looks like it's coming to an end. There are wars. Man's inhumanity to man. And we don't know when it's going to end, but for whom is this? For you? Find out for whom is all this destruction. For whom is the negative conditions? Not for you because you are not your body. As long as you believe that you are your body, then the world becomes very real to you. As long as you believe you are your mind, then your thoughts will frighten you, scare you, and make you do strange things. Will make you hate people, be suspicious, be doubtful. You'll have all kinds of problems. But, when you inquire for whom is the mind, for whom is the body, everything stops. You see, the substratum of all existence is bliss. 
That's the bottom line simply speaking. The substratum of all existence is bliss. You come from bliss and you go to bliss. It is your real nature. It's like you're watching a movie and in the movie, there are good people and bad people and all kinds of people, yet you watch. You do not get involved in the movie, even though you're watching the movie, you know that it'll have an end, and you'll awaken from the movie and you'll get up and go home. Life is like that. Life is a cosmic movie. Things begin, things have a middle, things have an end. Everything changes, changes continuously. Nothing is ever the same and it pulls you in. It pulls you into what we call Maya, into the grand illusion. It makes you believe that life is virtuous and interesting and gets you enmeshed in certain things of this world. Until you become totally involved and when you become totally involved, you see it turns out to what you didn't expect. It's different to what you thought. Then you go after something else and you go after something else, it never ends. Until you become so discouraged you don't know what to do with yourself. This is true of every human being, everybody. So what to do? Take time out by yourself, think about these things. That's the first vessel. Be alone, be happy to be by yourself where you're not disturbed. For it's only by being by yourself that you can think of these things and take control of your mind and your body. Spend lots of time by yourself. Being by yourself is not loneliness when you understand what you're doing. Begin to love to be by yourself. You can't wait for the time that you can be alone. Number two, the second vessel, is love to be in satsang. Satsang literally means to sit at the feet of the master with an empty mind, not with preconceived ideas, not with doubts, not with a fighting spirit, but with an open heart. Love for satsang leads to enlightenment. But, you have to be careful in this world to whom you go where you go. They have so many movements, so many organizations, so many pseudo-spiritual groups that it's hard to decide where to go. The best way to know, is to ask yourself, be by yourself. If you are sincere, if you have been working on yourself diligently, something in you will lead you to the right place. Where you can grow and unfold beautifully. Vehicle number three. You have to have a desire to associate with people on the path like yourself, your friends. To associate with sages, with people who think like you. Who are trying to unfold. It's easy for the world to pull you down. You can associate with the wrong people and they look very interesting to you. They pull you down into Maya and then you have to start all over again to work your way up. You've got to be careful. You've got to be aware where you go. With whom you hang around. Let your heart tell you. Those are the three vessels. Now we'll play some music. Music played. That thing is usually where I don't talk as much as I usually do here. Where we ask questions about spiritual life. And I know you have questions about the path and about what I was talking about generally about anything, and this is where we get a chance to find out what really is going on. Because if you don't ask, you will never know. So feel free to ask questions at this time. Anything you would like me to expound on, to talk about or whatever you feel inside. Narada? SN, second principle, I have a deep feeling that you're never born. Robert, that you are unborn, you do not persist and you do not disappear. SN, when you say that you do not persist, it means your life between so-called birth and death does not exist. SN, does not exist. Okay, in trying to reconcile that with when we were doing the meditation, I exist. I exist. When I'm referring to, you do not exist, I mean you do not exist as an entity as a person. SN, so I exist is just self-inquiry to find out who exists. Exactly. SN, and when you say, I do not persist, I do not persist as an ego entity. As an ego entity doing all kinds of things in the world SN, 
but I persist as the self. The self is. Sn. Persistence. Persistence is the ego. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this, it appears that you are real the way you are, but science has proven that nothing is the way it appears. Think for a minute, if you were the size of an atom and you found yourself in my body, would I be a body? Do you know how small an atom is? And if you found yourself in my body, every cell of my body would be the equivalent distance of the Earth to the Moon and to Mars and all the planets. There would be cells and as an atom, you would be able to look up and see a universe like you do now and that would be my body or your body or anybody's body. So as you can see you are not what you appear to be. It is your senses that fool you. It is your ego mind that tells you that you are a body and you look this way and you have to eat and drink and you get older and you die. It's a lie. But as long as we collectively believe in it, the lie becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Though when you are working on yourself with the principles and this is the second principle, you have a deep feeling, a deep realization that you are unborn. There was no time that you were born. And you prove this again by realizing who gave you birth. Your parents. Who gave them birth? Their parents and you go back all the way. Now when you go back to the end what do you get? Nothing. Who was the first person that lived? If you believe in the biblical tale, you believe in Adam and Eve, but that's nonsense that's a fairy tale for children. You just appear just like in a dream. When you dream do you dream about Adam and Eve giving birth to the human race? Of course not. The dream just begins in the middle as it appears, like everything is already here. This life that you call real is the same as a dream only longer. Everything just appears because of your mind, and everything keeps appearing because of your mind. When the mind is transcended everything stops and you wake up. Just like waking up from a dream. Though you have to understand that you were never born. You do not have a life that appears to be real just an appearance, a dream. And you do not disappear in the end, you do not die because there is no place to go since you are omnipresence itself. But, do not allow this to confound you. Keep it simple within yourself. Let the message go deep into your subconscious. And you will know the truth by yourself, not intellectually, but you will become a living embodiment of the truth involved and you will become free. What seems to confuse some people is sometimes I intermix absolute terms with relative terms. I talk about the self as human and the self as divine. There is really one self, but for discussion to take place, we have to divide it to show you that your human self is not real but your real self is real. So do not become confused. SS you mention about reading and that you could do it for motivation and for inspirational words. It lifts me out of Maya somehow. Robert, for a while. For a while it's temporary, yes. Robert, well it's like people smoking grass, it lifts them up for a little bit, makes them feel high, but then they drop down again. And then they've got to get stronger grass and stronger grass, Ganya, and the best stuff they can buy and then they've got to switch to cocaine, to get more high. Books are the same way. SS, but then would you think that not reading at all is better? Sometimes if you have a class like this to go to read very little. SS, Joel Goldsmith and Paramahansa Yogananda are those paths or those readings in conflict with what we're talking about here. Robert, there's only a conflict when there is not realization. When there is a realization there is no conflict. SS, well then there's conflict at this point. Lass. The real sage never writes too much or hardly anything. Every stage that I have met in India or elsewhere, Buddhists, Indian or whatever was not well read. It is only after they attained enlightenment that people gave them books. And they started to confirm their own experiences. 
though after you're enlightened you can look at anything it doesn't affect you any longer because you know who you are. But, before that you are very impressionable, you get pulled into the wrong teachings. Joel Goldsmith and Yogananda are good teachings but you've got to be careful. It's better to sit by yourself and argue with yourself, yell at yourself and investigate yourself, find yourself, work with yourself, spend more time doing that than reading. Somebody gave me three books during the month and I've been trying to get to them but I can't. Because like yesterday morning I was telling you I was by myself all day. I open a book and I read a passage or a sentence or a paragraph and I get blissed out and I've got to put the book down and get lost in consciousness. But, to read and read and read is not too healthy. You've got to be careful. SS, was Yogananda and like Joel Goldsmith were they realized beings or not? Robert, who is to say? I can't go into things like that, it doesn't matter. What matters is your life, your enlightenment. When you're in a burning building, you do not stop to admire the pictures on the wall. You get out of the building as fast as you can. But when you're engulfed in Maya, do not take the time to watch everything. And say this is interesting, and that's interesting, and I'll go here, and I'll go there. Work on yourself diligently, before you leave your body in this life. Though you will not have to come back again, and you will be free. No matter where we are, no matter what we think of ourselves, we can always work on ourselves. There's no one who cannot work on themselves because you exist, and as long as you exist you. Break in tape as Robert continues and watch and work with yourself. Something will give, something will happen, wait and see. But, you've got to do it, do not waste any time. SS, relax with it I guess. I thought if one say loses their job then there's this hole and automatically we go and try to fill that hole oftentimes don't we? Robert, sure we do. You have to stop thinking of yourself so much. SS, you have to let the holes be. Let everything be, stop fighting. Merge into it, become one with it. Do not fight. Do not try to change anything. But. Merely look at yourself, observe yourself, find out who you are and everything else will take care of itself. SS, so you should love the nothingness. Enjoy that space of nothingness? Well don't enjoy the space like you say due to the fact that you enjoy it as an ego. Don't do that. Don't love and don't hate. Leave it alone. Just watch become observant. Watch the feelings, watch the thoughts, watch how you act, observe yourself and see what happens. That's how it begins, and as you keep observing yourself, all of the negative conditions will begin to diminish and you will start to feel a peace that you never had before. You will feel a joy, a peace that's beyond comprehension. Says, do we sometimes get afraid and we try and hold on to those things, is that what happens? Well of course, but you must ask ourselves before that happens who fears. To whom do those feelings come? SS, like I'm losing my identity. Who is? Ask yourself whatever you feel ask yourself. All the answers are within yourself. SS, a thought came up while coming here. How we want to hang on to certain identities, and I thought that going to satsang, is that trying to fill a space? How is that different? Robert, it isn't any different, but you have to ask yourself, where do these thoughts come from? Where do these feelings and emotions come from that tell me this? Where did it arrive? How did it get here? To whom do they come? Who is bothered by them? That's how you go about it. Whatever happens you ask yourself the same question, to whom does it come? What gave it birth? How did I get this feeling? And when you do that for a while your heart will take you to the right place and you will know what you have to do. Trust yourself. Think of yourself as a divine person. Forget about the old you. Lift yourself up and worship yourself. SS. You mentioned positive thinking at one time. Well, 
positive thinking is better than negative thinking. When you practice self-inquiry your thinking patterns begin to change automatically. So you don't have to worry about that. SS, so you don't practice either positive or negative. No you don't. SS, but if you catch yourself in negative thinking, ask yourself, to whom does it come? That's all you've got to do. SS, you've mentioned positive thinking some time, right? I don't know if it was when I talked to you on the phone. Robert, well I did that because there are some people that just can't practice self-inquiry. So they have to do the next best. You have to do whatever you have to do. But, self-inquiry is the fastest and best way to get rid of yourself and become aware of who you are. SG, I'm just curious what do you think about? I mean as an alternative just sitting in the silence. Is that as fast as self-inquiry, or it depends on the person? Robert, it depends on the person. Silence is the best way. But, when we speak of silence it's not really silence, it's bliss. We just use that word. SG, not silence but, just like emptiness. SG, not even that, it's just, it's not really emptiness. SG, you can't describe it. But you have to be sure that you're sitting in the right silence. That's why self-inquiry is better because it brings you to silence in the right way. SG, right. If the silence is not silence, but it's not nothing or something. If you feel a joy. If you feel something you can't explain. SG, something all-encompassing then you know you're on the right track. When you follow the I when you ask, who am I? It leads you to silence because you don't answer. That's the true silence. But, if you're into the occult, or you're into channeling, or you're into the rest of these things, if you try to sit in silence, you'll be bombarded by voices, by things, by all kinds of nonsense, and they all come from your own mind because you believe certain things. That's why people say, these entities have gotten hold of my body, because they were dwelling in these things, and they believe in spirit entities. Though naturally they create it in themselves, but they think they're coming from somewhere else. SN, so when we sit in silence, I see how the thoughts arise. We should inquire, to whom do these thoughts come? Robert, exactly all the time. Whenever a thought comes, it's like you have a gun, you shoot it down by self-inquiry by asking, to whom does it come? That's gone, then another thought comes. Sen, now if we sit and the thoughts arise, but we don't inquire is that also another practice? That's another practice, that works also, by just watching and by not reacting to it. But, you have to be able to do that. It's not easy for most people. But if you can watch your thoughts they'll just disappear by themselves, but you have to be able to be the witness to watch. SN, you know if the thoughts arise, rather than say, to whom do these thoughts come? If you say, who am I, it gives you a different impression. You can do that. It'll change your mode of thinking. SN, you know what I've noticed is that if I was doing, who am I? It starts to become like a mantra. It shouldn't be a mantra, it's not a mantra. SN, right. SS, do you do it fast when you do it? Robert, no. SN, rather than to do self-inquiry through who am I? If I just let the thought arise and then ask, to whom do the thoughts come? That gives a different practice. Robert, yes it does. Whenever you inquire, who am I, you just don't repeat over and over again like a parrot, but you take a space and rest in between each one and you say, who am I, then you can change it and say, where does the I come from? Who am I? And you emphasize the I I, who am I I? Where did the I come from? SF, Robert, we're just sitting with I, does it have the same effect? Robert. 
Yes, it does. You can just sit with I. I. It has the same effect as I am. S. F. Or who am I too? It has the same effect. It depends what your nature is. Everyone's nature is different. If you repeat I. I. You can do that like a mantra. You can say I. 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 It's like saying I am. I am. I am that I am. That you can do like a mantra. S. N. What is I. I. Robert, I am that I am. I am I. I am I. Okay, thank you. S. F. Even though it has a mantric appearance, it's more or less an equivalent to inquiry. Robert, it's inquiry. Yes, that comes to pass. It comes out. It's a very good thing to do. Do whatever you have to do, but make your life simple. Do not make it complicated. In other words, don't say, "I've got to do this by five o'clock tonight." Take your time. Relax. Forget about time. Forget about days. Forget about lifetimes. Just do what you have to do and let nature take its course. Everything will happen like it's supposed to. S. B. When I inquire, it always leads me back to bare consciousness, which is like an impersonal mystery. Robert, that's good too. As long as you think it's an impersonal mystery, then something is working deep within yourself, and something will answer the call, and you'll be told what the mystery is. But don't try to figure it out. S. B. It's like not knowing anything at all and not being anything. No space, spacelessness, no dimension. How do you feel? S. B. The feeling of it is a lovely feeling. Then it's good. S. B. A joy probably. Then keep it up. Something will give. S. B. It feels like being in love with self. That's a good feeling. S. G. I had a similar feeling. I guess it was two Saturdays ago. An amazing peace. It wasn't like I had explosions or anything. It was just so firm that everything just contracted upon itself. There was no. I feel it was stronger. Robert, well, how did you feel after? S. G. I don't know when it ended. See, when you have these feelings, and they're real feelings, they have an effect on your humanhood. S. G. Yeah, I didn't feel emotional. I felt very peaceful. It's hard to say. Yes. S. G. Love for everything, but there was no need for love for everything, you know, because it was there. You have a feeling of immortality. S. G. Yeah. You just know that all is well. S. G. Yeah. See, the funny thing about this is enlightenment doesn't make you a soothsayer or magician. You do not perform occult acts. When I was with Ramana Maharshi, I remember people used to come up and look at him, and they used to look at me and say, "He's just a funny old man. I get nothing out of him. Who's he?" And they'd go away. So you see, people who appreciate sages like that and who know where they're coming from. They would have had to have done something to themselves for many years before, many lifetimes. Otherwise, they just can't get it, or you will not understand what it's all about because you're looking for something, and there's absolutely nothing to look for because everything is, all is well. S. S. Is that why some people aren't interested in spiritual paths? I see people getting married, their babies getting baptized. And they seem well and happy, and they don't have problems or any other things wrong, or maybe they're already there. Laughs. Robert, well, that has to do with karma. Do you're speaking on a human level? S. S. Yeah, because they don't seem interested in this kind of stuff at all. Everybody who experiences human happiness will have to experience human unhappiness. They're two sides of the same coin. S. S. Maybe not even in this lifetime. Maybe not, but it's not for us to judge. It's for us to be. Do we learn to leave the world alone? Because the world is so strong, it'll grab you. It'll fool you. It'll say, "Look at this person. Look at that person. They're fine. They're like this. They're like that. 
they're not doing what you're doing. But don't fall for that, they've got their own problems. SS, I went to dinner with a friend about six months ago and she kept let's get together for dinner, I kept having to say oh well this is not a good time, we finally went. After the first five or ten minutes I didn't have anything to say, I felt very uncomfortable being there because everything we said was more like chit chat, it didn't mean anything. I guess these things just fall away. Robert, do not concern yourself with why things happen to you. SS, it bothered me that I was there and couldn't wait to get home. I'll have more excuses next time because I couldn't feel any reason to get together really. Robert, again, do not make your life complicated, keep your life simple. Try to be by yourself. Associate with those people who think like you. Try to keep yourself happy and peaceful. Don't make your life too complicated with people or places. SS, not too many people in Orange County that are into this. I hope you guys are familiar with Orange County but it's pretty conservative. I guess there's people out there. Robert, if you're doing the right thing the right thing will happen. SS, so those people will meet up with people. Like begets like. So don't criticize yourself. Do not look for anything just be yourself. Be natural, be yourself, be simple, be spontaneous, be happy. Do not look for things to complicate your life. SS, kind of childlike in a sense. Yes simple. Another thing Ramana used to do. People used to tell him that were some intellectuals coming to see you, some pundits. Who are coming to have a discourse with you about the religion, about Hinduism, about this, about that. So he used to go outside of his place, and he always wore loin cloths. And he would rub himself with mud and become filthy and sit in the mud. And when they'd come by they would say, where does the sage live? And he would say, he's gone, he doesn't live here anymore, and then they would inquire up the hill, and they would say, you just passed him sitting in the mud. Laughter. And they would become disillusioned and go away. There was no time to argue. Nobody is trying to prove anything. Nobody is better than anybody else. Simplicity is the key. Do not try to convert anybody, be yourself and then they'll ask you, how come you're like that, I want to find out, then you can tell them. Become a living example and people will follow you. Play some more music. Hate break then Robert continues after the music played. This is your class. SM, how long were you in India with Ramana Maharshi and when did you receive your enlightenment? If you want to talk about it. Robert, it's a long story, but I was with Ramana Maharshi for two years before he died, 1948 to 1950 and I don't know anything about enlightenment. I've always been this way. Except what I've read in books when I was a teenager that that's what is called self-realization. Lass. Assess, did you talk about realization during the time you were with Ramana? Robert, I went to see him because he felt like I did. He had the same experiences. Assess, you've had this since you were a child? Yes. SB. A few weeks ago, Robert, you said when you were with Ramana and you had a profound experience. Robert, oh of course, but it wasn't an experience that I didn't have before. Just sitting there, things happen. SB, did it become permanent at that time? No, it was always permanent. It was just, when you're with somebody like that, you just merge into them and you get an extra dose of bliss. Laughs SB. How many years were you with him? Two years. SB. Two years you were in his presence. Yeah, not all the time. That was my main headquarters, but I went to different places and came back. SB. You said you went to see Amanda, my ma. Was she a great realized person? Robert. Oh yes, she was a great person. She was like Romana, female version. I know you like to hear stories about those things, 
but I purposely cut it short because you get enthralled with the story and you forget about yourself. It's important to remember that you are Ramana. What he had you have and to awaken yourself to that fact through self-inquiry. SB, you know I was thinking just now Robert. This whole process is similar to like a caterpillar shedding its caterpillarness and becoming a butterfly. Robert, you can say that. You know it's just like here we are as mind, myself, this ego self and this you know. Coming more of consciousness and less of mind and it's like becoming a whole different animal like. Robert, that's a good analogy. And yet we were that all the time, the potential of that and we weren't. We were being the mechanism, the apparatus mind, instead of being the consciousness which we really really were. It's just the other way around. We were animating and acting like the mind and forgetting about the consciousness which is our real life and now we're just putting the mind aside and using it only when we need it and abiding in the consciousness and then something magical happens, then we become the butterfly, like in a whole different dimension. Robert, yes. When we're babies, we're free and we actually have a semblance of self-realization when we're a little baby. But, then we become brainwashed by our parents and then by our schools and our churches and our environment, and here we are totally brainwashed into believing we're something we're not. S.N. Robert, have you seen this type of metamorphosis happening to people along the way? Robert, yes I have. Quite a few, not quite a few, but quite a few. S.N. Was it a permanent thing? Oh, it's a permanent thing. When this affects you it's like contagious. It affects you permanently and then everybody else is affected too. But it doesn't come and go. It's something that stays all the time. If it comes and goes it's not that it's something else. SN and then these people go on and live their everyday lives. Yes. The body does what it came here to do. Again that's something that people still can't understand. They can't understand that for a self-realized person, why they would do this or do that, or act like an ordinary human being. But, the fact is that's how you see it. That's not what I see, that's what you see. Like when Ramana was dying he was laughing and his disciples were crying, they said, Master don't leave us, we've seen you heal other people, just by them being in your presence. Why can't you heal yourself? Don't go away, and he said, You fools, what did I teach you? Where can I go? There's nowhere to go. I will always be here. He saw something else. He was living in the world, but he saw reality. He saw himself as eternal bliss, as absolute reality, and he was not dying. But, those people who are not enlightened see death and that's the difficult part to comprehend. Try to remember that everything that you see with your eyes is erroneous and false. That's why when someone who wants to argue with me about it, I always say the sky is blue. Because in truth, there's no sky and there's no blue. It's an optical illusion. That's how our life is, it's an optical illusion, it does not exist the way it appears to and when we wake up we'll see that. SS, you said we can do self-inquiry when we're driving anyway. Robert, yes you can. But if you want to make it more of a habit if it's fairly new, I mean I've meditated, but self-inquiry feels different to me than when I've meditated because I kind of get relaxed or something. Is there a specific amount of time that you would recommend doing it? Robert, if you want a time, you can use two hours in the morning before you get up, just like if you get up at seven, get up at five. SS, before you do anything? When it's quiet in your home and you're not disturbed. Sit by yourself. And do it two hours before you go to sleep, sit by yourself, if you need a time. But make it go on all during the day. What I'm going to do, is I'm going to give you a mantra to help you out. This is a self-inquiry mantra and you can alternate with this and everything else you do. Now the way you're going to use this is this way. Whenever something is bothering you, 
Whenever you feel out of sorts, whenever you feel something is wrong, stop thinking of your problem and do the mantra. Do it before falling asleep and as soon as you get up in the morning. This will help tremendously. You can interchange this with the four principles. When you get tired of thinking of the four principles, you can do this mantra. And it's very powerful and it works wonders. It starts with your breathing, here's what you do. You inhale and you say, who am I, and before you exhale you say, I am he, then you exhale and you say, I am not the body. You inhale and you say, who am I, before you exhale you say, I am he, before you exhale you say, I am not the body. Simple. Any questions about that? Tape break then student asks question. SS. Go through the principles, the four principles first that you gave. Robert. You can interchange. If you get tired of the four principles and the three vessels, use the mantra. SS. When you say use the four principles you mean recall them to mind, observe them and be silent. Yes, but when you get tired of doing that use the mantra, or during the day you can use the mantra, or whatever you like, whatever is easier for you. So you've got something to do and something to use all the time. That's important to keep your mind busy. SM, would you say it again? Robert, you inhale you say, who am I, as you hold your breath you say, I am he, and you exhale, and you say, I am not the body. It's very simple, but very powerful. Things will begin to happen if you do this. SN, this shouldn't replace self-inquiry. No. What I'm trying to do is to give you ammunition. So you can handle every situation that comes along. Laughs. SB, so you do this when you're like disturbed and your mind is racing angry. Robert, yes. SN, when you can't do self-inquiry. Robert, yes. SG, it shouldn't be in place of because some people could be attached to the mantra. Robert, it won't do you any harm. It'll do you good. It's good to be attached to it. Because you're stating the truth. SS, it's okay to be attached to that mantra? Yes. As a matter of fact, let's do it right now. Make yourself comfortable and you'll see how good you feel. You can close your eyes if you like. First relax yourself by taking 10 deep breaths, diaphragmatic breaths, 10 deep breathing breaths, for relaxation. Silence. Now ask the question, inhale and say, who am I hold it and say, I am he exhale and say, I am not the body. Who am I? I am he. I am not the body. Thoughts interfere. Just ignore your thoughts and go right back to it again. Silence. Did anything interesting happen to anybody? This is very powerful stuff. S.M. Really deep energy. Robert, did your thoughts bother you and interfere? S.M. Definitely. Your thoughts are very powerful. They don't want to be left out. So they're going to butt in and you'll start thinking about dinner or what you're going to wear tomorrow or whatever. When that happens don't fight, but simply in a gentle way go back to the mantra and keep on doing it again and again and the thoughts will come less and less. This makes you unpointed. SG when I was doing it, it dissolved after a while. Robert, and what happened? Everything was gone. Robert, how did you feel? Oh, it was great, I mean, it was great, it wasn't an experience per se, it was just a very deep state with nothing. A very peaceful state. Robert, it affects different people differently, but that's good. SG, very peaceful state, I wanted to stay longer. Laughs. There was no thought. Yes, all these things bring you to no thought to mindfulness. SG, yeah. Effortlessly, there's no fighting, no shoving. You simply let it happen by itself. SS, 
I felt calm and then I did the self-inquiry and then I felt that I was gone and I jolted like this because I started to fall asleep. Laughs Robert, um, it's good for your body. It frightened me at first but then as soon as I caught myself I just went back to it. Robert, it will make you peaceful and calm. Tape ends. Transcript 9. That's in the S practice. 6 September, 19, 190. Robert, Thursdays, we're very informal. We have a chance to get into things perhaps we don't usually talk about on Sunday. We should continually remind ourselves of truth, of who we are and what we are. Don't let yourselves get caught up in your jobs or in your work or in whatever you do where you forget about yourself. Always confess the truth to yourself. So when I make my confession, I speak in the first person, I am. And as you are aware when I say I am, I am not referring to Robert. I'm referring to I am omnipresence, which includes all sentient beings. So the confession includes you, not me. For I don't have to say anything myself. So let's close our eyes and remind ourselves of this truth. I am absolute reality. I am unfathomable wisdom. I am pure intelligence. I am Sachit Ananda Parabrahman. I am of the unborn. I am perfect intelligence. Divine mind. Nirvana. Emptiness. I was never born and I shall never disappear. I am that I am. This is the truth about me. This is my confession. This is my reality. Silence. Who am I? I am he. I am not the body. Phone rings, I am not the doer. I am not the mind. I am pure consciousness, para-Brahman, omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience. This is my truth. Short silence, Robert continues. Um shanti 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 peace peace. You can open your eyes. Become aware of this truth all of time. You know let an hour go by when you are not aware of this truth about yourself. Someone called me on Tuesday and asked me this question. Sunday you said that the best way to awaken is to be at satsang all the time and then later you said the best way to awaken is to practice the teaching at home. Which is which? Sounds like a contradiction. Who can tell me the difference? Students guess. SD, I can guess that satsang is more or less an attitude. Robert, you're on the right track. Any more answers? SK, satsang is where you can get a taste or understand what the state is, and you go home and develop that doing your practice. Robert, in a way that's true too. SD, what's the original question? Robert, I said that satsang is the best way to awaken, but then later I said, if you practice the things at home that we learn, that awakens you also. The which is real, which is better. Laughs. Students ponder and guess. SF, no difference? Robert, there is no difference. But remember we're talking to students. So if a person is a real devotee, then satsang is a thing for them. But, if they're a disciple, or if they're a student who goes from teaching to teaching, then they should practice at home. That's the main difference. Do you see that? For real devotee, all you need is satsang, nothing else. SD, continue, you learning at home? No, whenever you're there. That will do it for you. SG, I've never separated the two before. Robert, it depends on your discerning. SN, Robert once gave a satsang on the difference between a devotee and a disciple. It's worth hearing. I have it on tape. Robert, is there a difference between a devotee and a disciple and between a bhakti and a jani? Robert, in reality as you know there's no difference. But, 
at a level from where somebody is coming from or where they think they're coming from, there's a difference. Though it depends on what level you're talking about. Bhakti leads to jhana. Everything leads to jhana. When you love God with all your heart and with all your soul, you become God. So you become a jhani. SD isn't also a jhana is acknowledging bhakti with devotion? Robert, yes. Though devotion is leading to ultimate reality. Robert, yes, and when you're devoted to God, really devoted, and you really surrender your life to God, then you will merge with God. SN, now if you go to satsang with a devotional attitude, I can see how that would make one a devotee. However, if you're more tending toward Johnny, then would you still feel that devotion in satsang? See what I'm getting at. Robert, yes. When you attend satsang, the vibration for a devotee makes you equal with the Johnny. You become one with the Johnny. SN, but if you're more tending toward being a Johnny, then is that devotion near? The devotion is near. SN, so even if you're a Johnny, you could feel a great love still. Yes, you always feel great love. SN, so what's the difference? At that stage, there's no difference. SD, but if you actually in Sanskrit break the words down, there's a slight difference between devotion and knowledge. Bhakti means devotion and jhana means knowledge, that's all. SN, but really isn't it having love but as well as understanding? Robert, it's all one. For whom is there a difference? For the Ajani. Person that still thinks they're the body. Then there's a difference. And that's the person we're talking about. Though for instance we get some students who go from teaching to teaching. Read all kinds of books. Do all kinds of things. That's more of a disciple type person. So that person has to practice and come to satsang. But, the true devotee, like the person, I always talk about who used to fan Ramana. Who used to pull the fan and fan Ramana for 40 years. Laughs. That's all he did. He was a devotee and when he dropped dead Ramana said he's not coming back. SD, so he would have reached enlightenment by devotion. By pulling the fan. SD, which is devotion. Yes. SN, he didn't have to do anything else. That's it. He was always at satsang. SF, I was going to ask you Robert a question. Of course it seems like aside from the Janic gesture or inquiry, I would say self-inquiry, but yet devotion to the Guru per se also takes you to the self, doesn't it? Robert, the devotion of the Guru? SF, to the Guru. Oh to the Guru, oh yes of course, but it doesn't mean you have to worship the Guru. SF, no. It means if you're devoted to the Kiru, you're devoted to God and to yourself. SD, that's what he was telling us, the man who did the fanning on Maharshi. He was a devotee, and that devotion led him to enlightenment. SF, okay. So, would you consider in the process of self-inquiry, somebody may just be a devotee more than a disciple, or he could be a next step, right? Robert, well, what usually happens is that a devotee becomes a jhani, and the jhani becomes a devotee. But, they're all are the same, there's no difference, and the devotee is to the self. They begin to see if somebody like Ramana is the whole universe. Everywhere they look they see Ramana. SD, then are you saying that the devotee has reached enlightenment? Robert, possibly. In the case of the man who fanned Ramana, he didn't know within this lifetime that he would not come back so at his death. Robert, well even when he was alive because he knew nothing else. Laughs. All he knew was Ramana. He didn't have a mind of his own anymore, his mind was gone. His mind became Ramana's mind. SD, he would be enlightened in a sense that he did for forty years. Yes, he never said anything. 
SN, you know how they say in the Bhagavad Gita. The thought, the last thought you have before you leave the body think on that and it's not so much the last thought but progression what you are you become. Though he became Ramana in his lifetime. Robert, well not only that if you take it literally. He say well I don't have to do anything on my last thought I'll think of God realization and become realized but the trick is you won't be able to. SN, you won't be able to? Robert, no, and also isn't there a principle when you leave the body then you become enlightened, like at that moment it's like sudden or final enlightenment. I forget what the term is, I've been thinking about that. SD, that's given mukti when you're enlightened while living, and there's another kind and I forget the word too but another kind of mukti. SU, for whom does all this come? Robert, that's right. Who wants to know? Laughter. SD, I have a question, and I know what your answer going to be, but when you had us close our eyes and more or less repeat with you or absorb with what you were saying about that I am. There's always the part of me, and I know this will be your answer to this, who thinks that but that feels too insignificant and humble to believe that stuff. Robert, just observe. Observe that there is a part of me feeling too insignificant. Robert, observe what's going on, become aware of it. Just to be aware of it, gets rid of it. SG, that's just the difference between I am and your little self. Sn, but I would say the truth is, is that you are that. First of all, yes you, yes you. But also to feel humble in such a way, well not humble but. SD. Well it is humble and insignificant. Insignificant, that's kind of blasphemy again because I remember once I mentioned to Robert well I'm just ignorant and he said well that's blasphemy. SD, well I may be feeling that once I question your words but nonetheless that's how I feel that keeps me the same way. Well what I'm trying to say, it's kind of a reverse psychology because one is like the ego is saying, well I'm great which is like not specific, and the other one is saying, well poor me. Which is the same thing because it's still me. And it's the same thing, yes you. I would say yes you. SD, well I knew you would say, well who feels insignificant, right? Robert, well, not only that but just to be aware of your feelings, makes those feelings disappear. Just to be aware of them. To watch them. To observe them. SD, I sometimes don't feel worthy when you say I am. I started to ask should I resist that feeling but I just observe it. Robert, no, resist nothing. SG, you merge into that and there's no ego to feel in that sense. SD, yeah that's true, does anybody else have a hard time dealing with their omnipresence? SN, well I did, I did, and then, when Robert brought that to light I saw the mechanism. SD, two sides of it. Yes, so my point to you is understand the mechanism. It's the same for showing its face at a different thing, and know that you are, you are that, you are that, you are all of that. And when you think, feel like Robert says, the four principles. When you think it and feel it, and you understand it, you become it, don't resist. Who me? Don't say that, that's blasphemy. Yes me. I am that. And I did feel that way, I did feel that way, and he, Robert, pointed that out to me, and I meditated on it, and never put anyone down, never put yourself down. Robert, no matter how many mistakes you make, just pick yourself up, brush yourself off and start all over again. Another question people ask me. Somebody in particular called me a couple of weeks ago and asked me the question, which is real interesting. They said, I used to be a Johnny laughter. But, what happened is, it didn't do me any good. Laughter, SD, I used to be a wife but. But it didn't do any good physically laughter. SN, so then I took up baseball. Laughs. Exactly. 
SD, what did you say? Robert, well, I explained that if you were a Johnny, you would always be a Johnny, there's no turning back. You can't intellectualize it and say you're a Johnny, but the important point is this, actually of what significance is it, what good does it do you in the world? Well to begin with, it's hard to explain, because when you realize you are not your body. This is literally what it means, you are not your body. Even though the appearance of the body is still there. Even though people look at a body and say well I see your body. Who sees the body? The Ajani sees the body. But, the body is not there it doesn't exist and in the appearance world the body seems to be going through all kinds of things. Just like the sky is blue. The sky is not blue and there's no sky. But, we say the sky is blue because it looks blue and it looks as if there's a sky. In the same way, it appears as if there is a body, but this is like hypnosis. This is the mortal dream. We're seeing with our senses, and we're seeing with our false imagination, and we believe what we see is real. Though the secret is to not identify nor judge with your eyes or with your senses, the things that you see. We just watch like we're watching a movie. But we realize it has no substance. There's no cause, it's egoless, it's all an emanation of my mind. That's how we should talk to ourselves and get rid of the feelings that bother us when we observe something we don't like. But, again the question really is, while I am not enlightened what good does it do me? Will it make me rich? Will it give me a new house? New companions? Will it give me love, happiness, joy? Of course I try to explain those things are your very nature. Though it can't give you those things because you are those things. But, as long as you believe you're not, the path to this jhana marga, the path to jhana will make you dream a better dream. Do you see what I'm saying? SD, yeah, as you unfold even though you still believe that you are the body, you'll become happier, you'll have more peace. Things will go better no matter how they look. SN, things seem to go better with Robert. Laughter. Robert, and you'll stop worrying. All your worries will just cease as you unfold. Until the time comes when you realize nobody's home. There never was a body, there never was a mind, but until then your so-called humanhood does improve if you're following the path. In other words, the things that used to bother you before will cease. Before you used to look at the pictures of the world, you would become disillusioned, there's wars, man's inhumanity to man and you'd worry you'd be sad. All those feelings will go away. Not because you don't care, because you realize what's really going on. You will know the truth about the world as you will know the truth about your body. The reason the world is the way it is, is because you believe you are the body. You're giving birth to the picture. And you say, well, Robert, everybody else gives birth to the same picture. True, because collectively we're all dreaming the mortal dream. SD, are we all dreaming the same dream? I thought the reason, tape unclear. Robert, in reality that's true also but we're all dreaming. SN, but we perceive people to be a certain way and then when we get to know them, we find out that they're not that way. We only thought they were that way. We never really know. We can't judge a book by its cover. Happened to me continually then I said, that's what it means don't judge. Robert, we leave things alone. We stop fighting, we stop trying to get even. We stop trying to change people, to make them believe what we believe. We're just easy and gentle and watch. We have extreme compassion, mercy and we just observe. We float through the world. We're in the world but not of the world, but again the answer to the question is, your life does improve. What do you call your life now? This is why I say sometimes, it's dangerous to expound these truths to people that are not ready because it seems to give them license to do as they please, and you can't do it. It's like what we were talking about in the car. We were talking about rules and some other people and you said, well that's their karma. 
but that's a mistake I didn't want to say anything. Even though that's their karma, we have to act like karma doesn't exist. Until we realize that we don't exist. SD, do you mean disciples too or everyone? Robert, everybody. SD, everyone has to act like karma doesn't exist. Yes. Exactly because karma only exists because you believe that you are the body. Sen, I mean, I can see that in terms of myself and I said that was their karma, as if I'm trying to work on myself and trying to understand that I have no karma whereas they aren't doing that therefore they are bound by their karma. Robert, but it's not your business what they're doing. Sn, true. In other words, if you were in trouble say you went to court yesterday right? And you were locked up in jail. Sn, I did go to court yesterday. Laughs. And if I heard about it, I would come down and bail you out. Sd, even if you thought that was his karma? Robert, I wouldn't think about it. Sg, you would just do it. Robert, I would just do it. Out of compassion or whatever just do it. Without analyzing. Robert, exactly. SD, yeah but you could mean that it was your karma to bail him out and that could go. Robert, that's how the Ajani sees it. SN, yeah but you could take it either way. Who takes it either way? SN, the Ajani? That's right. That's false imagination. The Johnny just does what's present. SN. Okay my question is, should we not only act and understand as if we have no karma but also as if other people have no karma? Yes exactly. Do we have wisdom that goes along with that? We do not become a doormat for people to step on. But, if someone is in trouble we help. If they're in our path. SD, well aren't you saying that the Johnny lives in the now? Robert, spontaneously. Everything is spontaneous. Though somebody tells me Glenn is in jail, I don't think about it, I don't care what you did. I won't try to analyze it. I'll just go down and bail you out. Laughs. Asen, so when I say that well so and so is going through this, but that's their karma. Robert, that makes it sort of cold. You know what I mean. Asen, yeah I see that yeah. It makes it like we're better than that we know it's their karma so they deserve it. Sn, well yeah. Laughs. Sg, because they believe they have to go through karma and that karma exists for them. Robert, yes but it's not our business. Sn, so when you say that that's cold then how should we view it? By not viewing it at all by just being. Sn, just a total objectivity you mean? Yes. SF, what about guilty feelings, that's a problem because I'm. Robert, ask, for whom are the guilty feelings? Observe them. SF, okay then you question yourself about action? For whom is there action? SF, right action. Right, right action. If you're living spontaneously you will know what to do. You'll take the right action. Anything you do will be the right action. If you're doing it spontaneously. But, if you have to think about it that's something else. SF right, so you do your first impulse? It depends who's doing it. Because the first impulse may be to kill somebody. Laughs, SF. The first impulse could be egoic or it could be spontaneous depending on what you are doing. We'll look at it this way. If you're on a true spiritual path and you're devoted to the path you don't have to worry about those things, it'll work out. But what I said is also a contradiction. Because let's say Rahul calls you and wakes you up at 3 in the morning and says, Glenn, drive me to the dentist. Laughs. Then what you should do, if you're really on the path you spontaneously say Rahul, I'd love to take you but I just can't because I've got to sleep, it's very important to me. I'm sorry I'll try to help you next time goodbye.
and you forget it, no guilt feelings, no feelings whatsoever. You're just doing what's right. But you don't even think about it. So it happens in the right way, if you do it spontaneously. But if he calls you and then, can you drive me to the dentist and you say, you think about it and you get guilt feelings and say, gee, I wonder if I should, I wonder if I shouldn't, and you feel mad and angry. SF. All these things are again analogies and then you keep going on rolling and rolling. And it never stops. The whole thing keeps going on and on. SF, so Robert by doing spiritual practice things will take care of itself. Robert, yes. That's why I gave you that mantra on Sunday. If you work on that all the time, when your mind starts bothering you when you have guilt feelings, when you feel something is wrong somewhere, immediately catch yourself and do that mantra. SD, you told us that mantras do not lead to enlightenment. They can help to still the mind. Robert, it helps to still the mind. Everything I told you, everything I give you is to make the mind quiescent. Once there's an empty mind you're realized. Those things are important when you're troubled. SD, do you dwell in the, I am as a Johnny, but do you personally breathe I am? Robert, well you just answered the question. Do I personally? Is there a person left? Could I still be there? There were a person. SD, what about Robert? Robert doesn't exist. SG, I cannot understand Robert doesn't exist. Robert, Robert only exists for you because you exist. So you really didn't come out here. Laughter. SN, what about other mantras that other people get? Is there any difference? Robert, they're all produced of the same thing. So there's no difference. Robert, there's no difference. SK, what about the mantras that actually seem to give you something? Robert, who is the you who gets anything? SK, I don't know. There's no you that needs anything. SK, at the same time on a relative level there seems to me to be some kind of feeling that pleasurable. If it helps you use it. If it helps you to get rid of the feeling that you just described, use it. SK, or if it gives you a divine energy of some kind, and it also leads one to the state of emptiness of mind. Then use it as long as it helps. SD, Robert has mentioned before anything that quietens the mind makes you one-pointed. Robert, but always remember who needs a mantra. Body the mind. SN, so Robert, People can become self-realized on any path as long as it's usually either through devotion or through jhana, which almost any path takes on one of these colors, right? Robert, yes. So, self-realization can happen on any path through these methods? Robert, yes it can. Because ultimately they all lead to self-inquiry. Robert, but unfortunately what happens in most paths, they get lost in the process. SD, the first lesson in the book of Ananda Maima, she said that to any path, whatever path that suits you, pursue with all your heart, and you will reach enlightenment. Robert, yes, but she had to take that statement, pursue it with all your heart. Pursue it with all your heart, think about that. SD, well maybe I said it wrong not in the same reference. You're right. SG, and the changes that occur when a Bhakti and Bhakta becomes a Jhani and Jhani becomes a Bhakta. Those are very nauseous images that I've never seen myself. It's all ego self. Robert, yes it is. SG, if one is a Bhakta becoming a Jhani do they ever go to a state of a Bhakta again? No, not really, but when you're a Johnny, you just have unconditional love, devotion. If I go into a holy temple someplace, I start crying. SD, you would be seeing it as a bhakti. Robert, exactly. 
Me too, what is it about that is there a holy energy or something? I find it in the churches and temples not even of my own. Robert, there is a divine energy that's who you really are and your heart just opens up. Esti, is there something in that place? At least on the earth plane, something that's collected like in the old churches, like you said in a holy place, you know what makes this holy. Robert, something within you remembers, remembers your divinity. S.D., there seems to be a collective consciousness in certain places, holy places. Robert, yes, but it's you. That's right because you are collective consciousness. Robert, you remember from past lives, from past experiences. You remember your divine nature. Who you really are, and you start crying. Why are you crying? Because you believe that you are the body all these years, and you don't know it. S.D., it just seems to me what I felt was a feeling of release. Yes. S.D., it's not a sorrow, your tears just flow. Exactly. S.F., Robert, in several traditions I see, I think they talk about realization, it comes along with the elimination of thoughts. Is that true or is the thinker which is creating that and thoughts are still happening in the jhani? Of course I believe that thoughts are happening in the jhani, it's just that he doesn't identify with them or he doesn't think. Robert, that's true. They like bounce off. Thoughts come and disappear at the same time. They come and they're gone, they come and they're gone. S.D., that's right, you don't dwell on them, do you? Robert, exactly. S.F., but the Johnny or the realized one doesn't see them as factual things. Robert, indeed that's right. No, the thoughts are just returned to nothing. They come and they melt. Like ice. They come and they melt and they go, and they come and they melt and they go. S.F., no clinging, whatsoever. No clinging, no attachment. S.F., so that's what it means, elimination of thoughts. Yes, you can say that. S.F., because actually thoughts will always happen within the nature of things while you are living in this world. It's not like the thoughts that the average person has. The thoughts that come to me. I realize that they're not real. So I just look at them and they go away. S.F., so they acquire a new quality. They're a different quality of thought. But, you're right as long as there's something present, some part of the body is still present. Thoughts come, but they don't come to me. They just pass through. Like empty mind. S.D., Indira Divi, remember her? Robert, oh yes. Used to talk about that they were like clouds over a lake that don't touch the lake at all, they just pass by. Robert, Yes. They're reflected in a way, but they don't affect the stillness or bother whatsoever. Robert, you can say that. S.N. Robert, the thought came to me, well, does a Johnny cry? And then I thought, well, does a Johnny laugh? And then I thought, well, does a Johnny eat? So stupid. Laughter, Robert, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know the mind wants to say, well, does a Johnny cry? But then think about it. Robert, this is the karma of the body, but I am not the body. That's the way you see it. S.D., if you cry or Robert cries, is that what remains of you as a body? Is that real? Robert, know what you're seeing is like you're seeing the body. The body is going through that, but I'm not. S.D., aren't you the real you moved by those feelings? There's nothing to be moved, but that's how it appears. Laughter. S.N., because you know Ramana cried and so to understand. Robert, that's difficult to understand. Yes, yeah, so it's a very profound thing because some people will react, well, why does Ajani or why does Robert do this? Why did Ramana do that? Of course they don't understand, of course you can see why they can ask that. Though something to ponder. Robert, 
Yes, there is something to ponder because it's beyond words. Only when you touch the deepest part of yourself can you understand that. I seem to be walking, I seem to be sleeping, I seem to be dreaming, I seem to be here with you and yet I'm not doing any of those things. SD, but somehow we're getting emotions from you. That's how it appears, that's an appearance. SD, well it seems to happen only in your presence. Robert, it's like the sky, is blue again, like a mirage in the desert. SN, it's kind of like when you come to see Robert you get a chance to look in the mirror and then you say, ah, here I am, that's who I am. Robert, what you see is what you get. But you said the last sat thing that people think when you become self-realized that you have siddhis or whatever, and we would think that someone who is self-realized is absolutely perfect. That's why they don't cry, they don't fart, they don't you know, they're just perfection and that's not what this path is saying. Break in tape as another Robert continues. Robert, there's a mysterious power that's prepared you for something like this and brought you here and there as a mysterious power that made me appear this way. SD, so that same power brought us together. Robert, exactly. That's why they say when you're ready the master will come. Robert, yes. We've prepared ourselves for this path a long time ago in past lives and whatever we've done and here we are. SF, every single feeling or thought regardless of quality of that omniscience bliss from you Robert. Robert, bliss. I always feel bliss. With or without thoughts all the time. Robert, no thoughts. There's an indescribable feeling of love and peace and bliss and happiness. It's always available. SD, peace. That's always there but I can't describe it because it's the natural state. SD, it's our natural state. Yes, there are no words to describe it. SF, what I mean is the actual Johnny. Every thought, every feeling, everything could be sometimes presence, could be sometimes limitation. But I have the feeling that maybe the Johnny sees everything in bliss. Though it's bliss with a stimulus all the time. Robert, I see myself wherever I look. Though what I am, I see wherever I go. SD, so you see perfection, right? Everything is perfect. Again, it's a difficult thing to explain. SN, and yet we see ourselves in whatever we see too. Except that you see perfection and we see whatever our projection is. Robert, everybody sees differently. If I ask you all to look out the window and I ask you what do you see, I'll get six, seven different answers. One person will say, I see dirt in the street. Another person will say, I see the blue sky. Somebody else will say, I see my car being towed away. Everybody will see something else. According to your state of consciousness, that's what you see. But when I see, I see oneness. Like a moving picture and I see beyond the screen. SG, I don't know how to describe this but there's this feeling that comes. It's more peaceful, more powerful silence. Beyond silence itself, but it permeates everything. Even the most noisiest situation. I've been to concerts and even within that, even loud rock concerts or parties or the most peaceful park scene, there's still an underlying vast peace that doesn't matter where I am and it's as if that thing is so distant from you and yet it permeates you, and it doesn't matter where you are. You can be anywhere and there's a vast, I can't describe it. Robert, you're on the right track. There's a deafening silence that's just. SD, that you can always call on. No, it's there, you don't have to call on it. It doesn't matter where you are and what situation you're in. I can't describe it, but... Robert, let's say here's another example. Say for instance you started a fist fight and you're all fighting with each other. So I see the fight, it's not that I don't see the fight, but I see through it, like you were saying. 
I see through the fight. Though I'm not disturbed because I know all is well. SG, it's as if it doesn't exist. It exists but there's permeating through it. Like when you go to a movie, you watch the violence on the screen. But, something within you tells you that's not real. It's only a movie. SD, no matter how much you get caught up in it you can get up and leave. Robert, exactly, it's the same thing. I look at the world and I see the world going on. But I realize the world has a middle and a beginning and an end. And this too shall pass. So I don't get caught up on a minute of illusion. SG, in the practice on the path one can use every moment and every situation and shouldn't just try to find peaceful places or peaceful moments but should permeate that in every moment and find that everywhere. Robert, that sounds good. It's hard in the beginning I know. Robert, that's why if you look at the three vessels I gave you. The first one when you begin, you have to be alone. You have to find time to be alone a lot. Though you can work on yourself and become strong, then you can do what you said. SG, yeah. SD, so the vehicles or the vessels are the way to that feeling. Robert, yes. SG, so everything is holy and unholy, I mean everything is the same at that point. Robert, when you are by yourself a long time and you're working on yourself you become stronger and stronger and stronger. SD, some people do and some people get cranky. Well that's because they have no practice. SD, yeah what about the people who are lonely? We're not talking about those people. We're talking about people on a spiritual path. SD, so even just being alone, but also pondering spiritual matters. That's why you're alone. SN, it's a wanting to be alone. Robert, yes. Some people are alone, but they don't want to be alone. SD, right. It's not even wanting to be alone, it's what you do when you're alone. That too. SF, it's a yearning. SN, because one could hear the first vehicle, well because I heard this then, I should do that and it's not that, it's something that you desire, something that you understand, it's something that you do. And it's also like meditation because when I was on another path of meditation, and they would say that meditation is something that should be done lovingly, it should not be a burden, and for so many people, it was a burden and they missed the whole point. SD would now be a good time to share about that retreat you went on cause, you never really told us briefly what that path was about, and how you kept going back to it. Narada talks about his experience when on retreat. Robert, Robert responds to Narada's experience, you must be careful when you tell somebody, you are God. When it's said in the Upanishads, am Brahman, the true interpretation of that is, I am as Brahman. Though I am is God, not I am God, because I am God. You're saying my ego is God, and that's not true. SN, or how about you are the Guru? Well what part of you is the Guru? SN, just to say that you are the Guru? You can say that but explain it more specifically. Because this guy can say okay I'm a Guru now that's great. But when you say, I am as God you're speaking about your real nature. SD, oh right because you're speaking of everything. Because everything is God. Robert, so be careful about that, because that can also build your ego up. Though you say, I am God, wow that's great, I am God imagine that that's wonderful and I can do anything I like. Laughter. And you can actually freak out, I've seen it happen. People go and rob a bank or go kill somebody they don't care I'm God I can't do anything wrong. ST. I read an interesting story of a Tibetan story. There was this young boy and his father was a painter in one of these temples and he painted these demons and demigods and the boy died. 
and as he was passing into the other worlds, he saw these very same beings because this was all he experienced visually, and he wasn't scared of them, he just acted toward them in the very same way, and they just went away. He just said, you don't scare me. SD, it's just a creation of the mind. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's just where he was at, and how he approached it. SD, well, isn't that the third fundamental that everything is egoless and has no source, isn't that sort of what he's talking about? Robert, you can say that yes. SG, but if he was scared of those things then they were real, very real. Robert, because his mind is giving them power. Right. SD, isn't that the same thing you said on evil, the concept of evil? that it only exists if you believe in it? Robert, yes, true. You said if you believe in it, you've granted it power and its existence. Robert, your mind creates it. Your mind creates everything. SD, in the first fundamental, is it the same to say everything is a manifestation or emanation or projection? Robert, it doesn't matter, you don't have to change it. But you have to remember these things especially in the mornings when you get out of bed. Your mind will start thinking as soon as you wake up. Catch yourself and don't allow it to think. If you're feeling sorry for yourself, catch yourself and do something about it. Just realize that feeling sorry for yourself is a mental emanation. It's not true. It's not real. There's no one to feel sorry. Students talk between themselves. Robert just to realize that all things are an emanation of the mind, doesn't it make you feel good? SD, well you know how it occurs to me that if everything is an emanation of my mind why can't I just make it more to my liking? You can. SD, is that what they call creating one's own? Creative minds. SD, like science of mind sort of. Yes. SD, Yes, but that's still on the mortal plane. On the relative level. SD, if someone is coming toward you with a knife and you say, well these are just a projection of my mind, how would you? Robert, and then you get stabbed. SD, it's only a dream anyway. No, but how would you change it? You would change it by pulling out a gun and shooting him. SD, or getting out of the way, you wouldn't think about that because that's the mind again thinking about you being stabbed. We have to use common sense. SD, well can you give me an instance of how you can change it if you really? Here's what you would do. First you would have to get out of the way or whatever you have to do to stop the situation and then when you get home and you're by yourself, you would ask yourself the question, why did I attract this? What am I that I attracted a condition like this? Because if it weren't for your mind, you wouldn't have attracted it. Though there's something in your mind that pulled you to that condition. SD, is it your mind or is it karma? Both same thing? The same. Your mind is karma. SD, your mind is karma? Yes. SK, karma is action just another meaning for it. SD, so you know you hear these freak things like an innocent young girl killed alone in her apartment, I find that difficult how she might attract that. I find it easier to understand how that might be karmic. Robert, that's how she attracted it through karma. SD, cumulative karma. Yes. But, if you realize the third principle, the egolessness of all things, there's no karma. SK, do you dissolve it with thoughts like that? Yes, immediately. SD, so if you wanted to change your earth reality and you asked, now how did I attract it? That's how you would change it. You would think what thought patterns am I? Robert, you would work on yourself. Where did this come from? How did I get involved in this situation? SD, that's true. Science of mind is not a bad path, but it's definitely mentally oriented. That would be kind of what they're doing in feeling our reality. 
know what they're doing is they're creating it again and again and again and again. It doesn't stop. SD, so they stay on the karmic wheel. Yes. SK, this process seems to dissolve everything. Robert, yes. SN, how do they finally break that cycle? Robert, by realizing the truth about yourself. SN, what would differentiate one from another on that same path? There's no differentiation when you know the truth, the whole cycle stops. Tef, karma is only for the non-self. Robert, oh yes of course. As long as you believe you are the body there's karma. Though it all goes back to the first principle. Everything is an emanation of the mind. And there is no mind so nothing is happening. SD, so that's why you take it to a degree you could turn it to a path on the earth. Robert, if you're working with your mind. The mind appears to be very powerful. And you can do a lot of things with it. SD, so science of mind is not incorrect, it's just relative to the earth or astral plane, is that right? To an extent. SN, so how did the ignorance originate? Robert, it never did. If this is the paradox, it's perfect. Robert, how come the sky is blue? It never was. SD, we are already realized, but we don't realize it right. Laughs. There's nothing to become, is there? Robert, exactly. We are self realized. But, that's what we're talking about. Robert, but you don't want to believe it, so you keep working on yourself until you know. SD, who doesn't know? You everybody. Your ego. SN, well it's like saying life is a dream. But, the dream doesn't exist. Robert, yes. SK, it's a divine paradox. SG, so wake up. SD, even though you're not asleep. Seth, so Robert, I've heard you several times say that everything is all predestined, and what's going to happen is going to happen regardless of what you do, what's bound to happen will happen. That implies the elusive egoic entity, because in actuality nothing exists. Robert, yes exactly. We go right back to the old saying, as long as you believe that you are the body-mind phenomena, whatever is going to happen will happen. SF, okay. Then from that sense the Ajani will have to leave all the things which aren't supposed to happen to him? He'll have to live through it. SF, have to live through it? But those things are not of any concern to the Jani. No, because those things don't really exist. SF, right. So if the Jani can see the same things happen to his body? Yes. SF, and he would have rest. Yes. SD, yeah because that's just a certain kind of karma, not boomerang karma, but a karma like the arrow that's been shot and still has to reach its destination, but to a Johnny it would be non-existent. SF, but his life is no any more concern to the Johnny. Yeah, but he takes care of his body while he's in it, but he knows it isn't real. Laughter. Students discuss how Robert takes care of his body and Johnny does. Robert, see I take all the stuff that Bob brings me. I get up in the morning early and think about it. I throw everything in the blender, everything. Then I mix it up. SG, how's it taste? It tastes good. SD, oh yeah I bet. I wouldn't drink it if I didn't like it. SD, but if you don't have it, you don't take it, right? I don't take it if I don't have it. But, I don't think about it. It's like a game. I put it in the blender then, I mix everything then I pour it over the... SD, but you do that when you have it, but if you don't have it, it's the same difference. I'll eat something else. SD, yeah or nothing. Students continue discussion along these lines. Robert, well, everything becomes spontaneous, I walk to the park in the morning. 
I do push-ups on the bars. Though somebody asked me, why do you do push-ups? Though I say, because the bars are there. Laughter. If they weren't there, I wouldn't do it. SD. Thank God the bars are there for our sake. We like to take of you at this point because our egos need you at this point. Robert, you're just saying that. SD, no I love you Robert I want you in my life. I'm always there. SD, I know but I'm not strong enough to realize that you're with me. I feel you with me all the time, but if and when you leave your body I hope I have the strength to realize it. I probably outlive everybody. SD, probably will die first and you'll be doing push-ups on the bars. Laughs. SN, Ramana's disciples didn't understand though. SD, I know. Remember they begged him not to leave and he said, where would I go? And even Christ's followers didn't understand. Robert, you only hear about the ones that didn't understand. SD, there must have been some who grasped it. They keep silent. SN, and Robert said, the last satsang, I asked him a question whether we're getting into people experiencing self-realization and I asked him whether he had witnessed people having that experience and so he's seen it quite a few times. SD, how do most people react? Do they start laughing, crying? Robert, they just wake up. SD, what does it look like? They just wake up. SD, isn't there sometimes they start laughing like it's a joke? Oh yes, that's after. SD, do they cry for relief? That's after. SD, oh that's after. The moment of realization is like opening your eyes or the veil is removed. Like waking up in the morning. They now I see. There's nothing mysterious about it. SD, about the process. Yes, it's just like we're all in the dream and we're all asking, how is it when you wake up, how is it when we wake up, and I keep saying, you just wake up. But you say, I don't understand, what kind of a feeling do you have? The same feeling you have when you wake up now. You just wake up. SD, yeah, there you are. But not when you think. SD, what was the thing that you said you would like to have on the phone, when you wake up there you are. Laughs. You know what I mean when I say, just wake up it's not like when you wake up now and your mind starts thinking. It's a moment before you start thinking that's how it is. SD, I'm not aware of that Robert. Catch yourself before you think about it. Think about it the night before. SD, you mean of being aware of that moment before you start to think? Yes. SD, because the first thing I'm aware of is my thought. Because you started to think. But, there is a split second there between waking and thinking that yourself realized. SD, so you think the night before, you sort of try to program yourself to be aware of that state. In a way you can do that, yes. SG, it's like when you're daydreaming and you're gazing, but you're not gazing at anything in particular and you're not thinking. SN, and also you know how you're very tired. It happens to me often, and I sit in that chair and I listen to tapes and I wait till I'm tired and sometimes I might meditate even during the day, and then I'll fall asleep when I'm meditating and sometimes I won't get right up or lie down in a bed, I'll just go in and out, in and out, so you get a semblance of waking up in the morning when you're in that state. Though at night sometimes you should try to stay awake a little bit when you're feeling sleepy, and you go in and out. SD, is that sort of what they refer to in earth terms as the alpha state? Robert, well the alpha state is more of a psychological state. In way it's like that but that's more like samadhi. SD, what the alpha state is more like samadhi or the state you're talking about? The state I'm talking about is beyond samadhi. SD, it's beyond samadhi. Though alpha is like samadhi. Yes. Well of course the state I'm talking about is no state whatsoever. As long it's a state it's not that. You just become yourself. 
the self you've always been. Here I am. Laughs. SK, student talks about a twilight show on TV night before. Reminds of this state. Robert, he brought some prashad. So let's cut up the apple and eat it. General talk between students. Robert, when we eat prashad we have to know what we're doing, you know. We shouldn't just eat it. But we have to realize that we're eating God. We sort of have an attitude of gratitude. We're able to eat blessed food. It's part of a ritual, but it's still good. SD, like breaking bread. Robert, yes. SSK, is that the original meaning of blessings before food? Robert, yes. Food is God also, but then it became a blessing of God. SD, but everything is God so is this plate and the cups, even the styrofoam. Laughs. Robert, but the food that's prashad is something we eat, so it merges with your blood and your guts and everything else. SD, I remember once you said, you must eat flesh referring to eating meat, to everyone that would be eating God. Wouldn't that apply to all foods though? Robert, yes. More general talk. Robert, another one of the signs that you see in yourself on the way to self-realization is you begin to have reverence for everything. The ground that you walk on, the minerals, the animals, the vegetables. You have respect and reverence for everything. SD, even the things that seem negative. Robert, yes. Really? Robert, everything. SD, that's difficult for me because mentions something about smog. Robert, because you've seen that. Who sees that? SD, my ego, the mind. So when you have reverence for something, you have no quarrel with it. SD, but I do have a quarrel with the smog. Then it will hurt you. Whatever you have a quarrel with, it has the power to hurt you. But when you reconcile yourself with the smog, it loses its power to hurt. SD, is reconciling the same as reverence? In a way, take the human condition. If I have a quarrel with you, and if I reconcile myself with you then, I have reverence for you, then you no longer want to hurt me. Tape ends abruptly. Transcript 10 Spiritual Healing 9th September, 1990 Robert, I welcome you with all my heart. What can I tell you that you do not already know? I can only give my own confession. When I use the pronoun I, I refer to omnipresence. So when I make my confession I do not speak of myself. It involves all of us. I am as consciousness. Consciousness is omnipresence. When I say, I am that I am it means in reality we are nothing but pure consciousness. It's like a chalkboard. You may draw pictures on the chalkboard of Indians and they're fighting the cowboys, but what happens to the chalkboard? Nothing. You can erase that picture and draw another picture. This time you're drawing the beach and the sun and the sand and it's a beautiful balmy day, about 75 degrees. What happens to the chalkboard? Nothing. Now you erase that and you draw a storm or hurricane. People are getting blown away, winds 90 miles an hour. What happens to the chalkboard? Nothing. This is true of our lives. Whatever you experience you're going through whatever the experience may be. I can assure you that it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Whether you're going through a horrendous experience, a beautiful experience, you are like the chalkboard. It is only a picture, a play on consciousness. You are free. You are bright and shiny all the time. Like the sun. Sometimes the clouds cover the sun, do you say, there's no sun? When the clouds dissipate, the sun shines once again in all its glory and splendor. So when you appear to have problems, whatever they may be, do not go about trying to solve your problems like everybody else. But 
rather remove the clouds of darkness. Allow the clouds to dissipate. How do you do that? By quieting the mind. When the mind is quiet, the sun of your heart will shine once again and you will be free of problems. Break in tape as Robert begins self-confession for everyone. I am that. I am an absolute reality. That was never born and will never cease to exist. I am pure intelligence. The same yesterday, today and tomorrow. I am empty space. Nirvana. I am Sat Chit Ananda, being existence bliss. I am bliss consciousness. Water cannot drown me. Fire cannot burn me. I have always been and will always be. This is the truth, it is unchanging. Like the chalkboard. No matter what pictures appear it has absolutely nothing to do with me. I abide in the self. The self is my protection. The self is myself. I may appear to have a body, a mind, but this is an untruth. This is hypnosis, mesmerism, illusion, maya. In reality I am not the body or mind. I am not the doer. I am pure consciousness, absolute reality, parabrahman. That is the truth. Ah, somebody called me this morning, she isn't here today. She wanted me to say something about spiritual healing. Think about that spirit, spiritual healing. Who has to be healed spiritually, who can tell me? Student, nobody Robert, that's the answer, that's right. There is no one who needs spiritual healing. But in our delusion we see a different picture. People tell me, well, Christ healed people, how come? How come? I don't know. Because he felt like, I guess. That was his dharma. But did you ever wonder what happened to those people after they were healed? Laughs. Take for instance Lazarus, that he brought back from the dead. To begin with Lazarus was about fifty years old, and in those days to live to fifty years old was like ninety years old today. He was considered old. So when he brought him back from the dead, how long did he live after that? Did he live forever? A year, a month, a day. Nobody knows. The people he healed from blindness, leprosy, or whatever, how long did they stay healed? He said, go and sin no more. Meaning do not keep thinking the way you're thinking. Because it is your mind that caused your so-called problem. Of course, they didn't understand what he was talking about, and you can't change your mind so fast. So apparently they reverted back to their sickness. Though it would seem. If you abide in the self, there's no one that has to be healed. There's another story about Ramana Maharshi. One of his female disciples who had been with him for about 40 years or so. She was a devotee, was lying and living in the house of a disciple. Remember the difference between a disciple and a devotee. A disciple is someone who occasionally comes to the meetings and who reads all kinds of materials and gets confused and goes to a hundred different meetings a week and never practices anything, that's a disciple. A devotee is someone who stays with the meeting or with the person and lives for that meeting and for that teaching. So anyway, his devotee was in bed dying of cancer and the disciple was taking care of her. And she said to her, look what's happening to you and she started crying. Is this what Bagven has done to you? If this is Bagven then I don't want any part of him. This is the disciple talking. Look at you, you're emaciated, your skin and bones, you're dying, how could this happen to you, you were such a devotee to Bagvan for forty years. Hearing this the devotee shot up in bed, she shot up fast, and she said, you fool is this what Bagvan means to you? Is your mind that sees this picture? I am not dying, how can I die? It is you who see this picture. That's why you cry. You think that I am a body and you feel sorry for the body so you become upset with Bagvan me and yourself. Can't you see that I am not the body? There's no one to be sick, 
There's no one to die. And she had a beautiful look and smile on her face, and with that she lied back down and she left her body. And she had the most gracious look. A beatific look on her smile. When Bagwin heard this story he said, She's not coming back, she's emancipated. What do we see? When we look at the world do we see lack, limitation, man's inhumanity to man? Do we sickness, poverty, wars, or do we see love, harmony, peace, joy? What we really see is ourselves. If you become hurried and worried, and you're always believing something negative is going to come your way, and you're always making plans ahead of time to save yourself, you're really killing yourself. You do not understand that your mind has created that picture for you and the way to handle it is to not try to improve the condition, but to slow down your mind. To make the mind quiescent, quiet, still, peaceful, placid. When the mind becomes placid and quiet and still, divine harmony automatically ensues. Every negative condition you see in the world is a lie. Every positive condition you see in the world is a lie. Reality is beyond positive and negative. Why do you see these things? Why do you worry and fret about your life or about the life of someone else? What can possibly happen to you? Where can you go? Who suffers? Only the body, ego, mind suffers. To the extent that you can realize that you are not the body, ego, mind, to that extent do you become totally, absolutely free. I think I told you this story about when I was with Nimkarali Baba. And one of his devotees came to him and said, Master, my husband is dying, only you can save him. And he was a funny old guy, he looked around and he said, Me? I can save him? He looked to all his devotees and he said, What should I do? And his devotee said, Go save him. Though he said, Okay. Though we all trudged a mile down the road, to a little shack, and there was her husband in bed with candles all around him, lying there. Nimkarali Baba looked at him, and as he was looking the candles started flickering and they went out. Though Nimkarali Baba started to run back to his ashram, and everybody ran with him. When he got back there they asked him, Master, why did you run away? What happened? And he turned around and he said, Oh God wants him to die. And that was the end of that. In other words, what a person's dharma is, is going to happen, but you have absolutely nothing to do with it. That includes yourself. Whatever your body is going through has been preordained before you took on this so-called body. And your body is going to go through whatever it has to go through. You have to realize that you are not the body and you have absolutely nothing to do with it. To that extent that you realize this truth, to that extent will you become happy and peaceful, and you will stop worrying and fretting and stop trying to change things. You will be peaceful by yourself, at home, wherever you are. You will be in the world, but not of the world. Though spiritual healing is a lie, because it presumes somebody is sick or somebody is out of sorts or somebody is suffering from something whether it's depression or lack of companionship, whatever it may be. This is all a lie and you have to start knowing the truth. Look into yourself. This doesn't mean that you should sit down and do nothing. It means whatever your body's meant to do, it's going to do. Even though it doesn't exist. Your body is really your Atman. It is pure consciousness. It is absolute reality. This is what your body is. This is the reason why you should never put yourself down and call yourself names and think you're bad or you're weak or there's something wrong with you. You are not what appears. When you make statements like that, negative statements about yourself, what you're really doing is getting pulled back into Maya, deeper and deeper and deeper into illusion, into body-mind consciousness into the dream and the dream becomes more real for you and you get caught up in it completely. It's like you're watching a movie and instead of watching, you jump into the screen and want to play a part of the movie and you forget that you're not part of the movie. But, you start acting out the movie until you get so caught up in it that you actually think that you're in the movie. 
that's how it is now. Think about yourselves and the so-called experiences that you're going through. How do you you caught up in them? Think you can tell about the way you feel. If you fear, if you have doubts, apprehension, suspicion, then you know you're really caught up in your slime. I'm thinking of the green slime I drink every morning. Laughter. Please say what about you? You drink green slime, how come? Well what I do every morning is I just get up. Spontaneously I throw everything in the blender, I don't think about it. Whether it's making me sick or well or whatever it's doing. And I mix it all together and then I pour it on the granola and then I eat it. I happen to enjoy the taste or I wouldn't eat it. I wouldn't do it if I didn't like it. But when I'm finished that's the end of it. I don't think about it. I don't condemn it or justify it, I just do it. Though I go about everything that way, spontaneous. Now you think if you think about that you are not the body, your body will not function properly. Or you will get into trouble. You will only get into trouble when you're putting on an act. In other words when you're pretending to be spiritual. But, when you're a real devotee of truth, of the self, automatically, your body so-called is well taken care of. You have intuition. It comes by itself, you don't even know it's intuition. You do the right things for all concerned. And it happens by itself and it can be real funny like the story I'm going to tell you. There was once a real cheap skate. Real cheap, had millions of dollars. But, Always cried poor mouth. Couldn't afford a bus fare so he walked. Couldn't afford to buy a glass of lemonade so he was thirsty real cheap. I'm sure you know people like that. Well he got old and was about to die and he had guilt feelings because he never helped anybody else with his money. He just hoarded it, he had millions of dollars saved in the banks. But he believed in heaven and hell. So he kept worrying about this. So what shall I do? He consequently sent for a priest, a minister and a rabbi. And he thought about this and he said, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to give you each three million dollars if you pray for me to go to heaven. So they all talked about it and looked at each other and they said, well three million dollars, not bad. Laughter. They said, okay, we'll do it. So he made out his will, and they all signed it. Six months later the priest, the rabbi and the minister received a notice that the guy was dying and was going to die. They went to his side, and he looked at them, and he said, Oh okay, I'm going to give you the money, but he started to think about this. And a thought came to him, and the thought said, What if they discover something to bring me back from the dead years from now? and I'll be cured and healed and I won't be dead anymore. So if I give them my money now, I won't have anything when I come back. And he wasn't sure and so he said, Okay, here's what I'll do, I'll give you each five million dollars instead of three with this condition. When I die and you file past my coffin, you each have to drop a million dollars in the coffin. So if I come back and they discover something to cure me and bring me back from the dead, I'll have a nice amount of money. So they all looked at him like he was crazy, and they talked it over and they said, well what the heck four million is better than nothing, and they agreed. He finally died. And he had a funeral and his casket was laid open and everybody filed past and they looked. The minister filed past the coffin and looked down at him and he said, well you son of a bitch, I don't know what I'm doing and what you're going to do with the money, but a promise is a promise, and he threw a million dollars in the coffin. Next the priest came by and he said, well this is all crazy, but this is what you want okay, and he threw a million dollars in the coffin. Now the rabbi watched all this and he said, there must be some solution to this. And he was going to John Amarga meetings, the rabbi, and he was working from his intuition. So he filed by and looked at the money in the casket. He took out his checkbook and wrote a check for three million dollars and picked up the two million in cash and he said, when they find a cure for you you can cash your check. Students laugh. It isn't this like us. 
We always imagine somebody's going to heal us. We go and see all these healers, psychics, channelers, everybody in town. We want advice from psychic readings. We want to know what's going to happen to us. What can possibly happen to you if you were never born to begin with? You have no history. You are pure consciousness. Forget about healings. Forget about psychics. Forget about readers and channelers. Look to yourself for the answers. Everything is within you. Learn to be still. Find out who's worried, who fears, who's unhappy, who's depressed, who's sick and you will say I am, but who am I? And follow the I to its source. And the I will disappear of its own accord. The realization will come that you are absolute reality and that all is well and everything is unfolding as it should. Tape break as Robert continues. Vinda and Gopala are different names for Krishna. Gopala is baby Krishna. There's only one reason why people suffer and that is because they identify with the body-mind phenomena. That is the only reason there's no other reason. I know you can give me a lot of reasons, but they are not real. If you take your mind off your body and then you get rid of your mind completely who's left to suffer? And you must ask yourself, who sees the suffering? I do. Well, who's thy that sees that suffering? Find out. Follow the eye and see who suffers. Any questions about that? Any questions about anything? Remember I am not a lecturer. Asel, what does it mean to follow the eye? Robert, it means to abide in yourself. The eye is yourself. It starts out as the ego but as you follow the eye it becomes yourself. And yourself has no existence. Therefore it becomes no thing emptiness, space. Like the blackboard, the chalkboard. Everything happens around it on it but it itself is not affected. That's what it means to follow the eye. The eye becomes yourself and you abide in yourself. S.D. Robert, maybe if you explain self-inquiry and that will maybe explain following the thought. Robert, well they know self-inquiry. Pardon? Robert, they know about self-inquiry, don't you? S.D. asks another student, do you understand how suffering follows the I thought? S.L. I can understand it subtly. S.M. Egolessness in all things. Robert, exactly, there is no cause for existence. There is no cause for existence, there is no cause for suffering or for anything else. It simply has no cause. It didn't come from anywhere. History is like a dream. It never existed. When you back into egolessness, everything that's been troubling you becomes transcended and you're at peace with yourself and the world. For the realization becomes that you are the world. You are the universe. The whole universe emanates out of your mind. And when your mind stops, the universe stops and there's only the self. The self appears as bliss consciousness as I am, and that's your real nature. S.N. Robert until we come to that realization then we don't know the self, is that true? Robert, no it's not true. You always know the self, except you won't admit it, you want to admit something else. You're confessing that you don't know the self. But, it's not true. Just let go of all your doubts, and the self will shine once again. Do not believe that you don't know the self. Don't question it too much. Realize it. Come it and put your doubts at rest. I am the self that has always existed, and will always exist. It will never cease to exist. I am pure intelligence, absolute reality, consciousness, emptiness, space. I am that I am. That's your real nature. Confess that to yourself. Do not tell yourself that you're not the self because you're lying. 
It's like saying there's no sun because the clouds are covering the sun and you're swearing up and down saying, look Robert there's no sun the sun doesn't exist. But if I take you up in an airplane above the clouds there's the sun. It's the same thing as us. We're so covered with delusion that we believe that we're not the self. We still know that I am God. Therefore you just have to be still long enough and know and all will be well. SN, but until then do we know? Robert, until when? Until then. Robert, there's no then. There's no time that you are not the self. SN, I've been examining this, see when we are asleep the self is no different. Robert, the I am is always the same. Because when you get up you say, I slept. Who slept? I dreamt. SN, I seem to be identifying I am with consciousness when we spoke of consciousness before. They for instance, the self in between thought is the I am, that is consciousness, yet when I sleep there's no consciousness, there's nothing. So, I am is just nothing. Robert, you think there's nothing. SN, right. But when you get up you say, I slept. I was always present. I am is always present. Even when you're sleeping, except you're not conscious of it. SN, so when you become realized though, you're conscious even when you sleep. Exactly. SD, a Johnny is conscious of dreaming and of dreaming within the dream. SN, so until we're realized. See, I'm trying to make a connection of the self. And so I say, well, when I'm asleep, I'm not aware of the self, so when I'm awake, am I awareness? Though I'm trying not to delude myself. Robert, what you should rather do is say, when I am asleep, who is aware of the self? Ask yourself that question. When I sleep, who is aware of the self? And you will realize I am. You are always aware of the self, except when you sleep. You're not conscious of it. But it still goes on. SB, Robert, is it because when you're asleep, the consciousness is not associated with the physical brain? Is that it? Robert, no, the physical brain has nothing to do with it. When you're asleep, you're dreaming just like when you're awake. This waking state is just like the dream state. Though we don't say it's just because we're associating with the brain. It's because we're deluded into believing that we are not the self. Though you make it simple. The brain has nothing to do with it because the brain is part of the body. The body does not exist, neither does the brain. Though when you're sleeping the brain is at rest, the body is at rest but you're still abiding in the self. You're always abiding in the self except you are not conscious of it. SB, what happens to the consciousness that is? Nothing. It's still there, except just like now. Let's take the waking state. You say what happens to reality while I'm awake. Reality is still there but you still believe in the body and the mind. It's just like I give you an example of the sky is blue. In reality there's no sky and there's no blue. Though in reality there's no body and there's no one to be unconscious. SB when you abide in consciousness in the waking state, will that help you to actually be conscious of the sleep, the deep sleep state also? Yes it will because there is only one state. SB, in some of the Ramana books it says when you're abiding in the self more and more your deep sleep will be conscious. Robert, yes. One time I was in deep sleep, and I like was aware, I was actually conscious that I was deep asleep, and it was like being in a cave. There was like awareness, it was very strange. Robert, that's a good sign that's how it is. When you become realized. SB, it was like a very sweet bliss, not a powerful ecstasy, but a kind of like a, just a background, kind of just a vague but very sweet bliss, and it was like being in a cave. It looked like a cave and it was like a sleep while awake. Robert, well those are just pictures you drew for yourself. 
But, when you awaken, you will be awake in the three states sleeping, dreaming and waking. SB. So if we can hold on to this position of consciousness that we have at satsang, if we can maintain that pure consciousness without adding the whole mind to it and be established in that, then that's the... Robert, that's abiding in the eye exactly. SB. So that's all it is really. That's all it is. SB. Right this minute with that, if we don't add the whole me on top of it. Exactly so, and you don't put yourself down, do not say, I am not conscious of myself. I don't know who I am, realize the truth like you just said. SB, and yet for this moment we're abiding in the self without the mind, we can't say that we're God realized because there's a certain process that happens that actually, right? Robert, it's better to say nothing. Yeah, because there is a process that happens as a person establishes in that. Something happens. Robert, every time you say, I am not God realized, you pull yourself backwards. But like Narada said, don't fool yourself. Though you have to walk the middle path, the razor's edge between realization and not realization. SB, so actually we're just hung up with the relations of consciousness and the associations of consciousness and we're just not being pure consciousness without adding all those associations on top of it. Robert, true. That's it. Robert, that's it. Zeph, Robert, actually this body-mind will never abide in the self. Robert, no because it's false. So when I say, I am abiding in the self, when I make that suggestion it means, it's an expression rather than being. Robert, it's an expression. It means I am is abiding in the self. Seth, the I am? The I am. Same thing is the self. An expression like you say. But, when you say, I am you're not referring to your body. Seth, not to your mind? Not referring to your mind, you're referring to yourself. It's like saying I am that I am. Same thing. I'm abiding in the self I am that I am. By saying these things to yourself, it pulls you closer to that state. SF, yeah it's sort of a process of elimination of your ego self. You can say that. That's why you shouldn't say anything negative about yourself. Never say anything bad about yourself. Always say I am abiding in the self, I am the self. And then somebody might say to you, something this I can say, no I'm not because I feel problems. So you practice self-inquiry and you ask yourself, who feels these problems? To whom do they come? And go back to abiding in the self. Tape break. Robert. The only reason karma exists is because you believe that you are the body. Once you realize there's no body, for whom is there karma? Karma is for the body not for yourself. But as long as you don't believe that then there's karma. SD and Robert has also explained to us that self-realization gets you off the wheel. SN Robert when we're asleep are we closer or further away? Robert, closer self-realization is just like being in deep sleep. In deep sleep, only you're conscious and you're conscious of bliss. So when you're in deep sleep you're in bliss, but you're not conscious of it, that's all. SN, now when we're in satsang and we have devotional feelings, say, when we come to satsang to develop something, attaining something, that we don't get when we're alone or in the world, when we come to satsang and feel something, a devotional feeling, is that the self? Robert, that's the self trying to emerge. Yes, it's the self. Try to abide in those feelings. Sen, now when we're asleep though, it's more, it's like without emotion. Because you're asleep you're not conscious, but if you were conscious you'd be in bliss. SN, but it would be different than the feeling it when we have for devotion. No it wouldn't. It would be self-realization. SN, in other words the feeling that I get is a love for all things. 
Okay, yet when I'm asleep it's not like love. How do you know? SN, yeah well I don't. You're asleep? SN, yeah that's the whole thing. I'm trying to make a connection, is that what the feeling is? The feeling of love abides when you're asleep only you're not aware of it because you're not conscious. When you're illumined then you're conscious of being in sleep and then you realize that it's just called sleep. But you're in love, you're in bliss. SN, now that love is the self. The love is the self. SN, but what comes to mind is you ask, well who loves? Why should you ask that? SN, well only to not delude yourself. To see well is this real or is this just another play of the mind? That's only when you love your tape recorder more than anything else. Though you ask yourself, who loves my tape recorder? And you will realize it's your ego and once the ego is abolished there is only a tape recorder. Period. SF Robert, even the egoic love, egotistical love, or the love of the Johnny for persons or objects, to me that kind of thing should be the love of the self that has been misdirected. Robert. Yes, it does exactly. Whatever you do in life, even a crook or a bank robber is really trying to find himself. That's why he does those things. We're all inadvertently searching for the self and we don't know it. SF, so every desire which is attracting me is the self? Yes, every desire, every urge is a search for the self. But we're misdirected. As if with self-inquiry what you do is you go deep down the hole. You go beyond the conscious and you jump deep like you're diving in the ocean. You dive deeper and deeper and deeper till you make contact with reality. That's good. SF, Robert, about when the Johnny talks about omniscience and says I'm omniscient. The Johnny has a concept about omniscience and it's a mundane type of omniscience. The Johnny says he's omniscience, he must know everything. He must know all the mundane knowledge. That's not what implies in the statements of the Johnny, right? Robert, you're right. Omniscient for the Johnny is being in everything, but not necessarily knowing what's going on in China. That's a different kind of omniscience. SF, because people are using nowadays omniscience they say to be channelers. Robert, Yes. They think they are channelers, they are very knowledgeable and sort of think that is a form of omniscience. But, that's not what we call a Johnny. Robert, that's a limited form of omniscience. Yeah. SD, is omniscience the same as omnipresent? Robert, omniscience is all-knowing, all-knowing. Omnipresence is the same thing, really. It's all presence. You're everywhere present. SD, aren't they the same? It's like omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. All power, all knowledge like being everywhere at the same time. SD, you were saying not necessarily knowing what's going on in China, but it's knowing the oneness of all things. Yes. It's like you become the rock but you're asleep on the rock, because the rock has no power to move, but you become the rock. SD, when you are omnipresence you are a rock. Yes. You become a rock but you're not aware of it. You just are pure, unconscious awareness. SD, so you're not aware of anything exactly. Robert laughs. You're on the right track. You're just being. Your being. Absolute being. Your everything. It's something like when you're asleep and you expand yourself in a dream and in that dream you know what's going on in the dream, but you're asleep. So with the Johnny being omnipresent, omniscient, you are everything but you are not aware of everything. SD, you're aware of being then. You're aware of being just being. SK. Is there a way to be aware of everything as well? Robert, as long as you are carrying a body, you won't be aware of any other thing because your mental process won't allow that to happen. 
SD, it seems like if you're aware of it, everything is an illusion to be aware of it right. Robert, when you drop your body it's no different. When you drop your body there's no difference you expand a little bit more. SB, Robert, how come the Buddhists say that the Vedanta are deluded because they're looking for the Brahman and the self and that there's no Brahman and no self and use different terminology? Is their emptiness of all things the same as the self when it happens? Robert, they're right. Because there is no Brahman and there is no self. Those are just words to describe it. SB, it's easy to confuse the ego self with the real self. That's why we discuss it, because the ego self is the I and when the I disappears it becomes the I am. And the I am is pure emptiness. Nirvana. SN, Robert, when you said the best way to help other people is to know the self. So when you know the self, you become the other people. SM, and realize that you are the other people. Though that's what I was trying to get at earlier. Get to know what is the self. What is the self that we must know? And it seems like sometimes I know what it is and then I forget. And now it comes back to me, I feel that. If I have a feeling of love it's like it becomes expansive and I can understand what it means. You become everything or everything becomes you or whatever it is. SD, so is self-realization the awareness or the oneness of everything. Robert, Always remember if you know what it is, it's not that because the finite mind cannot know. It's beyond the finite. So when you think you know ask yourself who knows. And you back to your ego again. Only the ego knows. Asen, but what if you say who knows? That's good. Laughter. SK, what about a realized being that whoever comes before them so to speak, they can know everything about them. Not only what their self is because it's the same as their own self but about their arrogance of the ego and mind conflicts. Robert, you don't have to be a realized being to do that. SK, yes, I realize that. Though taking an opinion from a being who's considered to be realized also that happens. He can remark when it's spontaneous that something about that being that maybe will turn them towards a spiritual path. Like Jesus healing others. Robert, but a true realized being does not need to do that. By his very presence, changes take place. SK, but not everyone is so receptive or open. It's just like grace. God's grace is always available, but only some people pick it up. SK, yeah. Same thing. SK, so sometimes that grace for me seems to be extended and then some action that can be done that that person can understand more than just subtly. And it may not take effect then, but it may take effect in that person's life six months, a year down the road. Robert, that's possible, but again a realized being does not interfere in anybody's karma, if they are prepared and ready they become realized also. By their very presence. It's like Ramana again, we go back to Ramana. People used to come to him from far and wide and say, I looked at your picture and healed myself, you healed me. I made a million dollars and you did it. This happened and that happened. And Ramana would look at his attendant that pulls the fan and say, Why do they always tell me I did these things? I did nothing. SD, but his grace might have done it. That's possible. SD, because he could give the darshan. But he couldn't possibly be aware of it. Because to be aware of it, there would have to be somebody left to be aware. SD, but he could do it unaware. Yes. SK, he didn't say anything to people who came to him. Robert, no. SN, even when it's his grace, you have to understand that everything is one. Though whose grace is it? SK, whose grace is it? Right whose grace is it? It's you. 
Everything is you, and this is similar to the stories when the person touched the garment of Jesus and was healed and Christ always said, be it according to your faith. SM, don't you think that a person who wants to be healed so badly almost heals himself? Sen, that's the whole point, everything is the self. SM, it is the self. Ramana was the self, and they say, Ramana you did this, and that's true because they did it themselves, because they are them. Robert, well the point is, a truly realized being does nothing. SN, it's not so much he's a realized being, he's a realized non-being. Laughter Robert, okay. We always think in terms of a realized being of Ramana, as if he's the body and the idea of the self is one. Robert told the story of the woman, he and himself is one, healing and the self is one and Ramana and the self is one and that self, see I always try to grasp this self with my mind and that's where I get lost. But, now I know if I sink into deeper than the mind, intuition, heart, whatever, then I can explain, oh that. SB, in other words he realized no self. He realized that there isn't any self. He realized nothingness. But, the whole thing dissolves in a big mystery. Robert, exactly. And then whatever is going to happen is going to happen spontaneously. Robert, Ramana was a simply humble person. People would come to him with all his problems, all their problems all day long. Help me please, help me overcome this. At the end of the day he would look at his attendant and say, To whom shall I go for help? They all come to me. SD, one of my favorite stories is that there was a Swami who could perform tricks or magic or whatever, and he lived near the ashram. Though a lot of people on their way to see the Swami would stop by to see Maharshi. They just peeking at him because they've heard about him too, and he told one of his devotees because he had a lot of trouble with his feet he said, keep rubbing my feet, and they'll see that I am just an old sick man, and they'll leave me alone. Laughter Robert, there's nothing special about a realized being. SF, Robert, it seems that with a little understanding, using quotation mark, if there is a jani or anybody approaches him, is karmic, all karmic. All karma. Robert, yes, yes that's true. However the fact that there is hypocrisy on that quotation on the self because the presence of the jani, there can be, maybe a sort of acceleration, a catalytic effect. Robert, that's true too. And that also is karmic. Robert, that's also true. Depending on the openness of the disciple, devotees. Robert, yes the teaching is full of contradictions. That's true you're right. All these things are true. SB, so Robert you're really going into battle with your karma. Laughter. Confrontations with our ignorance right? Robert, if that's what you say so be it. You see this is why I emphasize over and over again, we've got to develop a great humility, a great compassion, a great love. Not play tricks and have all these siddhas, powers and materialize all kinds of things. Anybody can learn that if you practice enough. SK, how does one express these things? Robert, express what? Compassion and love. Robert, by being yourself. If you become yourself it's automatic. If you abide in the self, you have to have compassion and love for yourself first, and you do that by letting go of your thoughts. Controlling your thoughts and compassion and love and humility come by themselves. It always goes back to that again. It goes back to you. You can't develop enough love yourself. It has to come from within yourself. It appears that the world has a very strong pull on us, and you have to try to resist that by every day practicing these things. That's why I gave you all these techniques. You have to keep remembering every day. And soon it'll become automatic. I feel this is a very important meditation to help us. 
For what it does, it goes deep within the subconscious and pretty soon it starts doing you, instead of you doing it, it's really helped many people to see the way. And the way you do this is, you relax yourself and with your breathing you inhale, and you say I, you exhale and you say him. Now you can also do this all day long. When you're driving your car or your bus, whether you're washing dishes, whether you're making supper or dinner or breakfast. You can watch your breath and do I am with your breathing. So let's do it together. Make yourself comfortable and you can close your eyes to remove obstructions. Acquire a good feeling in yourself and the formal way to do it is first you relax your body. To make sure every part of you is relaxed. You can start with your knees, relax your knees. Relax everything below your knees, your feet, your toes. Relax everything above your knees, your thighs, relax your hips, your abdominals, relax, your chest, relax, relax your back, fingers, hands, wrists, forearms, relax, upper arms, relax, shoulders, neck. Back of your neck, relax. Back of your head, top of your head. Your forehead, your face. Every part of you is now totally relaxed. Focus your attention on your breathing. For you do I am, you can practice Vipassana meditation, Buddhist meditation, where you watch your breath. Watch yourself breathing. Watch the sensations in your body. Just watch. Do not react to them. For instance, if you have a pain in your thigh, watch, do not react to it, observe it and observe your breath at the same time. Do not force your breath, just breathe naturally. If you get lost in thoughts, as soon as you catch yourself, go back to your breathing. Do not become discouraged. Do not force your thoughts out, ignore them and go back to observing your breathing. Short silence. Now you ask yourself the question, who is the observer? Who observes my breathing? Of course the answer is I am. Now with your breathing start the I am meditation. Inhale normally, say I, exhale and say am, with your normal breathing, do not emphasize your breath. Normal breathing I am. I inhale, am exhale. Again if your mind wanders, do not be mad at yourself, but gently go back to I am and ignore your thoughts. Long silence and break in tape as Robert wraps up. Remember to love yourself, to worship yourself, to pray to yourself, to bow to yourself because God dwells in you as you. Om Shanti Peace. Happy you could come. See you again soon. That's all she wrote. Tape ends. Transcript 11. Two Ways to Self-Realization. 16th September 19, 190. Robert, there are two ways that I think bring you closer to self-realization. Of course we're already self-realized and we don't have to come closer, we just have to remove the cloud that tells us we're human. But, there are two methods that I think through the years of understanding that brings you very close to self-realization. One is satsang which we're doing now and the other one is practicing all the things we learn at home. Now satsang is a very sacred teaching. If you come to satsang you pick up the power that goes with it. With us it's a direct lineage to Ramana Maharshi. So what this means in satsang, we are all actually Ramana Maharshi, every one of us. There's no difference and we're all each other. This means we all have the knowledge we need, and as we keep coming to satsang, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. In the beginning when you first hear this it sounds strange, but it's not so strange. If you're studying to become a doctor, you associate with doctors and it sort of rubs off and you feel the vibration. If you're studying to be a lawyer, you associate with lawyers and the vibrations sort of rub off and you always feel ego. So when you come to satsang there's a direct lineage with the founder, or the rediscoverer I should say, of Advaita Vedanta who is Ramana Maharshi. So in any event, we should all feel something, deep within our hearts and allow it to bloom by itself without forcing it. 
and this happens just by attending satsang. As you attend satsang you become a sweet person. By sweet I mean you give up all of the anger, the tantrums, the doubts, suspicions. You stop worrying and you begin to unfold like a flower with its calyx toward the sun. You just open up. You start feeling good for no reason. You notice that things stop bothering you. You're no longer concerned. I don't mean you don't care. You're very compassionate. I mean you understand the nature of the world, that it's Maya, it's transitory. Nothing is ever the same in the world. So the world ceases to excite you one way or the other. The world no longer makes you too happy nor too sad. It becomes impersonal to an extent. But you still do your work. Your body does whatever it came here to do, yet you're always in heaven mentally. Now, if you can't come to satsang, or you don't feel that kind of devotion, then you practice diligently the lessons, the teachings of Advaita Vedanta. And then you will find the same things happening to you in a little different way, but you will also unfold. It's wonderful if you can do them both. But, those are the two ways that'll bring you closer to realization. You subsequently have to ask yourself, what am I doing with my life? In what direction am I going? And look at your life, analyze it. From the moment you get out of bed until you go back to bed again at night. What are you doing with the hours that you're awake? Do you waste your time? What do you do? You have to remember you have only so many years to live in this world, and then you'll just vanish if you don't know who you are. You will repeat the lessons over and over again, and you'll have many opportunities to understand and discover your true nature. But the wise person begins the discovery immediately. It's like digging for gold. You can talk about the gold. You can just make a couple of holes with a shovel and say, I'll come back next month where you can really get into it. And get a pickaxe and start chopping away until you discover the gold and dig it up the same day. The choice is always yours. There's a story about a beautiful tree, a large beautiful tree. And on the lower branch, there lived a little bird, and the bird used to hop from branch to branch, tremendous tree. It would eat sweet berries, and it would sing and whistle and was very happy. Then it would hop on another branch, and there were sour berries, and it would get upset, Stop singing till it found sweet berries again. And this went on for years, sweet berries, sour berries. It was happy when it found the sweet berries, unhappy when it found the sour berries. Isn't this like us? When we think we found something we like, we become very happy. But, then when it changes like all things must change, we become miserable. And so the bird started to think about this, and it flew around the tree. It happened to gaze way up to the top of the large tree, and it saw a majestic big bird sitting there, a translucent shining bird. It looked so happy and so radiant, doing nothing just sitting at the top of that tree in bliss. And the little bird said, Oh, how I wish I could be like that big bird. Look how happy it is. It doesn't have to hunt for sweet berries or look for anything. It just sits there by itself, so radiant. I think I will fly up to it and discover its secret. Though it started to fly up toward the big bird, but a quarter up the tree it saw some beautiful red berries, and it stopped and started to eat the berries, and they were delicious. Though it forgot all about the big bird. It started to sing again, it was happy. Isn't this like us? We find something we like and we forget about spiritual life. And we say, this is what I want, a new jaguar, a new house, a new companion, a new something, but then after a while we become disgusted, disillusioned. Though after a while the sweet berries ran out, and there were only sour berries left on the tree, and the bird again became disillusioned. Though it started to fly around the tree again and looked way up on the top, and saw the translucent radiant bird sitting there once again, so majestic, so happy and blissful. Again it said to itself, this time, 
I'm going right to the top. But on the way up it went halfway up the tree again, it saw some beautiful purple berries. It had not seen purple berries in years. It loved purple berries. So it stopped and started to eat up the purple berries and became very happy again, started to sing eating berries. And again it's like us. We find a new companion. We get a new toy. We move to a new state whatever we do. We think that's it now, I'm going to be real happy. But soon the berries were gone and again, it was left with sour berries. So it flew around the tree and saw the big bird again. And it said, this time I'm going straight to it, and nothing is going to stop me, nothing. It resolutely made up its mind. So it started to fly up, but again three quarters up the tree it saw some orange berries, and it loved orange berries. So it stopped and started to partake of the orange berries and again forgot about the big bird. And went on for months and months eating the berries until they were gone and only the sour berries were left. And again that's like us. We say we're resolutely going to go after spiritual life and that's where we're going, that's where we're headed. But, then something happens. We discover some good humanhood. Something we like and we say, to heck with the spiritual life, and we're going after this instead. So we do that until we become disillusioned and we get tired of it. Again the bird saw sour berries and it got sad and upset. It flew around the tree again and this time it said, nothing is going to stop me. I'm going right to that big bird and find out who he really is. Nothing will stop me and he flew right toward the big bird. It skipped all the berries, saw all kinds of berries on the way, it didn't care anymore, but went right to the big bird. As it got closer and closer, the big bird shone brighter and brighter and brighter until the light was unbearable. And the little bird landed right where the big bird was and you know what it discovered. It was the big bird all the time. And that's like us, isn't it? We talk about God as far away. But we have no time because we've got to do our work. We've got to do our material work, that is. And we talk about God being too far. But, we're going towards God, until we resolutely make up our mind to be on the spiritual path. And then, we discover something interesting. We discover that we've been God all the time. That we are the only God there is. That we are the absolute reality. That we are pure intelligence, infinite wisdom. We discover that there's only one life, and that life is absolute reality, Satchit Ananda, Parabrahman and we're at peace. Therefore the choice is always yours. In what direction do you want to go and I know sometimes it's hard. Some people have been on the spiritual path for many many years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and they believe they have not gotten anywhere. But that isn't true it appears that way. But remember if you don't make it in this life you'll make it after. But, if you have been on a spiritual path you're gaining credits, you're accruing good merit to yourself. You can't help it. The worst thing you could ever do is to judge yourself. Never judge yourself. Don't even look at yourself too much. Realize your divine nature and do not allow your problems to get to you. Understand that you are not your problems. You are not the body. You're not the thoughts or the mind. And begin by controlling your thoughts. Do not allow your thoughts to become greater than you. No matter what your thoughts tell you, don't listen. Remember your thoughts are not your friend. Your thoughts try to confound you, confuse you. And they will tell you all kinds of things. Do not listen to your thoughts, even your good thoughts. Transcend everything. Go beyond your thoughts to your bliss, to your joy and to your happiness. Your thoughts will take you away from this. It'll make you think all sorts of things. But if you realize that your mind is a trickster, you will not allow your thoughts to convey any message to you at all. As soon as the thoughts start to come, you ask yourself the question, 
to whom comes these thoughts? And they'll stop. They come to me well, who is this me? Who is me? I am me. Well, who am I? And you begin to search for the source of the I. And as you search, everything in your life begins to improve. As you search diligently, things improve because you're no longer reacting the same way to situations. Your reaction has become different, the situations may be the same. As an example, when you hear about the Iraq, United States confrontation, before you become disturbed, you're thinking of a war, and you're thinking of man's inhumanity to man and you're worried about inflation and recession in United States. And all these things used to worry you. But, as you advance spiritually, you realize that this is the way of the world. The world has always been like this and you see it differently. You begin to see love, compassion. Though the world hasn't really changed, you've changed. You see the situation completely differently. You realize that all this is the self and I am that. In other words, what you realize is the first principle. Everything is a projection of your mind. Whatever you see is a projection of your mind. Therefore, if you see something that's not right with another person, you're seeing yourself, aren't you? If you're seeing another person who is troubled or another person who has problems or if you're seeing anything wrong, doubts, apprehensions, suspicions. You have to remember that you have to have those qualities in order to be able to see them in another person. Though as you grow, you start seeing through those things. And whatever anybody else does no longer disturbs you. If it no longer disturbs you then that negative vibration cannot come near you when you're at peace. Any questions about that? SD, when you say not to judge yourself is that because you would be judging the ego which isn't real? Robert, certainly exactly, because you're always judging your experience, your outer experience and you can't judge that because that doesn't even exist. SD, I think in the past you've said something like, to judge yourself or condemn yourself is blasphemy. Robert, yes. Because you're talking about in that case the real self, right? Robert, what you're doing is you're denying the real self. It's like saying that God is no good. Though you're saying there's something wrong with you and there is not. It's only temporary, it only appears that way. It's an appearance. SD, so even though you're judging the little self as it were, that's blasphemous too? Yes, because you are the real self all an illusion like the snake and the rope. You think in the dark you're stepping on the snake, but it's only a rope. It's a mistake, it's error. Therefore you do not judge yourself, you do not judge anyone else. You leave the world alone, but you're happy and you're blissful and you help others because that's your nature to do so. SD, that reminds me of one of my favorite of Maharshi's stories because he talks about realization being. He says it's like watching a trick of what looks to be the snake, but it's really a rope. And he says once you've seen the rope you can never see the snake again. It's like any magic trick once you've seen how it works you can't see it again you know. Robert that's right. And I think at the time he was talking about once you realized it's impossible to become unrealized, you know? Robert, you have to have patience with yourself. That's another thing to remember. It doesn't appear that most of us become perfect overnight. So don't concern yourself if you make a mistake. SL, so another thing that you were saying too is that if we judge others, we will bring their vibrations to us. In other words, we're judging others and we see ourselves in others and the weaknesses in others. Robert, and you're becoming weak also. By judging them for that? Robert, you become like them. Though it goes two ways then. Robert, yes. Okay, and then you've said it's not until you let go then you get rid of the vibration, so you don't draw that vibration to yourself. Robert, exactly. Your mind becomes calm. Your countenance becomes peaceful. 
you no longer feel those so-called negative things around you. SL, so it's just a matter of accepting. No you don't accept, you become your real self. And the real self is perfect bliss. There's nothing to accept. To accept means that you're yourself, your lower self and you're accepting something higher. But you're not to accept anything. You to be become, I am that I am. SL, so you just live and let live sort of? Yes, but again you have to qualify that. But live and let live, if you see somebody suffering on the road, you don't allow that person to suffer, you get down and help the person, but you don't have any thoughts about it. You just do it. It doesn't mean again you become calculating and cold. It means you become loving and kind, and you do what has to be done. But, you're not involved in it mentally or physically or spiritually. Your body just does the things it's supposed to do. And the more spiritualized you become, the more you become of service to all of humanity. You become the servant to life. It's egotistical to think that you're superior to somebody else or you're better or that you know and they don't. As you become realized, you have more and more humility. You become humble and things no longer affect you and you no longer feel hurt. So you can help anybody and everybody without qualification. SF, Robert please, so the first principle in reality means, everything is a projection of the self or is the self itself. Robert, no the first principle is that everything is a projection of your mind. That begins to make you understand that you are not the mind, you are the self. SD, everything you mean everything. Robert, in the world. Material. Robert, everything relative is a projection of your own mind. We're not talking about the self, we're talking about the human mind. SF, all right, the diva, or the egoic mind. Robert, yes. But ultimately, yeah, the mind also comes from the self, of course. Robert, yes. But I guess the point in the first principle I want to touch is that, you don't get infused with the mind creations. Robert, no you don't because you realize that everything is a result of your own mind, so why get enthused in them? SF, no power there? No ego. SF, for the projections of the mind? There's no power, cause there's no mind. SF, right. That's why you don't get excited when you see something happening in front of you because you realize you're that yourself. And you're projectioning yourself. It's like you're a projector and you're projecting a picture on the screen. Though the mind is the projector and the screen is the effect, the picture is the effect. The screen is the self. Nothing changes the screen, but the pictures change according to your mind. But, the screen always remains the same. Therefore, the screen is like your real self. It never changes. Pictures are like the world and your mind is like the projector. The projector and the mind have to be destroyed. The pictures have to be destroyed and only the screen remains, that's the truth. Only reality remains. SF, and then again, everything is Brahman. Everything is Brahman, yes. SF, including also the play of the mind. Of course. SF, ultimately. Ultimately, there's only oneness. There's only the self and there's no mind and there's no play. There's no projection. That's the truth. SF, there is no projector, no screen. No. SD, because the mind is part of illusion or maya. Though his question was correct that ultimately everything is also the self, that's what he was saying. Robert, everything reverts back to the self. Everything is the self. SF, everything ultimately goes back to the source. Robert, Yes to the source because what appears to be real does not really exist. SF, right. Only I am exists. Self exists, that's it. The self exists just the way you are now. 
You are that. What I'm trying to say is, do not separate yourself with yourself. It's really a mistake to say, well I am not the self because the self is in me. The self is not in you, the self is you. You are that self. But, for the sake of talking, you want to place the self someplace so you say, it's in my heart. When you look for it, it's in your heart. In reality there's only the self and you don't exist at all. But, when you talk about it you place it someplace. SD, so you're just led into the second principle. Robert, yes. That you're unborn and you don't exist or disappear. Robert, yes. That one leads to the other, doesn't it? Robert, it does. That's why you should practice the principles. SF, I was thinking if everything's a projection of the mind and the mind comes out from the self, I don't know if that's right but mind. Robert, comes out of the self. Comes out of the self, and then again goes back to the self. Isn't that the reason why these Bactas talk about that everything is Shiva, or everything is the self? Robert, Shiva the self God are one. So they're in wonderment and devotion to almost everything. Robert, yes exactly. Even the thoughts are asking. Robert, yes this is why I say often, the ground upon you stand is sacred ground. We should have reverence for everything. Because everything is the self. SD, so you're talking on two different levels when you're saying everything is a projection of the mind you mean everything in the material world. Robert, yes. When you say everything is the self you're talking on a higher level. Robert, everything is the self as it appears. Though you should have reverence for everything. I know it sounds complicated. SD, no it's not, it's really two different levels you're addressing to me. It's really one level but it appears like two levels. Everything is sacred, everything. SD, well how do you, or do you react when you watch the situation in Kuwait and see it then, is it like a movie to you? Robert, I just watch but I realize that's the self. Or do you realize that it's illusion? Robert, same thing. That's what I meant about the two levels the real self is not illusion. SK, as the absolute, it's not, it's illusion right. From the absolute it's the self, as the relative it's illusion. Robert, exactly. ST, that's good. Say that again? SK, as the absolute, it's all the self, on the absolute level, on the relative level, it's illusion. Well that's what I meant about the two levels. I know what you mean and there's really only one level. The ultimate truth is one level. Robert, so when I look at something, when I look at you, I look at a chair, I look at a book, I see the self. SD, do you see a portion of the self or all of the self? It's all the self. Everything is all the self. SD, it's individual. It's hard to explain in words, but take this chair for instance. When most people look at this chair, they see a chair, but I see the self as the chair. Or to put it in simple language, this is God, this chair is God. SD, no matter what you look at it's God. Yes. Though you have no quarrel with anything. SK, the looking, the actual looking is also God. SD, that's assuring. You have a good understanding of this. SN, and you keep thinking of two levels, but it's like when we're saying, people say that well it's an illusion therefore, it's not real. But, the idea is that nirvana and samsara, are the same thing. So though you say there's two nirvana and samsara, yet they're the same thing, that's where the one is, so really it's one. Though it's not like the unreal is different from the real, or that the self is different from the manifestation, I guess. Nirvana and Samsara are the same thing so that's why wherever you look at you see the self. SL, 
so it seems like it's different levels of consciousness for want of a better word. Robert, when you have to talk about it, it appears there's multiple levels. But, when you keep quiet then it all comes to you as one. You see the more we get into the conversation we get into all kinds of things and all kinds of levels. SD, because we're trying to discuss the infinite with finite words. And you can't do it. SM, it can't be intellectualized, can it? No, it cannot. That's why the only way is to go within yourself and discover it for yourself. But as we keep talking about it we get involved in the world. SK, is it true that it's more like it's the illusion that we're separate from all this, more than that this is an illusion? Robert, exactly. We're not this at all. At the same time we're not separate from it. Robert, we're not separate from it it's all one. SF which comes also. If I say that I don't exist in the sense of an egoic entity, everything is just as it is. Is that more or less a feeling? Robert, say that again. Like if I. Again it is imagination, but as a helper I would say that I don't exist, I don't exist, but when I say that I am denying the egoic or the jiva part, then there is still there is something which subsists or is there. Robert, the self. The self is always there. And there is nobody to distinguish anything. Things are as they are. Robert, exactly in the last analysis, you are the self just the way you are. Okay, but not as you think you are. Laughter. Robert, as long as you think you're relative then you're not that. Laughter. SL, yeah you're not supposed to think. Robert, but you are the self just the way, you are naturally and all is well and there's nothing wrong. Do you can look at it this way. A substratum of all existence is harmony and out of harmony comes harmony. Though everything is really harmonious. Except we've sort of been hypnotized and we see a different picture. It's all in the mind. The mind has betrayed us to make us believe that this is black and this is white. When in reality there's no black and there's no white. There just is. You can only come to that conclusion in your own consciousness by deep self-analyzation, vichara, self-inquiry, and you'll come to that conclusion yourself. And then you will become omnipresent, and you will realize that everything is the self. SL, why are we here on earth in this physical form? You're not, you think you are. SL, okay I think I am, but why? If you're not then there's no answer to that. SD, but why does she think she is? Why the illusion? How could the self be illusion? Robert, there is no self and there's no illusion. SD, but I mean like the higher self. There is no illusion at all. You believe that there is an illusion but there is no illusion. SD, but why do we believe there's an illusion? You don't. None of this exists. SD, I understand her question which is, then why is there even the appearance of illusion? To whom is there an appearance? SL, me. Okay, is it the ego? So that goes to the original question, okay? Robert, of course the ego does not exist. Do not give the ego power. Some people get hung up on the ego. And they say yes everything I feel is the ego, so it's the ego. They're inflating the ego by saying that. And the ego becomes stronger and stronger. SL, because the philosophy that I'm trying to wrestle with though I know what the answer is, in that philosophy is that the souls are the things that exist that's the not me, but the self that exists you said self. Though I interpret self as being the soul? No. SL. No. The soul is another part of the body. It seems that when you give up your body there's a soul. It's just like an alter ego. SD. Oh so the idea of the soul and existing between lifetimes is also part of Maya, 
illusion. Robert, it's all Maya. All the planes are Maya, the causal planes, the mental planes karma, none of that exist. SN. First principle. Everything is a projection of the mind, everything. Robert, and for somebody who doesn't know that or doesn't understand it, it appears that after they drop their body they go to a different plane, and they go through all kinds of experiences, but it's still an illusion. SL, it must take a lot of patience for someone who has been realized to have to answer questions from people like me. For me that doesn't exist. Robert, no, on the contrary, on the contrary. SN, who has patience? There's no one there. SL, yeah, but from the projection of my mind, my philosophies was that there was a soul which you know according to these philosophies, the soul doesn't exist just the self. But from the earthly ignorant plane that I'm on, what the ultimate question is, it seems that some people are just denying everything of the self, you can't really enjoy food, you don't enjoy anything else because the ultimate goal is just like the Catholics, the ultimate goal is just to be with God. Robert, well you can't put it like that because the self enjoys itself. SL, that's why it seems like what little I know of certain philosophies, certain Buddhist philosophies, it's kind of like for being on earth in this form. Robert, that's right. It's a crime for even being here in this form. We're being condemned for being here on this earthly plane in this form. So it's kind of like, well if you're here why not smell the flowers too? Why not let the me, the self use whatever vehicle it's in, whatever it's invited in, to just feel and help bring joy, at least for this physical body and once again my ignorance for not being enlightened. You know it's like why are you wrong for being what you are? Robert, you're not. Or projecting what you think you want. Robert, you're not. Because it's like denying food, denying enjoyment of this earthly plane. SK, why is it terrifying? SL, no just talking to people about different philosophies of Buddhism and everything else. Robert, it becomes very confusing. That's why the best thing you can do for yourself is to quiet your mind. SL, yes. And when your mind becomes quiet, you become more beautiful. And you will enjoy everything. We do not deny ourselves at all. SD, yet just because you're not in the movie doesn't mean you don't enjoy the movie. SL, true. I believe in enjoying because that to me makes me happy. Robert, yes but you'll enjoy it in a little different way. As an example, I love to take in fresh flowers at my breakfast table because they're beautiful, right? Tape break tape restarts as student continues. SL, acceptance is just basically just letting be. Robert, just being yourself. That's all you have to do. SL, so it's the two ways also with the denial. SK, it's beyond accepting and rejecting beyond that. Yeah. Robert, just be yourself. SL, just that you use that word denial, so I'm taking your words of physical, earthly interaction which is projected by the mind to try to understand what I was feeling. So remember again that this is not a philosophy. A philosophy is usually dry words and this is not a wordy teaching at all. We are not a philosophy at all. It's more the realization. It's more of a quietness and emptiness. It is not a denial of anything, and it is not an acceptance of anything. It is a total emptiness, a quietness, a peace, a love, an ultimate oneness. That's what we are, Satchitananda. That's our true nature. So when we look at something, we see joy and love and peace, we do not become ecstatic. We do not become overwhelmed. We do not become sad or angry. We just enjoy the self at all times and it never changes. It's always the same. SD, so you're always in bliss always? Robert, see I can't tell because I don't know what the word is. 
SD, but Sat Chit Ananda includes bliss so. Their words but the person who's experiencing that does not know it. SD that's true. Because there has to be somebody to enjoy it, and if there is no one there who can enjoy it? SD, I didn't say enjoying bliss, I said, always in bliss. But it's a word. SD, that's true, I guess I get hung up on words. Well, we're discussing words, so. SK, it implies, too, there's something to be in something. Robert, we have to talk, so we have to use words. SD, that's right, implies separation. Robert, yay. Yeah. As long as we're talking like this we have to use words. But, the reality is that is the Ajanis that attribute these words to the Janis. Ramana Maharshi never said I am in bliss or I am happy or I am filled with joy, but his disciples said it about him. He didn't know what he was. SL, I guess it goes back to who's the I? Robert, who was the I? Yeah. Students continue discussing point. SF, Robert, about this thing of ignorance, actually we cannot fathom how the Johnny sees reality. We can just talk and talk about that. The Johnny tries to describe as much as he can to try to help us and to direct us, however what I was wondering is what about the ones in the relative level to feign ignorance and just be silent or advocate ignorance. Robert, a few months ago I was speaking of divine ignorance. It's okay to say I am divinely ignorant. Divinely ignorant means that we do not know what anything is. You have to think of it, we know nothing. We don't know what a dog is, or a cat, or a tiger, or a human being, or a tree, we have no idea what it is. It just appeared on this earth the same time we did. That's called divine ignorance. When you admit to yourself, I do not know what anything is. You see a rock, where did it come from? Where did the first rock come from? What came first, the seed or the tree, the chicken or the egg? We don't know, it's a mystery. So that the first thing we should know as spiritual beings, we should plead divine ignorance. It's your ego that tries to say, I know this and I know that and I know everything but we really know nothing. We have no idea why we're here. Do we? We have no idea why anything exists. Just understanding that makes us relatively happy, because nothing is our fault, because we don't know why it is. We have no idea why anything exists. It's later on when you work on yourself that you discover, well, nothing really exists. Everything is emptiness. Only the self exists. But, until then, you give your ego a blow when you tell it, I don't know why anything exists, because the ego wants you to know. It tells you, you want to be smart. You want to be intelligent. You don't want to be a dummy, do you? It has an answer for every question. But, when you say, no, I really do not know what anything is, then you're pleading divine ignorance and that's good. SD so who asks these questions that we come up with, the ego, our egos? Robert, you use your mind to destroy your mind. SD, oh that's right, turning it on itself by confusion or whatever. Exactly. SD, so it can't be put into words what part of us inquires. It's your mind that inquires. It inquires about itself and the deeper it inquires the more it disappears. SF, she's still. SD, yeah, I'm trying, I can't seem to quite do it. Laughter. Robert, this is why I always tell you, try to keep your life simple. Do not make your life complicated. Don't have too many opinions about anything. Try to be still quiet and realize you don't know anything because you don't. Does anyone disagree with that? SD. Are you kidding who would say yes at this point? Laughs. Robert, well somebody can say well I know why this chair is here. Sen, he said we don't know anything and in an earlier satsang you were saying, well the only thing we know or if there is anything we know, 
that we think we know first principle keeping in mind is that I exist and as long as I exist you can work on yourself because you can find out who exists through self-inquiry. But, when you inquire who exists you find out that SD, no one SD, and yet I remember telling you one time I had read that Krishnamurti said, the ego would never annihilate itself, and you said that that was true on the relative level. Do you remember what you meant by that? Robert, well on the relative level it fights, you very badly. It brings up all kinds of things from past lives, from this life to confound you. But, if you do not react to it, if you do not fight it, but rather inquire to whom does it come, it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker until it's annihilated. SN is there a difference between the ego and the mind because the ego would not want to destroy itself, yet it's the mind that is the tool. Robert, the mind comes first. The mind creates the ego in the body. SN, so it's not the ego destroying itself, it's more, the mind destroying the ego. It's more than ego, it's not the mind destroying the ego. They're usually the same terms. We break them down so you understand what I mean. But, there's only the mind and everything is a projection of the mind. The ego is a projection of the mind, the body is a projection of the mind, the world is a projection of the mind. So when you go back to the mind and you quiet the mind, there's no ego. SL, you mentioned an answer to Dana's question you mentioned past lives. With the word past lives, isn't there karma and soul and all of that? Robert, yes but as long as you believe that it exists, so you have to work with it. SN, that's why you say that everything is an illusion because as long as you believe it. Not that everything is illusion, that you see you're separate from everything is the illusion. Robert, see this is why when I make my personal confession to you, I say there's no mind, there's no self, there's no enlightenment, there's no one trying to become enlightened, there's no God, there are no others, there are no principles, there's nothing. SD, but you do say there is the self and the self is all that is. That's a word. SD, are you now saying there's no self? Who is the self? SD, everything. Yes, that's how it appears. But, in the end the self doesn't even exist, it's also a word. Because if we start thinking about the self, we start thinking of an entity. How else can we imagine the self? When I say there's only the self, what do you think the self is? SD, the oneness of all things. And what is that? SD, everything. So it has to be one. Who is the one? SD, I never understood before that there was not one. I thought the self was the one. The appearance is the one. The first appearance is the one I. That's the one. And out of I springs everything else. SD, and I is in delusion I can see what you're saying. Some, it's just the all Robert? It's just the all? Robert, even the all is no good. Laughter SD, we're all wrong. Laughs. SN, because who thinks that there's an all who perceives that there's an all? Who perceives that there's a self? When you're at that state there's no one to perceive it. There's nothing to perceive. Just be. Robert, as long as we're using words there's ultimate oneness. But, when the words stop see this is why the practices I give you, are to quiet the mind. The only thing you really have to do is to quiet your mind. What do you think self-inquiry is? Is to quiet the mind that's all. It's the fastest thing available to quiet the mind and when the eye disappears the mind is quiet. Then you know. What do you know? Don't ask me. Laughter. I don't know. It just feels good. Laughter. SF, yeah about feeling good Robert. 
When you are doing inquiry, sometimes you have a absence of thought for a little bit. Robert, yes. But then when I realize about this absence of thought, I'm already thinking. Robert, yes. And then there's some other times in which there is no thought. I don't know about the absence of thought neither, but there is a little bit of good. I mean, feeling good, feeling like a little bit blissful. Robert, that's the true state. Is that the true state, Robert? Where there are no thoughts in between thoughts. S.F. Right. However, they're very fast, and then you again go on thinking. Yes, in the beginning they're very fast. S.F. Yeah. One of the last satsings you pointed that we should reject everything. And I was wondering about these questioning about these little periods of bliss. Did I go back? Ask who do they come to? Robert, if you can think about it, reject it. S.F. When you are in that process of thinking it, it's time to reject it. S.F. Reject it. You don't care about if it comes back or not. Exactly. You do not look for experiences. You reject them. When it comes, really, it comes by itself. S.F. So when it starts creating a body in your mind, reject it. S.F. So it's time to kill it. Yeah. When it comes by itself, it comes as no thought. That's incomprehensible for a human being to understand. But it's just no thought. When there's no thought, you will know. S.D. That's what he was saying, but his mind says, "Oh, I just had a moment of no thought." And that's what you reject. Thought about the no thought, Robert. No, you reject everything. See, when you're really having that feeling, there will not be any body left over to reject. S D. So can we taste self bliss? You can taste, but it's still illusory. So you should reject it. S D. Why is it illusory? Because he can think about it. See, when the real thing comes, there's nobody left to think. The thought process has been annihilated. It's like you live in the moment. Cell. So the body knows what it's supposed to do. Robert, the body will take care of itself. The body comes under a different program. Cell. Why is it some people just by the body's program or the existence of that self? Some people might not be balanced. The spiritual and physical might not be balanced. That's not true. In reality, when you discover who you are, the body is very balanced, and it does better work and does whatever it's supposed to do better than ever. And you're always happy and blissful and feeling good physically, no matter how it looks to anybody else. S.L. Otherwise, it goes back to what you said. This entity, if it were me, the I or whatever, I would let my body react to take care of whatever I see needs to be done, and then move on. Yes. S L. Completely spontaneous. Okay. Exactly. S F. When I am sleeping, the self is taking care of my body, nurturing it. Robert. Yes, and you have nothing to do with it. That's how it takes care of your body when you awaken. Same way. S L. We just have to listen to it ourselves so it can take care of it. Robert, yes. S D. Do you have to listen to something, or it just happens? Robert, it happens. S N. Well, Robert, who breathes then? Is it the self? Is it the mind? Robert, the self has nothing to do with the breath. The breath is part of your ego. Sen, so it's the mind. The mind is breathing, and it keeps on breathing until it stops. S D. I thought it was the body who was breathing. Robert, the body, the mind are the same thing. But we have to have patience. That's very important. S F. Robert, do you know the fact or legend about Krishna Murthy? He was a young sixteen years old. I don't know. Was he a reincarnation of Shiva? He sat just in silence, and he had disciples or listeners to hear him, older than himself, and he sat in silence. 
and I think that the legend says that the people who were around him got enlightened or something. Robert, that's true, he never spoke. SF, due to his presence, they don't mention for how long or so. That's the story, yes. SF, what does that exactly refer? Does that refer to the concept of grace? You can call it grace, that's what we were talking about in another satsang. What we're doing here is we are abiding in the self as Ramana Maharshi did. So we can say we have Ramana Mahar, she's grace upon us. SD, isn't that the meaning of Darshan's silent teaching? Robert, no not silent teaching. Darshan is a vision of light. There is a visual transmutation. SD, oh I thought Darshan was like what you got from being in the presence of a master being in silence. It's a grace in the form of light, a vision of light. SK, a foreseen reality said simply. Robert, yes. SL, what is grace, what do you mean by grace? Robert, grace is always available, you just have to wake up to it. SD, but to find grace. Grace is goodness mercy. SK, helps you on the relative level. SD, what he was talking about a story that grace was bestowed in silence and Maharshi has said that the Guru can bestow grace by thought, by look and by touch and all of those are silent. SF, excuse me I was referring to transmission. Transmission of grace? Robert, there is such a thing too, yes. SD, could you further explain that though? Well an enlightened person is something like a current in a voltage, of a high voltage, and when you're with that person you pick up on that voltage. So there are some physical teachers like Ramana Maharshi, who can give you a look or a touch, or by silence and if you're receptive you pick up a lot of grace and knowledge. SD, I think you're that way. Who knows? But, all those things are possible. What you have to do is make yourself a good receiver, and you make yourself a good receiver when you stop worrying, and you stop getting involved too much in the world, and you start loving yourself. SD, quieting the mind would make you a good receiver, right? Robert, yes same thing, when you do those things your mind quiets. SD, we're talking about like a radio receiver in a way, wouldn't we? Yes. When you love yourself, you become quiet, you stop condemning, you stop condoning, you stop making decisions too much. You become quiet. But that doesn't mean that you sit home and do nothing. It means your body will do what it's supposed to do. But your mind will be quiet. SD, so even what we refer to as decisions will be spontaneous reactions, right? Yes. Like a tree, the tree does not have to think about growing fruit, by its very nature fruit grows. The sun shines, the grass grows. Same power that takes care of that takes care of the body, all by itself. SD, the lilies of the field that Christ taught us. Yes. Let's play a little music. Music played. SM. Robert, I saw on the top on one of the sheets you had I think it said John Amarka. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Robert, John Amarga means the path of Jana. That's the name of our group. SD, and Jana means knowledge. SM, that I know but I was wondering about the Marga. It means the path. SD, so there would be lots of Margas, right? I mean theirs. Lots of margas, too many. SD, what are some of the others? Like Jana Marga Bhakti Marga, would there be Bhakti Marga? Anything you want to say with Marga, you just put it in. SM, OIC. SD, Path of Knowledge. Marga means path, Jana means knowledge. Cell, what about healing? I know that it's within the self. Robert, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago actually. You have to ask yourself who needs healing. Who actually needs healing? Find out who has to be healed. 
Healing is a funny thing. It has a lot to do with karma and the body. I find from experience if you leave your body alone it has the power to heal itself. The more you fool with it the worse it gets. Laughs. There's a self-healing mechanism in the body. Isn't that right Horat? SF, I believe so. There's a self-healing in the body that knows how to take care of itself. SF, every seven years they said the body and all its organs and tissues tend to renew itself. Robert, of course you can help it by eating the proper foods I guess. SD, but what about healers and what they call spiritual healers? Robert, I think that's all karmic. SD, if you're supposed to be healed you will, if you're not you won't. Yeah, before you came into your body you knew exactly what was going to transpire and you know when you're going to leave the body and when you're going to die and when you're going to be sick and whatever. Everything has already been planned. Though if you're supposed to be healed, that's already been planned also. SD, might have been planned that you would meet a healer and... Yes sure. SD, it would be karmic or not. If it didn't work that would be karmic. Yes. SK, either way you don't know. Robert, that's right. There is no way to know. SD, true. Well Jesus' healings always seem to relate to a lesson, they always seem to make a point. SK, I think a healing without a lesson being given is useless, it doesn't help the person they've got to learn their lesson. I don't even know if it could be done actually. I just know that the woman who touched his robe and he said your faith has made you whole, he did not deny anything for lack of a better word, denying that he'd done anything, but her faith had done it, and that was the lesson. But, the lesson was that her faith had made her whole you know. Robert, people want to live forever and we can't. SD, can I read what Nasargadatta says just the cover of his book? Rather interesting right if I brought my glasses? The real does not die, the unreal never lived. Imagine a big building collapsing, some rooms are in ruins and some are intact. But, can you speak of the space as ruined or intact? It is only the structure that suffered and the people who happened to live in it. Nothing happened to the space itself. Similarly nothing happens to life when forms break down and names are wiped out. The goldsmith melts down old jewelry to make new. Once you know that death happens to the body and not to you, you just watch your body falling off like a discarded garment. The real you is timeless and beyond birth and death. The body will survive as long as it is needed. It is not important that it should live long. Robert, that's good. SD, I just love that you know. I keep bringing it for Arnold hoping that he'd be here because he asked me to borrow it. I hope he's not still ill but he must be. I better call him and see. Robert. But that's very true. Most people, especially Westerners, will try to preserve our bodies for as long as possible. Why? There's nothing wrong with dying. It's not bad, just another experience. SD, I think because they fear annihilation, they think that they've lost something, it's the fear of non-existing. Yes, of course, while you're alive it's good to be in radiant health though you don't have to suffer while you are living. SD, that's what Yogananda said he said, you can reach enlightenment in an ill body, but it's much less distracting if you're well. Um yes. SM, you can reach enlightenment in an ill body? Robert, oh yes. SM, is that preordained also Robert? Everything is preordained. SM, I mean your enlightenment. Yes. SK, but it's not limited, it's not fixed. Robert, it's not fixed but it's preordained. SD, preordained in what way? Preordained as in which lifetime you will wake up. Robert, no, you know the lifetime before, if you had a lifetime before that you're going to be enlightened in that lifetime. 
Esti, do you know at what point between lifetimes? Between lifetimes. Esti, and then do you remember it? No, you don't remember it, but you find it. You do whatever you have to do. Esti, and didn't you say that someone who reaches enlightenment usually has been approaching it for several lifetimes? They have been practicing sadhanas before. SD, so we do get credit. Oh yes. SD, not like the slate is wiped clean. Laughter. SL, that's like the journey of the soul that goes from life to life, though Robert says there's no soul. SD, I know what you're talking about, that entity or whatever. It's all on a certain level, he doesn't deny it. Robert, see, this is why we should get rid of all conceptions and just go and find ourselves and get rid of everything and be free once and for all. SD, I sure don't want to come back. I know people who act resistant to self-realization because they say they're looking forward to their other reincarnations. Well, they don't understand. SD, they can't relate to that. Some, that's sick really sick. Laughter. SD. I guess they think that realization is the end of adventure or something. And they look on different reincarnations as adventure but. SK. Either they're sick or they're realized. Well if you were realized you wouldn't look forward to future reincarnations. You wouldn't look forward to anything. SK. Unless you had the motivation to help others. Right. That puts you into a different category. SN. The Buddhists say that I will not be liberated until the whole world awakens. SD. Now that's depressing that. Laughter. SK. More accurately is I will not take the final liberation until everyone has brought back to whatever levels of enlightenment they can reach. Robert. That's a certain sect of Buddhism. SK. Yeah. There are other bodhisattvas that don't do that. SK. Huh. There are another sect of bodhisattvas that don't do that. SK. What do they do? What we're doing. SD. But actually there is a certain truth to that because you are the whole world. Robert. Yes but they want to stay in the relative world. SK. They make a vow actually. But, then they attain the state where they consciously know when they are going to be reborn into the next life and they write a letter or note and go and tell someone or not. So that's an area of control that's. Robert, but to get back to health again. It really makes no difference whether you're sick or healthy in the long run. It has nothing to do with it. To remember that you are the self is more important than whether you're sick or healthy. SD, because you're only sick or healthy in the dream anyway. Robert, of course. Like we were discussing the other time. We have no idea of the people who Jesus healed, how many stayed healed. They could have reverted back to sickness the next day. And I was talking about Lazarus, remember? Being brought back from the dead. Well Lazarus was about 50 years old to begin with, and at that time the lifespan was about 50. Laughs. Though even if he was being brought back from the dead, how long did he live after that? SD, yeah makes you wonder. But again, I don't remember what the point was but all those miracles had a point. To give people more faith. SD, yeah. It was less to raise him from the dead than to prove to the people that Christ was who he said he was, right? Yes. SK. You know at the time of Christ there were a lot of people claiming to be Christ. Robert, but here we are. What are we going to do with our lives? That's the question. SD. It's okay to look for healers because if you look for healers that's what you're predestined to do. Robert. Yes. And whether they help you or not is also predestination. Robert, of course. Though it's neither good nor bad. Robert, it's okay. SL, what about healing others? 
and that's also predestined to to be able to heal others. Robert, that's okay. Well look at it as a profession. If you're a professional healer that's what you do. It's like being an accountant. SD laughs. Only a lot more rare. It's a human profession. SD Horath's a healer in a way. He's a physician. We do whatever we have to do. SL, there are other ways to healing aren't there? Robert, through food, through fasting, through prayer, through meditation, finding a healer, all kinds of ways. SL, the unconventional ways such as some people who seem to be able to heal just with their hands. Yes, all things are possible. SD, but wouldn't the thing to remember be again that that is happening within the grand illusion? Even if it's on the astral plane, or whatever all those levels are a part of Maya. Robert, oh yes. SN, what do you do once you're healed? Then what? Then you get sick again. SD, or not. It depends on your karma I guess. SF, in the ultimate sense it doesn't matter what we do or don't do. Robert, that's right. We can do whatever we want to. Our reservations we may have about certain actions, I guess is also in the script. Our enthusiasm we have is also in the script, that Robert told us. Robert, true, I know certain people with some diseases who go spend their life traveling the world trying to heal themselves. What they're doing is wasting their time and using that time properly by trying to find themselves. SL, what about things like astral projection? What is that? Is that what you experience? Robert, that's part of the psychic realms. SD, which are also part of Maya, just another level. Slightly different from the Earth plane. Robert, in the Upanishads it states that if you get caught up in the psychic levels you can be caught for thousands of incarnations, going around and around in psychic realms. SD, isn't that perhaps due to the fact that some people think that's the end goal? Robert, a lot of people do yes. Being psychically gifted or being able to astrally project something. They see that as an end rather than just another level of illusion. SK, it's like another body traveling the physical body, traveling the astral plane, it's a subtler plane and it's just as material, in a sense, it's hard to. SF, and probably without knowing we have shared a great deal of these other levels of experience. Robert could be yes. We are just not aware now. Robert, true. As you advance spiritually a lot of psychic levels open up for you, but you're supposed to go beyond it and not get caught up there. Tape ends. Transcript 12. I am not the body. 28th, September 1990. Robert, tape starts abruptly. I am merely voicing what I feel. I am absolute awareness. I am Satchitananda. I am not referring to Robert. I'm referring to I am and remember I am includes everybody here. I am ultimate oneness. I was never born and I can never die. I am total bliss, infinite happiness, divine awareness, pure intelligence. This is the I am. It has come to my attention that the mantra that I gave you a while back is a little confusing to most people. When you say the mantra, who am I, I am he, I am not the body. There's a little confusion. I was speaking to one of you last week and I saw where the confusion lies. When you say I am not the body, to whom are you referring? This is an important point. I am not the body to most people means simply this, I am not my body. But I am apart from my body especially those of us with a Christian Judeo background. We say my body is the temple for the living God and God resides within myself. This may be true to an extent, but it is not the ultimate truth. 
the ultimate truth is exactly what it says, I am not my body. In other words my body does not exist, but there are not two of us. There's not I am in my body or there is not God in my body. There is not God residing in my body. There simply is no body. No body exists. Therefore I am is that I am. You are consciousness just the way you are, but you are not the body. In other words what you think is the body is consciousness. There is not the body in consciousness. There is the body as consciousness, and the body does not exist the way it appears. As an example, take a movie theater, you have the moving picture on the screen. You do not see the screen because it's covered by images, and you do not even think of the screen. You have no idea there is a screen because you do not think about it. You're thinking about the images. You become immersed in the movie beginning, a middle and an end. But, yet without the screen there would be no movie. Though we can say the movie is not reality. The screen is the reality. And when the images cover the screen, the screen is still the reality. But, the images give an appearance like reality. An example of this is when you try to get up and grab the images on the screen what will you get? You'll be grabbing the screen for the images do not exist. And so it is with us. Everything you see, everything that appears are images, or what is called false imagination, and the only truth about these images is consciousness. These are all cosmic images on the screen of consciousness, and that's everything. You and I, the chairs, the couch, the sky, the moon, the universe are simply images, appearances, optical illusions. The truth is that you are consciousness, but you can't see yourself because of the maya, the grand illusion. Though you believe that you are the body and you are the doer. Again it's like the movie and the screen. You get wrapped up in the movie and you start to feel the movie. You've forgotten there is a screen and the screen is the reality, but you're all wrapped up in the movie. And you can tell me everything about the movie. But you can't tell me anything about the screen. The only time you remember there's a screen is when the movie is over and even then you do not pay any attention to it because you get up and go home. But remember if it weren't for the screen there would be no movie. Though if it weren't for consciousness, there would be no images. Consciousness is real, the images are false. The images come and go, change continuously, constantly. But consciousness remains the same all the time. Consciousness is like emptiness, like empty space and you are that. I am that I am, that is the meaning of this. I am absolute awareness. Though you say, well H.O. come I feel all these other things. How can I feel disease? How can I feel hurt? How can I feel my problems? The reason you feel these things is because of wrong identification. You're not identifying with the screen, you're identifying with the images. And as long as you believe that you're an image like the movie, you're going to suffer accordingly. The secret is therefore to let go and quiet your mind. Identifying with consciousness and not with the image which is called false imagination. But, you may say to me will I see my fellow man suffering? There's a war to break out in Iraq. All kinds of man's inhumanity to man is happening all around me. Is that false? As long as you believe in it then it's real to you. Therefore I will not tell you it's false because you believe in it. Again it's like the person in the movie. I tell them the screen is the reality, but they say no the images are real, I can see them, can't you see the person killing somebody else? And somebody dying of cancer? And a bomb falling on the city? How can you say that's not real? So I come and take away the screen and there's nothing but a blur. This is what happens when you awaken. The human dream is over. It becomes nothing but a blur. And you become steeped in reality. Reality becomes bliss, happiness, eternal joy, Satchit Ananda. 
question therefore is, how do I identify myself with consciousness? There's only one way and that is to quiet your mind. Your mind has to become quiescent still. When the mind is still reality shines forth by itself. But, as long as you accept images, images are problems, things that you see with your eyes and your senses, and you think they're real, things that you feel, this is called false imagination. And because you feel these things first you suffer accordingly. The secret is to transcend those feelings and again the only way to transcend those feelings is to quiet in your mind. How do you quiet your mind? By taking time to be still. Be still and know that I am God. And if you can't become still by yourself there are various methods the highest one being self-inquiry. By simply asking yourself, whose mind is not still? Who feels all the images? Who suffers? Who becomes angry? Who identifies with the world? Again don't make the mistake and believe that you are not the body as I mentioned in the beginning. Though you think you're separate. There are two of you. You think there's the body and this is what advanced people who believe this now. They think they're not the body, but the body goes off by itself and does what it wants. But, they are something else. This couldn't be further from the truth. There's only one ultimate oneness. One. There are never two. There's never the body in yourself. There's only the body as yourself. And as you see this the body vanishes and disappears. It disappears because it never existed. That which exists must always exist. That which never existed must disappear. That's why the body gets old and dies, because it isn't real to begin with, it's an illusion. Though the real you is exactly what you are right now, the self. You are the self. You are not the body but you are the self. It's one not two. The body does not exist. If you're traveling in the desert, and you see a body of water, compare the body of water to your body. You believe in it because you see it. Yet, when you get close to it, it's not there, it's an optical illusion. True. Same thing with your body, you see it, you carry it, you think it's yours and you have identified with it. Why? Because of your mind. Your mind is the culprit. When the mind becomes still, everything disappears and you become the self, which you really are anyway. You have to use any method you have to, to quiet the mind. You must ask yourself, who am I? What is the source of the I? Where did the I come from? And then follow the I to its culmination. The I becomes like the mirage doesn't exist. When you follow the I deep inside your heart, you will find that the I never existed. Remember also that everything else is attached to the I. Every problem, the ego, the mind, Everything is attached to this I. So when the I is transcended, so is everything else and you're free. But the important point tonight is this, when you say I am not the body, realize that there are not two of you, there's only one. It means the appearance of a body does not exist in reality. You are consciousness, you are the self and that is the only reality and nothing else exists. Any questions about that? SD, it seems once you've explained it you can almost just say, I am is not the body. And that seems more clear to me saying that. Robert, if you're saying I am is not the body then, what is the body? SD, illusion. Exactly. As long as you remember that the body does not exist by itself, but it's like a projection on the screen, then you can say whatever you want. The whole secret is to know who you are and you are the immortal self. You were never born, you can never die. You have always existed. You are Sat Chit Ananda. That's who you really are just the way you are right now. Just the way you are. No changes have to be made. Just the way you are right now. You are God.
You are consciousness. But do not mistake this with the body. I am not saying that the body is God. I'm saying that you are God. But I see you as consciousness. I see you as absolute reality, as pure awareness. That is God. If you identify your body with God, you're making a big mistake. Therefore, when I tell you, you are God, I am referring to yourself. Not your ego, not your mind, and not your body. And when I refer to the term God, or consciousness, or absolute reality, I am referring to omnipresence. So when I say I am consciousness, I am not referring to Robert. I am referring to I am omnipresence, which includes the whole universe. Do you follow that? Everything is consciousness, nothing is left out. This is why we have reverence for all things, for all of life. For the mineral kingdom, for the vegetable kingdom, for the animal kingdom, and for the human kingdom. For everything is God. Nothing is excluded. If you hate anything, you're hating an illusion. If you feel out of sorts, or you feel sick, or you feel bad, or you feel angry, or you feel you've got a bad temper, you're identifying with an illusion. This is false imagination. It's not you. The more you think about these things, the freer you become. Any questions? S. N. Robert, is there any difference between an animate and an inanimate object? Or between a sentient or insentient? Robert, only in a material sense. In the absolute, there's no difference. It is all pure consciousness, egoless, mindless. It's all emptiness, all pure awareness. S. N. So physical things are the same things as people? Same thing. But, at a certain point in relativity, you call things sentient and insentient, but in reality, there's no difference, it's all the same. S. N. I was reading that only a sentient being can become self-aware of its own consciousness. How about inanimate objects? Well, inanimate objects cannot be aware at a relative level because they're inanimate in a relative level. But in reality, there's no relative level. Though everything is consciousness. You're probably speaking about Buddhism. The Bodhisattva says, only a sentient being can realize absoluteness. At the level he's speaking of, he's right. But he's speaking at a level. I am speaking of no level of the absolute. The absolute is the absolute. It is non-duality. SG, so can we say, in the absolute sense that everything contains everything and nothing. Robert, yes. It's the same, the same thing. Everything is nothingness, and nothingness is everything. Question also arises, how am I to live my life if I don't exist? Laughs. How can I live? Again, as I remind you all the time, you will be taken care of. As long as you believe that you are the body, there's a mysterious power that will guide you and lead you to your highest good if you let go and let God. Though at all levels you're protected. In other words, if you can't see the absolute and you can't understand it, that's okay too. This simply means you must surrender. Surrender to God totally and completely and you will be totally protected and taken care of. But that means absolute surrender, total surrender. Though you can use any level you like, it doesn't matter. Everything is in your favor. The whole universe is your friend. There is nothing against you, and there is nothing that can or wants to harm you, nothing. It's all in your imagination. When you're suffering from anxiety or depression, when you think the world is against you, or you think you have problems, try to realize that you think that from a human standpoint, and even if you can't believe that you're not human yet, let go of your problems. Give them to God and God will take care of everything for you. Also you came here karmically to do something at that level. Though so you're going to do whatever you came here to do. What I'm trying to tell you, 
you've got no problems. There's absolutely nothing wrong. All is well and everything is unfolding as it should. The as we sit in quietness, what's going on in your mind right now? What are you thinking about? Can't you see that's your whole problem? You're thinking. If there's no one left to think, you would be self-realized, but as long as you allow yourself to think, you're causing yourself one problem after another. It's like looking at a movie and you know who the killer is in the movie. Though you start thinking about a solution. How the police are going to catch the killer and what the killer should do to get away from the police. That's what you do when you're human self. You cause all these abstractions. You cause all the problems yourself and you don't know it. You believe that your problems are coming to you from the outside. But they are not. You are creating them out of your mind. And you're perpetuating them by thinking about them every day, thinking, thinking, thinking. And the worst thing you can do is to think how you can solve your problems. Because when you think how you can solve your problems, you are admitting you've got a problem that needs to be solved by some human way. And you may or you may not solve it that way. But if to solve the problem another one will pop up somewhere else and there's no end to it. The only way to get rid of your problems is to quiet your mind, go within, and realize the self. To that extent will your problems dissipate. Mary why don't you tell the class about what you told me about your problems. Would you like to share that? SM, a lot of dissension at home. My husband doesn't want me to come to these meetings, very much against everything spiritual now, and it has become very very hard on me and I've followed pretty much the way Robert talks to us and all of a sudden, the problems are still there but I'm very happy. I have changed, the problems haven't changed but I've changed. And I can face it all now. And it doesn't bother me. Today when Robert and I got in the car and he said, she you look happy Mary, and I said, I am happy, I really am. So, really, you change, not the problem, and I really learned it works that way. Robert, and that's the first step. The next step after that is everything else will change too. It has to. Sell, so it's the attitude, on this plane it's the attitude that happens first. Robert, yes. And then everything else will follow. Robert, exactly and patience is the key because things may seem to get relatively worse before they get better. That's called chemicalization. Things are beginning to happen. It seems that everything's going to blow up and get relatively worse sometimes, not all the time. That's when you have to hold on real tight. And all of a sudden there'll be a peace and a calm and everything will change into goodness and happiness and harmony. SK, the way to have patience is to accept, have acceptance. Robert, no you don't really accept. I don't like to use that term. What you do you turn from it and you go within and see the truth. And the truth is that you are the immortal self. You are not the situation. And you are not the body or the circumstance. SK, you're accepting reality. You're accepting reality, yes, that's a better term. SK, the truth. And when you accept reality, reality starts from you and expands into the world because you have formed a new creation. The world becomes your reality that you've accepted and everything becomes beautiful. SE, about three weeks ago, I had a sudden insight. I recognized that I was consciousness and not the body. It seems so obvious after thirty years not understanding what it meant. And that I create the world. Whatever the I is creates the world. You the body is just a small part of consciousness. But, I haven't understood absolute consciousness. Consciousness to me still means all of the images, changing, changing, changing and interacting, but I don't know what's before the images, consciousness, absolute consciousness, how do I find that? Robert, this is called Parabrahman, absolute reality, absolute consciousness. 
by denying the world within yourself by watching and not reacting. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper till the whole thing disappears. SD, isn't that the fourth fundamental that you gave us more or less apply in that case? Robert, explain that. Well, the fourth fundamental is that self-realization can be discovered by eliminating what it is not. Though, I feel that is what is meant. Robert, yes. When you see these images, and whatever you're still seeing you say, not this, not this. S.E. Netty Netty. Exactly, and you go deeper and deeper and everything will dissolve into consciousness. But, remember, you yourself, the way you are now, are absolute consciousness. So don't think you've got to drop your body. There is no body to drop. And that's the point, and that's the hardest part for people to understand. No body exists that you have to get rid of. I've seen very advanced people who have been practicing for years like you just said, and they're still saying boy when I get rid of this body then, I'll be free. There's nobody to get rid of. Like the sky is blue again. You take me outside and you say Robert see the sky, it's blue. I look and I say yes, but in reality, there's no sky and there's no blue. There's only atmosphere. It's like the rope and the snake. In the dark, you see a rope coiled up and you think it's a snake. But, upon investigation you realize it's only a rope. And you'll never be scared of the rope and the snake again. So when you see bodies, images, whatever your own body in particular, you realize what appears to be my body is pure consciousness and my body does not exist as it appears. And the more you can meditate on that the greater the reality will come to you that this is so and you become free or you awaken to your freedom just the way you are. This is why like I always tell you, what are you doing with your life? What's more important than finding yourself? Everything else is just a fleeting picture. It's here today and gone tomorrow. You have to be true to yourself. And really know where you are and what you're really made out of. Like I say many times, there are so many students who profess to love this truth and they live for it and can't wait for it and that's all they can do. Yet if they won the lottery and have 30 or 50 million dollars we'd never see them again. Or they'd be out celebrating and going crazy. So where are you really? The understanding of course is not a way out. The money will be spent. If you make investments, you have to worry about the IRS or about people trying to steal your investments. There are always problems in the human world, always problems. Turn within and really find reality. As I mentioned last week to you, even the times I was in India and I met with all these sannyasis, and you know sannyasis, they're renunciates, and they're sort of like bodhisattvas, they're supposed to be real high. Yet in reality, these sannyasis never had anything to give up or to renunciate because they never owned anything to begin with. And the first people that give them any money, they get rid of their swami outfits and they go to town. They put on new suits and they become a gentleman, so to speak. So you never know how you're going to turn out. You never know what you're made out of. But, if you keep turning within enough and you cry for realization, you cry for God, you have passion for God like you have for a football game. Something will give and something will happen. But you have to have that passion and it has to come first in your life. And you start in the morning as soon as you open your eyes. You may ask yourself the question, who is it that's awake? And the answer will come, I am. Who is it that slept? I did, or who is it that dreamt? I did and you will notice that the I is always there. So you continue by asking yourself, where did this I come from? The I that is present in all these three states of consciousness. Where did it come from? And you abide in the I. You abide in the I and you follow the I to its source until the I totally disappears like the sky and the blue like the mirage in the desert. The eye is an illusion it does not exist. And when the eye disappears, 
I am will shine again in all its glory and splendor. And that's a beautiful way to get out of bed in the morning. It's a beautiful way to wake up. But you have to remember to do these things. And not get up thinking about a cup of coffee or thinking about your problems or what you're going to wear or whatever. And the worst thing you can do in the morning is turn on the TV because those things stay with you all day. It keeps you from going within. Forget about newspapers. Forget about the TV for a while. The world will still go on. Save yourself. If you find yourself in a burning building, you do not stop to admire the pictures on the wall. You get out of the building as fast as possible. Though you find yourself engulfed in Maya. That's like a burning building. While you still have time before you leave your body, find out who you are. Know the truth and the truth will make you free. Let's play some music. Music played, tape break as Robert continues abruptly. Robert, believes they're the body. As long as you believe you are the body, there's reincarnation, there are souls, there's God, there's the world, there's the universe. And there's getting enlightened. But as soon as you realize you're not the body, all that ceases. Sam, Robert, what about the people who don't become enlightened at this particular time? Robert, there's no such thing. But, if you still believe you are the body and you happen to throw your body off and you believe you are the body, then you come back more advanced. SD, so you get credit for these courses, huh? Even if we don't pass. Even if we don't graduate. Laughter. That's right, you do. There's a gigantic accounting system that takes care of everything. SD. But that's within worlds of karma and reincarnation, right? Which don't apply once you're realized. Robert, exactly. But marry the things that um, realization gets you off the karmic wheel. The rules are different once you're realized and you realize all of that was always non-existent. Robert, but again I must emphasize. I'll say it again, that this is sort of a dangerous teaching because when I say there are no rules, it gives some people license to do whatever they like. But, they don't realize that as long as they're doing some evil someplace, they believe that they're the body and they have to suffer accordingly. If you become realized, you leave everybody alone. SN, Robert, when you said you could do whatever you want with the body, you can throw it in the garbage can at the same time. Everything becomes holy, right? Robert, in the last reality, in the last analysis, everything is holy. But, by throwing it in the garbage can doesn't make it less holy. SN, throw it in a holy garbage can. The garbage can is holy to begin with. SK, but it doesn't make it any more holy. No, doesn't matter. If you want to go through all these rituals of death, go ahead. Do whatever you like. Stee, they're almost necessary as long as we identify with the body, aren't they? Because they're all part of the dream, the same dream. Yes, as long as you identify with the body, everything is going to disturb you. You'll never find peace no matter what you do. SD, but I mean as you go through the rituals of death, you might re-remind yourself that you are doing that in the body, and the higher truth is that it's not real. Yes, when you leave your body you take a rest and you're able to see all these things. Then you get pulled back again and you have another chance. SD, didn't you say something about for seven days after death and seven days after a baby's birth that they know they are realized? Robert, you become aware, yes. For approximately seven days. SK, after death. After death. SD and immediately after physical birth as well. The little babies aren't so dumb as we thought. No. SM, have you ever seen a new baby? It never looks at the face or the eyes, always looks above the head, I've always noticed that. Robert, that's true. And depending on what type of person they look at they sometimes scream to get away from them and others, they're just so glad to be near them. Robert, a baby is real pure until the parents get a hold of them. 
and it's spoiled. SG, does the nature of the child say something about what the child's going to end up like? Though if the baby is very quiet and sweet and good-natured. Robert, not necessarily. SK, but probably in its young years, you get indications from them. Robert, you can and you can't. SD, that would be karmic, wouldn't it? Robert, everything is karmic, yes. So you, I think behavioral scientists try to stand on their heads to prove that the child grows up, like from seven and they're already fixed, but I don't believe that. I think people change continuously with the world. Robert, anything is possible. Anything, absolutely. Some what they say in the Catholic religion, get a child before they're seven years old and you'll have. Robert, lifetime Catholic. Yet yeah, fixed laughter. A guilt complex. Robert, that's what Khrushchev used to say. SM, pardon me? Khrushchev, he says the same thing, give me a child at the age of five and I'll give you a lifetime communist. SM, yeah I know. He must have got that from the same place as me. SL, admitting that he thought he was God. SU, also the training of a young child during Nazism in Germany. And they try to instill in the child, but I don't think that works either. Robert, everything is karmic, if it works it's karmic, if it doesn't it's karmic. There's no escape from that as long as you believe you're the body. SU, as long as what? You believe you're the body. SU, and yet we take care of our body, we feed it and we exercise it. Sure. It's like going to the movies. You pay to get in to watch the movie. You see all these pictures on the screen and you cheer, or you scream, or you holla, or you're afraid, then you go home. Laughter. SE. The process of disidentification with the body or with the ego is basically a problem of the mind, it's a process in the mind. It's the mind that realizes. Robert, yes, the mind is the culprit. Because of the mind you have a body and an ego. S.E., and because of the mind you lose your body too. Yes. That's why it's so simple. Quiet the mind and everything disappears. SD, including the mind right. Robert, including the mind. It annihilates itself. Robert, because the mind is only a conglomeration of thoughts. So the more you quiet and the more it dissipates. And when there's no mind, there's no world, there's no body, there's nobody. You're free. Then. The way to quieten the mind is through self-inquiry, right? Robert, that's the best way. Because they say that people that like to quiet the mind will renounce the world or go away to a cave. The mind is no different in the cave than it is in the world. SD, probably worse because that's all you do would be to think. Robert, yes exactly. SK, but maybe best to purify it, have a sub-confrontation with it. Robert, you'll go crazy. If you can't take it in the world or the marketplace, you'll be worse off in the cave. Sin, you can't force it, you have to let it happen of itself. The mind appears to be very very powerful, and it will overwhelm you. Though if you go away by yourself and you're not developed, you'll scream and you'll holla and you'll run back home. You can't force it now. You have to watch it. Become the witness to your thoughts and it'll dissipate. SK, what is the brain? Robert, the brain is nothing. It's a part of the body. It's the electrical system for the body. SK, takes care of the body. Yeah. SK, does it have anything to do with thought? No. SD, so the brain and the mind are not the same. No they're not. SU, those are just parts of functioning of the body to some extent. The brain is for the body. SK, you know they've done experiments where they tap certain places of the brain, and then the person thinks different. 
Robert, sure. Is that how the mind, the thoughts are embedded in the body, even they say that people who do massage, they tap into a place where someone has stored anger, emotion, or thoughts, or all of them. Robert, that's all on the physical mental level. SK, right so they can be interwoven so often. Yes, but the brain has only to do with the body. The mind has to do with thoughts about the brain. SK, so it's just as any other part of the body our thoughts could be stored with emotions. Oh yes, and then you can unstore them. SK, yeah, but you don't have to do it if you're not relating to the body. Um. SK, you can just do it by dissolving the mind so to speak. Oh yes, that's the best way because if you do it the other way they may be healed for a while. SK, and then you can restore it. But something else comes up. And even if you heal the body from this life, you have other lives to deal with, it never ends. SK, yeah, it's just helpful on a relative level. It could free someone up enough to indulge in a spiritual discipline. Yes it can, but that's still under the laws of karma. It was meant to be that way. Whenever you see a situation before you react to it ask yourself who sees. SD, sometimes reactions seem instantaneous could you ask yourself who's reacting? Robert, yes you can whatever is easier for you. But, I'm referring before you react. Most people are confronted by the situation and react with anger or whatever. So before that happens remember to catch yourself and ask yourself who sees. Then the reaction will dissipate and you'll become quiet. S you, you said to ask yourself who sees. Who sees the situation like this? For instance if you're watching the war in Iraq and you become angry over it. Catch yourself and ask yourself who is affected by this. Or who sees. Same thing. SD, or who responds right? Whatever helps you. Who responds who's affected who sees? SL, and if the answer's I. Go right into the teaching. Who am I? Where did the I come from? What's the source of the I? SL, and don't react. Don't react. SD, because it's the ego to whom it comes. SK, but don't believe that, find out. Laughter. Robert. J brought some food. Break in tape. Conversations about reincarnation and transmigration. Robert. It's very rare, but it happens to some people. SH, what would occasion it to happen? Would there be something that they've done? Robert. If someone's real vile, real mean, real bad and sort of like an animal, they'll come back as an animal. S.E., I'd like to come back as a rock. S.D., you would. It's a joke. Laughter. Robert, anything is possible. S.D., but all within the context of Maya right. Robert, yes. No one really comes back because there's nowhere to go. Robert, exactly. So if we could just wake up, we would just get off that wheel you know. Robert, well wake up. SD, that's a good reason to wake up as far as I'm concerned. Who tells you you're asleep? What makes you think you're asleep? SD, I know you tell us we already are awake. Words are inadequate, if I could be aware of being awake. If I could realize it. If you live in the moment, in the second, you're awake. But, every time your mind thinks you're caught up in Maya. SD, if you live in the moment is that the same as being one-pointed? No, no, no. One-pointed is to make your mind go after one thing. Go after the thing, quiet the mind. SD, oh so it's just an aid in the body? Then you become one-pointed. But, to awaken you just have to rest in that second without thinking. 
SD, so one-pointedness could lead to quieting the mind, which could lead to awakening. Yes, but just think of the second. Nothing is happening in the second and you're awake. SM, Robert, I thought it would come like a sound big blast. For one week. Robert, no, on the contrary, nothing happens. SD, I thought you said it was like a flash of light. Or were you just being symbolic? Robert, no that's before awakening. When you're really awakening you just open your eyes and you're awake. SD, one minute you're not and the next minute you are. It's like being in a room full of darkness and you flash on the light. SD, but I thought you said it was like a flash of light. That's before. That's when you have experiences. SD, um, I thought maybe you were talking symbolically cause, it'd be like seeing the light. Like I always thought in the Bible the light that shone around, Saul or Paul was symbolic of a seeing the light or awakening. Robert, symbolic yes. That's true yes. That's what I said, you're in darkness then you turn on the light that's it. No big deal. SD. Oh, but what a big deal. It is a big deal because it's what we all are seeking. You seek too much, it won't happen. Laughter. Stop seeking. Just become. Be. Be yourself. SG, I think a good analogy is when she was talking about concepts and being here and being there. If you're in a daydream state, there are no concepts to have and there's no one to have them or the moment between thoughts. Then you're not aware of any different states and you're not even aware of the unified state. You're just aware. And there's no one else necessarily to be, and I use the analogy before of the eye looking outward and everybody being a part of that eye looking outward. It might help with the conceptual daydream state. SD. I think the only reason I did speak in terms of levels was just for differentiating what we're supposed to see in finite terms. S.E. About two weeks ago I met Jane Dunn who was one of Nisargadatta's students. And I was talking to her in a motel room in Torrance and she was visiting her mother who was in hospital. And I was very impressed by her and I said, I really get the impression that you understand. She got angry with me. She said, you really didn't get it, she said, people would tell this to Maharaj all the time and he would get upset and say, you don't understand, you created me. And she waved her finger in my face like this and she said, you created this body, you created the teachings that you're understanding from me, it was a wonderful experience, I spent a week going around owning everything. The walls, the stars, it's all mine, I created it. Robert. She's right. I created the teachings, Iraq, Saddam, everything. Robert, and you created God. I created God, Robert. She's right. SK, what do you think of Nisargadatis, the guy that's taken up his works? SE, Ramesh. SN, Balsakar. SE, I like him a lot. I like Ramesh. He's very intellectual though. Theories, conceptualizations, tying together physics and philosophy and it's just too much thinking. Maharaj wasn't at all a thinker. Ramesh just confuses me sometimes with all of his conceptualizations. I liked your simplicity very clear. I like my simplicity. Laughter. Robert, it's the same with Ramana's teachings. The people who write the mountain path, they're going to be in San Diego next month. The great grand nephew of Ramana Maharshi. But, they're all intellectual. I've seen them before in India. SK, whose gnome is that a person? Robert, no mask Sam. SG, I don't know him. SD, he leads an ashram in Santa Cruz. SK, Santa Cruz. So there's a book with Ramana Maharshi that says from I to eternity Robert, how did you get that book? SK, 
I discarded at the Bodhi tree probably years ago. Did you know that book is supposed to be, it's a secret book. SK, well people get it and they go to the used book store and sell it when they want some money. Laughter. So I picked it up from there. Students discuss between themselves. SG, is no minute with a picture of Ramana. Robert, no, that was the first one. There are now two versions. SK, from I to Eternity, it's a small little booklet. Essentially saying, come to our place and do meditation. Tape break as Robert continues. Robert, he had a cave and he had other yogis upstairs in the other caves and they used to throw big boulders at him and try to kill him. They rolled boulders down. He would just look up and look at the boulder and it was like a fly bothering him. He'd just stand there, he couldn't care less, and they'd push these big boulders down at him. And they'd always miss. And this went on for months, because more people used to come and see him more than the other people. Though, you never know what people are going to do. S.E., was that when he first came to the mountain? Robert, when he was at Iskander Ashram. After he was there about fifteen years. See, there's so many things going on in the world, so many movements, so many teachers. That's why the true teacher is within yourself. Contact yourself. Find yourself. And leave everything else alone. Try not to make your mind complicated. Because there's so many books, there's so many teachers, there are so many movements. You have to go where your heart takes you and never condemn anybody. Just leave them be. There's enough room in this world for all. And everybody goes to what they need in the moment. In other words, if you have a rotten disposition, you'll go to a rotten teacher. Laughter. So you're always in your right place. Cell, is that what happened to me? Robert, who knows? I'm kidding. Laughter. SN, of course when you look at the world you see yourself. That's what Ed was saying. Robert, everything is in its right place. See, also, a big recognition of mine was, is I have no choice in my spiritual path it's unfolding. The person feels as if he's making these kinds of acts of will and practices and so forth, but it's just a bubble. Robert, true. It's deeper than that, it's deeper than the person. That I'm here it's not my choice, it's foreordained a long time ago. Robert, exactly. SD, that's what we talked about last Sunday karma. How everything is preordained, even decisions that you seem to face and the choices that you seem to make is predestined. SK, does your person still do spiritual practices every day? SE, I lay in bed all day long when I'm not working, that's what I do. S.E. Very advanced. Laughter. I used to be concerned about that, now I don't know what to think of it. S.E. I've been absolutely depressed for two years, I'm not interested in the world anymore. People say how depressed you are, you get out and do things, and I say I'm happy lying in bed and just being inside of myself. I don't even sit in meditation anymore, it's too much effort. Laughter. SN, what did Nisargadatta teach about meditation? SE, same as Robert, I would say. Robert, he taught for whom is there meditation? Who needs to meditate? But again, don't let it throw you. Because many people need to meditate. SK, what did you say then? I said there are many people that should meditate. SN, I almost feel as if I meditate to learn that I didn't have to meditate. SK, what about sleeping like we seem to be sharing some kind of the same experience but I'm concerned about that. Robert, well, if you're really on the right path your body will do the right things whatever it has to do. As long as you don't get in anybody's way and you're not cruel to anybody else you should do what you want. SK, but my only problem is my own conceptions of what I think I should be doing or what I'm used to in the past. 
Are you happy? SK. I'm both, I'm not sad. There's no sadness. Then there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. SD. When you talked of depression, could he not ask himself, who was depressed? Robert. Of course. Yes. SE. It's not a painful depression, it's just a lack of interest. SD. Whether it's painful or not, it's the ego who's depressed. It feels like the morning for the person. The person is dying, and there's a part of me that's mourning the death of the person. SD. The ego would resist the violation of the self. SK. Like a transition, also part of the transition. Cell. I think isn't that what somebody else said before someone's philosophy he said that you mourn for the person, the body, the self that's dying and later on the next. SK. Celebrate? Yeah, and the next step there's a little more enlightenment. Robert, that's possible too. All these things are possible. SN. Robert, can the ego resist annihilation? Robert, it appears to, but in reality if there's no ego who's to resist. But it appears to resist, it appears to fight you. But, when you become the witness and you do not pay any attention to it, it will subside by itself. SN. Well when you become the witness is that something that happens or can happen instantaneously? Yes. SD. But it's something you can do by plan. You can consciously become the observer. SN. But say if you become the witness doesn't the ego fight back? Robert, not if you become the witness. Because if you become the witness to the fighting then there's nobody to react, it becomes weak. The ego becomes very weak and subsides by itself. It's like when you have a friend, and your friend is talking to you, talking to you, talking to you, but you don't answer your friend, you just look at him. What's going to happen? Your friend will walk away and leave you alone. Laughter same principle. When your ego sees that there's no resistance, there's nobody left to fight. It becomes weak and weak and weak and weak and weak until it dissipates entirely. Asen, Robert, I've noticed in self-observation that there's a stream of thoughts and there's a time when I'll be observing those thoughts and then there's another time when I'll get involved in those thoughts and then I'll come back and try to observe them again. So is this an ego, this thing? Robert, well you are consciousness, so just observe the whole procedure. Observe what is happening but don't react. They, in your true nature as consciousness. SD, so when you say self-observation is being a witness, there's nothing magical about being the witness. Robert, no. Self-observation is witnessing. Robert, same thing. SK, and it's magical. Robert, why do you call it magical? Well because of the effects that it has on the ego. Robert, it's actually normal. Yeah. SE, you were with Ramena for two years. Robert, yes. How long was it after before you really got what he was teaching you? Robert, well I didn't go there to be taught, I actually went there just to see him. I had everything before that whatever it is. I was there two years before he died. SD, did you stay there the whole two years? No. I went back and forth because he was very sick, he could hardly walk. SD, and you couldn't stand to see that? No. I was able to have an audience with him twice. SD, how was it being in his presence? Robert, great. I mean, did you feel elevated? Did you feel like you'd known him all your life? Did you identify with him, or were you in awe of him? Robert, well if you recall the story, I used to see him when I was a baby in my crib and then I saw his picture in a book and then I went to India. SD, so you'd known him all your life? Robert, just about. SK, does he ever come to you taking on that same visible form? In dreaming or? 
Robert, lots of times. SG, how old were you when you went to India? Robert, 18. A young age to be traveling in India. Robert, I know. SL, bet you were wild. Laughter. SK, and that was a wild time about 1940 what? Robert, 1947. SU, you know the four rules and the three vehicles and all that. It's like, I'm not reading anything from all the different philosophies and everything so it's like whatever meditation or whatever I do it's just sort of like by feel and if I hear things that make sense to me I just do it. Robert, um that's good. Though the four rules that you say to follow, the four principles, does that help people to attain a certain thing? Seems to, it's like all one and the same just broken down into different levels. Robert, it's all the same that's true. Helps you to quiet the mind. S.U., I couldn't remember what you said the last time I couldn't remember all the steps, different steps that you said, three steps like who am I? And you said in between exhaling then, you say something else and the last thing is something about the God within us. Robert, oh that's the mantra. Yeah the mantra. I kind of like skipped through the thing and just like, I couldn't remember it, it's like who am I? I am the God within basically something like that. Robert, see, I give all these things to stop your mind from thinking. S.U., but it's different ways for finding your own. Different ways of getting there. As long as you can still your mind use whatever method you have to. Students' Discussion See, the teachings themselves are something to still the mind by satisfying it, isn't that true? Robert, that's true, right? It gives you something to nibble on, and then you can rest with your food, and you don't have to think anymore because you have faith. You believe in with that there's a settling within yourself. Robert, that's why I share these various methods. That's why I share all these methods. Because when your mind starts to think, catch it right away, don't let it take you over. And use one of the methods to stop the thoughts. Change the thoughts. Use whatever method you have to. By asking yourself, to whom comes the thoughts? By doing the mantra, who am I, I am he, I am not the body. SD, by breathing I am you said. By doing I am. Whatever you have to do, do it. S.U. Also I know that in metaphysics which is a level lower than whatever. In metaphysics the belief is when you meditate, you should be sitting up straight so that all your chakras could be reached when you breathe in and out. Does that make any difference or? Robert, that's a yoga technique but for whom are their chakras? For the ego. S.U. So in other words if one is laying down to meditate because it's like the lowest level of energy whatever. Not really. The only problem with lying down is you fall asleep, that's all, that's why I tell you not to lie down. SD, but it doesn't really matter does it, as long as you're quieting your mind. Robert, it doesn't matter but most people fall asleep, especially beginners. SU. I do it both ways, usually when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is go into that and before I go to sleep, you know I calm myself down and get into it. Robert, I know a Kriya meditator who does transcendental meditation, who has been meditating since the 60s, two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, and they're just the same. Nothing has happened. It's you. If they lay down you say, no they sit in meditation. SD, their minds are doing mantras when they are not doing anything. Robert, they're doing the mantras yeah. They seem to believe that the end result is a quieting of the mind, but quieting of the mind is only a step to realization. Robert, um. They see it as an end not a means. Robert, some become a little more peaceful, but it's all good I guess. S.U., so once you quiet the mind then what do you do? Robert, you do nothing. 
That was easy you know I lay down I quiet the mind and there's nothing. I wake up in the same space, exactly where I left off. SK, I don't even bother getting out of bed. Laughter. SE, very advanced right. Laughter. Cool of lazy Buddhists. Laughter. Robert, it's all good. Let's sing oh god beautiful. Tape ends.